Hi Dev and welcome to the Indian Coders. So today I am super excited to bring you an amazing course on the Monstack with GraphQL. So whether you are a beginner or you are a seasoned professional, this course is just made for you. So we start off by covering the basics of GraphQL API by breaking down the queries, the mutations and subscriptions in a simple and easy to understand manner. So you will quickly grasp the power and the flexibility that GraphQL offers for building the modern application. And once we have a solid foundation, then we jump right into an exciting project, a dynamic article writing application with comments, with multiple collections in the MongoDB. And you will get the hands-on experience by building a real-world application using the Mon stack. But wait, there is more. So we'll explore some fantastic content technologies like the React, Material UI, Redux, along with other tools that will help you make your UI look stunning and deliver a seamless user experience. And on the backend, we don't hold back either. So we'll dive into the Mongoose, the GraphQL, the ExpressJS and the Node.js by showing you how these technologies work together to create a robust and scalable backend for your applications. And we'll cover the important aspects like password encryption and other tools to enhance the security and performance of your application. And guess what? We won't stop there. And we'll also guide you through the deployment process as well. So you can showcase your app to the world. So you will learn how to take your project from the local development environment and make it accessible to the users worldwide. So whether you are just starting out or looking to level up your skills, this course has got you covered. So get ready to create an awesome applications and gain some valuable insights and unlock your two potentials as a developer. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribing to our channel and join our amazing community of developers. So today we'll conquer the world of the month stack with GraphQL. So again, thanks for being here and I can't wait to see you in the first lesson of our course. So let's dive into the fundamentals of the GraphQL and embark on this incredible journey of learning together. Before moving directly into the application, so let's have a look at what is the MERN stack. So MERN stack combines the MongoDB, ExpressJS, ReactJS and the Node.js to create a full stack web development framework that enables building the scalable efficient and the modern web applications. So the Monstack combines the MongoDB, ExpressJS, React and the Node and with all of that for the MongoDB we handle the data and with the Express and the Node we create the server and with the ReactJS we have the visualization part where we visualize everything to the user and then the ReactJS communicates with the server and the server communicates with the MongoDB database. So that is a cycle which is known as the Monstack. So let's have a look at what is the MongoDB. So we all know about the MongoDB, I think. So the MongoDB is a flexible, scalable NoSQL database that stores the data in the JSON-like documents. So if you're coming from the SQL environment, so the SQL has the tables and in the MongoDB, we have the collections. And in the SQL, we have the record in a table and here inside the MongoDB, we have the document in a collection. And each document has a type of the JSON type data. So let's have a look about what is the ExpressJS. So ExpressJS is a fast, minimalist web application framework for building the server-side applications and APIs. So it adds the middlewares, the routes to an API, which handles the data manipulation and server handling logic inside the Node.js applications. So the ExpressJS is a framework for the Node.js to create the server, to create the server logic, the data logic, and the route logic, the middlewares, and so many things. So it adds some functionalities to the Node.js applications. So let's see that what is the React.js. So I think we all know about the React.js. So it's a popular JavaScript library for building the user interfaces, which enables the creation of dynamic and interactive web applications. So currently the React.js is the most popular front-end framework, which is used to create the front-end of any application. And React is also there inside the mobile devices as well. And the framework is the React Native. So it's very popular library in which we create the dynamic UI. So everything is dynamic inside the React.js and it's very performant. So you can create any type of application with the React.js and it is currently in the demand as well. So let's have a look at what is the Node.js. So I think we again all know about the Node.js. So Node.js is a JavaScript runtime environment that allows running the JavaScript code on the server side, which is outside of the browsers. 
blocks and it provides the scalability and the non-blocking input output operations capabilities so the javascript earlier the javascript was only being running inside the browsers like the chrome and then it was taken out of the chrome because the javascript because the node.js is just a v8 engine of the javascript which was taken out from the chrome and it was maintained as a standalone project which we known as the node.js so it was just taken out to create the javascript capabilities to run on the server side because the javascript was just and it is still a front end language which is running on the browsers so it was just taken out to move out of the javascript and to create some server applications for, with it so let's have a look at what is the graphql so in this application we won't be using the rest api we'll be using the graphql api so graphql is a query language for the apis that provides a more efficient the flexible approach for fetching the data and it allows the clients to request only a specific part of data requirements and reducing over fetching or under fetching of the data so the graphql is a huge concept after the rest api because if you are using the rest api for creating an application so rest api gives you all of the data at once so if you request all of those users you get the whole data of the users like the id name email anything after that but with the graphql if you need only the name of all of those users you only request the name and you will only get the name so it will just prevent the problem of over patching and the under patching of data which happens every time with the rest api and trust me if you use the graphql inside this application then you won't be moving back to the rest api because it is very flexible customizable and it provides you a lot of features even in the development as well so now what we'll be doing so we'll be creating a monk stack application the mon plus graphql and the approach of our application will be the mvc approach the models the views and the controllers the models are the database models and the schemas the views is the visualization part which is being visualized to the user and the controllers which controls the workflow of the application so the models and the controllers are on the back end side where we have the database collections where we have the database and there we have the controllers which controls the database operations and with the view part we communicate with the server to send to receive some data and then the server sends the data and receives the data with the mongodb database so that is a mvc framework the model view and the controller and it's a best approach to create the web applications so now after the presentation now you will be seeing the basic graphql course in which you will learn the basic things about the graphql that what are the schemas so the schemas in the graphql are the schemas so you can have the schema for an api like if you have the users in all of your database so you can create the schema for the graphql as well and you can only accept those parts of the schema that you want suppose inside the schema you have the name and you have the email you have the password so if you need the email and the name from the users so you only get the data if it's available inside the schemas and we have the resolvers so if you make the api request to the graphql api then resolvers resolve those api requests so it manages like if we have to resolve this request we have to send some data so it sends that data that you require with the graphql api and then we have the graphql inside the graphql which is an api testing platform so inside the rest api we test the api the postman but with the graphql we have the graphic ql which is already enabled with the graphql to test your api so after this introduction you will be seeing the graphql tutorial and after that you will be moved on directly into the main project so we'll be creating the backend for the main project we'll use the node.js the mongodb express and the graphql which will be creating an api so with the graphql you only have the one api route endpoint where you make all of those requests and then the front end communicates with that type of api endpoint and then the back end would be created with the node mongodb express and the graphql and we'll be using a lot of more technologies as well like the password encryption for the encryption of the user passwords and a lot of the things like the course and multiple other packages as well and then for the front end part we'll be creating the application with the react.js which is the most used library we'll be using the redux as well we'll be using the material ui as well so the material ui is a react component library which has around thousands of predefined components for the react for the design purposes so it saves you a lot of time writing the css from the scratch so that's the material ui which is free of course so you don't have to pay anything for it so we'll be using the material ui for the design part we'll be using the redux for the state management inside our application we'll be using the react 
for enabling the dynamic interfaces and then the front end would also be secure so we won't be having any security issues because we'll be storing the data inside a secure format so that will be all for the front end and we'll be creating a medium like application so if you haven't used the medium before then you can use that again so we'll be creating a medium like applications where you will create where the users can create the blocks from the medium type application like you can create the title of the blocks you can create the descriptions as well and so many things according to that so that will be the front end part so now that's it for this so i will see you there so now you will be seeing the graphql tutorial a basic graphql tutorial which will be about like it will only cost you around 30 to 40 minutes and then you will be directly move on into the main project of our application which is the dynamic article writing application with the mon plus graphql so let's start from there so now let's hi and welcome to the graphql crash course so in this course you will learn about the graphql you will learn everything about the graphql that what is the graphql and why we choose the graphql over the rest api and how to use the graphql so without wasting more time let's start so i'm nikhil tadani and i will be presenting you this course and this course is prepared to you by the indian coders so let's start so what is the graphql so the graphql provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your api so with the graphql you have the complete understanding of what the data you currently receive in your api request so with this understanding the client has the power to ask for exactly the data that they want and nothing more and it makes it easier to evolve your apis over time and it enables the powerful developer tools with the graphql so the graphql is a query language which enables you to only receive the data that you want nothing more and no unnecessary data with that so you only get the data that you really need so if you only need some specific part or some specific slice of a data then you can get through the graphql you generate a query and you get that data and nothing more and it is very easy to work with so it is very easy to work with the schemas and handlers of the graphql so this is all about the graphql so let's see the differences between the rest api and the graphql so what are the differences between the rest api and the graphql so the first difference that we currently have is the endpoints so the rest api have the multiple api endpoints so for every type of request for every http verb request for every request inside that the rest api have different endpoint for that request but with the GraphQL, you only have one single API endpoint along with that. You only have one single API endpoint and then you generate a query, you get that result and you generate a mutation, you get that result. So this is all with the GraphQL. And in the part of the data, so you get the whole response data with the REST API as we designed in building the backend. So that it is a backend. So with the REST API, you get the complete response object. You get the complete data along with the request. Like if you are getting the user property from the REST API, you get the whole user data like the ID, the name, the email or everything related to that user. But with the GraphQL, you only get the data that you requested for. Like if you have just requested for the name of that user, then you will only get the name of that user and nothing more. So this is with the GraphQL. And with the complexity, the REST API becomes more complex because you handle multiple API endpoints with your application on the client. You handle multiple API endpoints inside the backend as well. You handle a lot of things with the REST API. But with the GraphQL, you have very less complexity because you generate some schemas and some schemas generate some handlers. So you generate the schemas and according to that schema only, you generate all part of the handlers and you don't have any multiple API endpoints. You just create some structures of the queries and mutations. So you have very less complexity with the GraphQL and speed. So both are good in speed, but the GraphQL is little bit more in terms of speed. Like it provides you a greater result because you have some static schemas with the GraphQL that enables you the high performance applications. And after the differences, let's move and let's see the benefits of the REST API. That what are the benefits of the REST API? So with the REST API, the benefits comes with the learning curve. So it is very easy to understand and learn and it has a great learning curve. So you get a lot of resources to learn the REST API and it is currently the most popular API. And it follows the standard HTTP procedures. So it follows the standard HTTP procedures and supports all type of HTTP verbs like the GET the post, the put, delete, update, patch, so, so many requests. 
So it follows that approach. So it provides you the data with the type of your HTTP verb request. Like if you are sending a GET request, so it will give you some data along with that. So that's how the REST API works. And it is very scalable as well. So the REST API is also very scalable. So you can scale it to the big applications as well. So these are benefits of the REST API. But let's see the benefits of the GraphQL. That what are the benefits you get with the GraphQL? So with the GraphQL, you have a lot of benefits like you only have single endpoint. So the data fetching with only one single endpoint becomes much easier as per the client perspective, because if you have multiple API endpoints, then you have to manage all of those API endpoints inside the client application. So it becomes very mess at the end of your application. If your application is very big, like suppose you are making an Amazon type application. So it becomes very difficult to manage all of their requests. And with the one single endpoint, you only send the post request with the GraphQL. So there is no get request, there is no delete put update. So there is only one single request, which is a post request to the GraphQL. So let's move on and you have the freedom of the data. So with the GraphQL, you only get the data that you requested in a query. You only get the data that you requested for the mutations and all of these things. But with the REST API, you get the whole bunch of data. You get the whole unnecessary data that you don't want. Like if you only need some slice of the data. So you get whole data with the REST API. But with the GraphQL, you can only request some piece of your data. And it enables you that flexibility with the data. And it is very fast. Oh? So it is very fast as compared to the REST API. So REST API is also fast, but it is also faster than REST API because we have some predefined schemas available. So inside the request object only, we have the schemas, like the schemas is related to the request and the handlers. So the schemas move on to the handlers and it provides you a quicker response than the REST API. So this is all about the understanding of the GraphQL, that what is the GraphQL and what are the benefits of the GraphQL, what are the differences between the REST API and what are the benefits of the REST API as well. So now let's see a simple demonstration of what the GraphQL language looks like. So the GraphQL just has the ability to only give the data that you currently requested. Like here you can see you have an object and inside that object you have suppose like a query like the hero and from the hero you only need the name height and mass of that hero. So with the response, you will get this response. So you get the response of what you requested for. So you request it for the hero, you get the hero like this. And then you request it for name, you get the name, you request it for height, you get the height, or you request it for mass, and then you get the mass. So that's how the GraphQL works. So ask for what you need and get exactly that and sending a GraphQL to your API and get exactly what you need and nothing more and nothing less. So this is all about the GraphQL and this is all about the introduction of this section. So this is about the introduction of the GraphQL. So now we'll be moving on and we'll create a project. We'll create a CRUD operation with the GraphQL. We'll be creating a CRUD operation of the users, their registration of these users, deletion of the users and so many things. So let's move on to that part. And from that project, you will learn about the GraphQL, that how to use the GraphQL, how to create the CRUD operations with the GraphQL and everything along with that. So let's start the project. So after the introduction, so let's create a basic application with the Node.js and the GraphQL. So in this project, we'll be having the CRUD functionality, a basic CRUD functionality of the users in which we can get all of the users and we can get a user by its ID. We can have a create operation. We can have a delete operation and then we can have an update as well. So there will be CRUD functionality of the users. So let's create this application. So I'm using the Node.js. So I do expect a very basic knowledge of the Node.js before starting on this project. So if you do not have any knowledge on the Node.js, then you can just go through one of my courses on the Node.js. Those are available even at free at the YouTube and some of them are paid at the Udemy. So you can see that course. So after that, here I am in the Visual Studio code and now we'll be initializing a new Node.js package. So we can initialize a new Node.js package by npm in it and dash dash y. So we have just given here the flag of the dash dash y. It means that when we run the npm init, it asks a couple of questions regarding our package name, the author, the description of the project. So we can just provide the npm init dash dash y to just by default say yes to all of the questions. So let's hit enter. And there you will see inside the root directory, there is a package.json file which is just created. And inside that it contains some crucial information about our application, like the name, it has provided the name as per the directory, the mon GraphQL. We have the version, we have the main, we have the scripts, we have the keywords, and then we have the license. So there are so many things regarding that. 
And now for creating the application with the GraphQL, we need a couple of packages to install. Like first, we'll be using the server. So for the server, we'll be using the Express.js. So we'll be using the Express because it is very familiar and widely used. And if you want any other server, then it is welcome. So you can use any other server that you want. So now let's install a couple of dependencies. So first, it will be the Express and PMI. That should be the Express. And then we need the second dependency of the GraphQL. So we are creating the GraphQL application. So we need to install the GraphQL as well. Like it will be the GraphQL. So we have installed these dependencies, the Express and the GraphQL, but they are not connected together. So there's another package which is named as the Express dash GraphQL, which automatically connects the GraphQL to the Express server magically. So we can use the Express GraphQL server with that. So we can just hit enter. So we only need these packages as of now. So these dependencies are now installed and then we can see it and verify inside the dependencies object. And now let's create the main file like the index.js. So we can move on into the directory. We can create the index.js inside that. And here I'll be using the ES5 syntax as of now because here we haven't set it up the TypeScript or the compiler options inside that. So we can use the ES5 module. So first we need to require the express.js. So we have the const, we have the express. That should be equals to the require and it should be equals to the express.js. So here we have the require of the express. And after that, what we'll be having is now we need to just use here the GraphQL packages as well. Like we need to use here the express GraphQL package, which is the GraphQL HTTP. So we can have a const, we can have something from the require. And that should be equals to from the express GraphQL. So I'll be importing this later. So I will be now just defining the server here. So we can have the const, we can have the app that should be equals to the express. So now the whole application is functionality will now be handled through this app variable because now the express has given its reference to the app so this app will be handled by the express js and after that our server is now created with this like this app is now our server and then we can just start this server on any port so for that we can use the app dot listen and then we can just provide the port number like we can provide the port number like the 5000 to make the server listen on that port and then we can run the callback function here as well like when the application will be listening to this 5000 port server so then the callback will be fired like we can have the console.log inside this and inside that we can have the server running so that will be the log message so if we save if we just run this file so we haven't added any script as of now but we'll be adding it later so as of now we'll be using the node to run this file so we can have the node as the index.js and then you can see now we can see the server is up and running on the port of the 5000. So here you can see now the server is running perfectly. And after that, let's create a first middleware with the express. Yes. So the middlewares are just routes. The backend also works on the routes. So we need to define the endpoints here. So as per the REST API, so if we just create the application with the REST API, then we need to have multiple endpoints. Like if we want to get the user, then we can have slash user. We can have a slash user slash ID. We can have user slash create. We can have delete. We can have update. So there are so many things. But on the GraphQL, there is only single endpoint and there can be only single requests. So the HTTP request method should always be the post method. And there should always be the single endpoint with the GraphQL. So make sure. And after that, what we'll be having is we'll be defining the middleware like the app.use with that. And then we can define one single endpoint that can be the GraphQL or you can define any name that you want. And after that, inside the REST API, we write here the request response and the next inside the callback. But here with the GraphQL, we do not need to write that because it is not the REST API. It is the GraphQL. So here we have a function inside the Express GraphQL, which handles this middleware we have the GraphQL HTTP. So here you can see we have the GraphQL HTTP, which automatically handles this request. And after that, we need to provide some options here inside that. So you can see the first parameter contains some options. So we can provide some of the options here. Like first, it can be the schema. So as we have discussed inside the introduction, so the GraphQL only works with the schema. So if we have the freedom to get the data, then this is because of the schema. Because suppose we have the users, so each user will be having an object which contains some properties like the ID, name and the email. So with this schema, what we will do, so we'll make a query to the GraphQL that we only want these details from the user. And those details should be available inside the schema. So make sure of that. And after that, as of now, we can give the schema as the empty object. And then there's another property, which is the GraphQL. It's optional property. We have the GraphQL, we can give it to the true. 
and what GraphQL will do is like we see inside the Postman, we make some requests to the REST API. Like it is same with the GraphQL. So you can also use Postman for the GraphQL, no issues. But the GraphQL automatically provides you an interface in which you can just run a query and then you can just get results according to it. And it is very simple to use. So we have the GraphQL interface for the GraphQL. So if we just save, we can restart the application server with the node index.js. And then you can see again the server up and running. And then we can just open any browser. And then we can run on the port like the local host, the port of the 5000. We can have slash the GraphQL. And once I will run this, then you can see after running this, you can see there we have a web page and inside that we have the GraphQL here. So here you can see we have the GraphQL and inside that here you can see there are some comments. So here we run the query. So here we run the query and here we get the results. And there are so many options like for typing the query, you can type for running the query. You can just press the play button, execute button. You have the Pratify, you have the merge, you have the copy, you have the history of all of the queries that you made. And then you can see here you have the results here you have the docs as well if you want to just learn about the graphql so here what i will do is i will now just define the type of that user because the graphql works on the types so if we are defining the users like each user will be having a couple of properties and those should be the fixed properties so the user should be having a couple of properties so we need to define each property and their data type inside that so that is known as the type to define inside the GraphQL like we do inside the TypeScript. So that's how we need to define the type of all of the properties inside that. So let's define their types. So first I'll be using the const. We can have the user type and that should be equals to a new GraphQL object type. So we have the GraphQL object type inside that. So here we have the object type. So it provides you an access like the GraphQL object type is a class which is used for the types, the queries, the mutations and so many things. So we need to handle it accordingly. Here we have the graphical object type and here as well we need to provide some configuration options. Like first there should be equals to the name. It should be the unique name every time you use the graphical object type. And the unique name should contain the user type I think inside this. Yes, correct. And then the second field is the fields. You can see here we have the fields and inside these fields this should be a callback function when using it with the type and after that we can define the fields here like we have here the fields this should be a callback function and here we'll be returning all of these fields so here i'll be using first the round brackets then the curly brackets and after that inside that what we'll be having is now we need to define some fields like each user will be having the id field so we can define the id and then for defining their type then we can use again an object the object will again contain a type property and the type would be equals to so you can give any type to the id you can give the string as well you can give number as well but here inside the graphql we have a unique id type as well so we can give the graphql id so here you can see we have the graphql id that we can just provide the type to the user so this is how we can just provide any type to the user so this is how we can just provide any just fields to any user or any type that you want and after that the user will be having the name as well so we can have the name and with the name again it will be your object of properties of the type and the type would be equals to this time the graphql string so we have the graphql string so you can see every property so you can see each property is available inside the graphql you have the object type the id you have the string so everything is available inside the graphql so you just need to know syntax and you need to know how things work so here we have the id name we can have the email as well so here we have the email we can give the type that should be again the graphql string so here we have three properties the name the email and the type inside the user's type so you can have more types as well you can have relations as well but as of now we'll be just having a very basic type so that you can get understanding of what graphql is and how to use the graphql and after that we have defined the user type and then this is just a type so this is just a schema of that user and now we need to just define the query structure in which we need to tell the GraphQL that how can we query. So now we need to define the query structure inside that so that we can query according to the data. So that again we can use any const. We can have we can have the root query. And that should be again equals to a new GraphQL object type. So it is also a new GraphQL object type. So this is how we need to define the query. And now for querying it again we need to define the name property as the unique name that should be again equals to the root query and after that inside the second parameter again we have the fields but inside this fields it will be an object 
which contains all of the query data so now inside the fields now we need to define the query structure like how can we query the data like for that if we need to get all of the users then we can just specify the key as the users in which we can just provide here a query to the front end or a user so we have the users and after that i will now just add a comment as well like to get all users like this will be the query so we need to run the query inside the graphql as the users to get all of the users inside that and now this object now we need to have here a couple of things like here we have the type that should be equals to a list so if we are using the users then we need to just uh, send the response of the list to the user so we can have the type that should be equals to we can have a graph ql list we have the graph ql list and list inside the list parameter then you can see we need to provide the type as well so which type the list will be having so list will be having the type of the user types so the list of the user types there with the list of the user objects and then the second parameter will be the arguments so here inside the root query and here inside the users we won't be having any arguments so i will now skipping this part but now inside the next query that we make it will be having the arguments object and after that there is another thing which is a resolve so resolve is just a resolve which resolve a query so resolve is just like something it is like a function which resolves a query so whenever we make a query to the graphql like the slash users like in the users object then the resolve will send you some data so resolve is a function which is like a which is like a return promise function inside the rest api which sends you some data so resolve is something like that so resolve is a function which contains some arguments as well like the first argument it contains is the parent like the parent is like a root object of the graphql like here we have the root object so the root is just a user so sometimes we have the nested objects as well so the root defines a root parent inside that and then the second it would be the arguments so we need to define the arguments here so you can see these are the two properties that a resolve can have we have here the parent object the root object and then we have the arguments but here inside this users we won't be having any so we'll be now removing this and after that we need to just return the list of those users like this we can return a list of those users with that so we can just define the list of those users as well so what we can do either we can use the constant file or we can define it here so i'll be now defining the list of those users here with the const we can have the users list so that will be an array of the type of all of the users like we'll be having array of the id name and the email so here we have the data of the users list so here we have the users list inside that and after that what we'll be doing is we'll be now moving on and here you can see inside the result we are returning an empty array but that should not be the case so here we need to return the users list inside that so we have the type of the users list so how the graphql will work under the hood so it will just check for all of the types inside that like the user type and then it will just find all of the types inside this array and then if it finds all of the array if it finds all of the properties inside that then we can just query through the data like what data do we want inside each list so that's how the graphql works and after that what we'll be having is now now we have defined the type and now we have defined the query structure as well and now we need to just export the schema so this is the type and this is the main query structure so now we need to just create a main schema and then we need to add these types here these two fields here so for that we can have the const we can have the schema that should be equals to a schema that should be equals to a new graphql schema so here we have the graphql schema inside that we have the graphql schema and inside that again we need to define some configurations like first we need to define the query so the query would be equals to the root query that we have defined so here we have the query so it will just apply the query structure to the graphql server so that's why the graphql schema is being used so it is now the graphql schema so now the schema contains the type of the graphql it contains some of the query structure which are linked to the root query and now we have defined the schema so we can use the schema here like the schema and schema the identifiers are same then we can just remove this so it will work like the schema and the schema so if we just save if we move on again into the application refresh the application once again i think uh, we got some error so i think here we have missed the new keyword inside the graphql list class so we need to add the new keyword and if we just save if we again move on to the terminal select the node index.js the server is up and running and now we can just move on into the chrome once again we can refresh once again so now you can see now this is the initial data of that query so now we can just remove that and then that should be the graphql only and now we can just refresh and then we can just try it out here 
So to define the query here, we need to add the object first. So here we have the object. And then you can see if you press control and the space, it will just auto complete. So it will give you some suggestions of the users, like as we have defined the users here. So here we have defined the users inside the root query, like that should be the query. So this is a query that it is making like the users. And after that, you need to run here an object once again, like the users will be having some of the properties. Like we cannot just get all of the data of the users with that. So we need to specify that what data do we need. So with the users, we'll be having some object. So we only need some properties like the ID of that user and the name of that user. So if we specify like this, like the users, I'll now specify once again. So we have the users query and inside this query, we have the ID and the name. So what it will do, so it will just only give us the ID and the name if we just execute this query. So here you can see now we have the data object which contains the users array and inside each array value inside each array object you can say it is providing us the id as the one id two and the name so we can just get there only the name as well we can remove the id we can execute and then you can see this is how the graphql works so you can get all of the data that you actually want not all of the unnecessary data as well like, so if we just want to render the data tables inside the web so we do not need any email or the id field with that so you can see that's how the graphql works so the unnecessary data i mean if you want to just enter a table inside the web so you do not need the id and the email field you only need the names field then you can see that's how the graphql can benefit you because with the rest api you get all of the unnecessary data at once and then you need to just modify it on the front end side so all of the works is being done on the back end side here so there is also the less work as compared to the rest api because we need to define multiple endpoints like user get by id of the user again with the endpoint again a new request again a post request for the create again update requests for the updation and so many things are there with that and then you can see this is how we can define the root query with that and now we have defined the query of getting all of the users data and now we'll be defining another query in which we can just get only details of just single user and then we can just provide the id from the front end like from this interface so for that we can have the user that should be also an object inside that and inside that object inside this user i will add comment as well here we have the comment and then inside that what we'll be having to get all users no to get user by the id so we'll be having this object and after that inside this user what we'll be doing is again we'll be defining the type of the data so this time the data type would be the actual user type that we have defined so type would be the user type inside that and then here we'll be having the arguments object as we discussed earlier we have the arguments and inside that we'll be having the arguments field with that the argument will be equals to the id and the id will be of type of again the graphql id so we'll be having the graphql id inside the arguments like you can see like this you can see we have provided the id as the graphql id so we need to iterate through this id with that and after that again we'll be having the resolve function so we have the resolve and the first parameter again the source root we have the uh, we can have here i think the parent and then the second it would be equals to the arguments object so here we have the arguments and after that inside the arguments we'll be getting the id so either we can destructure here like the id and then what we'll be having is first we'll be getting the id from the arguments like i will now just return the users list so we have the users list and then we can just find one item from the users list we have the find and then we can iterate through all of the user like the user that should be equals to user dot we can have the id that should be equals to the arguments dot id so we'll be having the arguments dot id of the user so we can restart the server once again with the node index.js and then we can refresh this page as well like i will now remove everything from there i think we are getting a message as well like the type of root query dot user id must be the input type but got the undefined I think the error is here. So we have just use here. So I think there is the error. We have just directly used here the GraphQL ID for the ID, but it should always be an object which will contain the type property that should be equals to the GraphQL ID. So we have here the GraphQL ID with that. If we rerun the application server, if we refresh the page once again, and then you can see here we have provided the syntax like we have the user, and then we need to provide the ID field of that user that should be equals to the one. And then we only need to get the name of that user. If we just execute this query, then you can see now we got the exact data. Like we got the data, we got the user and the name. We can just provide a different ID as well, like the three. If we just 
just execute the query and then you can see now we are getting the exact data that we want so this is how the graphql works so that's how we can just get the data from the graphql and it is very easy with that so now we have defined the queries for the users to get all of the users and then for a simple user for a single user which we can get through its id and now we have just learned about the queries so now we made two queries the users and the user and now let's work on the mutations as well so the mutations are used to just make some data like creating a data updating a data deleting a data with that so we can just make some mutations as well so for creating the mutations we'll be just completing the CRUD functionality of this project so for that we can define the mutations as well like here so we can have a const we can have the mutations that will again be equals to a new graphql object type so everything is there in the graphql object type so here inside that what we'll be having so again we'll be having the fields like first we need to define the property name which will be the unique name that can be equals to the mutations and the second parameter will be equals to the fields that we need to define so the query fields would be there like the mutation fields are there so like first there can be the adding a user so for the adding a user we'll be having a new query basis like the add user will be having the name the add user and inside that again we'll be having an object so it will also be an object which will contain the type so we need to define the type of again the user type so we have the type of the user once again and after the type now we'll be having the arguments object as well so now inside this arguments object again we'll be having the id of that user like we can just auto generate the id as well so we can skip the id so in the arguments we can have the name of that user so name would again be because the type of the graphql string so we'll be having the type of the graphql string for the name we can have the email of that user as well so we have the email will again be the type of again the graphql string we have the email of the graphql string so these will be the arguments that we need to write and after that we need to add the resolvers as well so the resolve will resolve this query and after that inside the resolve again we'll be having two parameters the first will be the parent object and then the second will be the arguments object so here we have the arguments and we can just destructure the properties here as well like the id and then we don't have the id so we can have the name we can have the email inside that so we can destructure their properties and now inside that now what we'll be having is now we need to just push these elements to the array of the users list so here suppose here we have the dummy database of the users list now we need to push to the elements of the users list here so here what we'll be having so we can define the new user like the new user that should be equals to an object which will contain the properties like the name the email and then we can just auto generate the id like we can have like we can have the date dot now so date dot now will give you a unique number according to the current date and after that we can just convert this into the string so we have the two string with that so with that we'll be just defining a new user so we have defined the name that should be the name call a name name call an email and then we have the string and after that now we'll be having we'll be having the list of this users we have the users list dot we can have the push to the users list element so that should be the new user with that so that will be the new user so this is how we can just resolve a query inside that and after we have resolved the query and now to get the data and now to get the freedom of the data that you want then you can just return this data as well like the new user we have the new user inside that so that's how we can just return the data so this is how we can just create a first mutation of adding a user to the database as we have just defined the schema here like the graphql schema we have the query and after that here as well inside the second key we need to define the mutations so here we have the mutations and that should be equal to the mutation that we have so here we have the mutations with that so we have the query as the root query and we have the mutations as the mutations and after that it will automatically be linked to the schema we can restart the server once again we can run index.js we can refresh the graphql and now for running the mutation now we cannot just directly run the mutation like this for that we need to just provide the mutation here like the mutation and inside this mutations inside the mutations field now we need to just define the name of that mutation that we have defined we have defined the add user so you can see we have the auto completion of the add user and after that here you can see now we need to define these fields like the name we can define a name like we can have the james so we already have the james so we can have a smith here and then we can have the email as well of that we can have the email we can have the smith at the test.com and after that you can see after we have defined this function now we need to just add some data that we want so we need to again add some fields that we want like we need to want the name we need to want the email as well 
so i will not notify this so here we have the mutation of the <coughs> sorry so here we have the mutation of the end user we have the name we have the smith we have the email at the rate smith at the rate test.com we are requiring the name and the email from this data if we just execute this query so here you can see now inside the data we got the name of the smith we got the email as the smith at the rate test.com so this is working totally fine and now we can just create another record we can have your we can have your john as well like we can have the john and after that we can have the john at the rate test.com so if we just make a query once again so here you can see now we are getting the john at the rate test.com so everything is working perfectly fine and now if we need to just get if we need to see that if everything is being stored inside the database then we can just remove everything from there we can again run the users query to get all of the users we can get name of all of those users if we just run a query then you can see now we are getting the exact data that we are want so we have the name we have the email so we have the name of all of those users inside the users list and now let's create a field in which we can update a user so we have a update a user and inside that we'll be having an update user like we have the update user field and inside the update user again we'll be having a type the type will again be equals to we need to define the type of oh sorry the user type and after that again we need to define here the arguments so there will be all of the arguments that we require inside this so we need to define the id as well so we need to just find the user by its id so we'll be having the id here and inside this id it will also be equals to the type so that should be the graphql id that we want so we have the graphql id and then inside second parameter we'll be having the email that will be again equals to the type of the graphql string so we have the graphql string of that type and then the third parameter would always be the name because we have three parameters inside the user's type so we have the name that should be the type of the graphql string once again so here we'll be having three type according to that and after that we can just provide you the resolvers as well so we can have the resolve again we can have the parent inside the resolve as we did inside others so we can have the parents and we can have <coughs> we can have the arguments so we can just destructor the properties of the argument once again like the id we can have here the name and then we can have the email as well and now inside that now we can just update the user so what we'll be having so we'll be having the const we can have the user that should be equals to we have the users list we'll be finding the user by its id so here we have the find of that user so we'll be defining a u with that so that should be equals to we can have the u dot id that should be equals to the id that we are getting from the arguments so that will be the user so with this it will find that user according to that and after that we can just update the fields of that user as well so we can have the user we can have user dot email that should be the email that we are getting and then we can have the user dot name that should be the name that we are getting so that will be as simple as it is i think something is wrong here so we'll be having like this we have the user dot email equals to the email user dot name equals to the name so after this now the user field will be updated and then what we'll be doing is now we'll be just returning the user that we have so we'll be just return the user that we have so with that the user object will be updated so if we just restart the application server once again with the node index.js if we refresh it once again so then you can say if we want to make a mutation once again like the mutation sorry that should be the top mutation and then update a user and then so we can just provide the update user field here and then we can just provide the unique id so we have the id we have the id of the one as the nickel i think so we have the id one nickel right and then we need to define the name to update we can have the name we can have the james we have the james at the second so we can just provide the john once again like the john and we can provide the email that should be the john at the test.com so we'll be having these fields inside the first id so we have the id one we have the name john we have the email at the rate john at the test.com and after that we need our data that we require so we can just get the updated name according to that if we just save if we just make a query then you can see now we are running the update user it is running successfully fine and then you can see now we are getting the updated name of that user as well we have the john if we just make a query once again to all of those records like the users and then you can see if we just get the name of all of those users we will be getting the updated names here we got the name of the john we got the name of the james we got the michael and now let's make a last request so that should be the delete so with that we'll be just completing the crud operations so we'll be having the delete so in the delete we only been requiring the id so i'll be now copy pasting this so 
so now for the delete now i'll be just removing this update user that should be the delete user we have the delete user and now we have the type of the user type once again so i will now adding the comment of the delete a user and then you can see here we have the field of the id email and the name so we do not need the email and the name here so we only need the id and after that you can see we have the resolve function so we can just modify the resolve function here i will now write it from the scratch so we only have the id field inside the arguments here so here you can see now we have the delete user we have the type of the user type we have the arguments we have the resolve function and now in the resolve what we'll be doing is now we'll be just finding the user with that like we have the user that should be equals to we have the users list dot find the user we can have the u that should be the user dot id like we have the u dot id that should be equals to the id that we are getting from the arguments and now what we'll be doing is now we'll be filtering out the users list so we have the users list dot filter so we can have filter and then we can have the users list once again we can define the u once again and then we can have the u dot we can have the id we can have the not equals to this id because if the because if we write the equal equals to then it will only get the data of this id inside the array so now we need to filter the array in which this id is not equals to this id that we are getting and after that what we'll be having is now we'll be just returning user here that is just deleted from the database so that will be the functionality so we have the user user dot find u u dot id equals to the id so if we find this id inside that then we need to delete that user so that should be triple equals to and then we are filtering out all of the users which have this id so we do not have any user with this id now inside inside the database and then now we are returning the exact user that we have if we just save again restart the application server again move on into the graphql we can refresh and then you can see if we make a mutation once again like we can have the mutation that should be uh, of, we can have the mutation of delete a user we can define the id here inside the field like if you want to delete the user of the id of the one then you can see after that we need to just specify the data that we want so we get the name of that user if we just make a request again so then you can see now the delete user is working perfectly fine so we are getting the delete user and then you can see if we just make a query to the database once again we have the users and then you can see if we are getting the name of that users then you can see now i think we still have the data so this is giving us all of these results because the filter returns a new copy of that array so what we need to do so we can have the users list so the users list will be having will be equals to the updated user list here i think we can just use uh, the let instead of the users list so we have the let users list and after that we can just restart this application server once again and then if we again need to refresh this and then you can see again we are running the delete query we have the delete user id has the one we have the name here if we just execute this query then you can see now the delete user works fine if we again run the query of getting all of the users and their names if we just provide a if we just execute the query then you can see now everything seems to be working perfectly fine so you can see now we don't have the user that we have just deleted so now the crud operation of the users are completed so we have created the user we have deleted the user we got the user by its id we are getting all of the users so everything inside the crud functionality is working perfectly fine so that's how we can make the graphql applications and later on now we'll be just linking the graphql application to the database as well inside the main block project so that's it for this now because now we have just completed the crud operation and the basic application with the graphql so now i hope that you got some understanding of how the graphql works how we get the freedom of the data that we want so here we only had here three fields like the id name and the email but inside the real world inside the production levels applications there are multiples of fields so you can have hundreds of fields inside that if you are building an application like amazon or any uh, google cloud application so there are so many fields related to that so that's why we need the graphql in which we can get the freedom of the data that we want and we cannot overload the data on the front end so that's the perfect use case for the graphql so let's now move on into the main block project let's have a look at the application workflow of this backend and then we'll be having a look at the database models and collections inside that so the models are just the models which contains the schema of the database and for the database we'll be using the mongodb nosql database which is the mongodb cloud with that so now let's have a look at all of the database models so first model will be of the user 
So the user model will contain some fields like the ID, the name of that user, the email of that user, the password and the blocks. So all of the blocks the user can have and all of the comments the user has made. So these will be the fields of that user. So they will be the ID, name, email, password, the blocks and the comments and the blocks and the comments will be a reference. So we'll have a look at the reference after, after this lecture. And the second model will be of the block. So we'll be having the block model as well. So for each block type, so we'll be having the couple of fields like the title of that block, the content of that block. So the content will contain everything about that block. And then we'll be having the date of the block. The block has been published, published date. And then we'll be having the user connected to that block, like which user has posted this block. And then we'll be having the comments as well for all of the comments of that block. So these will be the fields of the block model. And now let's have a look at the comments model as well. So there will be the comment model in which each comment will be having a text, the date of the comment, the user related to that comment, the user that has made that comment, and then we'll be having the block reference of that comment. So these will be the three collections of the user, the block and the comments. So now as we have discussed about the reference here inside every collection. So now let's have a look between the references between them. So the first reference will be made between the user and the block. So the user and the block will be connected. So the connected fields would be the user. Like inside the user will be having the blocks array, which is the reference of that block. So here we have the relations of that block between the user. So the user will be having the blocks field, which will be an array of the block type. So that will be the fields of that user, which is the blocks. And then each block can have one single user reference. So because each block can contain only single user and the user can post multiple blocks inside that. So that's why we are storing the array of the blocks. And for the block, we are storing each specific user that has made this block. So that will be the first relation between them. And now let's have a look at the second relation between the block and the comment. So each block can have the comments. So comments can be again an array because the block can have multiple comments and the comments will be of the type of this comments model. So with the comments model, so these are the fields of the comment. So each block can have the comments array, but one comment can only, but one comment can only relate to one single block. So that will be the workflow because one comment can only have one single parent of the block and, and a block can have multiple comments inside that. So that will be the relation. And now let's have a look with the relations between the comment and the user. So user can have multiple comments inside any of the blocks the user can make. So user can have the array again of the comment type. And then each comment type can have only single user related to that because user cannot post multiple comments like inside one another. So we will be having only single user inside each comment and single block inside the each comment. So that will be the whole relations between this application. So the user can have the user blocks, which is a type of a blog array and each block can contain only single user. So we are adding here the user field. Same for the comment, the block can have multiple comments. So we have an array of the comments and each comment can have one single block. And again for the final, each user can have multiple comments inside that. So we are storing the comments array and each comment can have only single user related to that comment. So that will be all about this workflow of this application. So here we have discussed about the mongoose schema inside that. So we have three collections inside the mongoose, the user, the block, the comment. So we have three models inside that. So now we are referencing all of the three collections with that. So that is for the mongoose and we'll be just giving the same types, the same structure for the GraphQL schemas as well. So now this is all about the workflow of this application. So now let's start building this application. So I'm very excited to join you guys. So let us start. So now we had a look at the whole workflow of this backend application. So let's move on and start building this project. So what I will do. So I have moved this basic application into the basic user crud and I will be now creating another folder, which will be a blog application. Like we can give the blog backend. And after that, we can just move on into the blog backend from here. We have the blog backend. And inside that we can again initialize a new node.js project. So we can have npm in it. We can have the dash dash by flag. So again, the package.json will be created with the by default options. So if we move on into this file, you can see here we have the block backend, we have the main and we have all of the things here. But here inside the block backend, we won't be using the JavaScript directly. We'll be using the TypeScript for building this application. 
so we need the typescript here and then we'll be having a couple of more packages which will help us during in the development process so let's move on and let's install a couple of dependencies so first we need to install few development dependencies so we need to install npm install we can have dash d flag to tell the node.js that this will be a development dependency and then we need to install few dependencies like first it will be the typescript so we can add the typescript there and then second there will be a node mon so i hope you know about the node mon and if you don't know about the node mon so what it does so it will automatically restart the server whenever any file changes so it is the functionality of this node mon to automatically restart the server whenever any file changes inside the directory and then the third packet would be the concurrently so that should be the concurrently so if you do not know about the concurrently so what it will do so as we write the scripts inside that like inside the script object we write all of the scripts it helps us to run a couple of commands here inside the scripts like if we add the development scripts then the concurrently will allow us to run the couple of commands inside that so we can run two or three commands according to this so there will be three packages as of now which we required for the initial setup of this application so let's hit enter and let's just install these dependencies so here you can see these dependencies are now installed and now we have used the TypeScript. So now for the TypeScript, we need the TS configuration file as well for the TypeScript. So what I will do, so we'll move on into the block backend, which is a root directory. And here I will be just creating another file, which is TS config.json file, which has the configuration file for the TypeScript. And inside that, we need to add a couple of configurations. Like first, there will be an object which will contain the compiler options. So for the compiler options, we need to specify a couple of options like the module. So we can give the module to the ES5 as well, ES6 as well. I'll be giving the module of the node next, which is the next version of the node. And then we can again give the module resolution again. That should be equals to again, we can give the node next. Again, we have the node next with that. So that should be the node next. And after that, we'll be having the target as well. So we need to define the target. So in which target the TypeScript will be compiled to. So in which target the TypeScript will compile to. So we need to specify the target like we can give the ES2020 because the modern compilers support the ES2020 versions as well. So we can give the ES2020 version for this compilations of the target and then we need to source map as well. So we can give the source map as a true because it will help us and then we can give the out directory as well. So in which directory the TypeScript will compile to. So we need to give it the dist. So we'll create a dist folder inside that in which the TypeScript compiles to. And after the compiler options, there another option, which is the include. So there's another key for the include, which will include the TypeScript files. So we'll be storing all of the TypeScript files inside the source directory. So we'll be creating a source. And inside that source, we need to create all of the, uh, all of the files of the TypeScript. So we can have the source folder inside that. And then inside that, we can have all of the directories, which contains the TypeScript. And again, inside the nested folders as well, we can have the TypeScript inside that. So that will all be the configurations inside the TS config. So now let's move on and let's just modify the package.json as well. So here first, we need to just specify the scripts command. So first command will be of the dev. So we can specify the command for the development. And then for the development, we'll be having a command like first, we'll be having the TypeScript. So what we will do, so first we will compile the TypeScript to the JavaScript in the watch mode. And then only we will just make this application to work inside the development. So for that, we need to run a couple of commands. So for that, we'll be using the concurrently here. So we'll be adding the concurrently here. So we can have the concurrently. And after that, we need to specify the commands. Like we can have the backslash between the inverted commas once again. And inside that, we need to run this command. We can have the NTX. We have the TSC. But inside the watch mode. So we need to add the flag for the watch. So that will be the first command. And after that, there will be another command for that. So again, the backslash again, inverted commas, and inside that again, backslash. And here we need to just specify the command over here. So we'll be having the node mon. So we have here the node mon inside that, and the node mon will be also running inside the dash q flag. And after that, we'll be running the dist. So inside the dist, we'll be having the main file, which can be index.js or the app.js. So we can have the dist slash, we can have the app.js as the main file as of now. So we'll be having this command for the dev. We have the concurrently. First, we will run the TSC watch for compiling the watch mode. And then we'll be having the node mon queue inside the dist slash app.js. So for that, we need to change the main as well. That should be the app.js for that. So that will be the command for the development. And now let's have a command for building this application as well. So we can have the build. 
So for building this application, we just need only the TSC. So it will automatically build this application with the TSC. So it will just compile the TypeScript into the JavaScript with the TSC. And after that, the last command will do of the start command. So we need to add the start command and the start would also be very easy. So here we won't be using any concurrently. So for the start, we just need directly to run the node app.js. So we have the node, we can have the dist slash app.js. And here we won't be using any concurrently or the node mode because the start command will always run for the production versions and it will run inside the deployment servers like the Heroku or like the railway. So start command will run inside that. So we have the node directly dist slash app.js. So that will be all of the script inside that. So that will all be the configurations as of now. And now let's move on and create the source directory here. So we can have a directory of the source and inside that source, we can create a new file that can be the app.ts. And inside that, if we run the console.log to check if everything works fine. So we can have the hello over there. If we just save, if we just move on into the terminal and we can run the dev command like the npm run dev. So here you can see now you have the hello inside that and what NodeMon is doing. If we just move on into the app.ts, if we just change the hello to the hello world, then you can see once we will save this file. So it will automatically rerun the whole server of this application, the whole development server. And then you will see there will be the new file changes which will be available inside the terminal. So that's how the NodeMon works. So now we have just completed the initial setup for the block application. So let's move on into the development. So now we only have the hello inside this application and now let's remove this hello as of now and then we can just move on and we can just start the express.js server once again. So for that we need to install a couple of dependencies like first we need to install the express.js and we are using the TypeScript. So for that we need to use their declaration files as well for accessing their types. So now let's move on and with the express we'll be using the GraphQL as well once again. So for that we need to install the GraphQL packages like the GraphQL itself and the express GraphQL. And after that, what we'll be having, so we need the mongoose as well, which is a type of package which works with the MongoDB, which enables us to use the MongoDB object data modeling. So which is a type of data modeling with the MongoDB. So we can use the MongoDB package as well with that. And after that, we'll be having some environment variables as well inside this directory. So we need to store some credentials like the password of the MongoDB. We can store some API keys, some passwords. So we can use the env files as well. So now let's move on and let's install a couple of dependencies. Like first, we need to install the express and then we'll be using the express GraphQL. And then after that, we'll be using the GraphQL itself. So we have the GraphQL and after that, we'll be just using the mongoose as well. So we have the mongoose and then we'll be having the dot env as well. So we have the dot env to store some environment variables. So we just need to hit enter and we need to let these install. So these packages are now installed and now we can just verify that inside the package.json as well. So here we have all of these dependencies and now let's just install the declaration files as well. So we need the declaration files for the express. We need the declaration files for the node as well. So for that we need to again use the npm install again slash d. Then we need the declaration for the node. So we can have the types slash node for the node.js types. And then again we need the slash types for the express. So let's hit enter and let these install. So here you can see now inside the development dependencies. Now we have the type of the express and then we have the types for the node. And now let's move on into the main app.ts. And here first we need to just import the express from the express. And as we have defined the compiler options here as the node next. So we can just use the ES6 imports as well. So we can use the import. We can have the express from the express itself. So we can have the from the express. And after that, what we'll be having. So we can just again define the app variable, which is a type of express.js application. So we can have the const, we can have the app that should be equal to the express. Now the express will be handling the whole app functionality. And after that, what we'll be having is we'll be just listening to the server. So we can have the app dot listen once again on the port of the 5000. So as we have defined the dot env inside the packages, so we can use the dot env. So here we can just create a new file of the dot env. And after that, we can just store the port here. So we can have a port that can be equal to the 5000. So we have the port of the 5000. So now to access this .env, first we need to just run the configuration file for the .env. So for that, we need to import something from the .env, from .env. So that should be the .env. And here, so something would be equal to the config. So we need to run the config of the .env inside that. So on the top of this application, even before declaring that, then we can run the config here. 
then we have the config here with that so now we have this config for the dot env and then we can just provide the comment as well like the dot env config and then what do we need to do so here we do not need to hard code the port here so we can use the process dot env dot port as we have defined the port here then we can just use the port here like this and now let's move on and let's again open the callback function as well like we can have the console.log and in the console.log again we can run the application or we can have the server open on port and we can define the port here like that should be equals to the process dot env dot port once again so we have the port so if we save if we just start this application so again we can move on into the terminal we can just run the development so we can have the npm run we can have the dev and then you will see once in a moment you can see now the concordant will run and then you can see now the server will be open on the port of the 5000 so here you can see now the server is open so now you can see this is the empty server and now before moving ahead now we can just connect to the database as well before working with the graphql schemas and all other things like the data so now let's move on into the mongodb to access some database configuration files and to connect this application to the mongodb cloud so let's move on into the chrome inside any of your window then you can just select any of the terminal here and then you can just select any of your profile then we can just move on into the mongodb so we have the mongodb here so you can just search for the mongodb and then you will see there will be the very first link of the mongodb the developer data platform you can open this and now let's move on and here you can see here we have the option of the sign in so you need to click on the sign in here and after that you will see there will be two options for the signing in the first will be the google option second will be the github so you can use any one option from this like the google or the github so i'll be using the google with that and once you are done with the sign in then you will see this opening screen of the mongodb so here you can see you can just move on into the project terminal and then you can just click on the new project from there and what it will do so it will redirect you to the new screen where you need to name your project so you can give the name like you can have the mon block so you can have a mon block you can have a dash graphql after that you can just click on the next and then you will see you need to add members and set permissions so we do not need to add the members or the permissions or you can do that later as well so now let's move on and click on this create project button so here you can see now we have the screen of the creator database so we need to click on the builder database button so what it will do so it will just build a database cluster for us so so here we need to deploy a database on the mongodb cloud so here what do we need to do so here are three options for using the m10 so you need to pay and this is a paid version so it is something around 0.08 dollar per hour and then you can also use this server less as well like you can have the 0.10 only for the 1 million reads of the database and after that the last version is the m0 which is a free version for learning and exploring the mongodb in a cloud environment and here you do not have enough storage like here you can see you have the storage of 10 gb here you have the storage of up to 1 tb and we have the ram options of the auto scale so, so here we have the ram of the 2 gb and here you can see here we have the storage of only 512 mb and we have the ram of the shared we have the cpu as well which is shared so now let's move on and select the free version and then you can see now we have these options like provider we can use any provider like the aws google cloud or the azure you can use any region that you want you can name your cluster as well but i will now keep it default and we can just click on the create so what it will do so it will create the cluster for us you can see the m0 cluster provisioning and then you need to provide the database user as well so whom will be using this database so we'll be using so we so we are the admins and we can provide the admin and then for the password we can generate the auto generate secure password with that so it will auto generate the secure password accordingly we can just click on the show password or we can just copy that as well and then we can just store that password inside the environment we can have the mongodb dash password and that will be equals to this password here we have this password here and do not try my password because i'll be changing the password after this video has been published so we can click on the create user and after that you can see now the new user is there and here you can see now we need to provide any ip address as well like this we can use the cloud environment we can use my local environment but i'll be now skipping this because we can just move on directly into the network access and here i need this application 
big and i need this cloud database to work with any ip so i can use it on any browser on any api on any internet so we can use the allow access from anywhere and if you need only your current ip address then you can just add your current ip address with that so we can have allow access from anywhere and then we can just click on the confirm and then all changes will be then confirmed within very few moments so you can see the status will be okay after a few minutes and then you can see they are deploying the changes to the mongodb as well so at last you can move on into the database and then you can just see if everything is there working fine or not so here you can see now the new cluster is being deployed so now it is deployed and then you can see here we have couple of options we have the connect in which we can just connect our application so here you can see we have connect our application button so we can just move on with these options like if you are using the mongodb shell so you can use the mongodb shell if you are using the compass if you are downloaded the mongodb so you can use the compass as well and you can also use the connect directly to the vs code as well but for that you again need the compass again so for now we'll be just moving on into the go back and here we have the option of connect your application through the mongodb's native drivers so we can just click this option so here as well you can see you have this option of the copy so you can just copy that and then you can see here is a note like we need to replace the password with the password for the admin user so we can just copy this url we can just move on into our application and here to connect this application to the mongodb again we can move on into the source and inside that we can just declare another file that can be the utils and inside the utils we can have here a new file we can have the connection.js so we have the connection dot ts file here and inside this file now we'll be using the mongodb connection code so first we need to import something from the mongoose to so import something from the mongoose so that should be equals to the connect so we need to import the connect from the mongoose because it helps us to use the connect it helps us to connect with the database and here inside that what we'll be having is we need to connect to the database so first we'll be defining the function here which can be used inside the app.ts so we can have the export Cons we can have a connect to database like connect to database and this will be an asynchronous function as well so that should be the async function and after that it is a async and we can use the try catch block to connect to the database so we can use the try and then inside the try then we can use the await and await would be equals to we can have the connect function so here we have the connect and inside that connect we need to specify the url here so we can use the backticks from the strings and then we can just pass the whole url here so here you can see now we have the whole url we have the await we have the connect we have the mongodb so as we have the note here like replace the password with the actual password we can move on into the environment we can just get the mongodb password key from here and then you can see here we have the password like this so we can remove this whole password thing and instead we can use here the expressions with that and now inside these expressions we can again use the process dot env dot this key the mongodb password so now this is all about the try and now we can use the catch as well like here we have the catch and if we get an error we will just return the error like the new error with the error inside that or we can just log that error first like we can just have a log of that error as of now and now we can just move on and we can just return the error and now let's move on into the app.ts so here we have the app.ts and here what we'll be having so we can just move on and here you can see we have the app.listen but we cannot directly open the application server even if the mongodb is not connected so first we need to just import the function of the connect to database so here we can have the connect to database so here we have this function and after that this is a promise so we can just wait for this as well like we can do the then block and after the then what we will do so we'll just open the application server so after the then then we can use this whole code there like the app.listen to this we have the then code so i think we have missed the arrow here so here we have the then and after we are getting some error so we can use the catch as well if we get an error then we can just log that error as of now so we can have the log of that error so if we just save if we just move on into the application so here you can see we have the server open on the port 5000 and then you can see now the connection has been successful so we are getting this message that the server is open on the port of the 5000 because now we have connected to the mongodb database but here you can see here we have the application warning like the strict query option will be switched but we are not using the switch but we are not using the strict query as of now so we can just skip that warning as of now so the connection to the mongodb database is also successful we are seeing this message that the server is open on the port of the 5000 so everything is successful there.
and there as well you will see here we have the connections like we have the connections of the one inside that you can see by now into this timestamp we have the connections of the one inside that so now this is also telling that one application has been connected to the mongodb cloud so that's all for the connection so now the application server is working totally fine so now the next step that we want to achieve is we want to just define the api for the block so for that here we have the express js application and after that we can just define the api middleware so like there will be only one middleware inside that where we need to handle all of the things there would be only single endpoint and we need to make a post request to that endpoint every time so now let's move on and let's define that structure so again we can use the app.use to define a new middleware and inside that we can just define the path as well so we can have a slash we can have the graphql here so we can have a slash graphql and after that again we can just use the graphql http as we did inside the demo application so we can use the graphql http and here we need to provide some configuration options like here we need to define the schema so here again we need to provide the schema so again we need to provide the schema here and after that there will be another key which is the graphql again we need to define it to the true so that will be the thing so here we are using the blank schema but it is not the approach so we need to use the null as of now until that now we need to move on and we need to define the schemas of all our models so we have the so we have so we'll be having multiple models so we'll be having the model of the user we'll be having the models of the blog we'll be having the model of the comments so we need to define the respective schemas for the graphql as well so the models are different so you need to know that the models are different and the schemas are different the schemas are valid for the api request like for the api request how much data that we want so we need to define all of the fields inside the schema as well so for that we can move on into the source we can just create a new folder that can be equals to the schema and inside that we can just declare a new file that can be equals to the schema.ts and inside that we can just define the schemas like there will be so many fields like there will be the user there will be the blog there will be the comments now we need to define all of those schemas there so first we can just define the type of the user type so we'll be having the user type here so that should be equals to a new graphql object type once again so we have the new graphql object type and we need to import that as well so we can move on into the top and then we need to just import something from the graphql so that should be from the graphql so we need to import that so that should be again equal to the graphql object type and here inside that now we need to define this structure of the type of the user so here we'll be having the unique name that should be equal to the user type so this should be the user type and after that we need to define some fields like now the fields will be our callback function so we need to define the callback function of the fields so we can use the es6 structure once again so there will be the fields and after that we can just return all of the fields in an object so inside that we need to define the fields like the first field will be the id of that user again it would be equals to an object of type and the object of type the graphql id so we have the graphql id with that so now we need to import some of the things like the graphql id and then we'll be importing the string as well so here will be the string of the graphql so we have the graphql string so here the id will be of the type of the graphql id and after that the second field would be the name so we can define the name so name would be equals to we can give the type of the graphql string so we have the name of the type of the graphql string and then we need to define the email as well so we can use the email of that user again we have email and email will again be of the type and we need to define the type should be equals to we can have here the graphql string once again so the email will also be a string the password will also be a string so again we can define the type that should be the graphql string once again so we have the graphql string so these are the types as of now so now we have a couple of fields here we have the id the name the email and the password so now we are remaining the two fields we have the blocks and the comments but we'll do that later after defining all of their types so now let's move on and define their types as well so now we need to define the block type so that should be equals to again a new graphql object type so the graphql object type will be there and after that again we need to define the unique name that should be equals to we can give the block type and after that second again we need to define all of the fields here so again that should be the callback function we will be returning the objects of the fields like inside the blocks as well now we need to define here the id so each block will be having the id as well while getting the data so we need to define here the type that should be equals to a graphql id so the id would always be a graphql id and then we need to define the title as well of the block so we have the title 
we can give again the type of the graphql string and after that we need to provide the content as well like that should be the content and it will always again be the type of the graphql string so with the type of the graphql string so i hope you know all of these types here so like we did inside the demo video like we did inside the crud application as well so now we need to just move on and here we need to define the date as well so again we can use the date and date would also be again the type of the graphql string so we need this string here again for the date so here you can see now we have these couple of fields here we have the user type we have the id we have the name email and the password we again have the id the title the content and the date so sometimes we need to tell the graphql that this is of the not null type it means that this cannot be an empty field so we need to tell the graphql that this is a required field inside every object of the graphql so for that again we have something inside the graphql that is a graphql non null so we have the non null inside that so what it will do so it will just check if the value is empty or if the value is undefined or if it's null then it will give you an error so we need to just make sure that every data is correct inside of fields so for that we can again wrap everything with the graphql null so we have the graphql we have the non null so we can just provide the non null value of the id so that's how we can do to all of the fields as well so now let's do it so now we have defined both of the types we have the user we have the non null properties for all of these types and same for the block type as well we have all of the fields of the non null types and then the final and then the final type would be of the comments type so that should be again equals to a new graphql object type so we need the new graphql object type here as well and here as well we need to provide the name property for the name we can again give you the comment types and after that we need to just provide you the fields as well once again so we can give again the fields and it would again be a callback function which will be returning all of the fields inside that so now inside the fields again inside the comments so inside the comments now again we need some types like the id would also be there so that should be equals to of the type of again the graphql non null so that should be equals to the graphql id so that will be the part of the id and after that we need to define the text of that comment as well so again the text would be equals to we can give the type of the graphql non null property which is a string so we have a graphql string with that and after the text now we need to define here the user as well and then we need to define here the block as well so now we didn't add any relations as of now because now we need to work with very simple api and after we verify that everything is working fine then we can add the relations so now we have defined all of the types inside that so now we have defined all of the types inside that you can see we have the user type we have the block type and then we have the comment type and now we have the types here but we haven't added the relations as of now so you can see we do not have any relations as of now inside each of the type we have the user we haven't added the blocks or the comments inside the user and same for the block we haven't added any user or like comments for each block and the comment as well we haven't added the block or the user so we'll do that later first we will define everything related to that so first we have defined the schema for the graphql and now we need to define the model for the mongoose as well to store the data directly inside the database so for that we need to define the schemas for all of types here for all of the collections like the users the blocks and the comments so let's move on and here you can see i've created a new folder as the models inside the source so you can also create the new folder and inside that we can define the respective models like first we can define the model for the user so we can have the user dot ts and inside that what we'll be doing and here we need to define the schema for the mongodb model so for that first we need to import something from the mongoose so we need to import something that should be equal to the schema from the mongoose so here we have imported the schema and after that we'll be creating a new instance of the schema class that will define the schema so we can have a const we can have the user schema so that should be equals to a new schema so here in the typescript we need to define the types as well so for that we can just use the type of the schema like this and after that let's move on and we can define all of the fields the user will contain like the user will contain the name each user will be having their name then it will contain the type of the string so the name will be of the type of the string and after that the name will be a required field for every user to sign up so that should be the required and that will be equals to the true so the name will be of the type of the string so the required is equals to the true and after that each user will be having the email as well so we can define the email so the email will be again of the type that should be equals to a string so that should be of the type of the string and then again the email will also be the required field that should again be equals to the true and after that after the email so every user will be having a unique email 
So we need to add another type inside the MongoDB database that each user will be having the unique email. So for that, we need to add here another thing, which is a unique property. So the Mongoose provides a unique property that we can define for each schema field. Like we can have the unique that should be equals to the true. Like if we now add a duplicate email for any other user, then it would give us an error that the unique property is set to true and you cannot add a duplicate field. So here we have the email and after that we can have the password as well because each user will be having their password as well to access their profile. So for the password again, the type would again be equals to again, we need to define the type of the string. After that, the password would also be a required field. So required would also be again equals to the true. And inside the password, we can have the minimum length as well. So inside the mongoose, it provides us a new way that we can define the minimum length for any field. Like here, we can define the min length. So here we can have the min length and that should be equals to, we can define the min length of the six. Like password should contain six characters minimum. So now we have defined all of the fields here, but here we haven't added the blocks or the comments here, but we'll do that later. And once we connect everything with the MongoDB and the GraphQL. So for that, let's move on and let's export this schema as well. And now for exporting the schema model, now we need to just import another thing from the Mongoose, which is the model. So here we have the model. So the model allows us to export a schema for the MongoDB database and the model, if we just export the schema, so the model will create the schema as a new collection. So for that, we can have the export. We can have the default as the model. So we can have the model with that. And inside the model, you can see the first parameter is the name of the collection. Like if we define the name of the model as the user, as we have defined, so what it will do, so it will just create the new model inside the MongoDB database. So here we'll be having the export default model and the model name will be equals to the user. And in the MongoDB database, so the collection will be stored as the users because it contains the plural names. Like if we define the user like this, and this is a singular, but then in the MongoDB database, it will be stored as the users. And after that, the second parameter inside the second parameter, we need to define the schema for that as well. Like as we have defined the schema for the user just now, so we can give export default model. The first will be the name. Then the second parameter will be the schema for that user. So this will create a new collection inside the MongoDB database. And after that, we have defined the collection and the model for the user. And let's define the model for the block as well. So we can have the block.ts. And here again, the syntax would be the same, but the fields would be different. So again, we can import the schema from the mongoose. So we have the schema from the mongoose. And after that, again, we can define new instance for the schema. So we can have the block schema here. So that should be again equals to a new schema class. So it will be a new instance once again. And then in the TypeScript, again, we can define the type as the schema object. And let's define all of the fields the block will contain. So the blocks will contain the first field that should be equals to the title. So the title will also contain the type that should be equals to the string. So the type would be the string and then we can give the required as well. So the required would also be equals to the true. So once we store the block, so the title would be a required field for any block. And after that, we can get the content as well like this. So we can have the content. It would also be equals to the type that should be again equals to the string here. And then again, it would be the required. So the required will be set to true. So once we store the block, those, so the content would be the required property to fill. So we have the required equals to the true. And then we can give the date as well, like the date of this block. So we can give the date. So that should be again, we need to define the type, but this time the type would be equals to the date. So we have the type of the date. And after that, this should also be the required while creating a new block. So the required would also be again equals to the true. So the title, the content and the date as we have defined inside the schema inside the GraphQL. So you can say we have defined the ID, title, content, date. So here you can say inside the GraphQL schemas, we have defined the IDs as well because this is something we get in return while we, while we just make a new query for the GraphQL because we need the IDs as well inside the front end. And this is something which is stored inside the MongoDB database. So the MongoDB automatically generates the ID for every collection for every object of that collection. So now we have defined the blocks as well, but we'll do that relations once again later. And after that, let's move on and export this schema as well. So we can again have the export default as the model. So model would be imported and then we can define the model name as the block because this will be name of the block. And after that, we need to define the schema for this. Like here we have the schema for that block. We have the block schema. So now we have defined the model of the user and the block. And let's do once again for the comments as well. So we can have the comment dot we can have the ts inside that 
and here as well we need to define the schema for the comment as we did inside the blog and the user so again we can have the const we can have the comment schema so that would be again equals to the new schema from the mongoose so the schema would be imported and after this now we can just generate here all of the fields that the schema will contain like it will contain the text so the text would be equals to again we can give the type so that should be equals to we can give the string for the text and it should also be the required property that should be the true so the required would be true and after the text then it will contain the date of that comment as well so the date would again be equals to the type of the date as we defined inside the blog as well so the date will contain the type of the date and then it should also be the required once again so we have the required that should be equals to the true now these will be the fields as of now inside the comment and now let's move on and export this schema as well so again we can use the export we can have the default so that should be equals to a model once again from the mongoose and again we can define the name of this model so we can have the comment and after that inside the second parameter then we need to define the schema of this comment so here we have the comment schema so now you can see now we have defined all of the schemas here so we have the block schema we have the comments we have the users and now let's move on into the main api request so here you can see now this is the main types inside every api request and from this schema classes now we'll be defining everything with the mongoose so here you can see now we have defined the types we have the types for the user we have the types for the blog we have the types for the comment and now let's move on and as we have the types and as we have the schemas for the databases as well so now let's move on and let's define the handler functions as well for the api so for that what we need to do so we need to move on into the source and there we can define a new folder that can be the handlers so here we have the handlers and inside this directory we'll be just defining a new file that can be the handlers.ts file and inside that now we'll be defining the queries and the mutations for the graphql for handling all of the api operations so for that what do we need to do so first we again need to move on into the schema and here we have all of the types so what we can do so we can just export each type that we have defined here so we can have export the user type export the block type and export the comment type as well now let's move on in the handlers file and here let's define the root query so for that we can have the const we can have the root query which will handle all of the queries so that should be again equals to a new graphql object type so again we need to make an instance of the new graphql object type as we did inside the basic project as well because this handles all of these queries and all of the mutations as well so now let's move on and here we need to define the unique name once again so the name once again will equals to again the root query that we can use and after that we need to define here the fields once again so here you can see now if you will press the control and the space you get all of the properties that the graphql object type contains you have the fields we have the fields est node description so here you can see if we need to define the fields for the schema then we need to use the fields as a callback but if we need to define the fields for the query structure we need to use the fields inside these fields now we need to define all of the query handlers like first We'll be having the queries of getting all of those users and how can we do that so first we can make a comment like get all users from this fields so for that we need to define the new query so the query would be equals to the users so once we make a request for the graphql which contains the users then it means that we need to get all of the users so for that again the user will contain the type so the type of the response that we need to send so type would be equals to again we can use the graphql list because for getting all of the users we need the list as well so we have the graphql list which will contain the type so the type would be equals to the user type that we have so the graphql list contains one argument of the type and here we have already defined the type of the user type so that will be of the type and after that we can have the resolve function because now we have the type and here inside the get all users now we won't be having any of the arguments inside the function so we need to send all of the users which are there inside the database and now let's move on and here we need to define the resolver as well so here we have the resolve but this time it would not be the directly the resolve but we'll be using an async await as well we'll be using the promises because now this time we are not handling with the constant data we are just making an operations with the actual database which is available inside the mongodb cloud so the database operations can take some time so we need to wait for their task as well so for that this time the resolve that should be the async function so we have the async resolve so here we have the resolve and after that what we'll be doing inside that so we need to just resolve this query so here inside that we have here the model of the user inside that so the model contains so many functions so these functions are available inside the mongoose package so the model contains all of the functions 
So here inside the resolve, once we make a query to the users, so here we need to rerun all of the users which are available inside the database. And how can we do that? So we can use the return, we can use the await. So that should be equals to, so we can import the model of that user. So here you can see, you can find the user model there inside the model slash user. And from there, what you can do. So inside the model, we have a function, which is the find, which will find all of the records on the basis of a query. So here inside the callback, we provide a query or we can just provide the query as well. Like we have the X string Y equals to number or anything. So here with the users.find, it gets all of the records with the find according to the query. But if we do not provide any filter or any query, then it will fetch all of the records from the user's collection and then it will send that records. So here you can see inside the resolve, we are just returning the await that should be the user.find to find all of the records from this query. So that should be the only thing inside the user's field. And now let's move on. So here we have the first request of the users. And now let's move on and let's define the request for the blog as well. Like for the blog, we can have the blog, we can have the get all blocks. So for that, we can have the blocks. So we'll be sending the query of the blocks. And then again, we need to define the type. So that should be equals to, we can have the new GraphQL list once again. So we can have the GraphQL list and inside this list, once again, now we need to define the type. So the type would be equals to the block type this time. So we have the block type. And after that, again, we can have here the resolve. So we can have the resolve and inside this resolve again, we'll be using the async because we need to wait for some operations from the database. So we can again have the return that can be equals to the await and in the await we'll be having the block again we'll be importing the block model and again we'll be calling the function for the find to find all of the records from that block so that will be the thing for the blocks and now let's move on and let's define for the comments as well so we have the comments so we can have the get all comments from that and with the get all comments again we can have the comments so here we have the comments to get all of the comments and inside that, what we'll be doing is we need to define again the type that should again be equals to the GraphQL list. So the type would also be always the list if we are getting all of the records and list inside the type of that list, the type would be equals to the comment type that we have. So here we have the comment type. And after that, let's move on and let's again use here the resolve for the async resolve. So we can have the async, we can have the resolve and inside this resolve of the async. Now again, we need to use the return statement. So we can have the return and again, we need to wait for the task to return. So we can have the await, we can have here the comment model. So here we have the comment model. And after that, we can use the dot find function from the comment. So we can have the comment dot find. And now inside the find of that comment, now it will find all of the records because we haven't passed any of the filter. So that's it now for getting all of the queries from there. So now we have defined all of the queries here. We have the user's query, we have the blocks query, and then we have the comments query. And now let's move on and let's just export this query. And here you can see, we have made these queries just for getting all of the records from the database. Inside this users, we are getting all of the records from the user's collection. Same for the blocks, we are getting all of the records from the block collection and same for the comments as well. And now let's move on and let's just test this API as well. And there you will see we won't find any of the records as of now because we don't have any records inside the MongoDB database as of now. So here what we'll be doing. So first we need to just export this as well. So for exporting this, we need to export this as a new GraphQL schema because the GraphQL works with the schema and inside the schema, now we need to define the queries that we can make for the GraphQL. So for that, we can have the export. We can have a default that should be equals to a new GraphQL schema. So we have the new GraphQL schema inside that. So here that will be imported again from the GraphQL package. And with this schema, again, you can see we have the config options. So we need to define the configurations. So here we need to define a new field that is a query. So that is a root query that this GraphQL schema will contain. So the query will be equals to the root query that we have defined over here. So we have this root query and now we have just exported the schema over here. Now inside the main file in the main app.ts, you can see here we have defined this schema as the null. So now the schema should not be the null because we have defined the schemas, we have defined the handler functions. So now inside the handlers, we are just exporting the GraphQL schema, which contains the query. So now we are exporting this file as well as the export default. And now we need to move on to the app.ts. And here we need to just import the schema from this file only. We have the handlers file. So now we need to import the schema from that file. So for that, we can just import we can have the schema and now it's a default export so we can use any name while importing and that should be equals to from this should be equals to from the handlers dash handlers so we have the handlers inside that 
and now the schema would be equals to the schema that we are importing from the handlers so that is all for the graphql query as of now and now let's move on and there you can see server is open on the port of the 5000 and now let's move on and test this server so we can move on into the local host the port of the 5000 slash p of the graphql and if we just hit enter then you can see now we are getting the graphql interface as well so we are here we have the interface and now let's move on and just remove these comments from now and here we can just define the query like this so here you can see now we have the queries for the users we have the blocks we have the comments so we can use the users as well and from the users how many fields do we need so we need the id we can have the name we can have the email but there you will see we won't find any record because we do not have any record inside the mongodb database so if we run this query so you can see we have the users object as the empty array because we do not have any records as of now so now let's just move on and let's just define the mutations as well for this so let's define the mutations over here so now let's move on and let's define the mutations as well so as we just discussed inside the introduction video so what are the mutations so the mutations allows us for the mutations like mutations are the changes or the updates so we can just define a mutation for creating a new user creating a new blog creating a new comment the same would be applied for updating a user blog or the comment again would be applied for the deleting as well so for the create operations like for the read operations we have the queries for just reading some data and for creating something like for the updations mutations we use the mutations inside the graphql so for that we'll be using the mutations over here so we can have the const we can have the mutations so that would be equals to again a new graphql object type so everything is there in the new graphql object type here so we can have the object type so we have the instance of this class as of now and now let's move on and let's define the name as well so the unique name should be there again we can define the mutation as the unique name and now let's move on and let's define the fields inside that so here we have the fields and fields the first field would be creating a new user like inside this there should not be the create because now we are building the block functionality so this application is a block functionality so the creating is not a good name so the name should be equals to the sign up because the user will sign up and then the user will be having a login and after that the user will be accessing their profile like all of the blocks or the whole blocks with that so now let's move on and here let's define a new field as the user sign up so we can have the user sign up with that so we can have the user sign up inside that and the request name should be equals to we can have the sign up and after that inside that what we'll be having first we need to define the type for the sign up as well again the type would be of the user type as we have imported from the types so here we have the user type and after that for the sign up now we need some fields as well because now we need to get some data for the request now we need to attach some body data as well to get some data extracted over here and then we make a new user so for that what do we need to do so we need to define the arguments so here we'll be having some arguments so for the arguments first argument would be of the name so first field in the argument would be the name so we need to define the field and then their types and now for defining the type again we can use a, an object which contains the property of the type so now we need to define the type inside that type and this time the type should be the required field because now as we have defined the structure of the users inside the model so the name is a required so we need to add a property which is the graphql non-null property so we have the graphql non-null and this time the property would be equals to the string so we have the name type that should be the string so we are defining the name as the string as the non-null property so we have the graphql non-null and after that the second would be the email so again we can define the email that should contain the type of the non-null property like we have the non-null and that should be equals to the string property from the graphql so same would be added for the password so we can just copy and paste for the password as well like this so here we have this for the password and now you can see now we have three fields over here and now let's just move on and let's define the resolver as well so here we have the arguments object and after the arguments let's just define the async we have the resolve and that should be equals to a function in which we'll be defining all of the data which will be resolved so first for creating a new user like we have the sign up and for the sign up first we need to add some validations as well because now we are just moving on into an advanced project and there we should be having some validations like if the user is already there then we do not need to perform next steps then we need to just return this function stating the message that the user is already there so for that first we can define let we can have the existing user like we have the existing user and that should be equals to like we need to define the type as well so the type we can define the type as the document 
so we can have the document that should be of any and here as well we have the any and here as well we have the any so the document contains three fields like we have the type of the existing user as the any so here i think this document is available inside the mongoose package so i think the document should be available from the mongoose and not from there so here we can import the document from the mongoose so we can have the import we can have something from the mongoose and that should be equals to we have the document property so with the document type and after that let's just move on and here we have the existing user which is of the document and after this now first we need to check if the existing user is already there inside the database so here we can run the try catch block because it's a database operation and it can fail as well so we'll be running the try catch block over here so with the try catch and if we get an error then we'll be returning some error over there so inside the try what we'll be doing so we'll be having the existing user so we'll be assigning the property to the existing user that should be equals to we can again use the await so that should be the user model so we have the model of the user and inside that user model we have the function of the find by id which finds a record by the id but here we won't have any id so we'll be using just the find one so we have another function which is the find one but if you have the id then you can use the find by id but here you have the find one method which finds one document so as we know that the email is a is like a unique property so there should be only one email with only one record so there you can see inside that we need to provide the filter so we can provide the filter inside an object and inside that we'll be defining the email field like we have the email property inside the user which is available so now what do we need to do so here inside the resolve we'll be having some arguments object as well like we have the name email and the password so now we need to provide the email so for that first we'll be having the parent inside that and then we'll be having the arguments so here we have the arguments and for the email we can use the arguments that should be the arguments dot email field so with the email with that as we have defined the email over here so what it will do so it will find a record with this email and if it will find that record then what we can do so we can again check the validation like if we have the existing user inside the database so we can just return we can have the new error and in the error what we can do so we can have the user already exist so that would be the error and after that if we do not have any record in the existing user then we'll be moving on and after that we'll be just storing that user so we can have the const we can have the user so that should be equals to a new instance of this user model so we have the new instance of this user model that we have so we have the user and there you can see now we need to provide all of the fields like here we have the name so we can use the name as the arguments dot name like this we have the arguments or you can also destructure all of the fields inside this arguments as well like you can have here the name you can add the email you can have the password over here and there you can see we do not need to use the argument or even we do not need to use email over here then we can just use here the email as for the es6 syntax and now as well we do not need the arguments so that should only be the name and the email and the password inside this user document so that will be everything with that so here we have the new user that is just created and now what do we need to do so we just need to save the user and now we have just created the new instance of the user and now we need to save this user as well so for saving this user again we have a function inside the mongoose which is the save which is just a save so what we can do so we can have a return we can have the await that should be equals to just the user that we have just created the new instance dot save function so we have the save and here in the save as well we have some options but if we are just saving the record then we do not need to provide any options so the save returns a promise and that's why we have used here the await as well so that's it for this request and there you can see if we find an error inside the catch then what we can do so we can return a new error that should contain we can have the user sign up or fail and we can have the fail and then we can have the try again so that will be the thing for the user sign up and there you can see we are just storing the password directly as we are getting from the user and that is not a good case because if you are working in an organization then you have access to the database and then you can see the records of every user there so you can get their emails as well you can get their passwords and that's not secure as for the security part so it means that so you are getting their confidential information as well so we do not need to use passwords directly so for that what can we do so here inside the npm we have a package which is a bcrypt which encrypts a password into a string and it also can decrypt the password so for that what we can do so we can install that package 
So we can move on into the CD again into the block backend and we can use the bcrypt. So we can have the npm installed. We can have the bcrypt JS, which is the package name. So we can install that. And here for using the bcrypt inside the TypeScript, we need to use their types package as well. So we can again use the npm install. We can have we can have at the rate D because we need the development dependency of the types. Then it should be at the rate types dash. We can have the bcrypt JS. So we have the bcrypt JS with that. So we have the types slash bcrypt JS. And now let's move on and let's install this library as well. And now let's just move on into the main. So we can just remove this terminal as of now. Now we can just move on here. So here you can see if we have existing user, then we are returning a new user. And after that, then we are creating a new user instance. So before creating this user instance, then we can just store the encrypted password for that user. So for that, what we can do? So we can just provide the const. We can have here the encrypted password, like we can have encrypted password. So that should be equals to, again, we can use the bcrypt.js. So we can have the import. We can have something from the bcrypt.js. So we have the bcrypt.js and something would be equals to, we have the hash sync. So with the hash sync method that we can use. So here we have used the hash sync over here. And now let's just move on and let's just hash the password. So we can have, so here we have the encrypted password. So that should be equals to the hash sync. So we can use the hash sync over here. And inside that we can just provide the string that we have. So we have the string for the password. So we can just provide the password like this, like we have the hash sync method. So what it will do, so it will synchronously generate a hash string for the given string. Like if you have the password, then it will auto generate a hashed password with that. So you cannot just identify the password from the hash string. So now what do we need to do? So here we have the password. So now the password would be equals to the encrypted password that we have defined. So that will be all for signing up the user. And as we have defined our first mutation over here, and now just export this mutation as of now to test this sign up field for the user. So for that, we have the new GraphQL schema. We are already exporting the query. So here we can also import the mutations as well. Like here we have the mutation. So that would be equal to the mutations object that we have created, a GraphQL object type. So now let's just move on and move on into this GraphQL API. And there you can see now if you want to just create a new field, like if you want to create a mutation, then we'll be using the mutation object over here. And inside that, now we'll be just defining an object over here, like we have the mutation. And after that, inside this, now we'll be having a new mutation of the user sign up. So we can also refresh this if you want to see all of the things here, like you can have the sign up over here. Like you can see the first property is the sign up. So you can have a sign up over here. And after that, inside this, you can provide the name. Like we can provide the name as the James. We can provide the email. So here we have the email. So the email would contain the type that should be equals to, we can have the James at the test.com. And after that, let's just move on. And here we define the password. So the password, we can define any password like James one, two, three, four. If we just save and here you can see we have defined the sign up, but here we need to add the return types as well. Like, like in return, what data do we want? So we can add the object over here. We can add the return, like we can add the name. We can have the email as well. We can have the ID as well. And then we can add the password as well for the new user. Now let's just specify that and let's just make a new query. So here you can see now we should be getting all of the data. So here you can see now we got our first mutation data. We have the name, which is the James. We have the email, which is the James at the rate test.com. We have the ID and you can see this ID is being generated by the MongoDB. So you can see this ID is there from the MongoDB. So it means that our record is being saved to the MongoDB database as well. So here you can see again, we have the password and there you can see we have defined the password as the James one, two, three, four, but inside the database, it is being stored as this hash string. So you cannot just directly identify this password. So that is the power of the bcrypt JS that you can use. And that is also a secure way of storing the password of the users inside any of the organization. So that's it for the user sign up. And now let's just move on. And here we have the user sign up and now we can create another user over here. So we can have the James, we can have the Smith at the rate test.com and here we can have the smith1234 once again and after that let's just move on and let's just execute this query as well so here you can see now we have the loader and then we have this data because we have used the async over here and now we have the sign up we have the name as the smith we have the smith at the rate test.com we have the password and then you can see these two users are being created inside the database and if you want to verify that all of the records are being saved so you can just remove this mutation over here or you can just comment that and now let's just move on and define your query, like for getting all of the users from there. And from the users, you can extract the property of the name. You can extract the property of the email. 
if you will execute this query so you can get now inside the data you have two fields you have the name you have the email and there as well we have the name and the email so now you can see everything is working totally fine so now we are able to sign up for the user and then you can see we are just getting all of the records from the users as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine now we have defined the functionality for the sign up and now let's just move on and define the functionality for the login for the user as well so here what we can do so we can have a new comment we can have the user login and after that we can have the login inside that inside this and here what else do we need here we need here again the type so the type would again be equals to the user type that we have and after that after the type then for the login we need the email and the password of the user and not the name so for that we can define the arguments over here so for the arguments again that would be our type we can define the email of that user so with the email what we can do again we can again give the type of the graphql non-null property which will be the graphql string which is the graphql string over here and after the email then we need the password as well so we can copy and paste for the password so here we have the password over here and what do we need after this so here we have the password inside that so here as well the result will be an asynchronous function and here what we'll be doing so we'll be just first fetching the details of that user and we will check if the user is already available or not so here as well we'll be using the let we can have the existing user that should be equals to we can again give the type like that should be of the type of the document we can give the any type of the document and after that what we'll be doing is again we'll be using the try catch block because everything should be there inside the try catch because that's a database operation so here we can have here the catch block and if we get an error then we'll return that error and after that what we'll be doing is inside this try we'll be having the existing user that should be equals to the await and it should be equals to again we can have the user dot find one method in which we can just find one record from the given filters and here inside the find one what we'll be doing is we'll be providing the query here so here we can just provide the query and for the query again as we are defining the arguments inside that so we need to accept these arguments so again we can have the parent and then we can have here the arguments over here so we have the arguments object and again we can destructure the fields here only like the email and the password field here so we have the email and the password and what we'll be doing is we'll be just finding one record by the email so we have the email that should be that email here so we can have the email over there so after that if we will find the existing user then we need to perform below steps so like here we can add the validation like if we do not have the existing user then what we'll be doing then we'll be just returning a new error once again the new error will be there like the no user registered with this email so that will be the error message if we do not have the existing user and then after that what we'll be doing is you know that as we are storing the password as the hashed password as the hash string if we just check in the sign up so here you can see we are just storing the encrypted password so first when we will get the password from the user first we need to decrypt this password so we need to decrypt that password and then only we can check if the password details are okay or not so then what can we do so first as we are just getting the password from the user so that is the actual password of that user inside the password and then we need to just decrypt the hashed password that we are hashing inside the sign up so for that what can we do so we can have the const we can have the decrypted password and that should be equals to so we have a function inside the bcrypt.js to decrypt as well so if we can hash a password then we can just decrypt that password as well so that is a compare sync method so we have the compare sync method in which what can we do so we can just compare the actual string with the hash string like we have hashed the password like if we hash the password with the one two three four then inside the compare sync then it will automatically check if the hashed password is the actual password then it will give true or it will give false as the return so what we can do so we can have the decrypted password that can be again equals to we can have the compare sync method from that so inside the first parameter we need to define the string that we are getting so the string that we are getting is the password so we can just directly give you the password and second thing that we can do is we can give you the existing user so we already have the existing user over here then we can give the existing user dot password over there so we can have the password of the existing user so that will be the thing so we'll get the password from the existing user from there and after that what we'll be doing so i am adding a question mark here to make it as an optional property and i think we will get an error like property password does not exist on document any so we can give the document type as the unknown as well if we just get this 
So we already know that the password is already available inside this user model. So what we can do, so here only we can have the TS ignore in which what we can do. So it will just ignore the type checking over here. So we can use the TS ignore. And after that, if we just have the decrypted password, so then we can just have the true or false with that. So after that, what we'll be doing here, so we'll be checking if like if we do not have the decrypted password, like if the decrypted password is false, then what we can do. So we can just return a new error. So we can just return the new error over there and the new error would be equals to we can have the incorrect password. And then if it is false, then it means that the password is incorrect. And then we are sending the exact error message to the front end. So that will be this. And after that, what we'll be doing after all of these steps, after the user is successfully logged in, then we can just directly return the existing user over there with that. So that will be the thing inside that. And if we get an error, then what we can do? So we can just return a new error. So the error will be the actual error that we have. So we have the error with that. So that will be the new error that we are getting. So here you can see now we have defined the login functionality as well inside this. So we have the login, we have defined the arguments, we have the resolve, we have the existing user, we have the proper validations according to that. So now let's test that here as well. So again, we can move on into the GraphQL and again, we can refresh this. So we do not need the comments. So here what we can do. So we can try the mutation we Can just click on the login. And then with the login, we can give the email. So we have a couple of emails that are here. Like we have here the James at the rate, we have the test.com. And after that, inside the second parameter, we need to provide the password as well. Like we stored the password like James1234, like James1234. And then what we will get in return is the actual name of that user. If we just predify, if we just save, then you can see now we are getting the exact details of the user. So you can see now we have the name inside the James and everything is working perfectly fine. But if the password is incorrect, like if I check with the incorrect password, like one, two, three, if we just check again, so you can see now we are getting the errors and then we have the message of the error that is incorrect password. So that we are sending the message over here. We have the incorrect password. So we are getting the exact error message that we want. So that is working perfectly fine. So we have the address object. So we are getting the incorrect password and everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So the validations are okay. And here we have specified the functionalities for the user like the sign up and the login. So here inside the user, we won't be having the full CRUD functionality. So here we can get all of this user from this query. We can uh, create a new user with the sign up. We can log in the user, but there should not be any functionality of updating or deleting the user as of now inside this application. So we won't be using the user functionalities here further inside this project. So what do we need to do? So now with that, the user functionalities are completed. So now let's move on into the block functionalities. So let's define a new mutation for the block. So we can have the create block. So for the create block, what we'll be doing? So we'll be having the add block inside that so that will be equals to again an object and inside that we can just provide the type that should be equals to we can have the block type so we're importing the block type so that will be the block type and after that what do we need to do so we need the arguments for the blog as well like there will be a couple of arguments like first we need the title of that block so the title should be there which will contain the type so the type would be equals to we again need to provide the graphql string inside the type and i think that should be the graphql normal property and after that, there will be a couple of fields like this, like the title, the content would be same type. So we can give the content. And after the content, we can just move on into the block. We can open it here. We can close the sidebar. So here we have the block, we have the title, we have the content, we have the date. So for the date as well, we'll be accepting the string inside that. So we can have the date. Again, we can have the string. So we can just provide like this. I think that should be the date over here. So we'll be having the date like this, like we have the type of the graphical non null and that is a graphical string. And after that, let's move on and let's close this. So here we have three fields inside the argument. And now let's just move on into the resolve. So we can have the async, we can have the resolve. So inside that, what we'll be doing. So here we need to perform some steps like here. We need to just create a new block for the database. So for that, what we can do. So inside the block, what we'll be doing. So here we need to define a new instance of the block. So what we can do, so we can have a let, we can have a let, we can have a block. And after that, it should be equals to, again, we can give the type of the document. So the document will contain the type again of the any and again of the any and again of the any because there are a couple of fields regarding the document. 
and after the block then we can again use the try catch session with that so we can have the try catch session over here and with the error if we get an error then we'll be returning that error over there and and inside the try what we'll be doing so we'll be having the block that should be equals to the new instance of this block like this new instance of this block over here so we can just import the block as well and inside the block then we can just provide a couple of fields that we have so we can extract that fields here so we can have the parent and again we can have the arguments object so inside the arguments we'll be destructuring a couple of fields like the title itself so we have the title over there and then we can destructure the content over there so here we have the content and then we can also destructure the date over there so we have the date and now let's just move on and define these t types over there so we have here the title so we can just provide here the content over there and then we can just provide here the date over there so we have the date so these three will be the fields of the new block and after we created the instance of this block then what do we need to do so we just need to save this block so we can have the await we can have this block dot save over there so we can have the block dot save after that and now you can see inside the catch block if we are getting an error then what we can do so we can just return a new error which will contain the message of the error that we are getting itself so that will be a new block so if we just save if we move on into the graphql we can again refresh so that should be now the block so you can just remove that over there so it should be the add block then once again so inside the add block now we need to define the properties like in the add block we need to define here i think the title of the block like the title would be my new block and then we can add the content as well like the content would be of the block so we have this dummy content as of now and after that we can just provide the date so we can have the date we can give the date like 2023 and then we can give 06 and then we can give word 2 so that should be the date and after that what can we do so we can just get the title the content date as well in the return so if we just specify once again if we create or execute a new query so here you can see i think we are getting the null over there like here you can see we are using the await block.save but we haven't used the return over there so we need to return for this as well so we have this return block.save over there if we just execute this query once again so then you will see now we'll be seeing the actual block as well we'll be having the title we have the content we have the date as well so now you can see now the mongodb automatically has created a new date because we have stored the type as the date inside that because now we have given the exact date with that so we have given the date like the 2023 june we have here the 12th of june 2023 and then it converted the date into a numeric format so if we just move on to the inspect if we just check the console if we just provide the date over there like the new date and if we just provide the date over there then you can see if we just have the two locale string then we will get the locale version of this date as well so like now you can see now we have the exact date that we are providing there and then it is giving us the number with that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine with that so you can see now the date is okay so now you can see now we are able to create a new blog as well and it is working totally fine so now what we can do so now we can just update a new blog as well so for that what we can do so we can define another query so with that we can have the update block in the update block and inside the update what can we do so we can do a couple of things like we can again define the update uh, block regarding that we have the update block and that should be equals to and that should be equals to an query once again we can give the type of that query the type can be equals to we can give the block type over there and after that we can give the arguments like the argument fields contain like this time the arguments will contain couple of things more like we need the id as well we need the whole things again once again so now inside the arguments now we also need the id as well because we'll be fetching the block by its id and then we'll be updating that block over there so what we can do so inside the arguments object we can give here the id of that block so we can give the id and it should contain the type so here we have the id which is of the graphql non-null with the type of the id so we can do same for the title as well so we can give the title so that should be equals to again the string we have the graph ql string over there and after that what can we do so we can do same for the content we can do same for the date as well so we have the content we have the date over there and i think what can we do so we can create a functionality that in which we cannot update the date of a block so we can remove the date from over there so now these will be the fields that we have as of now and after that what can we do so we can have a async we can have the resolve now inside this resolve again we'll be needing some arguments like first we have the parent object 
and then we'll be needing the arguments like we'll be getting the id we'll be getting the title over there we'll be getting the content over there as well like we'll be getting the content and after that what can we do inside that inside the update block so inside the update so what we can do over here so we can have here the let we can have the existing block so we can have the existing block would be again equals to the type of the document once again we can get the type of the document we can get the any or any or any or what else we can do so instead of defining the type like this over every time like we have defined inside all of the fields then we can just move on and make this type as a separate type so we can have the type over there so we can define the type so that should be equals to the document type document type so that should be equals to this type over there so here you can see with that we can just define the document type that is of the type of the document any 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 and then you can see we can just define that type here like we have the document type with that and now after that then again we can use the try catch once again if we just get an error then we will just post that error over there so we have the try then we can have here the existing block that should be equals to we can have the block dot find by id and if we get a block with that id then only we need to perform below steps and that should be the await as well because this is a promise so we need to wait for this task and after that what we'll be doing is when we do not have the existing block then again we'll be returning a new error like the new error over there like we'll be having the error like the block does not exist so that will be the error over there so we'll be sending that error message and if we have that block then what do we need to do so inside the mongoose model we have another function we have another method which is the find by id and update so we can use that function so with that what we can do so we can have here the return we can just directly return that so we can have the await we have the model of the block then we can use the find by id and update so we have this method that we can use and inside the first parameter we need to provide the id and after that inside the second parameter then we need to provide the whole data object that we need to update like here we need to update the title so we can use the title with that and here we need to update the i think the content as well so that should be the content so this will be the things that will be updating over there the title and the content and after that inside the third parameter that we need to add so we need to create the new instance of this document because once it will update that document then it will only return the previous document because it takes some time to update a document so what can we do so here we can just provide a new query which is the new that should be equals to the true so this new will just create a new instance of this document that we can just send to the graphql so with that if we just save i think we have missed the error part so if we get an error then we can just return a new error the error will contain the actual error that we have we have this error and now we can just save we can just move on into this and here what can we do so we can refresh once again we can just move on and first we can just get all of the blocks that we have so we can have the blocks with that and then we can get the id of that block we can get the title of that block as well so we can just execute the query so here you can see now we have two blocks with there we have this block we have the my new block and again we have these two blocks as well so like now we need the id of the block that we want to update so we can just copy that id from there and then we can just use the mutations once again and with the mutations we can have the update block and first parameter is the id so we can just provide the id over there like this and then the second parameter would be the title so the title would be we can have the updated block and then the third parameter would be the content once again so we can have updated content over there so we have the updated content with that and after that in return what do we need so we can just provide the title we can just get the content as well we can get the id as well so these three fields will be getting inside that so if we just make a query so then you can see now we are getting the updated title we have the updated blog we have the updated content and then you can see we have the exact id that we are providing so everything seems to be working perfectly fine here as well inside the update blog and it is working totally fine after the update then we can just move on with the delete functionality of this blog as well so we can just what we can do so we can just provide the delete block so we have the delete block mutation over there so we can have the delete block with an object so we so it will be an object and then we can give the type property so that should be equals to again we have the block type over there so we can have the block type and after that we can move on and we can define the arguments over there so here we have the arguments object and in the arguments we only need the id of that block and nothing else so we need the id so we can just provide the id as the type once again that should be a graphql non-null property that should be the graphql id with that 
so here we have the graphql id and after that we need to define the resolve as well so we can have the resolve and again this should be the async always so this should be the async and after that inside the delete what can we do here so first we can just define let we can have the existing and that should be of the type of the document type and then again we can use the try catch once again so we can have the try catch over there and if we get an error then we'll be just returning that error over there then we'll be returning a new error with the error message that we are getting and inside the try what we'll be doing is we'll be just fetching the details of that block like if we have existing block it should be equals to we can have the await that we can have the block dot find by id and with the find by id we'll be finding the block by its id so we can have the parent over there so here we have the parent and then we can destructure the id field from the arguments and here we can just provide the id over there and after that we can just move on and we can just check if we do not have the existing block like if we do not have the existing block then what can we do so we can again return a new error and after that we can just move on and we can just delete that block from the database so what can we do with that so again inside the mongoose we have the model and inside the model again we have a method which is a find by id and remove the find by id and remove that will be this function and here we only need to provide the id that we have so after that now we can just move on into the chrome and we can also refresh once again so now we can just move on and we can just fetch all of the blocks that we have so we have the blocks we can get the id and the title from that block we can just execute this query we have the new block we have the updated block and then we can just remove that updated block from the database so we can use the mutation we can copy that id and then we can have a, the delete block function in which we can just provide the id that should be this id that we have and after that we can just get the title in return so we get the title in return if we just execute this query so here you will see now we'll be seeing the title as the updated block it means everything is working totally fine so now we are getting the exact title that we have and this block is now deleted so we can verify that inside the queries as well so here suppose we have the blocks so we can just get the blocks with the title over there and if we execute this query so here you can see now we only have one single block inside the array which has the title of the my new block so everything seems to be working totally fine so now we have just completed the functionality of the blocks as well we have the add block we have the create block delete block read block so the users and block functionality has been completed so now with that our user blocks functionality has been completed and now let's just move on and define the relations so before starting on with the comments now the comments need some relations inside that so what we need to do so we need to add the relations for the user for the comment for the block and then we need to add same relations inside the schemas as well because we need some relations we need some parent child inside the schema like the blocks can contain some comments so we can get some comments names comments ids so so many things so now let's start working on the relations part of this application so now the current functionalities inside this application is working totally fine and now the next step that we want to achieve is we want to add some relations between them so you can see now we are able to create a user we are able to log in a user and for the blocks as well we are able to just create a cred operation for the block as well so now let's move on and let's define some relations between all of the collections of the mongodb so for that what we'll be doing for that we'll be just moving on into the mongoose we can have the populate inside the mongoose so you can see inside the mongoose we have the populate queries inside the mongoose we have a populate queries page so you can just access that page and then you can see the mongodb has a function called the populate so what it does so it provides you a reference to the multiple collections and then it fetches the records of the related collections over there so what i mean is you can see there is an example we have the const mongoose which is equals to require mongoose they are importing the mongoose over there they are importing the schema class of the mongoose and there you can see there they have defined some schemas like they we have the person schema we have the story schema and then you can see they are just accessing the model from that schema and the stories and the persons are the model over there so you have the mongoose.model so what we are doing to relate between the collections so you can see here they have accessed here the stories which will be an array there is an array for the stories not a single object and this time they have provided the type which is the schema dot types dot object id so this time the type would not be equals to string or number so this time the type will be the object id of a specific record and the reference is a story so that is how they have defined the relations between multiple collections so they have the person we have the story and they have just used the story scheme they have the array of the objects inside that and each object has the type of the object id of that story 
we have the object id or you can just access the whole object as well from that story which is related inside this stories array and then they have the reference for the story collection we have the story model they have the reference to the story model though over there so that's how we can just define here some reference and about the populate functions so what it does so it is used to populate the records of a different collection like here you can see we have i can show you an example of the population so here you can see we have the story dot find one so it is finding one record from that story and after that it is populating the author object from the story so you can see we have the author key and same key is being used while just adding there so you can see same key is being used while just adding inside the schema with the author which has a types dot object id so what it is doing so first it will fetch the details of this story and after that once it will find this story once it will find the relation as well for the author then it will populate the record means it will open the record of the author as well so that is how the relations work inside the mongos so let's just use this example for creating our relations as well so here we'll be having the relations between multiple collections we have the user we have the block and then we have the comments so we can have the user as well first so first we'll be having the user so for that what do we need to do so we can just define the fields like for the naming the fields you can name whatever that you want but i'll be naming the fields as the blocks for all of the blocks the user have so we can have the blocks which will be an array this time and each array will be having the type so we can define the type so that should be equals to we can have the mongoose we can have the schema dot types dot object id so as we have defined the object id so as they have defined the object id like the type so we need to define the type as the schema dot types dot object id and after that we need to provide the reference for that so we can have the reference over there so this time the reference would be the block model that we have so you can see we have the block model we have the model which has the name of the block so we need to define the reference for this block model over there so each block will be having the type dot object id so you can just access the whole document from the block as well which is connected to this user schema so that's how we have defined the relations between the block and the schema and after that we can just use same for the comments as well for the user so we can have the comments and the comments will again be equals to an array which will be having the type so the type would again be equals to via the schema dot types dot object id over there so we have the schema dot types dot object id and then we can provide the reference so the reference would be equals to now the comment over there so we have the blocks we have the array we have the comments we have the array and each array will be having the type here we'll be having the type for the block here we'll be having the type for the comment so that's how it works inside the mongoose so now we have just defined the relations between them and now let's define the relation inside the block and the comments as well so inside the blocks what fields do we have so each block will be having only one single user connected to it so for that we can just define the user field over there so the user of this block and then the user will be a single object not an array so inside this object we'll be having the type that should be equals to again we can have the schema dot types dot object id over there and then we can provide the reference collection so the reference model would be equals to the user so that's how we can just define the relations between them and let's just define the relation for the comments as well so each block can have multiple comments so we can have the comments over there so the comments will again be an array so we can define the type of the comment that should be equals to we again have the schema dot types dot object id over there and then we can provide the reference for we can define the comment over there so we have the comment model there so we can provide the reference to the comment so that will be the reference for the block scheme as well we have the user we can have the single user connected to a single block we can have multiple comments for the comments and after that let's move on and define for the comment as well so each comment will be having one block related to it and one user related to it we'll be having the block with that like we can have the blog id which is it's connected to so we can have the type that should be equals to we can have again the schema dot types dot object id so the blog id that it is connected to this comment and then we can have the reference for the block over there and same for the user as well like which user is connected to it so we can have the user object so the user again can have the type that should be because so we can have the schema dot types dot object id over there like this we have the object id and then again we can provide the reference for the user over there so that's how we can just relate the collections so now you can see the user is connected the comments are connected to the blog and the users the block is connected to the user and the comments and now let's move on and let's just define the schemas as well so here we have the graphql schemas inside that 
and let's just define the relations between the schemas to get some data inside the front end as well according to the relations inside the mongos so here you can see here we have defined the type for the user so now you can see inside the user if you open the user over there like this so user have the fields of the name email and the password we have the id name email password that's okay but the user has the fields of the blocks and the comments so let's define the fields like there would be the blocks that should be equals to again we can do the type that should be equals to we can have the graph you will list over there we can have the graph your list but here we need to provide the type of that list type of each list item so that should be equals to we have the block type over there so we have the block type but it will not be enough because now we need some connected data as well so if we need to relate to a different type inside the graphql so we need to add the resolver for that so what resolver will do so resolver will just fetch some data from the database and it will filter out the data which is connected to each single user like for each single object what data will be connected so for that we'll be using the resolve so we can have the resolve over there again we can have the async resolve but this time we need here the parent as well inside that because now we are relating to the blocks so the parent is the user the child is a block so we have the parent child relationship and after that what we'll be doing here we'll be just defining the async resolve and after that what we need to do so we need to fetch all of the blocks from the database which has the user connected to this id so that will be our functionality so for that we can just having a return we can just have Oh, sorry we can just have the return that should be the await and then we'll be having the block model so we can import the block model over there dot find because find returns a collection so here we'll be providing some filter to the find so the filter would be equals to inside the object so we have the field of the user connected to a block so block will be connected to a one single user so we can give the user field so that should be equals to the id of that user because we have just defined the id of that user here we have this type of the object id so we can give the user id so we can give the user that should be equals to we can have here the parent object dot id so here we have the parent object of the user and dot id with that so that's how we can just relate the data inside the graphql so we have the type of the return type we have here the block type we have the async resolve we have the parent object which is the user and then inside the child subject you can see we have the parent dot id over there and now let's move on and let's define the comment as well so each user will be having some comments so we can have the comments over there so the comments would be there again we can just define the type that should be a graphql list so the graphql list of type of the comment over there we have the type of the comment type and again we can use a resolver over there so we can have the resolve and this time again we'll be having the async and we need the parent again like this we have the parent object and then what we'll be doing is we'll be just returning we can just return again we can use the await and that should be equals to we can have the comment model so we can import the comment model and then we can have the find we can find a record from the comment we can find multiple records from the comment which has the user which has the user i think and that should be equals to we have the parent dot id over there parent.id and if we just go inside the comment so you can see we have defined the users that should not be the users that should be the user over there and now let's just move on and we can just check here as well inside the schema so we can have the user field which has a type which has the value equals to the parent.id which is connected so you can see now the user is being connected to the blocks and the comments as well so same should be applied for the blog again so you can also practice that then you can again follow me so you can just move on and we can just define the user like which user is connected so for that again we can use the type we have the graphql list of type of the user type so we have the user type over there and then again we can use the async we can have the resolve over there and inside the resolve again we'll be having the parent so the parent will be having we can have the return statement over there that should be equal to the await we can have we can have the user we can have the user model and then we can have the find or we can have or i think we only need to find one single user so for that what can we do so we can use the find by id of that user because only one single user would be connected to a one block so for that we can have the find by id so that should be equals to we can have the parent we can have dot user field inside the parent so as we have the user field inside the mongoose model so we have the user field 
so that should be equals to the parent object dot user inside that and now let's just move on and let's define here for the comment as well so we're gonna have the comments so that should be again equals to we can get the type so that should be equals to a graph ql we can have the list we can have the graph ql list of type of the comment type over there and after that what can we do so we can just provide here the resolve as well so we can have the async we can have the resolve so that should be equals to again we can have the parent over there and after that here inside the comments now we need to access multiple records because we can have multiple comments for just one single block so for that what we'll be doing so we can have the return we can have here the comment model so we can import the comment model from there so i think the comment should be there and then we can just use here the find so we can have multiple records so that's why we have used the find so we can give the blog id so that should be equals to we have the parent dot id over there so we have the parent dot id inside that and there you can see for the user we have defined the parent dot user because each block inside the because each block will be having the user field so it will auto fetch the user from the database and then it will just provide to the user field and that's why we'll be getting each user from there so that's how we can just relate between some multiple collections inside that and now let's just move on into the final type which is comment so we can just define the comment as well so here we'll be having the user connected so for that what we'll be doing so again we can just define the type that should be again equals to we can have here the graph ql i think we can i think we have done a mistake so if we just move on into the top so here you can see inside the comments so that should be the list but inside this user we won't be having the list we only be having the user type over there because there would be only single user and for the blocks and the comments so that would be okay so we had the mistake over there and you also need to fix that so we have the type that should be the user type over there and should not be an array and after that we can just define the user over here as well we can give the type so that should be equals to we can have the user type we can have the user type over there and after that we can give the resolve once again so we have the resolve again we'll be using the parent over there so we have the parent object and this time again we will be having the return we can have the await that should be equals to we can have the user dot find by id find the user by its id so the id should be equals to we have the parent object dot user field with that and and after that what we'll be doing so we'll be defining the relation for the blog as well so we'll be having the block the block will be having a each block inside that so we can have the type so that will be only one single block type so we can have the block type over there and then we can provide the resolve as well so we can use async resolve over there and with the resolve again we will be using the parent field so here we have the parent and inside the parent what we'll be doing is again we'll be using the return that should be equals to the await that should be equals to we can have the block dot we can have the find by id find a record by its id and then that should be equals to we can have the parent dot block over there parent dot block with that so that's how we can do all of the things with that so if we just save if we just move on into the graphql we can also refresh once again and then we can just test some relations of the graphql so let's just test for the graphql so we can just move on here and then we can just provide the query of getting like all of the users and then inside the users what we'll be doing so we'll be getting the name of that user and then what we'll be fetching is we'll be fetching the comments of that user and for the comments of that what we'll be fetching so for the comments we'll be fetching the text and we can fetch the block of that user so that's how we can just use the comments and for the blog as well so you can see blog again have a reference so for that we can just fetch the blog title inside that and block date as well with that so you can see that's how easy it is to manage it into the front end so we have the user object which has the name and then we have the comments array so for each comments array we'll be having the text and inside the block inside the comments array we'll be having the blocks as well we have the blocks title we have the block state so everything seems to be working fine so you can see now the graphql collection is working totally fine so now we have some relations inside the graphql types so everything seems to be working fine and let's just modify some handler functions as well while creating a new block and while creating a new user so now let's start working on the handlers once again so here we need to modify the handler function here so here you can see we have the handler function we have the query so query is okay because query we made from the graphql interface so you can see we have here the mutations and now we need to modify one of those mutations like here you can see while signing up a user every data will be sent to an empty array so the comments and the blocks will be set to an empty array so we won't be having any issue while sign up because while the sign up while the user registers we don't have any records of that user 
सो साइन अप इज ओके लॉग इन इज ओके बट वंस वी क्रिएट अ रिकॉर्ड देन वी नीड टू मेक अ चेंज लाइक हेयर यू कैन सी वंस वी क्रिएट अ ब्लॉक देन दी ब्लॉक शुड बी क्रिएटेड एंड ऑल्सो दिस ब्लॉक शुड बी पोस्टेड इन साइड द यूजर्स ब्लॉक एरिया एज वेल सो दिस ब्लॉक शुड बी देर इन साइड द यूजर्स एरिया एज वेल सो फॉर दैट वट डू वी नीड टू डू सो वी नीड टू मॉडिफाई दिस ब्लॉक फंक्शन ओवर देव सो वट डू वी नीड टू डू इन साइड दैट सो हेयर फॉर दैट विल नीड सम सेशन सो वट इज अ सेशन सो द सेशन इज जस्ट अ सेशन ऑफ अ टाइम लाइक देयर कैन बी अ टाइम सो देयर कैन बी अ सेशन टाइम एंड इन साइड दैट सेशन टाइम ओनली वी नीड टू अपडेट द रिकॉर्ड ऑफ द ब्लॉक वी नीड टू इंसर्ट द ब्लॉक एंड देन वी नीड टू इंसर्ट द ब्लॉक इन साइड द यूजर्स एरिया एज वेल ओनली इन वन सिंगल सेशन सो फॉर दैट वॉट विल बी डूइंग सो एज वी हैव जस्ट डिफाइन द रिजॉल्व वी हैव डिफाइन द लेट ब्लॉक एंड लेट्स डिफाइन अ सेशन हेयर एज वेल सो वी कैन हैव अ कॉन्स्ट वी कैन हैव द सेशन so that should be equals to a start session from the mongoose so we have start session function which creates a new session inside the mongoose and inside that session only inside that session will be just storing the records inside both block and the users collection and start session contains a promise so we need to await for this task as well so after the await then we'll be moving on into the try catch so here you can see once we create a new block inside that now we need a couple of more fields like here you can see here we need the id of that user as well as we need to store the id inside the user object so for that what do we need to do so again we can move on into the handlers and here inside the arguments now what do we need to do so we need to accept the id of that user that we want to insert so for that we can have the user inside that we can have the user so that will be equals to we can have the type that should be equals to we can have the graph ql non null that should be the graph ql id that we need to insert for the user so we'll be accepting the user id inside that so for the user id what will be doing so we will be providing the user here as well so we can have the user inside that and after that what will be doing so we'll be having the new block over there and inside that we'll be storing the user field as well like this we'll be having the user and after we'll just create a new block inside that but before just saving the block now we need to make a couple of more changes like here after we create a new instance of this block now we have just a new instance of this block but this block hasn't been saved inside the database as of now so what do we need to do so here after we create the instance then we will start a transaction so for that we can start a transaction so we have a session and when we can have the start transaction so it will start a new transaction and inside that we have the configuration options so in the configuration we can just provide the session that we have just created so that will be the session and now we have the start transaction and there will also be a commit transaction as well so we can have a commit transactions but commit transaction should be there inside the finally we have the try catch and then we can have the finally so we can have the finally over here so we have finally block inside that and in the finally we can have the await we can have the await over there and then we can have the session dot commit transaction over there so that will be the commit transaction inside the finally block so after the try catch is over then we need to commit a transaction but once we are just starting a transaction then what do we need to do so inside this transaction only now we need to just save the record inside both user and the block so for that what can we do so here first we can just fetch the details of that user like if we have the user with this id then only we need to move forward so we can just check that inside here so we can have here the if we can check this before starting the session as well so that will be okay so that will be a good approach before even starting the transaction then we are validating the whole user data so what we can do so before adding the if then we can just define here the existing user so we can have a const we can have the existing user so that should be equals to we can have here the await that would be equals to we can have the user model inside that we have the user model and then we can have a find by id so we'll find a user by its id that has the id of the user inside that that we are getting from the graphql from the graphql api and then what we will do so here we have the user model and after that we will just check if we do not have the user if the existing user is empty or is null if the existing user is empty then what do we need to do so we'll be returning a new error over there so there should be a new error in which we'll be having the user not found so we can have the user not found and then we can have the exiting the process we can have the exiting and in the exit the try catch block will be over and then we'll be committing the transaction and after that what we'll be doing so we'll be just moving on and here you can see we have here the start transaction and then what we'll be doing so we'll be just having the existing user we have the existing user over here and then what we will do so we'll push to the array of the existing users block so the existing user you can see once we open the user model 
so we have here the blocks array so inside the array we'll be pushing a record into the array we'll be adding the record into this array so for that we have a function inside the mongoose which is a push so we can have the existing user dot we can have the blocks property inside that because here we have the blocks existing user date object dot blocks dot we can have the push method and from this push method now you can see we'll be just storing here the block that we have just created so we have created this whole new block so this block will be then pushed inside the existing users block push array so that would be the functionality when we have the existing user so now what do we need to do after next so now we have the existing user dot blocks dot push array and after that we need to save the existing user as well because this is an instance and now we need to just save this instance as well so what do we need to do so first we'll be just storing this so we can have the await we can have the existing user we can have here the save so we can save the existing user but only within that session that we have just created only within that session and after that we'll be just returning the block dot save and only with that session that we have just created so only with this session only we'll be just creating these things like we have the existing user dot blocks dot push and i think we can just move this start transaction into the top like this so we'll start a transaction and inside this transaction only we'll be fetching some of the records like creating a new instance of this block creating and validating the existing user and we have a the pushing to the array of the existing users blocks and then awaiting for their save and then returning the save data with that so that will be the whole functionality of saving a new block and you can see this is very simple inside the backend you can see now it should work so we can just move on into the graphql we can also refresh and there what we can do so we can just provide a mutation over there but before the mutation now we need the user ids as well so for the user id is what we'll be doing so first we can generate a query of all of these users with their id and with their respective names we can execute this query we have two users james and the smith so we can just copy the id of the james we can just move on and define a mutation object so we have the mutation we can have the add block over there and in the add block what we'll be doing so we'll be just running the title we can have here the test block once again this should be wrapped inside this quotes so that should be the test block after that we'll be just storing here the content as well we can again have the test content and after that what we'll be doing so we'll be having the date we can again send a date like 2022 we have the 2020 we can send any date 06 and 06 and after that the last parameter would be we need to specify the user and the user would be equals to the whole user object that we have we can give the id of that user we can provide the id and then in return what can we get so we can get the title of this blog we can get again the content of the blog and also we can get the user of that block as well that has created this block so for that as we have defined the user parent dot user so we can get the name of this user which has created this block so that will be the whole request so i am now just maximizing it so here you can see this will be the whole query for the mutation and then you can see if we just execute this query so you can see it is awaiting for a task and then you can see now the task is okay and then you can see after the task has been executed you can see the add block is working fine we have the add block we have the title we have here the content and then you can see inside the user we have the whole user object inside that we can get the user property which is james so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so you can see that's how the graphql api works and then you can see what the process is so first we are pushing to the array of the existing user and then we are creating a new block instance over there we are saving all of those records and then you can see once we make this mutation once the mutation is over and now while getting the query data like here while getting the query data from this query object then we can just move on into the root query or we can just move on into the schema so here we have defined the schema and then you can see inside this schema we have the user object what it will do so once it will just move on into this user object we have this user object it will go to the schema of the block type and then it will just get the type from there like we have the type of the user type then only it is giving you all of those fields of the user type we have the name email and the password and then you can see inside the resolve once we just execute this query so what it will do so we have the user dot find by id it will find a user by its id which has the user id which is related that we have provided here we have provided the user id like this so it is fetching the parent object the whole block object dot user we have filled the user and then we have given the id inside that so that's how it is accessing the user id from that so this is very simple process inside the graphql and that's how the graphql works in the real world 
So this is how we can just generate a new block. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So now we have just created our first handler with the add block with some relations inside that. And now you can see initially, if we just check the comments as well, if we just move on, if we just check here the query. So inside the blocks, we can get all of the query. We can get the name. I think we can get the title of the block. We have the title. We can have the user object as well. We'll be having the user. We can have here the name. And after that, what we'll do, so we'll just access the comments as well. But you can see here, we won't be having any comments. So we can give the text property and then we can execute this query. So here you will see here is in some of the fields, you will file an empty array. So you can see we have the user null because this block was created when we do not have, when we did not have any relation. And here as well, you can see we have the username as the James. We have the comments array as the blank array, empty array. And here as well, we don't have any comments. So now let's just move on and let's define the update functionality of the user. So here you can see inside the update block, we won't be having any change because here we only are updating the title and the content of that specific block. But there would be a change inside deleting a block. So once we delete a block, then we also need to delete all of those comments of that block. And then we also need to just delete the block from which the block has been created. So that will be a complex functionality for the delete. So for the deleting now, what do we need to do? So we can just move on into the delete block. We have the ID of that block and we only need the ID as well. So what we'll be doing here. So again, we can just define the session inside the delete. So we can have here the session once again, we can have the con session that should be equals to await. We can have here the start session from the mongoose. We have the start session and after that inside the try catch block now we need to make a couple of changes but here we need to populate a record of that user so we need to populate all of those records of that user that it have so as we just discussed about the populate inside the mongoose so the populate is used to get some records as well like there you can see we have generated a new query like find one story but we are populating the whole object of the user which is related to this specific one record so for that, what do we need to do? So we can just have the populate. We can have here the populate method here. So the populate will be having a field of the user. I think we'll do that comments part later. So we have here the user. And after that, what do we need to do? So we will just first verify the user if we already have the user related to this. So we can have here the const. We can have the existing user. That should be equals to, again, we can have I think with that we can have an existing block dot user field with that. So we'll be having the whole user field with the existing block dot user because inside the user we have the whole functionality because we won't be having just the ID because now we have the populate. So the populate just populates the whole object of that user. So we have the existing block dot user functionality according to that. And then I think we are getting like property does not exist. So what we can do so for here as well, we can use here the type as the ts ignore so we can ignore the next line and what we'll be doing so we can again have a validation like if we do not have the existing user then we need to just return a new error so that should be no user linked to this block and after that what can we do so now we can just move on and there what we can do so we can just start a new transaction over there so with that we can just start a new transaction and inside that transaction only we'll be just saving the records like here first we are removing the id and then we need to just also remove the block from the user's block as well so what we can do so we can just start the transaction once again at the top so we can have the const we can have your the we can have your i think just the session dot start transaction we can have the start transaction over there so after we are just validating the existing block, if we have the user or if we have the block, then only we need to just move on. So then what do we need to do? So here we have the existing user. So as we did inside that, as we just push to the array of the existing user block like this push. So we have another method, which is a pull, which is provided to you by the mongoose once again. So we have the pull method that you can use. So you can have the existing user. We have the existing user, sorry dot we have the blocks array once again so we have the blocks and then we can use the pull method which pulls out a record which deletes a record from this we have the existing block so we need to pull that existing block with that and then what do we need to do as the next step so here we have the existing user dot blocks dot pull and after that we will just save the existing user so for that we can have the await we can have the existing user 
existing user object we can have dot save function according to that we can have the save and then we can provide the session as well like this so on site this session only we need to save and there we are just returning the find by id and remove we have the id and i think we can just remove this find by id and remove which is we can have the existing block dot we can have the remove function so we can have the remove and then inside the options we can just provide the session over there so with that as well we can just have here the existing block dot remove as well so that will work fine so it will also work with the save as well but it will also work with this and after that inside the finally block now what we'll be doing so after the try catch finally then we'll be just closing the transaction so we can have the session dot terminate transaction so i think we can have i think so we can have about transaction like this or we can have the commit transaction like this so we can have the commit transaction with that so we'll be having a start transaction and then we'll be having a commit transaction according to that so now what are we doing is now we are just removing the block from the users as well and from the blocks collection as well so if we just save if we just test this again first i will now just get all of the details of that users so we have the users inside that so from the users we'll be accessing the property of the blocks and their name and their ids according to that so we have the blocks we have the title we have the ids we can predify the record and after the users then we'll be accessing the blocks as well like this we have the blocks and then we'll be having the connected users regarding that we have the name and the id of that user so that will be the query if we execute this so here you can see now we are getting all of the data with that so we are getting the data object which will contain the users array and then we have the blocks array so the user will be having an array which has the blocks like now you can see if we just access the users id and the name here like this and we won't be using the blocks for now we can now delete the blocks if we just make a query once again then you can see now we only have the users we have the, the array of the users so like you can see this james user have two blocks and this smith user does not have any block so what we can do so we can just try while deleting a new block so here you can see if we just delete the test block too so we can just copy that id and if we just make a mutation over there like mutation and then we can have the delete block with that we can provide the id like this id should be there and after that we can just get some data in return like we can have the user object name and after the user then we can just get the title of that block if we just execute this query i think everything should work fine so here you can see now the delete block is working fine we have the user we have the james we have the title as the test block too but here you can see we had this id of the block we can just copy that id we can just add here here we can just add that id here like this we had this id inside that and now we can just move on and make a query for getting all of those users to verify that if this block is still there or not we can get the blocks from there we can get the id and then we can get the title if we make a new query so here you can see now the james object so you can see now we have the james object and this only has one block inside that which is the test block if you are still not sure you can just provide the name property so you can see now the james has only one block inside that so that is working totally fine so here you can see once we are deleting a block so you can see the block is also being deleted from the users array as well so everything is working totally fine so you can see this functionality is also working perfectly fine so now we are done with implementing the functionality of the users and the blocks so now let's just move on and let's just define the functionality for the comments as well so for that here you can see here we have here the users functionality the login and the sign up we have the block functionality we have the add we have the update and we have the delete and then you can see we have the read operations as well for the users blocks and the comments and now let's just move on and here you can see we have here the delete block and after the delete block let's define another mutation that can be add comment to a block we can have a app we can have a add comment to block and inside it again we can define an object we can have a add comment to block and this will be again an object in which the type should be equals to this time so the type would be equals to the comment type so as we've defined as the comment type here up oh, so that should be the comment type as the type and inside that we need some arguments as well so we need some arguments that we have defined inside the comment schema so here we have the model of the comment so here you can see we have the text we have the date and then we have here the block and then we have here the user so we have the ids of the block id and then we have the user id as well so the respective object id and the respective blog id so we need to just ask the blog id and the user id from the front end and here we need to define the arguments now 
so inside the arguments the first argument would be that we need to define would be the blog so we can have the blog over there and this time we can define the type that should be again the graphql normal property that should be equals to a graphql id so we need to define this argument over there and after that we need to define here the user as well so we can have the user and again this should be of same type so we can again copy and paste this type and after that we need to define the functionality for the text and the date so for that we can have the text functionality again so inside the text we'll be having the graphql string so we'll be having the string from the graphql and again for the date again we'll be having the string from the graphql like this we'll be having the date so that should be the graphql normal property that would be a string so here we have four arguments that we need to receive while creating a new comment to a block so after that let's just minimize this and let's define the resolve function so again we can have a resolve the async resolve and that would be a function in which we need to get the parent once again and then we need to get some arguments like the argument for be the user itself we can have the blog we can have the text we can have the date so there will be four arguments that we are destructuring and after that what do we need to do so now while creating our command we need a couple of functionalities to be implemented so first we have here the user so we need to push the comment to the user's comment array as well so here you can see inside the user we have the comments so we need to push a comment to the user's comment array and then we need to just move on into the block and here you will see here we have the comments so we need to push the comment to the blocks comments array as well to a specific blocks comments array so here you can see we have the id of the user and we have the id of the block so we can easily just get a block from its id and the user from its id and we can push to their array and now let's just move on and here we can say we have here the comment so now what do we need to do so again we need to define a session inside that session only we need to just implement all of those functionalities so for that we can have the cost we can have the session so that should be equals to we can again have the await that should be the start session from the mongoose so that is a promise so we are using the await and after that let's define the comment as well so we can have a let we can have the comment so that should be again equals to a type of the document type that we have so we have a document type so here we have the document and after that what we'll be doing so again we'll be using the try catch block over here so we can have the try catch over there if we get an error then we'll be just returning that error we'll be having a returning we can have the new error so that should be equals to the error itself so we have the error so here first we can just start our transaction so we can have a session dot we can have the start transaction and then we can give you the session as well like this as we have defined the session so that would be the session itself and after that what do we need to do so first we can just fetch the user so we can have the const we can have the existing user that should be equals to we can have the uh, user model dot we can have the find by id so we can find a user by its id and then we can just define the id that we are getting from the arguments so we have the user and that should be the await as well because that's a promise so we need to await for this task and after that let's define the block as well we can have the existing block so that should be because of the await and then we can have here the block dot we can have the find by id so we can find a block by its id like this and then we can just define the block id over there that we are getting from the arguments and then let's have a validation check as well after this but if the existing block is null and if we do not have the existing user as well we have the existing user then what do we need to do then we need to return a new error once again so we can have the new error and inside this error what we'll be doing so we'll be having a user does not exist but once we have here the user and the block once we have both of the things then what do we need to do then what we will do is we will just create a new comment we'll create a new instance of the comment so we can have the comment that should be equals to a new comment model so we need to import the comment from there and here we need to just define the whole document we'll be having the text property like we can just provide the text like this and after the text then we can just provide the date as well so date as we are getting from the front end and then we can define the blog as well and then we can just define the user as well so these will be the four things that we need to define so we have the text date block and the user so everything should work perfectly fine and after defining the comment now what do we need to do so we need to just push to the array of the user we need to just have the users dot comments array dot push this new comment and same for the block we need to push to the blocks comment array as well and then we need to save this block so for that what do we need to do again so we can have the existing user we can have dot comments so we have the dot comments over there dot comments array and then we can push to a record of the comment so we have the push so that should be equals to a comment over there 
and after that same should be applied for the blog as well so we can have existing blog dot comments dot push so that should be equals to a comment so now we have pushed this comment to the existing blog and the existing user and after that what do we need to do so here we can just save all of these things so first we can just save the user we can have the existing user we can have the existing block dot save so we can save to the block of the existing block and then we can define the session in which we'll be just saving so inside this session we need to save this and again we can use the await we can have the existing user dot we can have the save once again so we need to save to the object of the existing user we can define the same session over there and after that let's just move on and let's just define the await we can have a comment dot save so we can save a new comment over there and the session would be the session that we are generating and here this should be the return statement as well because after saving the record then we'll be returning this record as well to get something in return from the front end and after that after the try catch then we'll be having the finally and inside this finally block what we'll be doing so we'll be just having the await we can have this session dot we can have the commit transaction so we'll be committing a transaction regarding that so that will be the whole functionality for creating a new comment over there so that will be the functionality and for the delete comment functionality as well now we need to just delete from the users area as well from the blog area as well and we need to just delete the comment as well so that would be the functionality so if we just save if we just move on into the application we can again also refresh and here first we can just get everything like we can get the blocks we can get the id of the blog and then we can get the user object as well we can get the id we can get here the name and after we have the id then we can just get the title of the blog as well so there will be these things that we are getting so if we just execute this so here you can see we have the my new blog and inside this blog we have here the id but we do not have the user so we'll be trying which have the user as well so this blog has the user as well we have the user id we have the james and then we have the test blog as well copy this blog id as of now so we have this blog id and after that we can just provide here so that's the comment and after that let's just define here any user as well so we can get any user from the database so again we can have the users we can have the id and we, with that we can just move on and here we have two users so we can just copy this user's id and then we can just paste that over here like this so we have this block we have the user and after that let's just define the mutation so here we have the mutation and inside this mutation we'll be having the add comment to block and with that we need to define the block id the block id should be this id that we have copied so this id would be there inside the block and then we can define the id for the user as well so user will be having this id we have this id and then we can define the text as well of the comment so we can have the text it should be the my new comment and then we need to just extract the data as well like we can get the text as well we can get the blog as well we can get the id of that blog and then we can get the title of that blog and then after the blog then we can get the user as well and then from this user we'll be getting the name of that user and the id of that user and i think we have missed defining the date over there so that should be the date as well so date should be there like again we can define 2022 we can define 05 and then again we can define 06 so if we just now save so we can just see the query as well once again so here we have the full query we have the add comment to blog we have the blog id user id text comment date we have a uh, the blog as well that we are extracting we have the user that we are extracting and then the text that we are extracting if we just make a query if we just execute this so i think it should work so here you can see now it is working fine so we have the add comment to block and then we have the text as well we have the block in which we are just generating a new block over there we have the new block and then we have the user as well that is commenting inside this and now let's just move on and let's have a query and let's have a query so we can have here the blocks so we can get all of the blocks we can get the id we can get the title of the block and then we can get the comment as well after this so after the title we can get the comment and inside the comments we'll be getting the text of all of those comments so if we just execute this query so here you can see now we have here the block and there you can see the first block doesn't have anything but inside the second block you can see we have the blog id we have the title and then you can see in the comments we get a comment as well so it means everything is working totally fine so now we have just completed the comments functionality as well so the add comments functionality is perfectly completed and now we can just check with users as well so we can have the users we can have the comments of all of those users so we can have the text of those comment so if we just execute this query so here you can see now we have the first user which do not have any comment and the second user has the comments as well
so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so the add comment is completely done and now let's just move on and let's define the functionality for deleting a comment as well so for that so we can define another mutation so that should be a delete a comment from block and after that what do we need to do so we can have here the function as we can have the delete comment we can have this middleware and then this would be an object which contains the type property so again the type would be the comment type and after that we'll be just defining the arguments so inside the arguments we only need the id of that comment so we need the ids so we can just define the id over there id would be having a type that should be equals to again we can have the graphql normal property which would be the id of the graphql so we can have the graphql id and after that after the arguments then we'll be defining again the resolve so we can have the async that should be the resolve and after defining the resolve then let's just move on and here you can see inside the comments so what do we need to do so we need to check inside the schema that if we are just providing the resolver here or not so we can just move on into the schema so here you can see once we are just generating the block so that should be the find by id parent or block and that's okay and the user that's okay and now let's just move on into the handlers once again so we can complete the handler so here once deleting the block now what do we need to do so first we can just get a comment and then we can just verify that comment is that like if the comment is already there then only we'll be deleting that comment so for that again we'll be defining let we can have the comment the type would be the document type and after that what do we need to do so again we can define a session over there and after this start session then let's again add a try catch block over there so we can have a try catch we'll be returning a new error over there which will contain the whole error object and after that we can have the finally as well and inside this finally so we'll be having the await that should be equals to we can have here again we can have the session dot we can have the commit transaction so we have the commit transaction and after that let's just move on and inside the tribe let's just start a new transaction so we'll be having the session dot we can have the start transaction and then inside that we can define the session object so here we have the session and after that let's just find out a comment by its id so we can have the comment that should be equals to we can use the await and then we can again have the comment dot we can have the find the comment by its id and the id would be equals to so we need to define the id inside the parent inside the argument so that should be the parent object first and then it would be the argument inside the id so that should be equal to the id that we are getting from the comment so after just generating the comment now what do we need to do so first we need to extract the user by this comment so as the user and the comments are related and the blocks are related so we'll be getting the whole blog object as well with this so here what do we need to do so here we can have here the const we can have your i think first we can just check for the comment as well like if we do not have the comment like if we do not have the comment then we'll be just returning then we'll return the new error that the comment not found so that would be the error that we need to send so there should be the error and then now we want to extract the user and the block so we can have the const we can have the existing user so that should be equals to again we can have the await we can have your i think the user dot find by id so we can find a user by its id so we have here the comment dot we can have here the user because the comment has the field of the user as well so we'll be using the comment and this will give us the id of that user so we can just use the same for the blog as well so we can have here with the block and first let's just have here the if statement for the validation like if you do not have the existing user then we can just return a new error once again and then once we have here the existing user then we'll be defining the existing block so block should be equals to we have here the block model so we can use with the block model and there that should be comment dot block with that so we have the comment dot block and i think you can see we have the error like property user does not exist on the type of the document type so what we can do so again here we can just use here the ts ignore to ignore that error so we'll be having dot ts we can have the ignore and here as well we'll be ignoring that so that should be the ignore and after that what we'll be doing is we'll be just validating the block if we do not have the block over there so now you can see now the error handling parts are being completed and now we need to just delete the comment from the array of the block and the user so as we did inside the delete block so here you can see we used here so we can just again use here the pull 
so as we used here the existing user dot blocks dot pull so we'll be pulling the existing block from there so now let's just move on and let's define the same functionality over there so we can have here the const or we can just define here i think we are already defining this transaction so here we'll be just using here the existing user dot we have the comments so that should be equals to we have the pull and that would be equals to this comment over here so we have the existing user users array we have the comments array inside the user we are pulling a record of this comment and the same would be applied for the blog as well we have the existing blog dot comments dot pull and after that what do we need to do so here we'll be saving all of those records so we'll be having a wait we can have the existing user dot save and we need to save from only this session id and after that we need to just move on and again await for the existing block we can have the existing block dot save once again and with the save we'll be using the same session over there and after that let's just move on and let's just delete this comment as well so we'll be having a return we can have the await so that should be equals to we can have the comment dot remove so we'll be having the comment dot remove as we did inside the blog as well and then we need to just define the session over there so that would be the whole big functionality for deleting a new comment so if we just save if we just move on into the application so here we can refresh the page as well and after that let's just get all of those comments so we can have the comments we can just get the id of that comment we can get the text of those comments we can have the blog as well with the blog we'll be having the id of that block like this and then we'll be having the title of that block and after that we'll be accessing the user property after that so we have the user and with the user we'll be accessing the id and the name of that user so you will see there will be only one single record if we just execute this query so here you can see now we have the comments array and inside this comment we have one single object and inside this we have the id we have the text like my comment we have it the block we have the id and the title we have the user we have the id and the name of that user and let's just now delete this comment as well so we can just now copy this comment id and let's just define the mutation over there so here we have the mutation and inside this we can have the delete this comment and then we can pass the id over there if we just use that if we just now save if we just get the text in return if we just save now then you can see now this comment would be deleted i think so here you can see now the delete comment is working perfectly fine so we are getting the text like this and if we just move on and if we just define the query once again like the comments we can just get the text if we just execute this query so here you can see now we do not have the comments as well so with that the comment functionality has also been completed so now we are done with the users part with the comments part with the block part so everything is done and now let's just move on into the front end part as well but before moving ahead now we can do some optimizations as well so here you can see inside the app.ts as we have defined this connect to database function so let me just move on into the connect to database and here you can see earlier we were just returning a new error so you can just have the throw a new error so what it will do so once you will get an error then it will not return anything inside that it will throw an error and you won't be getting anything inside the then statement so that would be the functionality so that would be the first optimization fix and there you can see now we have defined the configurations so that is fine we have defined all of the api keys the password inside this and if you want to just change the url as well so you can also change the url you can just use the blog as well you can use any url that you want over there and then you have the graphql http you have the schema graphql property to the true and then you can just move on into the blog you can move on into the comments so you can see everything is totally fine so every functionality is working fine so after that if we now need more of the requests like if we need some more queries as well so we'll do that later once we'll move on into the front end so now we have completed this application and then you saw it was a huge project that we built so you can see at the time of building our application we had the mongoose version of the 6 but now the mongoose has released the latest version which is the version 7.0.2 but inside that they have just have some breaking changes inside that and the breaking changes would affect our application and then you can see they have removed the remove method from that because we were using the remove inside the handlers so you can see earlier we were using the return await we have the existing block dot remove to delete a block and we were using same for the comments as well like for deleting the comment we were using the await we have the comment dot remove this session but now they have removed the remove method from the mongoose but they have provided the one more method inside that which is a delete one so you can see they have provided the breaking changes with that so earlier we were using for documents we have the await document dot remove but now we are using the await we have the document dot delete one 
so you can say we have a new method of the delete one in which we can just provide the delete query with that and then we can delete our document with that instead of the delete one method you can say you need to provide the id like this so you have the id and that would be the comment dot id and then same for the blog as well so for the blog if you want to delete a blog but now we need to have here the await we have here the existing block dot delete one so we'll be deleting one block the id would be the existing block that we define dot id so now with this change there won't be an issue with our application and everything will work perfectly fine so now you can see this was a breaking change so that's it for this change in the mongoose so the back end of this application has been completed and now we need to move on into the front end part where we'll be creating the front end of this entire application so for the front end we'll be using the react js so let's move on into the terminal and select a new terminal from there and from this terminal now now we'll be creating a brand new react js application with the typescript so for that we can move on into the chrome and we can search for the create react app so we can have the create react app with typescript so we can search for it and there you can see now they will find the typescript like adding the typescript and in this section you will find the installation as well for the create react app with the typescript template so let's move on and let's copy that and if you are on the yarn then you can select with the yarn version so i am on the npx so i will be using the npm version so we can just copy that and we can just move on and we can just paste that here so we have the create react app my app and then we can also change the name of this application as well like we can have the block front end so we can have the block dash front end. So we have this application name and then let's move on and let's hit enter. So now it will just create a brand new React.js application with the TypeScript template. So let's wait once it initializes a new React.js application. So the new React application has been created and now we can just check this folder directory. So first we have the node modules which contain some packages which runs under the hood. Then we have the public folder which contains some assets inside our application and it contains the index.html file which is the root file of our application where we render the div id equals to the root and inside this id root inside this element we render the app component of our application and the app component you can find inside the source directory which is the main component which is the overall main component of our application where we write a sub components inside that. And after that, let's move on. We have the CSS file for that component as well. And then we have the index.tsx file, which is a root file, where we render the app component inside the div element of the root, like this. And then you can see we have the React app environment, we have the report web vitals, and these are just for the performance purposes. So we can also delete this file as well. And then we can move on into the index as well. And here as well, we can delete this file as of now. So we can delete this function as of now. So here we have the source directory and now we can move on and let's see the package.json. So inside this you can see we have some dependencies like we have some development dependencies as well, some scripts as well. So we have all of these dependencies which are installed with the React application. And then finally we have the tsconfig file which contains some configurations for the TypeScript compilations. So these are everything about the folder structure inside the React application. And now let's move on and let's just run this application inside the development server. So we can move on CD into the block front end and then we can just start this application with the npm. I think we can run the npm start command and it will start the development server for this application on the localhost port of the 3000. So you can see now the localhost port of the 3000 is running and then you can see now we have the home page of this application. So this is the home page of this application and the new react app has been created finally. And now let's just move on and let's just delete the boilerplate code of the react page so we can move on into the main file which is the app.tsx and here we are rendering the boilerplate code so you can see the whole header is the boilerplate code which are generated by the create react app so we can just delete that and we can also delete the class name app as well and we can also delete the logo as well from there because we do not need the logo and the react import as well so if we save if we move on into the application so here you can see now we have nothing over there and then we can just render the hello world like this so we can render the hello world like this and there you can see now we have the hello world inside this application which is working perfectly fine and we can also remove here the app.css import as well because we do not need them at all and there we have the hello world and then we can move on into the index.css as well so here we have the body margin zero so we can also provide the padding as well we can have here the padding that will be having the margin of the zero inside that so we'll be having the margin and the padding as the zero inside this application so now you can see now we have created a fresh start of the react application and now we'll be building everything from complete scratch so let's build this application so before building this application let's move on into the paint and let's just define the structure of this application that how this application is gonna look so we can move on into the home 
and there you can see now suppose this is a web page right and after that what do we need to do so first we'll be having the header of this blog application so suppose that is a header over there so we have the header and do not judge me on the basis of my styles because now i am very bad at the styling and then we can move on into the home and then first we'll be having the logo of this application so suppose that would be the application logo like this so we'll be rendering the logo like this into the top left corner of the navigation bar inside the header and then we'll be rendering some links onto the right side of that so suppose these are some links so we'll be using some tabs for the links so the tabs are available inside the material ui so we'll be using the material ui for the styling so let's move on so there will be some tabs like this that will be used for the navigation purposes like this so there will be some tabs and after that finally we'll be having the button for the sign up or login so we can have the button after that like the sign up or login button like this so we'll be having this button like this and as i told you earlier that do not judge me on the basis of this styling because this styling is at the paint as well and even my styles are not good so that will be the home page of this application and then we'll be having the block as well like this like we'll be having some text of this application like the applications company so we can have the block something like that as of now so this will be the header of this application and then we can move on into the home so for the home page we'll be rendering some of those images with that so we'll be rendering the images and the text along with that so what we'll be doing so we'll be having an image like this so first we can have the image on the right side and then we'll be having some text on the left of the side like on the left side we'll be having some text like this like create blog or somewhere like which motivates to create a blog so we can have this like we can have the create text and then we have the image and then in the next row so we'll be having three rows for this so in the next row the position will be vice versa so the image will be there and create will be there and then on the third row again the position will be vice versa so the create will be here and then the image will be there after that if i want to show you one more container over there so like this will be the image another image and then we'll be rendering the text like this like create here like we can have the create so that will be the structure of this home application and then finally we'll be creating a footer element as well so for the footer now what we'll be doing so we'll be rendering some of those links like first we'll be having some text like created with love by nikhil tadani or indian coder so you can name so you can name your own name as well so you can write your own name as well and after that we'll be having some buttons for the navigation like view all some blogs view some links of the blogs create links so we can have some links inside the footer as well so here as well we'll be having some link spaces like this so that will be the home page of this application that we need to build so this will be the home page of this application that we need to build so let's build this application from the scratch so like now so as we discussed earlier so we'll be using the material ui for building the application so for that we can move on into the chrome once again and we can just search for the mui so we'll be using the material ui so here is, this will be the home page of the material UI and then you can see this is a beautiful library which have some predefined react components that we can use and it saves a lot of time instead of writing the CSS styles directly from the scratch. So we can use the material UI which has the predefined and pre-styled components that we can use and to get started with it. So here you can see now we have here the link to install the packages of the material UI. So we can just copy that and we can move on into the application and then we can open another terminal and we can move on into the main front-end directory like this and then we can just paste this command over here so after that now we'll be installing the material ui and then we'll be using the icons as well so for the icons we'll be moving on into the react icons so here this will be the library that we'll be using for the icons so we can just install this as well npm install react icons dash dash save so we can use this library as well for the icons so these are the two main libraries that we'll be using for the design purposes and then for working with the GraphQL backend, so we'll be using the Apollo client as well. So you know about the Apollo client as we discussed inside the introduction video. So we'll be using the Apollo client for the integration for the backend and the frontend for like mutations and the queries. But as of now, we'll be designing the application like first we need to design the home page, then the header, then the login sign up page. And then we'll be working on the Apollo client to get all of the data and to render all of the data because we have a lot of things inside this application. So let's just design the home page of this application, then the header. So there will be a series of steps that we need to perform. So let's close all of that and we have used the material UI and for that now what we'll be doing so here you can see everything is installed and now what we can do so we can move on into the source directory and we can define some folders so now let's move on and let's define the folders inside that so we are into the source and we can define the folders for the components so we can have the folders we can have the components inside that 
and now inside that now what we'll be doing now for the home page now we need to define another folder so we can have the components home and inside the home now we can define a home page so we can have the home page of this application with that so that should be the home page dot tsx so we are using the tsx extension over there because it is a typescript xml so after that now what we can do so we can add the default or we can have the boilerplate code for the react component inside any react component like this so we can import the react from the react and then we can run the component function over here then we can just export that component so now we do not need the react import as of now so here we are declaring the component and now we can just run this component inside the app so here we have the app.tsx so here instead of this hello world now we'll be creating the home page component over there so now we'll be rendering the home page over there like this so if we save if we move on to the application and if we refresh the page so like now you can see now we have the home page over there and now let's design the home page so we'll be using the material ui for the designing so what we can do so again inside the source we can create another folder that can be the styles so in this folder now we'll be defining the styles for separate components like for the home page we can define the home page we can have the styles.ts so inside this now we'll be designing the styles object from the material ui so here we'll be having the styles and now inside the styles now what we'll need to do so we need to define these styles for every component or for every element every jsx element that will be using inside the home page so here we'll be having the object of the styles so then we'll be using some keys over there so like first we'll be having we need to import something from the material ui so we can have something from the material ui from there at the rate MUI material and then something would be equals to the SX props. So what are the SX props? So the SX props contains the style subject inside the material UI components. So it contains all of the styles that are supported by all of the components of the material UI. So we'll be importing that string and now we need to just create the style subject for the material UI. So we can have the const, we can have the home page style. So that should be equals to, so now we need to define the styles. But before that, we are using the TypeScript and then we need to define the types. So we need to define the type annotations for everything that we use. So we can define the types. So what we can do, so we can define here the type like this. We can define the type here. So we can have the type that should be equals to, so we can have the style like this. So we can have the type styles that should be equals to an object. And inside that, now what we'll be having, so we'll be defining the key. So the key would be of the type of the string. And then the value of this will be the SX props of the material UI. So they will be having this styles, like we need to define the key. So like if we define the homepage styles, like these styles like this. So if we annotate the type over here, so then you will see if we define the styles for the topmost container, so like we can have the container over there. And then you can see inside this object, now we can define any styles that we want. If you press the control and the space, so you get all of the styles that we can provide here. So we can define any background or we can define anything that we want. So we'll be defining the styles like this. And then finally, we'll be just exporting this home page styles as well like this. So we'll be having the export const home page styles. So there we have the styles for the container. So now we need to just move on and we need to define some elements that we'll be using inside the home page. So we can open the home page here. And now we have opened the home page styles here and we have the home page component here. So now we'll be rendering everything like this. So like first we'll be having the box from the material UI. So what is the box? The box is just like a container inside the material UI which contains some elements. So here we'll be having the box inside that. Now after the box, now what do we need to do? So first box will be the container. So we can give the SX that should be equals to. So we can just import the styles for the home page styles. So we can import the styles over here like the home page styles. So that will be imported from the styles home page styles and that should be the styles containing that should be the container over there. So we can have the container styles with that. And after that, now what we can do so we can just render all of these elements. And now inside this container, now we'll be having the wrappers over there. Like they have the image on the left corner, then the text on the right corner and same vice versa on the next row and vice versa on the next row. So we'll be having the three containers over there. So we'll be having the container for the wrapper. So we'll be having the wrapper over there. So we need to define the styles for the wrapper. So then we can define the wrappers over here. So we can have the wrappers. So we can define the box element here and then we can give the SX prop that should be equals to. So we can have the home page styles dot wrapper. So we have the style for the wrapper and then we'll be just copy pasting it two more times because we'll be having three wrappers over there. So like you can see now we have the structure of the home page and we have the container and then we have three wrappers over there. And after that, let's just define all of the things inside that. And now let's move on. And first inside this, inside the first wrapper, we'll be having the typography. So we can have the typography over here like this. So we can have any text that we want. So we can have like the right 
and share your blog with millions of people so we'll be having the thing like this like write and share your blog with millions of people so we'll be having this typography and after this typography then we'll be having the image as well and attached to this lecture you will find the zip of the images so there will be three images inside the zip so you can download and you can extract that inside the public folder so there you will find three images like the articles.png the blog and the publish.png so after that now what can we do so again we can just close the sidebar and then we can just define the source that should be equals to so first image would be we can have slash blog so we can have slash blog.png because now the server is open on the local host port of the 3000 and the public is accessible on that server because you can see the index.html is also there and the public folder will be having all of the assets that we can use inside this server only so we'll be having the blog inside localhost 3000 slash blog and same for the articles and same for the publish so here we have the blog.png and then we can define the alt as well like we can have the block like this so that will be the first container that we have written so we can just copy that and then we can just paste that here like now this will be the second container and in this container the image will be on the top so now the image will be vice versa so here for the image now what we'll be doing so we'll be defining the image of slash publish.png so we can have the publish.png and then again we can just copy this thing we can just copy this image and this wrapper and then we can just paste that here like this so now you can see now we have three containers over there like this for the first container this for the second container like this and this was the third container that we have so inside this container we'll be having the typography on the top before the image so here you can see now we have something over there so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now this is our application so i know this is not looking good because now this is not responsive at all so now we need to make it responsive so let's move on and let's define all of the things so here we have the container styles so we can define the styles for the container so for the container we can define the styles like display like the display should be equal to we can give the flex so we'll be using the flex box and the flex direction would be inside the column basis so we'll be having the items on the bottom of each other we'll be having the padding as well so that should be the six and then we'll be having some gap between the items so that should be the 10 so if we save so now you can see now we have all of the elements like this and after that now what can we do so we have this gap and everything and after that let's just define the styles for each of the wrapper so the wrapper can contain the styles like display again that should be the flex so that we can have the items on the row basis then we can have the justify content into the center to make it into the center then we'll be having some gap between the items like four and then we'll be having the align items property to align all of this content into the center vertically so if we save so now you can see now we have three items over there which are aligned centered so now we have all of these items which are aligned over there and now we can just move on and we can define the styles for the typography as well so the typography again we can define some styles like we can have the text over there like we can have the text and then we can define some text as well like we can define the font size so we can have a font size and there we need to define the responsive font size and not the static because we are defining the application which is a responsive so now we need to make this application which should be the responsive on all of the screen sizes so we need to define the responsive values for this font size so we can have the responsive values like this so for the lg for the lg screens now we'll be defining the font size of the 50 and for the medium screen sizes we'll be defining the font size of 40 and then for the sm screens for the small screens we'll be defining the font size of 35 and then for the extra small screen sizes then we'll be defining the font size of 20 so there we have this text over there and then we can just provide the sx prop and then we can have the home page styles again we can have the home page styles dot text so if we save if we move on to the application so now we'll be having some responsive sizes as well and now we can move on and we can define the styles for the image finally because now the image is taking a lot of space here so let's define the styles for the image so we can have the image over there like this so for the image now the image property like you can see now the image is there from the html and not from the material ui so we need to define so we need to define some styles which are available inside the html only so like the styles can contain we can have the, like we can define the width and the height of the images so for the image we can define some styles we can have the box shadow so we can define the box shadow and other styles over here and then we can give the width and height over there inside this component while we call this component so we can have the box shadow we can have the 10 pixels we can again have the 10 pixels we can again have here the 25 pixels of blur 
and then we can have hash triple zero for the border shadow so for the shadow color and then we can have the border radius as well so we can have the border radius of something around 20 for each image so that should be the 20 for each image and now let's move on and let's define some stylings inside that so we have the text and let's define some styling for the image so each image can contain the width and height of the 50 percent so we can just copy all image text like this so we can just copy this thing so we can just select the image and then we can just press ctrl and f2 so it will select all occurrences of the image so now we have the image then we can provide the width that should be we can give the width of 50 percent of the original image then we can give the height as well so the height should also be the 50 percent of the image then we can also provide uh, i think we also have the alt then we can provide this style that should be equals to so we can have the home page styles like we have the home page styles dot we can have the image styles over there like the image so then you will see it will give us the type error because now this style is for the react css properties and not for the sx props so what we can do so we can just use here a thing like we can again select this style over there we can again select these styles and then we can just ignore the type error for this style so we can do that with the typescript so we can have here the comment so we need to add the comment and we need to tell the typescript that ignore the type checking for the above line so for that we can use at the rate ts that should be the ignore so what it will do so it will ignore the type checking onto the next line over there so now we have all of the things here so you can see now we are rendering the typography the image and the image and the typography and then with the typography in the image and i think we have used the publish here as well and here as well so i think that should be the third image which is the articles.png so we can have the articles we have the articles.png and then we have the alt as well so we need to give the articles and here as well we need to provide something like that should be the publish so if we save if we move on into the application so here you can see now we have everything with that so you can see now we have the text and then we have here the image then again you can see now we have this image and then we have here the text and again we have here the text and then we have here the image so if we just move into the 100 percent so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine and i think we haven't provided these styles for the typography so we need to do for all of the typographies and then we have another error so you can see this image is not available so i think we have provided some wrong url like we have the articles that should be the articles so if we save so now we have this image and then we need to provide the text style for all of these typographies so we have this text over there so we have this text and then we can just move on so we can select the typography which we do not have so here we have the text so we need to provide the text for this typography as well and for this typography as well so we can just copy and paste this thing over there and then you can see now we have everything with that so you can see now it is looking good so now we have the text over there like this and this as well we have the text and for this as well now we have the text over there so now we have this home page that we have defined and then you can see if we just decrease the screen size over there if we move on into the inspect so you can see everything seems to be responsive over there so you can see we have the responsive styles we have given these styles as the responsive numbers for the image and even for the text so it is responsive for, for all of the styles that we have for all of the mobile devices that we have like this and like this as well so all of the devices have the responsive styles with that so now let's move on and let's just define some more stylings for this text as well so you can see the text is not looking good so we can use the google fonts over there for this font so we can move on into the google fonts and then we can just work with the google fonts over here so here we have the beautiful fonts inside the google so i have pre-selected a font that we can use which is a work sans so we can have the work sans and then you can see now this is the text that we want so like now you can see this text is looking good so we can use the work sans over there and then you can choose whatever style that you want like we have the light 300 light 300 we have the extra light and from there you can just select any font weight that you want like medium like the regular you have here the semi bold as well so you can select any style that you want so i will be selecting the regular 400 style with that so we can just select this style and then you can see now if we select that now we'll be having this screen over there we'll be having this sidebar and then we'll be using the import statement for this style so we can move on and we can just copy that import statement over there so i think we can just copy that import statement over there like this so we can copy that import and then we can just move on into the main file into the main css file like this and then we'll be just rendering these styles over there and on the top of that now we'll be pasting this style so we have this style over there so you can see now we have the google font with that and now let's move on and let's just move into the home page styles like this then we can just define the font family so we can have the font family that we want 
so that should be the we can have the font family so you can see now they have defined the syntax as well like that should be the box and we can just copy that font from there and then we can move on here inside the text and then we can just provide the font family so that should be equals to that we have pasted so that we have copied we have the box sense so we need to paste the box sense over here so we have the box sense so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now the font is now updated so you can see now we have the updated font and this font is also looking good inside our application so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and if you want any bolder as well so you can just select the 500 style as well like this like if you want to select any 500 like this font is also looking good so you can just select this as well and then you can just import this whole style again so you can just copy the import statement once again you can move on into the index and then you can just paste that over here and then you can just select any font weight that you want like you can have the font weight of something around we can have the 500 as well so you can use the 500 and then you will be seeing now we'll be having the font weight of the 500 with that so you can see this is also looking good so that's how we can just use the google fonts as well with that so after that if you want to provide some shadows as well for the text so you can provide the shadows as well so you can use the text shadow so so you can use the text shadow property so we have the text shadow and then we can provide the shadows like we can have the 12 pixels horizontally we can have the 12 pixels and then we can have the 10 pixels then we can have the blur of something around 8 pixels over there and then we can just provide the color as well like that should be hash triple c so if we save so you can see now we have the beautiful shadows for the text as well so you can see this shadow is looking good but if you do not want the shadow and it is as for your choice and then you can also increase the blur property as well so you can use the 10 pixels so now you'll be having the 10 pixels of the blur with the shadows so that's how we can just use the shadows as well so now you can see now we have just mostly designed the home page of this application so now let's just move on and let's just define the footer part as well so now for the footer now we can move on again into the main vs code so here you can see now we have the source we have the components and inside the components we have the home and then we can just provide the footer as well so we can have the footer dot we can have the tsx extension and then we can again provide the rfc for the boilerplate code for the react component and now again we can close all of these files so here we have the footer and we can define some styles for the footer as well so here we have the home page styles inside that we can define the styles inside the home page as well so we can use home page styles as well for the footer we can have the footer container and for the footer container now we can just define the styles like we can provide the styles like again we can have the display that should be the flex basis on the flex box we'll be having the align items so that should be again inside the center of the screen then we'll be having some height as well so we can define the height of 20 v port height for the footer then we can use the justify content we have missed so we need to provide the justify content to the center and everything should be working so we can provide the gap property as well like this so we have the gap property like gap should be the 20 between the elements so we'll be having some buttons over there and then we can define the styles for the button so we can have the button we can have the footer button so that should be equals to for the footer button we can provide some styles like i think we can have the border radius so that should be something around uh, 10 would be enough and now we can just define some styles like this inside the footer so we can move on into the footer component so here we have the footer and then we can just close all of the files here we can move footer into the right and then we can just start from the scratch once again so we can again have the box over there so we can import the box from the mui material and inside that now what we'll be doing so we have rendered the x over there and after that inside that we'll be just providing the sx that should be equals to so again we can have the home page styles dot we have the footer container so the footer container and after that now we can just move on and we can just define some buttons over there for the footer so as of now we can just define some static buttons like we can have the button over there like this so we have the button from the material ui and then we need to provide a different variant for the button so we can have the variant of something around contain so we have the contained variant and then we can provide the style as well for the sx property so we can have the home page styles once again dot we can have the footer button so here we have the footer button over there and after that let's just move on and let's just define some text like we can have the view articles so here we have the view articles page inside that view articles that would be a link then we can define another button over there so that should be a publish one so we can have publish so we can have the publish one so that would be the thing so here we have the publish one and then we have the footer so so now we can just move on and we can just render these things over there so we can just move on into the home page so we can just search for the home page over there 
and now inside that now after this now we can just render the footer over there after this box so we can have the footer inside that so that will be the footer so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the footer as well we have the view articles we have the publish one and then we can just provide any custom background color for the footer as well so we can provide the background color inside the footer container so that should be on the top so we can provide the bg color that should be equals to so i have copied a hex code from somewhere that you can use so the background color for the footer would be the hash we can have the 404040 so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see that would be the background color for the footer and then you can see we have some padding between the footer and this is because we are rendering the topmost container we have the padding of the six so we can just remove the padding from here and then we can just add the padding inside the wrapper because now we'll be having the padding inside the wrapper and now you can see now so now you can see everything is same and then you can see now we have the footer as well with that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there now we can provide the background color for the button as well so we can provide the bg color that should be equal to the blue violet so that should be the color so if we just save if we move on to the application if we refresh the page then you can see if we just move on to the application now you can see now this color is looking good for the footer buttons and then everything seems to be working perfectly fine now we can also increase the width as well for the button so we can have the width of something around we can give something around 200 would be okay i think so now we have the 200 width and now we can just define the hover as well for the buttons so for the hover we can just move on and define the hover state so we can just move that into the strings then we can just search for the hover and now inside that we'll be having the bg color so that should be equals to we have the hash we have the bd 63 fa so that will be the hover color so if we say if we move on to the application if we refresh the page then you can see now we have the beautiful hover color as well for the buttons so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and after this now we can just move on and we can define the typography as well inside this so we can have the made with love text so we can add the text inside between the buttons so we can have inside the buttons so we can render the typography over here and then with the typography we can render the styles as well so we can have the footer we can have the text so that should be equals to we can have here the font family so we can give the font family that we have we have the work sense and then after that we can provide the font weight so we can have the font weight after that so that should be the 500 and then we can give the font size as well so the font size would be static as of now that should be that 20 and then we can also provide here i think so then we can provide the color as well so the color should be equal to the white inside that and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be defining the text layer so we can have the mate with love and with the love i can just copy a symbol as well so we can have the made with and after that we can copy a love symbol so here we have the love symbol text so this will generate an emoji of the love so we can have the made with love by we have the indian coders or you can give your own name as well so we have the indian coders as well as of now so we'll be having this thing over there so we can just save and then we can move on to the application so here you can see now we have the made with love by indian coders but i think we haven't applied these styles so we need to apply these styles as well so we can have the sx prop over here so for the styling we can have the sx prop over here so we can have the sx that should be equals to we can have the home page again we can have the home page design home page styles dot we can have the footer text so we can have the footer text over there so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have this text over there so we have the made with love by indian coders and then you can see this will be the final footer of our application so we can just zoom to the 100 percent so you can see now everything is working perfectly fine so now we have built the home page of this application and now let's just move on and let's just define the header of this application as well so for the header now what we'll be doing so we need to define another file over here so inside the components we can create another folder that should be the header and inside the header we can just create the header file the main header.tsx so we have the header.tsx over there so now we are into the header.tsx file which is the main file for the header and now inside this file now we'll be defining the component for the header so let's just move on and let's just quickly add the boilerplate code for any component inside the react so here we have the rafce which adds the initial boilerplate code and then we can remove the react import from there because we are already importing the react inside the main file and after that let's just move on and here you can see we have defined the styles for the home page as well so let's quickly do for the header as well so we can have the header dash styles dot ts and inside this file now we'll be rendering this designs or the styles for the header so we can have the const we can have the header styles and that should be equals to and here you can see now we need to define the type as well for the header styles so as we are defining the type inside the home page so we can just quickly export this type as well to use it inside other components as well 
So here we have the header styles and now we can just provide this type of the styles that we can use that we have defined. So here we can have the styles from here. So then you can see now it will be imported from the home page dash styles. And now inside that now we need to define some styles for the header. So we can define these styles like inside the header we'll be using the app bar from the material UI. So what is the app bar? So if we can move on into the app bar page inside the material UI. So you can see the app bar displays the information and actions relating to the current screen. So you can see this is a basic app bar which is a navigation bar of any application. So you can see this is a good navigation bar that is predefined and pre-built with the material UI. And after the app bar then we'll be needing the toolbar as well. Like it increases the width and height of the app bar because the basic app bar is just a basic nav tag from the HTML. So once we add the toolbar inside the app bar, so it extends the functionality of an app bar. So let's just move on and let's just use the app bar and define the styles for the app bar. So we can have the styles for the app bar over there. And the app bar will be having some styles like we can give the position of the header that should be the sticky over there. So we can give the position as the sticky and then now what we can do so we can move on into the header and then we can just render the app bar over there instead of this div. So here we can have the app bar and after the app bar now what we can do so we can just move on and if we just render the hello inside that like this and if we just save and if we move on into the app.tsx which is the main file and here we can just define the header so we can have the header over there. And now inside this header, we can just render the header like this. So here we have the header. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so then you can see, so here you can see now we have the very basic navigation bar inside that. So now you can see now we are only rendering the hello inside that. So this is very basic app bar. And then you can see once we add the toolbar inside the header, because the toolbar extends the functionality and it extends the height as well for the app bar. So we can use the toolbar. So we have the toolbar. So if we just save, if we move on to the application once again, so now you can see now this app bar is looking good. Now we have increased a bit and increased functionality inside the app bar. So the toolbar by default provides a display as the flex as well. So let's just define some styles inside the toolbar. So as we have just discussed earlier inside the paint, that first we'll be rendering the logo of this application and then we'll be rendering some links over there on the right side. So let's just quickly implement that design over there. So for the logo, now what we'll be doing, so we'll be using a package which is a react icons. So we'll be using that package for the logo. So let's just move on and let's install that package as well. So I think we already have that installed like the react icons over there. So we'll be using this package. So let's just move on into the react icons to check about that icon. So we can have the react icons over there. And then you can see here we have the home page of the react icons and there we can just search for the blog icon like blog. And if we just search for the blog, so there you can see there are multiple block available like we have the FA blogger, FA blogger, this. So we have a lot of styles which are available for the blogger. So you can see now this is also looking good like we have the I am blogger. So it is looking like a transparent version. So we can just copy that style over there. So we can just copy that and then we can move on into the header and then we can just render this over there. So we can have the I am blogger from there and then we can render this as a component. And then we need to import it from the react icons so we can use the import we can have something from we can have the react icons so here we have the react icons and then we need to import it from the react icons slash im because we are using the im package from there so now we can directly import the im blogger from there so here we have imported the im blogger so if we just save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we have the icon over there and now let's just move on and let's just quickly give some of the styles as well to the im blogger because the logo like this is not looking good. So we can just provide some customization to the logo. So we can just move on and we can just provide the border radius and then we can give some border radius. So that should be somewhere around, we can give around 50%, like 50% would be enough. And then we can also give the padding as well. So the padding should be something around, again, we can give the 10 pixels. And then as we have provide the border radius, now we can just provide some background color as well. So as of now, we can give any background color that we want, but we'll be changing it later. So we can give background like the red. So if we just save, if we move on to the application. So here you can see now we have this over there. So now we have this, but I think the size is not good. So we can just increase the size as well. We can give the size that should be somewhere around 30 pixels would be enough for the size. So if we just save, so now you can see now this is looking good. So now we have the header over there, but we'll be changing the background color as well. Once we define the functionalities inside the app bar. So now let's just move on. And now we have defined the logo of this application. And now inside the right side, now we'll be defining some of the links. And for the links, we'll be using the tabs from the material UI. So again, what are the tabs? So we can again move on into the MUI.com and there we'll find the tabs. So tabs is just like a button feature inside the links. 
so if i want to show you inside this so here we have the tab so you can see this is like a tab so here we have the functionality of the ripple effect as well so we can choose item one item two item three so we can define some tabs like this so these are the tabs and then you can see these tabs are also looking good so we can define any tab that we want so now let's just move on and let's just define some tabs so after this icon then we can just provide a container for the box so here we have the box container and inside that now we can just provide some styles so we can move on again into the header styles so here we have the header styles so here we can have the tab container so here we have the container and inside this container now what we'll be doing so we'll be providing the width that should be the 100 percent over there we can just provide the margin as well so the margin should be equal to the auto so margin should be auto because we need to align it and then we can just provide the display as well that should be equal to the flex or like what we can do so we can give the margin left that should be equal to the auto so it will be then auto aligned into the right side so here we have the display flex then we can use the justify content so here we have the justify content that should be again inside the center of the screen and then we can use the align items over there so here we have the align items so align items again that should be inside the center so we should export it first so we can have the export const we have the header styles and now let's just quickly implement the style for the app bar as well so we can have the sx that should be equals to we can have the header styles dot we can have the app bar and then we can do same for this as well so we can have the sx that should be equals to we have the header styles dot we can have the tab container so that would be the tab container i think so here we have the tab container and that is same and now after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be defining the functionality for the tabs so we have the parent tabs container like you can see this is a tabs which is a container of all of these tabs so this is not the actual container of the tabs we are just defining it a box container but there the tabs is a parent container which renders the child elements inside that and the child elements start from the tab like this so each child element starts from the tab like this so this is the parent tabs and inside this tabs this holds the values and functionality of this tab element so we can render as many child elements as we want so here you can see now we have the tabs now we can just for the label as well so label of this tab would be equals to we can give like home or we can give a label like we can give we can give label to the blocks as well so we have the label to the blocks and then we can just save and if we move on to the application so here you can see now if we just refresh the page now we have the home and the blocks inside that so you can see now we have this functionality the home and the blocks and if we just move on i think they are coming into the center but i think we can move on into the header styles so we have the justify content that should be equal to the flex and property so if we say if we move on to the application so now you can see now we have the tabs over here we have the home and the blocks over there so you can see now we have defined the tabs and you can see now we have the tabs container over there and as we discussed earlier that the tabs the tabs container holds the value of the tabs so you can see once we click on any tab then that tab is highlighted so if you want to implement this functionality so this tab this tabs holds the value of all of the child elements so it start from the zero like first element would be zero so it is like the array indexings like the first element start from the zero value so this element has the value of the zero so if we provide here the value like this like the value should be equals to the zero then it is referring to this element and then if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see this tab is highlighted like the home is highlighted over there and if we give the value equals to the one so you can see that tab is highlighted and this tab is highlighted because the by default background color of the material UI is the blue so we are giving the blue color for that tab as well and we have the background color as the blue same so we are not seeing anything with that so if we just move on and if we just provide a different color for this tabs container so we can give the indicator color that should be equal so we can give the secondary and then we can also provide the text color as well so here we have the text color and that should be equal to we can give the inherit property so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now the blocks is highlighted because now we have given the value as the one so that's why the blocks is now highlighted inside that and if we give the value as the two from here then you can see now we don't have any two tab because we have the indexes from the zero and the one but if we give the value as the zero once again then the first tab would be highlighted like this so now you can see now the home is highlighted so that's how we can just provide some values but if we want to just dynamically change on any tab like if we click on the blocks then the block should be highlighted so we need to provide that functionality as well so for that we need to use this state so for that we can use this state like this so we can have the use state snippet we can have the first so first should be equal to the value the set value property and initial value would be the zero and then we can import the use state as well from the react 
so we can move on into the top and then we can just import something from we can have the react so that should be equals to we can have the use state hook so here we have the use state hook and now let's just move on and there you can see now initial value would be the zero so we can give the value as the value itself so we have here so here we have the value so once we click on any different tab inside that then a callback is fired so we need to catch that callback so that callback is available inside the parent tabs container so here we have the parent tabs and inside this container now it holds the value of that callback so the callback that fired is on change so here we can just handle the on change so we can have the function over there so inside this function the first parameter that we get is the event by default event and the second parameter that we get is the actual value of the tab which is highlighted so we can get the value from there and after that we can just store the value there so we can have the set value that should be equal to the value that we have so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the home and the blocks so you can see once we click now the blocks then you can see now the blocks is highlighted and once we click on the home then you can see now the home is highlighted so that's how it works so that's how the tab works inside the material ui and after that you can just provide your own callback function to this tab as well like here we are running some of the tabs, or you can just provide an array of the links inside that to render some of the tabs now you can see now this functionality is implemented and now let's just move on and let's just define some background color a different background color for this app bar and for this icon as well and let's complete the functionality for the header so let's just move on here inside the header styles and there you can see now we are running the app bar property so here we can give a different color so the color would be equals to so we can give the background color and that color would be equals to hash we can have the 404040 so we have this hex code over there so if we just save so now you can see now we have this over there so now you can see now we have this background for the header and let's just move on and let's just change the color for this icon as well for this logo of this application so this logo will contain a specific hex code so we can move on into the home page styles so we can move on into the header and there you can see now we are providing the background color as the red but that should be equals to we can have hash we can have the 6c5252 so if we just save if we move on to the application so now we have this background color for the logo and then you can see now this color is also looking good and it is matching to the background color as well and here you can see inside the tabs we provided the secondary color for the highlighting so you can also change that color as well so you can have the indicator color that should be equal to the primary as well so if you provide the primary then you can see now we have the primary color as well and if you want to provide your own color to that then you can use the components prop and then you can have the highlighter like this like here we can have the props so we have the tab indicator props and then we can just provide the property for the color you can provide your own color like this like the red so if we save so if we move on to the application if and if we remove it from here so if we just move on i think we have here the style property so we can give the style and that should be equals to we can give the color so that should be equals to we can give the red i think or what we can do so we can give the background like this so we can have the background and if we just save if we move on to the application so now you can see now this will be the color like this so now that's how you can just define the colors inside this so we have the background color for the highlighter so that's how you can just provide your own highlighter color with that so that's how it works and then you can just provide the white color as well like the white and if we just save so now you can see now this color is also looking good so we can keep this color only and if you do not want this ripple effect then you can also remove that as well so we need to provide the disable ripple property to each tab if you want to disable the ripple effect like there you can see we can have the disable ripple and then you can see once we will save once we'll move on to the application so there you can see once we just click on the blocks then we have the ripple effect so once we click on the home so you can see now we do not have any ripple effect inside the home only inside the blocks we have the effect and now we can just choose that inside the blocks as well like this we can have the disable ripple property and after the home and the blocks now we'll be defining the login button as well so for the login button let's just define the functionality for the login and after the tabs now we can define the functionality for the sign up button or for the login button so after that now we need to import the button after the tabs so we can have the button over there so here we have the button and after that we can just provide some styles for the button as well so we can move on again into the header styles we can have for the author button we can have the authentication button inside that we can provide these styles like margin from the left we can give around one or two something like one would be enough because the one is the eight pixels then we can give the background color for the button so bg color of the button would be hash d2 that should be equals to the 7e 20 so that should be the background color for the button then we can just provide the front color the text color that should be equals to the white 
then we can also move on we can give the border radius for this button so the border radius should be 20 then we can give the width as well so the width will be somewhere around 80 pixels would be okay the 80 would be enough then we can just provide the hover state as well for the button so here we have the hover and inside the hover we need to apply some styles like the hover will be having the background color so the background color for the hover we can give the double f nine four double zero so that will be the background color for the hover and after that let's just move on and let's just define the styles for the button so here we have the button we can give the sx that should be equals to we can give the header styles so that should be equals to we can have the auth button over there and after that we can just provide the text for the button like we can give the auth so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the auth like this so here we have the home we have the blocks and then we have the auth so that's how we can just provide some functionalities like this so i think we can again move on into this into the header styles so we can give the margin left as a two so if we just save if we move on to the application so now you can see now we have the styles for the authentication as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and after that we can just provide an icon to the button as well so for the icon again we can move on into the react icons we can move on into the react icons property into the react icons so we can search for the login like this and then you can see this login is looking good like we can use this login property or this login property is looking good so we can just copy that and then we can move on into the header we can paste that over here so we need to import something so the something would be this from it should be imported from the react icons slash we can have here the bi because we are importing the icon from the bi package so we have the bi and after that we can just write the end icon so that should be equals to we have the bi login software so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the authentication like this so now we have the icon over there and now let's just move on and let's just increase the width of that button like somewhere around 90 so that should be enough so if we just save so you can see now we have the authentication button like this so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have built the header of this application so you can see now this is the final home page of this application and now let's just move on and let's just implement the routing functionality inside this header so how can we implement the routing so we can move on again into the react router so here we have the react router package inside the react to enable the routing so here we have the version of this 6.8 and then what we can do is we can just import this package so we can install this package and then we can just implement the routing inside our whole application so for that we can move on into our application and then we can move into the terminal we can select a new terminal from there we can move on into the front end and then we can just install the router so we can have the npm install that should be the react dash router dash tom so this will be the package that we need to install and now let's just install this package first so now the react router has been installed and now let's just move on and let's just implement the routing functionality inside that so now we need to wrap the whole application with the router so where we can do that so either we can do that into the app so we can just provide the topmost container to wrap everything with the router or we can move on into the main file where we are rendering the root and from here we can implement the routing functionality so here inside the first so we can move to the top and then we can just import something so we can just import something from the react router dom and the something would be equals to we need to import the browser router so we have the browser router that we can import so now what we can do so we can just wrap the whole application the whole application with this with the browser router so that this context will be giving all of the values to this so now let's just move on and let's just implement the browser router here so we can have the browser router and now let's just wrap everything with that so here we have the so here we have the browser router and now the app component will be having the browser routing functionality and in the app we are rendering all of the sub components so here you can see now nothing will be changed inside our application because we haven't defined any of the specific routes so now we have the routing functionality inside that but now we need to provide and we need to register some of those routes so where can we do that so inside the app component then we can register all of those routes so here you can see now we have the header and the header and the footer would be available throughout the application so what we can do so we have provided the footer inside the home page so that was our mistake so what we can do so we can just move on and we can just copy the footer from here we can cut that footer from here and then we can just render the footer inside the app component so like here you can see now we are rendering the home page then we can provide the footer and inside this footer now we can render the footer like this so that will be the footer so now the footer would be available throughout the application so there won't be any change because we only have the single page as of now so we won't be having any effect and now let's just move on and let's just define the main content like this so here we have the main tag and inside this main now we'll be rendering all of those routes because now the header would be available throughout the application and that's of course same applies for the footer 
but not for the main content. So now we'll be rendering all of the dynamic content of all of the dynamic pages inside this main tag. So for that, let's just implement the routing. So for implementing the routing, we use the routes. So the routes is a container inside this. So we can just provide a container like this. So here we have the routes. So we need to implement the routes over here. So it is a container and this should be available from the React Router package. And it is a container and it is same like the tabs inside the material UI. So as we provided the parent component tabs and then we rendered each child element inside that. So that's how the routing as well works. So here we have the parent container to implement the routing. And this is a container for registering all of those routes. Then we can just register the routes. So we can have each single route like this. So we can have the route as well. Like this, we can have the route. And route as well will be imported from the React Router DOM. So we need to import like this. Like here, the first prop that we need to provide is the path of this route to register. So here we have the path and that should be equal. So we can have the slash because now the slash will be the home route. So we can provide the slash. And here we need to render the element that should be equals to so we can render the element of the home. So here we have the home page like this. So here we'll be rendering the element like this, like the home page. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we are rendering the home page inside this route. And then you can see once we add anything like home like this, so then you can see then it won't be available there. So you can see now we have the header and the footer, but the content is not available there. And now let's just move on and let's just define like this. So here we have the home. And after that, let's just move on and let's just provide the routes for the blocks as well. So we can just copy that. We can just paste again. We can have this slash. We can have the blocks. So here we can have the slash blocks and then we can create a component for the blocks as well. So here we have the components. We can create another folder that should be the blocks. And inside that we can have the block.tsx, which is the main page. We can have the blocks.tsx like this. So that will be the main page for the blocks. And here we can render the RFC for the initial setup. And then we can move on into the app and then we can just register the blocks like here. So we can have the blocks like here, like this. And then we need to implement the functionality. The home blocks are completed. Then we need to implement for the authentication as well. So for that, let's just create another route over there. We can just copy and paste. And then we have the path that should be equals to we can get the auth. And the auth, the element that we need to render is again, we can create another folder. That should be the auth. And inside this auth, now we can just render here the auth.js. So inside the auth.js, now we'll be again rendering the default setup like the RAFCE. And then again, we'll be moving on into the app.tsx. We need to render here the auth. So here we have the auth with that. So if we just save, if we just move on to the application. So here you can see once we are into the localhost 3000, now we are rendering the home component. But once we move on into slash blocks, then you can see now we'll be rendering the blocks over there. So you can see now we have the blocks like this over here. Here we have the blocks. And now let's just move on and let's just move on to the auth. So there you will see now we'll be rendering the auth over there like this. So that's how it works inside the material UI. So here we have the auth. So now we have implemented all of the routing pages inside that. And now let's just move on and let's just define some functionality in which once we click on the home, so then we should be moved on into the home. Once we click on the blocks, we should be moved on to the blocks and same for the authentication. So for that, we need to move on into the header where we are rendering all of the tabs. So for routing, we can provide a separate link component like this. So we have the link component and there we need to provide the link component that is a link and that should be imported from the React Router DOM. So the link is available from the React Router DOM that we need to provide. So we can import something. We can have import something from the React Router DOM like this. And after that, that should be equals to the link. So here we have the link. So what the link component will do. So it will apply the styles of this tab but the whole functionality of the routing of the link that we have imported. So inside the link, now we have the prop of the two. So that should be equals to, we can just provide a, a string that should be slash home or like slash nothing after that. So we have the two prop like this. So there you can see if we just save, if we just move on to the application. So you can just skip that error as of now. So you can see once we will move on and once we click on the home, then you can see now we are moved on into the home page. So that's how it works. So you can see we have provided the component of the link. Now it is using the functionality of this link router and we can now provide all of the props of this link to the tab component as well. We have provided it too. So that's how this works inside the material UI. So if we just move on again into slash, we can have the auth and then you can see once we click again into this, into the home, then you can see now we are into the home. So that's how it works. We can do same for the blocks as well. So here we have the blocks. So we can do same for this as well. So here we have the link that should be equals to we can give the two. 
that should be the blocks like this so that's how we can provide these things and now you can see now we are getting again the type errors like this property is not supported but this is supported inside the material ui now what we can do so again we can just provide a new comment that can be at the rate ts that should be the ignore so we can just provide this comment over there so it will just ignore this type checking over the next line and we can do same for this as well like we have the ts ignore so it will just ignore the type checking for the same line so if we just save so now you can see now we do not have any error with that so now we have the home page and the functionality is working fine so we can move on into the blocks like this now we run to the blocks page if we can move on into the home now you can see now we are into the home page so that's how it works and now we need to implement same for this as well for the auth for the button of the auth now what we'll be doing so here we have the button so now we need to do the same for this button as well so once we need to click on the auth then we should be moved on into the auth page so like what we can do with that so inside the button as well we have the link component like this so here we have the link component and if you do not want to use the link component over there so there's another method so what you can do so you can just provide the link from the material ui so you have the link like this so you can import the link and then you can just wrap the button inside this link so you can just wrap the button inside the whole link component like this and then what you can do so this should be there like here we need to provide the link like this so that will be the link and then you can just provide the prop of the two inside the link that should be equal to slash auth so you have two methods to provide these links as well like first i have shown you that how can you do with the link component and second you can just wrap the functionality with this and we haven't done that with the tabs because once we move on to a different tab then we need to change their values so the values won't be supported with the link so that's why we have used the link component inside the tab so here we have the button we are providing the two that should be auth so you can see once we click on the button then you can see now we are into the auth route so that's how it works and now let's just move on and let's just provide some styles to the link so we can have the style over there and then we can just provide the text decoration that should be equal so we can have the none so what it will do so it will remove the underline from the auth so now you can see now the routing functionality is working perfectly fine inside our application so you can see we are into the auth like this so once we click on the home now we are into the home page once we click on the blocks now we are into the blocks once we click on the auth now we are into the auth so routing is working fine and everything is working totally fine and now we need to work on the blocks page and the authentication page first so now let's just move on and let's just define all of these stylings and their functionalities so now we have built the functionality of the routing we are now capable of doing the routing inside our application we can click on the home we are into the home route we can move on into the blocks now we are into the blocks route and same for the auth so now let's just move on and let's just quickly move on into the blocks so here we need to define some stylings for the blocks as well but before that now we need to move on so now we need to fetch all of the blocks from the backend so what do we need to do so as we discussed earlier that for fetching the data for integrating with the graphql backend we need the apollo client so for that we'll be moving on and we'll be searching for the apollo client so the apollo client is there in which we can just create a connection between the front end to the graphql so we can have here the apollo client and you can also use the fetch as well with the graphql no worries but the apollo client gives you a lot of functionalities like it gives you the custom hook which fetches the data and if you get an error it will give you the error inside that and it will give you the loading as well with that so there's a lot of functionalities with the apollo client so we can just click on the get started and then you can see the setup is we have already created a new react.js application so now what we can do so we need to install these two packages the apollo client and the graphql itself so we can just copy that and then we can just move on into our application so here we are into this application and now let's just quickly move on and there you can see now we can move on into the terminal we can just paste that command over here like the npm installed and we need to install these two libraries from there so let's just quickly wait for this now you can see now the apollo client and the graphql has been installed inside the front end application and now again as we did with the router so we need to move on into the main file which is the index dot tsx we have the index.ts file and from there now we need to do one more thing like as we did with the browser router we need to do same for the apollo client so apollo client has a provider that we can use so it context has a provider so we need to use as the provider and then we need to wrap everything with that provider so let's just move on and let's just import something so we can import something so that should be equals to for the apollo client so here at the rate apollo client that we have and after that you can see now we have the apollo client and inside that what we'll be doing so we'll be just importing the provider so we can have here the provider from the apollo client so we have the apollo provider like this so here we have the apollo provider and now we need to just move on we need to just wrap everything with the apollo provider like this and after that the apollo provider needs a prop which is the client 
so we need to provide the client prompt and for the client we need to create a new instance of the apollo client because we'll be using the apollo for fetching the data for mutations for queries with the graphql so we need to define the client so we can have the const we can have the client so that should be equals to a new instance of the apollo client so here we have the apollo client and these are the same steps that are available inside this as well and then you can also follow this guide as well like the const client and then you can just implement the functionality like this like the client.query so then it is implementable with this as well but you can also provide here the apollo provider to the whole application so you can do with this method as well so you have it the apollo client and after that we can just quickly move on and we can provide the uri so we need to provide the uri for the backend so what is the uri for the backend so we need to define the uri so the uri for the backend as of now is the http we have the local host the port of the 5000 over there and then we have the slash graphql with that we have the slash graphql so we need to provide the cache inside that because the apollo client stores the data inside the cache as well so we can provide the cache and that should be equals to the new in memory cache and this is available again inside the apollo client so that's how we provide the client inside that so the client contain two objects the first is the uri property the url for the backend and then second we need to provide the cache that we can use so here we have the in memory cache so once we refresh the application then the cache would be removed and after that we have here the client so we can provide the client that should be equals to this client so that will be the functionality of this apollo provider and now let's just move on into the blog apps so here we have here the block.ts page block.tsx and here we can just fetch the data of all of the blocks from the backend so how can we do that so again we can just provide the new folder inside the components that can be equals to we have here or we can just provide the query so we can have the graphql like this we have the graphql and with that inside that now what we'll be doing so we'll be providing a queries like we can have the queries like this so we can have the queries dot we can have the ts so now we have the queries file and now to generate a query inside that now what do we do so first we can just again move on into this so here you can see from this how can we connect our backend to this so they have also used the apollo provider and then you can see we fetch the data with the use query hook so we need to provide the use query hook but before that we need to provide the query so here you can see now with that they have provided a query like this so you can have the get users get blocks or anything like that and then you provide the gql and it should be imported from the apollo client and then this provides you a query so then you provide a query like this like the get locations so this is the name of the function and this is the actual query from the graphql like here we have the locations so we can use our blocks as well like this so let's just move on and let's just define all of the queries inside a separate file so here we can have the queries of const we can have the get blocks and then this will be the query and then we need to import the gql from the apollo client so we can move on again we can import something from we can have at the rate apollo client like this so we need to import the gql from there like the graphql and then we need to provide the gql like this here and after that you can see we do not need to call this we need to provide the template returns after that so here we need to provide the template returns so we can have the template returns like this and there we need to provide the query for getting all of the blocks as we did inside the graphql interface so as we did inside the graphql interface now we can provide the query like we provide the object of the query and inside that now what we did so we did as the blocks like this like for getting the blocks and after that we can get the id of that block we can just get the title of that block we can just get the user property as well like the user associated with that block and then we can get the name of that user as of now so this will be a default query as of now so now we have this query of get blocks now we can just export this query as well like this we can have the export and now let's just move on into the main file where we need to use this query so we need to use this query inside the blocks so we are into the blocks and then to make a query to the graphql we use the use query hook we have the use query hook which is a very good hook provided to you by the apollo client so it gives you a lot of functionalities like the loading the error the data removing caches and reloading the whole query so that's how we can just use this so we need to just use here the use query hook so we can have that so we need to destructure something it should be equal to from the use query so we can import the use query from here so we can import the use query from we have the apollo client we need to use the use query hook so here we have the query and after that we can just run the query so here we have the use query and then inside the first parameter we have the use query hook and then we have the use mutations as well inside the apollo client like you can have the use mutation 
like this so with the use query you create a query with the use mutation you have the mutation of the graphql so we only need the use query as of now now inside that you can see the first parameter that we need to send is you can see the whole query that we have so we can give the whole query so we can give the query of get blocks like this so we have the get blocks so that will be the use query as of now so here we can just save and then you can see now the things we need to destructure is three things first is the loading so once the query is currently loading then we'll be getting the loading property as the boolean like true or false and then we have the data like the exact data of this query and then we get here the error like if we get the error then we'll be getting the error with that and there are a lot of properties like the refetch to refetch the whole page and we have a lot of variables that we'll be using later so as of now we have three properties the loading data and the error and after that we can just check something like if it is loading state if it is currently in the loading state then we can just return a p as of now that it is currently loading like this and then if we get an error then we can just provide the error like this so we can have the error then we'll be having some error like this error and after that when we'll be having some data then we'll be returning the data inside that so we can have the data like this so we can also log the data as of now like here we can have the blocks and then we'll be having the data like this so we'll be having the log of the data like this so if we just save if we move on to the application and then we need to just move on and we need to just open the server as well because now you can see now we have the error and we can just move on into the backend here we, we need to create another terminal and then we can move on into the cd into the backend like here we have the block backend and inside that we can just choose here the npm run dev so it will just run the backend inside the development server and let's just watch if everything works fine or not so here you can see now the server is open on the port of the 5000 so we can just recheck the url as well like the index.tsx where the local host 5000 slash graphql everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we'll be moving on into the blocks we'll be closing other files and now let's just move on into this page if we refresh this and if we move on into the inspect if we move on into the console so here you can see now we are getting the error for the course because now the course error is like one server cannot access the another server so because we are using the front end localhost 3000 so localhost 3000 cannot make request to the localhost 5000 so that's why it is giving us the course error so here we need to bypass this error so how can we do that so we can just move on into the main like here we have the block backend and inside that we need to install the course to bypass this error so we can just create another terminal we can just move on cd into the block backend here we have the block backend and inside that we can install the course libraries so we can have the course like this so we need to let it install and after that let's just move on into the backend again so here we have the source inside the backend we have the app.ts which is the main file so here now what do we need to do so here we need to import the course so we can have import the course from the course as we have just installed so from it should be the course and after the course now what do we need to do so here we have defined the express and this is the first middleware for the express so now even before the first middleware then we'll be defining the middleware for the course to bypass all of the course errors so we can have the app dot use that should be equals to the course so like this you can use the course like this and then you can just call like this and then if you have a different server if you want to inject the server then you can just provide some options so you can just call that course like this so here we have the course and now we need to just save and i think we need to provide the declaration file as well so for that we can just again install the declaration file so we can have the npm we can have the npm installed we can have at the rate types slash course like this and then we need to install it inside the development dependencies so we can have slash d after that and then we can just install that and then you can see now the error is now gone so now we do not have that error and if you want some more functionalities and you need to provide some more options then you can just provide some credentials like if you want to send the http cookies then you can provide credentials methods the origin so what we can do so we can keep it default and let's just move on into the main file into this so here you can see now we are again back into the front end if we just refresh the application once again so there you can see now we got the data so here you can see finally we got the data inside that we got the blocks so here you can see we have the id of the block we have the title and the user property is null because maybe we didn't have the user once we created this block and then we can just check the first properties so here you can see now we are getting the id we are getting the title 
we are getting the details for the user as well. We provided the name of that user. Then we are getting the name like this. So if we just check the query, we provide the ID title. Then we have the username. So everything seems to be working fine. So here you can see now this is a big step ahead that we have accomplished. So now we have integrated the front end to the back end. Now we can just get the data from here. You can see now we are getting the full data like this. We are getting the array of the blocks and everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And let's just quickly define the blocks like this. So now just quickly move on and quickly design the blocks page. And then we'll be just fetching all of the blocks and then we'll be rendering all of the data of that blocks. So let's just quickly design the blocks as well. So now we are getting the blocks data here. So you can see inside the blocks, we are getting a key of the blocks. And inside that we are getting two elements of the array that we have inside the database. And everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And now let's just move on and let's just define a list component as well in which we can render the list of the blocks here inside this page. So let's move on and let's define the component. So here we can move on to the blocks folder. We can define new component over there like the block list dot tsx. So that will be the component where we will rendering the list. And after that we can run the RFCE for the boilerplate code. And here we can remove the react import from here. And now let's just move on and let's just define the type. So we'll be accepting the props of the type of the props. So now we'll be defining the type props here inside this. So in the top, we can define the type like we can have a type of the props. So that should be equal to the type. And now inside this type, now we need to accept the array of the blocks. Inside each block array, now what are the things that we have? So we have the ID, title, we have the user, we have the comments. So there are a lot of things that we have over here. So like now we can move on into the backend to see what are the properties that we have inside the block. So we have the title, content, date, user, comments. So there are a lot of things. So let's just define their types as well inside the front end. So let's just move on into. So here we have the source file and here inside the source. Now we can create a new file. We can create a new folder that can be the types. And inside it, now we can define the file as the types.ts. So we have the types.ts and inside this types, now we'll be defining all of the types that we require inside this application. So let's move on and let's just define the type for the user. So we can have the type, we can have the user type like this. So that should be equal to, so what are the properties that we have inside the user? We have the name is the string, we have the ID. Again, that's the string. So we have the email as well. So we have the email and that is of the property of the string. Then we have the block area as well. So we can define the block like this. We have the blocks and the blocks are a specific type. So for the blocks now we'll be defining as empty array as of now. And then we'll be defining the comments as an empty array as of now. So now we need to give the specific types to the block and the comments. So let's just move on and let's just define their types. So now we can just define the type for the block. So we can have the type that can be the block type. So that should be equal to, so inside the blocks now, what are the properties that we have? So we have the ID, we have the type of the string. We have the title of the block. So the title is also the string. We have the content of the block. So the content is also the string part over there. So we have the date for the string. And then after that, now we have the user as well. So we can define the user. So the user is of the type of the user type that we have defined. So here we have the user type inside that. And now let's just move on and let's just define the comments as well. So here we have the comments of the block. So the comments will be defining an empty array as of now. And now let's just move on and let's just define the type for the comments. So we can have the type. We can have the comments like this. So we can have the comment type over here. And inside that now we can have your I think we have the text of the comment. So the text is type of the string. Then we have the date for the comment. So the date is type of the date. So we have the date, then we have the block. So block can be of the type of the block type that we have defined. Then we have the user. So user will also be the type of the user type that we have defined. So here we have the user and same would apply here as well. So here we have the comment. So that will be array of the comment type. So here we have the comment type. We can define the array of the comment types over here. And now we can move on and here as well, we need to define the block. We have the block type array and same for the comments. So we can have the comment type array like this. So that will be the type definitions inside our applications as of now for the blocks. And now let's just move on and let's just export these types as well. So we can export all of these types like this. So we can export this as well, this as well, this as well. So we can have the export type and all of these types. So now we are exporting these types. And now let's just move on into the block list. So here we have the block list. So here we'll be accepting the props of the blocks. So here we can have the blocks that will be type of the block type. So we can have the block type over here like this. That will be an array of the block types like this. So we have this an array with that. And now let's just move on. And first we can just render this array like this. So we can render the props dot blocks key over there. So we can have the blocks 
like this and then we can move on into the main blocks component and then you can see once we are getting all of the data so if we get the loading then we are loading something if we are getting error then we are showing an error and then if we are getting the data then we are rendering all of the things and this return statement so now let's just move on and let's just remove this and let's just now run the block list component here so here we can call the block list component like this so here we have the block list and inside that now we'll be defining the blocks like this so here we have the blocks and that should be the data dot blocks like this so that will be the data dot blocks so if we save if we move on to the application and if we just check once again so here you can see now we are getting the array of the blocks inside that so here we have the my new block and then you can see now we have this block so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over here so now before moving ahead into the design part of this block list now you need to do one thing so here you can see now we have just dummy blocks over here like we have just tested these blocks like the my new block we have the user property null we have the id we don't have any comments so now i want to add some real blocks inside that so you can have some real blocks like the learn typescript learn javascript learn c sharp or anything with that so you can write some of the blocks like around four or five blocks would be enough so you can write these blocks like this so let's just move on and let's just come back after defining all of that blocks inside the database so now you can see i have added a couple of blocks inside that so you can see inside the graphql i added a couple of blocks with this and then you can see there are a couple of blocks like my new block and then you can see we have the learning javascript we have the golang is popular we have the everything about python no stopping for react graphql for 2023 so you can see now these are some new blocks that we have so we can just now move on into our application so now we have a couple of blocks inside that so if we refresh this page then you can see inside the blocks area now we'll be having a lot of blocks over there so you can see now we have over six blocks inside that so we have the block type we have everything with that and now let's just move on and let's just design the blocks page inside our application so when to design the blocks page here so we can again move on into the block list so here we have the block list component over there we can close every other file and now let's just move on and let's just define some styles for the block list so here we have the styles so we can have the block list we can have the styles dot ts and inside this now we'll be defining some styles so we can have the const we can have the block styles over there and that should be equals to so here the type would be equals to the styles that we have defined and after that now let's just move on and let's just define the properties like first we'll be having some container so here we have the container over there and for the container we will be defining some styles like the display property that should be equals to the flex so we'll be using the flex box for the display and then we'll be having the justify content into the center so we need to justify all this content inside the center we can have the gap property so the gap property would be the 10 of the gap and then we can have the flex wrap because we'll be having some wrap items because we'll be having a lot of items over there so we can provide the flex wrap to the wrap so it will wrap all of the items on the on the row and then we can have here the empty we can have the margin from the top that should be the one we can have the margin from the bottom again that should be the one so these are the properties for the container and then we'll be using some styles as well for the cards and a lot of things so let's just define one by one so here we have the block list and first now what we can do so here we can just run all of the blocks over there so here you can see now we have the list container inside this so we can have the list container and after that we'll be defining a separate component for each block so for that we can have the block item so we have the block item dot tsx over there so we can have the tsx and inside that again we can have the refc and here we'll be accepting the prop like we have the type props uh type props that should be equal to the block itself so we can have the block like this and then the block will be of type of the block type like this so we'll be having the type like this and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be defining some styles over there so inside this now we'll be defining some cards over there so what we can do inside that so we can define the card over there like this so that should be the card and inside that now we'll be defining some of those styles so inside this card now we'll be having a lot of properties like we can move on again into the block styles and let's just define the style for the card so here we have the card so we can define some of the properties like we can have the display so that should be the display so it should be the display and that should be the flex property so we'll be using the flex block for the display again we can have the flex direction into the column basis so we need the items on the bottom of each other we can have here the height as well so we can define height for the each block so that should be somewhere around 70 viewport height for each block then we'll be having the transition as well so we'll be having some transitions effects so we'll be having some animation effects like this with the transition so we can have the transform so the transform would be equals to and then we can give the one second for that 
and now what we can do so here we can define the hover as well for each card so we can have the hover and with the hover again we'll be using the transform property that we defined over here so the transform would be equals to we can have the scale so that should be equals to we can have the 1.02 of the scale of for each block and after that we'll be moving on we'll be defining the box shadow over there so the box shadow would be somewhere around we can give around 10 pixels horizontally 10 pixel vertically 20 pixels of the blur and the color would be hash triple c for the shadow so that will be our thing so that will be our design for the blocks and after that we'll be having some header for the card so we can have the header so we can have the card header over there like this and inside the header now what we'll be having so we'll be having the font family so as of now we can just use any font like we have in the box sense like this so we can have the box sense and after that we'll be using the different font for this card header so and then we can define the font size as well so here we have the font size and the property is the 72 pixels for the font size so we can define the 72 pixels we can define the height as well for the header so the height would be somewhere around around 35 percent of the exact height we can define for the height like 35 percent of this and then we can have a lot more properties like we can have the padding as well and the padding would be equivalent to the eight pixels over there so that will be all for the card header and now we'll be having some card content as well so here we have the card we have the content and for the content part for the card i think we can provide some styles like we can give the width for somewhere around we can give the width of 80 percent so the width would be somewhere around 80 percent like this for the whole card and then we'll be defining the height as well so the height would be equivalent to 100 percent of the card so the 100 percent for the height and we can move on we can define the font size once again for this so the font size would somewhere around 20 pixels would be enough for the content and then we'll be using the font weight as somewhere around i think 500 would be enough and then we'll be using a different font family inside the content so here we have all of these styles for the cards inside that inside this and now let's just move on into the block item so here you can see now we are rendering the card now inside this sx we'll be having the block list styles over there so we have the block list i think we haven't exported that as of now so we can export this variable as well so we can have the export and then we can use that inside this so we can have the block styles dot card property with that so we have the card with that and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be defining a lot more things like we'll be having a box once again inside this for that and this box will be having the styles like we can define for the card header so the header will be a box inside that so we can have yeah, the sx property for this so we can have the sx like this and that should be somewhere around we can give the block styles once again dot we can have the card header so we have the header of the card and inside that we'll be using another box for i think the we can define the title of that block as well so we'll be using another box over there so we have this box and inside that now we'll be using the typography so here we'll be having the typography of the material ui and inside that we can just render the whole content of this block and now in this typography now we'll be defining the date and now this should be equals to now the props dot block dot date over there so we can add the date and then we can just convert the date into the date string as well so we can have the two date string with that so we'll be rendering the string like this and after this now we can just define the content of this block so after this block then again we'll be having the typography where we'll render the actual content of that block so what we can do so we need to define these styles for this typography as well so we can again move on into this like the block list styles over there and inside that we can have here the content or here here we can have the title over there like we can have the title of this block so we'll be having some styles like we can define somewhere we can give the font weight so we can give the font weight of somewhere around 600 so we need a little bit bolder font then we can have the margin properties so the margin property should be the one then we can have here the color as well so the color would be the white and then we'll be just having the text transform property so we'll be having text transform transform should be there and then we'll be transforming this text to the uppercase so we can have the uppercase like this and after that now what can we do so we can define the text decoration as well so that should be the underline so we'll be having the underline inside the text decoration and after this now we can just define some offset as well for this so we can have the offset for text underline so that should be the text underline offset so that should be somewhere around five pixels over there so these are the properties i think and then we can define the font family very important so we can have the font family over there so that should be somewhere around again we can use the work sense over there but we'll be changing this font later so we can have the work sense as of now so we have the work sense so these are the things for the font as of now and then we can also define some shadows as well like this so we can give the text shadow so the text shadow property would be somewhere around two pixels inside the horizontal 
and somewhere around 7 pixels vertical we can define around 20 pixels of blur and then we can use the property of hash triple c like this so we'll be having these styles for the title and now let's just move on and let's just apply these styles like in like here in the typography we'll be defining the variant as well so the variant would somewhere around we can give the h4 and after that let's provide the sx prop so that should be the block styles so we can have the block styles over there like this and dot we can have the title over there so we can have the block styles or title and inside that now we'll be rendering the title of this block so we'll be having the block like this we can have the props dot block dot title like this so we have this title and after this now we can just render the content of this blog as well so after this typography then we can define another box over there so another container and inside that we can provide the sx prop so that should be equals to so we can have the block styles over there dot we can have the card content so that should be the card content and inside that as well we can provide the typography once again so here we have the typography and this time we can just provide some different variant over there i think so the variant can be same but here we can just define some styles again like we can again move on into this so we have the content typography we have the content text over there and inside the content text now we can just provide the padding that should be the two from all of the styles from all of the sites then we can have a the font size of somewhere around we can give the 20 pixels of the font size then we can move on we can give the font weight property as well so the weight would be somewhere around 500 would be enough for this so we have the weight of the 500 with that and after that now let's just move on into the blog item and there we'll be rendering the sx prop like we can have the block styles once again so here we have the block styles and here we can give here the style of this like we have added the content text so that should be the content text and here inside that now we'll be rendering the props dot we can have the block dot content over there so the whole content would be rendered inside this typography so the whole content would be added inside this typography so that's it for the blog item as of now and if we just move on into the parent components so here we are getting the blocks over there so what we can do here we can just render the main parent over here we can have the main container like this so we can have the box which will be the main container we can define the style we can have the sx prop so that should be we can have the block styles so dot we can have the container so here we have the container for all of the blocks and inside that now what we'll be doing so we'll be rendering all of the blocks so we can have the props dot we can have the blocks dot we can have here the maps so we'll be using the map for returning the whole array items and inside that now what we'll be doing so we'll be just rendering the each block over there like block and after that now what we'll be doing so inside the callback now we'll be rendering the blocks like this so here we have the block item inside this we can render the block item like this so that will be the thing and then we can just provide the property block to the block so we can have the block that should be equals to the block that we have and inside this now we'll be getting the type of the block as the block type so we can define the type as well like this so here we have the block type so if we just save if we move on to the application i think we are not getting anything over there if we just move on into the blocks so here we have the blocks and there we are getting the data of the blocks but i think we are getting an error like cannot read properties of undefined two day string i think what we can do so we can just move on into the blog list and there you can see we can just check our condition like when we have the props dot blocks dot length is greater than zero then only we need to render something so we can have this condition over there and then if we just save if we move on to the application once again so here you can see again we are getting the error for the two date string so we can just check the two date string as well inside this so here we have the blog item so now we can just check like props.block.date two date string or what we can do so so i think we haven't done this i think what we can do so we can first wrap this inside a date so we can have a new date over there so we can have the new date like this and then we can just render the two date string so if we just save so here you can see now we are getting all of the blocks over there so you can see all of the blocks are there like this so you can see these blocks are not looking good but we got something inside that so you got my new blog we have the learning javascript we have the golang we have the graphql for this we have here the no stopping for the react everything about python so you can see now we are getting all of the blocks so we can just fix the designing part for all of the blocks so let's just fix the design part so now you can see now we are getting the data inside that so you can see now we have all of the blocks and we are rendering the block item component for each card over there and then you can see it is looking very ugly so you can see we do not have any styling over there and then you can see it's not overall looking good and now what can we do so first you can see first we do not have the content inside each block and we do not have the date and why because if we just move on into the queries so here we have the queries so we only access the properties of the id and the title so we need to access the properties of the date as well of the content as well 
So let's just add these properties. So we can have the date over there and we can have the content over there as well. So here we have the content. So if we just save, if we refresh, so here you can see now we're getting the content as well. So you can see learning JavaScript and then you can see now we have the content as well with that. But here you can see still we are getting the invalid date. So what we can do, so first we can just check with the debugger. So we can move on into the sources tab. So here you can see this file is open, the blog item. So what we can do is first we can just add a debugger here, like uh, we can add the debugger where we are adding the date. So here we have the date. And after that, let's just make some space for the console as well. So here with the console. So if we just save, if we again move on into the blocks, so here you can see now we have the debugger over there. So the debugger is paused at this line. So we can just check where is the line. So here you can see now we have the debugger. We have the new date. And after that, the new date, now what can we do? So first we can just run the props here. So we can have the props dot we have the blog over there. So here we have the blog. And then we can just check if we are getting the date or not. So we can just access the property of the date. So here you can see now we are getting the date, but still we are getting the invalid date over there. We can just check that we are rendering a new date over there and then we are rendering the date. That's okay. And then we are using the two date string and that's also fine. But I think here is the error that we are getting the type as the string inside the date. So we have the type of the string. So we need to fix that because the new date constructor accepts the property of the number or a specific date. If we provide the number date like this inside the numeric format, so it must be inside the number, not the string. Or if we provide the string date, then it should be inside the string date like 23rd Jan 2023 like this. So if we just check with the new date constructor like this, and then we provide the date like this inside that. So you can see if you provide the date, then you can see now it is showing exact date that we have Monday, June 12, 2023. So it is working fine. And because we are just providing the string date like this. So that's why we are getting the invalid date over there. So we need to fix that. So we can move on into the blog items. So here we are running the date. So first we can just convert this date into a numeric format like this. And then we can just convert this date into the string format to date string. So that will be the thing. So if we just save and if we just remove all of the debuggers, like we can just deactivate the breakpoints once again, if we just refresh the application. So here you can see first we have the loading and then we can just check once we load the data. And then you can see now we are getting the exact date that we have. So we have Monday, June 12, 2023. And then you can see now we have exact date that we have. So you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And now let's just move on and let's just fix the designing part as well. So you can see now each block doesn't have a certain width. So we need to provide same width for each of the blog item. So we can move on into here. So here we have the blog list styles. So here you can see we have the card property. So we can just provide the width property like this. So width that should be equals to. So we can give the width of somewhere around 500 pixels. So if we just check with that, if we just save. So now you can see now we have 500 pixels of the width for each of the content. And then we can see the height is too much according to this. So we can just decrease the height or something. So we have the height of 70, that should be the 60 as of now. So the height of 60 would be looking good. So you can see now we have the height of 60 pixels inside that and it is looking beautiful now. But here you can see now we need to work on the blocks part. So here you can see now we have the title. So now we need to fix the title part. So what I am thinking about the title is we can just provide the background color for this heading. So the card title, we can provide the background color which will contain the date and we can add the icon as well for the block. So let's just move on and let's just design that. So attached to this lecture, you will find a file in which I have defined the array of the colors that we can use for the background inside this. And then you can just paste that colors array inside this file. So you can just paste that into the top like this. So we have the colors array. And after that, we'll be defining a function in which we can just randomize all of the blocks colors. Like for all of the block pages, now we'll be just randomizing the colors array from this. So with that, we can just move on and we can just define another function over here. So we can have the export. We can have the function that should be we can have the random bg color so we can have this function as well like random bg color as well and after that inside this now what we'll be doing so we have this function and here we'll be just returning a random item from this array so we can just return that so we can have the array so we can have the colors array like that and then what we can do so we can just use the math.floor so we can get the floor value and inside that we can just use the math.random property so the random would be equals to, so we'll be having the colors dot length. So we can have the colors dot length with that. So we have the colors dot length. So to get a random number from the JavaScript. So if we have an array of three items, so we can just get the length of it and then we can just multiply it with the random. 
and then we get the numeric value with that because the math.random generates i think it generates inside the decimal numbers so we'll be converting it to the floor and then we are just getting that item from the colors so we can just do that but you can see if we just provide the colors here like here with the card header but if we provide the colors like the bg color here and then you can see now all of the blocks have the same background color but we'll be just having the different colors because if we generate this constant so it creates this as a constant copy and one copy is generated to all of the items so we can just remove the bg color from here and we can move on into the block item and here you can see we have the card header so we can just have here so we can just spread the elements like this so we can have this first we have so you can see first we render the card header then what we can do so we can just render the bg color property so here we have the bg color and that should be equals to so we can have the random bg color we can import that from the constants so you can see now we'll be defining the random background color inside this so inside this file it would create the copy so same function would be used inside all of the components so we can just move and then we can just save so now you can see now we have the random background colors for each of the blog item inside that and now you can see that's looking good so we have random items for each of the array so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then you can see now we do not have the fixed height for the title so we can just fix that as well so here you can see here we have the height of around 35 percent inside that but that's enough but why we are seeing all of this content in it so i think we just made a mistake inside the blog item so you can see if we just wrap this card header inside that so you can see everything that we are rendering is we are rendering inside this header so we can just remove this box out of here so we can just remove this and then we can just paste out of this so if we just save again if we just move on to the applications so here you can see now everything is working perfectly fine and now we can just change the shadow colors as well because that's not looking good so we can again move on into the block styles so here you can see we have the title we can define a uh, hash triple zero color and that will look good so you can see now it is looking good with that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine with that and then you can see now we have all of the blocks with that but here you can see again we have this error like the whole content so like you can see the content is not trending into the whole part so we can just check that once again so we can move on so here you can see card content has the height or like the width of 80 percent so we can just make that 100 percent as of now so you can see now it is rendering inside the full content and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so here we have the home page and here we have the blocks page with that and then last thing that we want to do is so here you can see now this date is not looking good so either what we can do so we can just render the icon of the date and then we can just render the date here so for that here you can see inside this blog item we are rendering the box so this box has the date inside that so we can just wrap an icon as well with the date so that should be somewhere an icon so we can again move on into the react icons here so here we have the react icons and from there we can just search for the date like we can have the calendar you can see this date icon is looking good we have the fc calendar so this will look good so we can just copy that and then we can just move on into our file we can just import something from we have the react icons so we have the react icons from there and we need to import something from the fc so we need to write the slash fc from there and then we'll be using the fc calendar and here we'll be just rendering the content here like the fc calendar over here and then we'll be rendering the content so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see first we have the date here and then we have the actual date and then you can see now we have the content over here but you can see the date icon is very big so we need to format this a little bit so we can just provide the size so size should be somewhere around we can give the 20 pixels for the size so you can see now i think the 20 would be very small so we can give around 30 pixels for the size you can see now the size is good now we can move on and we can just provide here the flex property inside this box so we can just provide that inside the styles so here we have the card content so before the content we can have the date container so we have the date container over here and inside the date container now we can provide the styles inside this so we can have the styles like we can have the display that should be equals to we have the flex then we can use uh, i think that would be enough so we can use the align items as well so we need to align these items into the vertically center position so that will look good and after that now i would and after that now i think everything should work so we have the date container over there and now let's move on into the blog item once again so here we can just provide the sx for this box so we can have the block styles once again dot we can have the date container over there like this so we have the date container so if we save so if we move on to the applications so here you can see now the dates are looking good inside that 
so now we have the date and then we can just also change the variant as well for this typography so i think what we can do so we can give the variant again as we can give the caption and then we can just increase the font size a little bit so we can just write the styles here only so we can have the font size of somewhere around we can give the 20 pixels so it will look good so now i can see now it is looking good and now we can just provide some gap between the icon and the date so we can again move on here we can have the gap property so the gap property can be somewhere around we can give the four so if we say so the four is enough so we can give around two would be enough so you can see now we have the same so here you can see now everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we are rendering the whole blocks here so you can see now they are looking good and then you can see inside this footer now we are getting some shadows so what we can do so here we have the container so we can give some margin from the bottom that should be two and from the top as well that should be two so i think it will look good so now you can see now it is looking okay so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine and if you want to change the color of this date then again you can do that it's up to you like here we have the block item we can just provide the color as well so color that should be because so we can get the white so you can see now it's looking good as well so even if we refresh the page then you will be seeing the random colors as well for the background we have the dates and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine so that's how a real world block page looks like so we can have the blocks and then if you want to make it into the real world project then you can just render some like the sidebar over here with some categories or what so you can do that it's up to you so now you can see now it is looking good so now you can see this block is also there and this block do not have any content so either what we can do so we can just delete this block from our database so we can delete that so you need to do it manually if you have provided the user prop so you can just delete manually as well and you can just delete with the graphql as well so it's up to you so you can delete that and let's come back again so i have removed then from the mongodb database so you can see everything now seems to be working perfectly fine and then you can see again we are just rendering the items inside the center so we can just move on into the block list styles so here we have the justify content in the center so what we can do so we can use the flex start property from here so we have the flex start and then it will be started from the start so, and then you can see now it is starting from the start so you can see we have this and then we can just provide some margin from all of the sides i think so we can give the margin from all of the sides that should be the two so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see now everything is working perfectly fine so you can see now we have the contents like this over here and then on this side what you can do so you can just render some of this content like you can render categories or what but you need to make sure that you need to use the responsive styles over there like you can see if we just increase the size of the screen then it is fitting to the screen as well so you can see it is fitting to the screen so you need to do it accordingly according to the screen sizes so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so you can see now we have completed the blocks page inside our application so you can see all of the blocks are looking good so now we need to move on into the authentication part so here we have the auth so we need to design the authentication screen so here you can see here we are into the auth component we have the auth.tsx component inside that and now we need to work on this component so for that you can see initially we have this div so we'll be again using the box from the api material so here we'll be having the box functionality once again and then what we'll be doing is we'll be just moving on into the styles folder and we'll be defining the styles for this authentication page so we can have the auth dash styles dot ts and inside this file i think that is rs so it means that we have defined the file for the rest but not it's a ts and here now what we'll be doing so we'll be just having we can have the const we can have the auth styles so we can have the auth styles over here and we need to define the type as well so here we have the styles which are defined inside the home page so first initially we'll be having the container again so we can have the container so inside the container we can have the display property that can be equals to a flex box so again we'll be using the flex flex direction should be a column so we'll be rendering the design over there like the column like this and after that now what we'll be having so we'll be having the justify content and that should be inside the center and then you can see now we'll be having the align items to align all of the content into the centers so we can apply the styles inside the center and then we'll be using the margin as the auto to auto align into the center but before this i want to introduce you that how our application that how our login screen will gonna look so we can go into the paint and there you can see now suppose this is again a web page like this so this is a web page and inside that now what we'll be having so again we'll be having the default header and the footer inside that and now inside this in between this now what we'll be having so we'll be having a, a box like so we'll be having a card like content so inside the center of the screen we'll be having the cart like content and inside that first we'll be rendering the logo of this application and after that we'll be having some states as well inside the screen so what the states will do so in this screen we'll be having the login as well 
and will be having the sign up as well. So both the login and the sign up screens will be applied from the state inside that. So we'll be having the button in the end like that can be the button and in this button we'll be defining the functionality that's switch to login or the sign up. So we'll be defining the screen inside the center of this like it can be a modal look as well. So let's move on and let's define that content. So we already defined the styles for the container and then we'll be using the logo as well. So we can have the logo and the title property with that. So the logo title will be having the display that should be the flex and again we'll be having the gap property from them so the gap can be equals to we can have the one because we'll be rendering the logo as well and then we'll be rendering some text as well like the name of this application like you can name whatever you want like the blog application or like dev blocks or anything and then we can use the align items property to align the content into the center vertically and then we'll be having the justify content property to justify all of those content into the center so we'll be having the centered content here as well and then we'll be having some margin from the top as well like the one and margin from the bottom again that should be the one so we'll be having the design for this logo title and then we have the logo title that will be a container inside that and after that we'll be having the logo text as well so like the typography styles so we can have the logo text and inside this property now we'll be having the font family once again so we can give the font family again of the work sense as we have imported it from the google fonts and then after that we can give the font size as well so size can be somewhere around 30 pixels would be enough for the size so these are the properties and after that we'll be having the form inside that so first let's define this content so here we are into the auth component and here we'll be defining the styles for this so what we can have inside this so here we have the topmost container the box and then we can remove this and then we can apply the styles for the sx that can be we can have the auth styles we can have the auth styles i think we haven't exported yet so we need to export this as well so here we are at the auth styles then we can export this const variable as well and after that now what we'll be doing so we have the cost styles dot we can have the container as well like this so here we have the container and inside that again we'll be having the box once again for the logo container for the logo and the title container so we'll be having the sx prop once again that should be we can have the auth styles dot we can have here the logo title like that we have like we have the logo title and inside that now what we'll be having so we'll be having the logo of this application so you know as we have defined the logo inside that so we defined the logo inside the header so we can just check inside this file like which icon did we use for this like you can see this icon we used so we can just copy this icon over there so we can just copy that and then we can just move on into the auth and here we can just render this over there like we have the i am blogger and then we can just import this from the react icons and after that let's define the typography as well inside that so here we'll be having the typography like this and inside this typography again we'll be using the sx prop once again so we can have the sx that should be equals to so we can have the auth styles over there so again we have the auth styles then we can just use the logo text that we have so with the logo text property that we have inside this so and inside this now what we'll be having so we can define the text of this application the name of this application so we can define the name like we can have the dev blocks like this so we can have the dev block so if we just save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we are seeing the dev block over there and now you can see it is looking good so we have the dev block like this and then we need to define the same name over here as well the name of this application so we'll be doing this inside the end inside the optimizations content then let's just move on and let's just define the form so as we discussed earlier that we'll be having the forms again inside the center so we can define any border as well for the form so after this as well so after this logo title container then we can have again a box that can be equal so we can give the sx that should be equals to so we can have the auth styles we can give the styles for i think we can give the form border so we can have the form border so we'll be having the border of this form or we can have the form container over there so we can have the form container and inside this we'll be defining the border and after that let's just move on let's just define the typography inside that so suppose we have the typography over there like we have the typography like this and then what we can do so we can again provide some styles for this typography so again we can have the sx equals to so we can have the auth styles so here you can see inside this typography now what styles do we apply so we can apply the auth styles dot logo text because we only need the font family and the font size from there so we can use this style over there and this will also look good and inside that now what can we do so we can write anything like we can have the login so if we save if we move on to the application and there you can see now we are seeing the login over there and you can see it is working perfectly fine and now what do we need to do i think so we need to apply these styles for the form container first so with the form container again we need to align it into the center 
So here inside this form container, we can give the border property as we discussed earlier. So we'll be defining the border and that should be equals to I think one pixels of the border. We can have the solid. We can have the color of the border like hash triple C or hash triple zero for the border color. So triple C will also look good. So we have this color. And after that, now what we'll be having? So we can have uh, the border radius as well. So we can have some radius of around something around five would be enough. Then we can have the padding as well between the elements. So padding would be somewhere around five only. That would be enough. And then we can define the box shadow as well. So box shadow can have, we can define like the five pixels horizontally, five pixels vertically, 10 pixels of the blur and the color again, that should be hash triple C. Or like we can have the hash, we can have the triple zero color and it will apply the black color inside the shadow. So here we have the form. So you can see now we have the login over there. So now let's just move on and let's just define the actual form over there. So we can have the form like this. So here we have the form tag from directly the HTML. And inside that now, what can we do? So we can again give the style property because the HTML accepts this style and not the SX. And here as well, we'll be getting some of the errors as well, like type errors. So as of now, we can give the auth styles dot, we can have the form. And there you can see inside this now what we'll be having. So we can have the auth styles and here we'll be defining the styles for the form. So here we have the styles for the form. So we have the display flex. We have the flex direction into the column. So with the gap and the padding as the four, we have the justify content center, align items into the center. But you can see we do not have anything inside the form. And now let's just move on and let's just define the text fields and the input elements inside that. So for adding the input elements inside the forms, we use the text field. So we can have the text field over there like this. So here we have the text field and here we'll be just defining the styles for the text field as well. So I think here we need that three text fields over there. So this is the first. We can have the second, we can have the third. So here we'll be having three text fields. So if we save, so now you can see now we have the text field over there. So we have this, we have this, and then you can see we have this. So now inside this, or like before this, now we can add some labels as well for them. So here we can have the input label over here. So input label will be having the name like this, like we'll be having the name for this. And for this, we'll be having the email like this, we'll be having the email, and then we'll be having the password for this, like this, we'll be having the password for this. So you can see if I will now format this, so now we have this text field for the name, this for the email, this for the password. So that should be the password over there. So if we save, so now you can see now we have the name, email and the password for the login forms. And here inside the input labels, we can provide the area label as well. So that should be the area label, that should be the name. And then we need to find the same area label name for this input. So we can have this. And then you can see once we added the label inside that, inside this form, like we can add the label like the name. So if you will save, if we'll move on to the application, so here you can see now the name will be attached to this. So once you will click on this and then you will see it will animate to the top. So it will just animate and it will move on to the top. So that's how we can define the animations inside this. So we'll be using the same thing for this email as well. That can be the email and same would be applied for this as well inside this. So here we have for this and then we'll be using same for this as well for the password. So we have the password like we can use the pass. And here as well, we can use the pass over there like this. So we have the pass and inside that we can provide the label. So label can be equals to we can have the password over there. And then this is a type of the password. So we can provide the respective type as well. So that should be the type of the password over there. So we have the type of the password over there. We can move on into the email and we can define the type as well. Like here, like you can see inside the text field. Now we can just define the label. So that should be equals to so we can have the email over there. And then we'll be using the type as well for this. So that should be the type that should be the email over there like this. So if we save, if we move on to the application and then we can just remove the label text as well like this. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we have the name, we have the email and then we have the password as well like this. And everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there. And here you can see now we have this design for the form. But here you can see here we are getting the error for the type because you can see the SX prop is not assignable or is not compatible to the CSS properties. So what we can do? So as we know that these styles are available inside the CSS as well. So again, what we can do? So we can provide a comment that should be we have the TS dash ignore. So this will ignore checking the type error for the next line. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we have the form and then in the end now what we can do? So we can have the button as well like this. So in the end we can have the button over there. So the button can contain the submit and inside this button now what can we do? So we can just provide the styles once again. So we can have the SX and that should be we can have the auth styles. So again we can have the auth styles dot we can have the button like this. So we can have the submit button and now we can move on and we can define the styles for this. So we have these auth styles and here we'll be defining the styles for the submit button. So here we have the submit. We have the button like this. 
and inside that now what do we have so we can define the styles like this so here we have the submit button and inside that we have the font family we have the margin from the top margin from the bottom the border radius the background color for this button we have the color we have the bg color we have the box shadow so if we save if we move on to this so here we have the submit button so if we save so here you can see now we have the submit button over here and then you can see it is now looking good so here we have the submit button and there what we can do so we can just increase the width as well for this button so we can have the width so width should be somewhere around we can use the 200 pixels i think that should be enough so now you can see now we have the good button over here so now you can see now we have the button of the submit and then we can move on into the auth then we can define the variant as well for this so the variant of this button should be the contained so we can have the contained variants so if we save so now you can see now we have the submit button over here like this and now you can see now we have the login here so now you can see now the login is aligned into the left so we need to fix that and you can see now we need to work on the borders as well so the borders is taking full available space so we need to fix that as well so we can move on into this and here we can just define the style for the logo so we can have the text align property so we can have the text align into the center over there like this and then for the width of this form container for this form box now what can we do so we need to use the responsive styles for the width so we can move on into the auth so here we can define the theme as well so we can have the cons we can have the theme so that should be we can have the use theme from the material ui so here we have the theme so with the theme we'll be checking the responsive breakpoints and after that to check the responsive breakpoints and to run a query for the breakpoints we use the use media query hook which is a custom hook which is available inside the mui material so we can use that so the name is use media query that we need to import so we have the media query so what it does like we write the condition inside the use media query and then it returns a boolean value the true or the false so we can add a condition that once our screen is below the medium then we need to perform something or once the screen is above the medium then we need to perform something else so we can do that so we can have the const we can have the is below md so we can have the is below md and that should be equals to so we can have the use media query so that should be the below and inside that now what can we do so here we have the theme property so we can access the breakpoints from the theme and inside the breakpoints property inside the breakpoints object so we have a couple of functions so you can see between the down the not the only the values and so many things so we can use the down so once the screen is down and we can define the key as well so the key is the md so once the screen is down from the md will return the true or else it will return the false and here inside that now what can we do so here we have the sx property for this form container so we can just use this spread operator to spread the elements after it so first we need to render the form container styles and then we can use the width property as well so we can check if the is below md is true so here we can render the content for the 50 percent for this form container or else we can provide the width of somewhere around we can give the 300 pixels so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have this and i think the 300 pixels is too much so we can give the 200 pixels for the width so if we save so now you can see now everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now what can we do so we can just align that into the center as well so we can move on to the form container we can provide the display that should be we can have the flex property and then we can use the justify content as well that should be the center and i think the display flex we need to provide the flex direction as well so we can give the flex direction and the flex direction can be the column that we can use so we have the column so if we save i think everything seems to be working fine then we can use the margin property we can use the margin as the auto so if we save so now you will see now everything is in center now we can just define some margin from the top like that should be the five we can give the margin from the bottom that should again be the five so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see now we have the login box which is looking good and if we just move on to the inspect and if we just check with the iphone xr so you can see it is looking responsive over there inside this as well and inside i think the pixel 5 as well it is looking good so now that's how we can do the responsive style inside the material ui so now let's just move on into the states part like we need to work on the sign up as well so in the bottom so we'll be adding a button like switch to sign up or the login so it will just switch the whole form content like for the login we'll be only rendering the email and the password and for the sign up we'll be rendering the name email and the password so for that now we can move on into the auth so we can just provide a new state property over there so we can have the use state property and inside the use state now what we'll be doing so first we can import that first we can use the use state snippet we can have the is sign up and then we have the set is sign up and initial value would be the false because initially we want to render the login part so here we have the sign up and the set is sign up so now what we'll be doing so suppose we have this text for the login so now what we'll be having so once the is sign up property like we can have the is sign up here as well so once the is sign up property is true then we can just render the sign up 
or else we'll be rendering the login part over there like this so else we'll be rendering the login or we'll be rendering the sign up like this so here we can have the sign up so if we save so you can see now we have the login because now we do not have the sign up and same would be applied for this name as well so for this name text field so we can again use the properties like this and then we need to wrap this as well inside a parent container because as for the rules of the JSX, you need to have only one single parent of the elements. So we can use this, like once the signup is true, then only we need to render this thing. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we do not have the signup as well. So you can see now we only have the login. So that's why we are not seeing anything over there. And then we can move on and here you can see after this button, now we can define another button over there. So we can have this button and this time the variant can be, we can get the outline like this. And inside this, we can just move on and we can just specify the condition or we can have the switch to and then we'll be rendering on the basis of a condition. Like if the is sign up property, like if the is sign up property is true, then we need to switch to the login or we need to switch to the sign up. So we can have the sign up like this. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we have the login property as the true. So that's why we are seeing that switch to sign up. So that's how it works. And now on clicking of this button, we need to update the state as well. So we can have the on click that should be equals to, so we can have a call back here and then we can just update the signup property like the set is sign up, and that should be equals to the previous value of the sign up. So we can get the previous value on the basis of the callback. So we can define the previous like this and the react guarantees that if you use the callback here, then it will give you the most current state element. So here we have the previous, then we can just set the reverse value of the previous. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we have everything. But if we click on the switch to sign up, then you can see now we enter the sign up. You can see now we have submit, we have the switch to login as well. And once we switch to the login, now you can see now we enter the login screen. So that's how we can define all of the contents. And that's how we can just use the same screen inside both login and the sign up. And then you can see now this style of this switch to sign up is not looking good. So we need to work on the styling as well. So again, we can move on and here you can see here we are rendering the auth styles dot submit button. So we can just use this styles as well. So we'll be again using this spread operator to spread the elements. So we have the auth styles dot submit button and then we'll be using another style as well. So we'll be just creating a separate style for this button. So we can have the submit button. We can have the switch buttons like we have the switch button and then we'll be designing some styles for the switch button as well. So in the end, we can use this like switch button and there we'll be defining some styles. So I think we can give the background color. We can have the background that should be the transparent. So we'll be needing the transparent background for this. So that should be the transparent. And after that, now what we'll be having. So we'll be having the color as well for this button. So we can have the color like we can have the hash. We can have the 273238 and then we'll be using the hover property as well like this. So we have the hover and then with the hover, we'll be having the text decoration like we have the text decoration property and the text decoration will be the underline. And then we can have the text underline offset. So the offset should be somewhere around five pixels. So here we are getting an error inside that. So the error is the type error once again, because we have used the spread operator inside this. So this does not accept the spread operator inside both of the elements. So what we can do. So again, we can use a comment over there. And then again, we can use the TS ignore once again. So it will ignore the type checking once again. So you can see now it is looking good. And then we can just also remove the variant as well, like the outline. And then if we just save, so now you can see now we have the switch to login and it is working fine. But I think the switch button styles is not there. We have the switch button and then we use the text decoration under. So that should be the underline. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we are getting the switch to sign up and it is working totally fine. So you can see everything is working perfectly fine. And now finally we can move on into the auth and here inside the every text field, we can just select all of these text fields. And then we can just provide a new prop, which is a margin. So we can give the margin and that should be the normal that we can provide. So we can have the normal. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we have some margins as well between all of these styles. And here, if you want this to be rounded, if you want all of the inputs to be rounded, then what you can do. So here we have the text field once again, and then you can just provide the input props over there. So here we have the input props. So inside the input props, then we can define the style property. And style property should be equals to again we'll be using an object over there and inside that we'll be using the border radius so that should be somewhere around 10 because it uses the parent component like the paper and then we define the input inside that style so if we just save so now you can see now we have some rounded icons as well so it is working fine and if you want to just increase the border radius then again you can do that then you can use around 20 as well 
if you will say so now you can see now it is looking fine so now you can see now we have defined the login screen as well inside this application so here we have the login and here we have the sign up and if we just move on into the inspect and if we just check the pixel 5 over there it is looking fine on this device iphone as well inside the galaxy fold as well inside this as well and in all of the screen sizes now it's looking good so that's how we define the styles for this so now you can see now the design part of this form is completed and now we need to work on handling the data of this form now how can we handle the data inside the form so either we would have used the use state variable inside our application so we would have used the use state and we would have assigned the state variables for all of the text field like for the name for the email and for the password so we would have assigned that and that is also a good option but one drawback for that is the drawback is once we change any data inside any of the input once we enter anything the whole component gets re-rendered on every input change so that's the first drawback and that's a huge performance issue that we can have so if we have over 20 or 30 form elements then for each input enter the whole components gets re-executed the re-rendered so we do not want to load our application at that stage so here with that drawback so we won't be using these states so as we discussed earlier inside the introduction section, so we'll be using a library, which is a React hook form. So we can use that library over there, which handles the form data and which does not re-render the form on every input change. So we'll be using that library. So we can search for the React hook form. So you can see this is a beautiful library for handling the form data inside the React. It's very performant, flexible, and we have the extensible forms with easy to use validations. And then we have multiple validation approaches with this form. So now you can see now we'll be just getting started with that so we can just click on the get started and then you can see to install this we have the very simple installation step we only need to install this so we can move on and then we can just install this library like this so it will install the react hook form inside our application and until it installs until it installs now we can just see the basic example with this so you can see this is a basic working example so inside the typescript so we'll be using the typescript so here you can see first thing that we have defined is the type of the inputs so here we can just define the types like the name email and the password inside the inputs and then we have the component and then you can see we are using the use form hook which is available inside the react hook form so the use form handles all of the data and the use form returns some functions to use like we have the first function which is the register so we are destructuring the property of the register and it is a function so for the elements that we can have for the input like here you can see we have the input and here as well we have the input and here as well we have the input so inside this we use the register to register this input to the use form so we have the library so it register this input with the use form and then we need to provide the first parameter as the unique name for every input like this input can handle the value of the register with the property of the example like this and then you can see this input can register the value for the example required so that's how we can just provide the input with that and then you can see the second function is the handle submit so it gets executed on the on submit of the form so once we run the on submit so, so the on submit is called when we submit the data of this form and inside the on submit then we need to run this handle submit function and inside that you can see the first parameter that we can have is the on submit which gets the data of this form so here you can see here we have defined that function of the on submit and here as well you can see now we get the whole data of that form and then we are logging the data that's how we can use the react hook form and then finally you can see we have here the form state and inside that we have the property of the errors so inside the register the second parameter that we have is the options object so inside the second parameter inside the register we add the validations like here you can see we have the very simple validation of the required property that is a true so like inside the second parameter inside the register we add some validations so inside this we can have the regular expressions as well we can validate our form data we can validate that this input is a date or a number or a string so we have a lot of validation functions which are available inside the react hook form and now let's just move on into our application so here you can see it is now installed and now we can move on into the top and then we can just import the use form from the react hook form so we can have the const, we can destructure some of the items that should be equals to we can have the use form. So from here we are importing the use form and inside that you can see now we can just have some of the elements like the register as well. So here we have the register and then we can have the elements like here we can have the form state that they have used. So if we write the validations and if we get the validation error inside that. So the errors property gives us the errors for a specific input element. And then finally what we can have is we can just have i think we can just have the handle submit that we can call once the data of this form submits and now here you can see now here we have the text field and inside each of the text field then we can register the react hook form to handle the data 
so for that we can have the object we can use the spread operator which will use the register inside that so here we have the register and inside that we'll be registering this input as a unique name that is a name property so we have the name and then inside second parameter then we can add the validation subject and there you can see we have a lot of options available for the validation we have the minimum length we have the maximum length disabled own blur own change event so you can get the own change as well so whenever the input gets changed so you get the own change event with that and there are a lot of properties that you can use so here what we'll be using is the required so the required property is the true so once we enter the data so once we use the name and then it's a required field so we have the register and then we can use same for the email as well so we have the email so we can use register for the email but here inside the email we'll be having some validations so we need the validations inside the email like here we have the required property that is a true so it is good but here inside that we have the property of the validate so the validate accepts a callback function so we can have the validate and it accepts a callback function and inside the first parameter we get the actual value of that input so we get the value and that should be equals to inside the string format so we get the value inside the string like this and now after that now what can we do and here for the email validations you can find the regular expressions for the email validation so you can just search for that so you can have the regular expressions for email validations so we have the email validation and there you can see now we have the email validations so we can just copy that from there we can copy the whole regex from there and then we can move on and then we can just paste that here like here we have the regex and there after the regex then we'll be using the function which is the test so we'll be testing that regex and the value would be the value that we are getting from the parameters inside this so this is the value that we are getting from there so like once the validation fails then it will register this email input inside this form state errors property so it will register this input here and then we can just extract this email property from the errors.email and then we can just find some more validations after that like here you can see inside the email we have the error property as well inside this so inside every text field we have the error property so we can just check like error so once we get the error inside that so we need so here we need to convert the value inside the boolean because the form state errors give you the string so once we have the value inside the errors like this so we have the errors like this so we can have the errors dot we have the email so once we have the errors inside the email then it will show the error inside this input element and now let's just move on and let's just define the same for the password as well so for the password again we'll be using the register so we can have the register over there like this we can have the register and inside that we'll be registering this as a password like this and then in the second parameter again we'll be using the require so that will be true and then we'll be using i think we'll be using here the minimum length property so that would be the six so because the minimum length that we require is six now finally you can see now we have defined the register for all of these input elements after the form submits then we want to handle the data of that form and inside this on submit you can see here we have defined the handle submit function and here we have the own submit inside that we have the callback of the on submit so here we can run the handle submit here like this and for the on submit now we'll be getting a new function over there so we can define a new function so we can have the on submit that should be equal to so we'll be getting the data inside that and then we'll be logging the data inside that like we can have the log of the data and then we can just provide the any property as of now to the data so if we just save and there we need to just pass the callback function for the on submit so we have the on submit for the callback like this so if we just save if we move on to the application and if we just refresh the whole application and then you can see once we add anything inside the email like if i will add the incorrect email over there like i will add the nickel only and in the password i do not have the minimum length and then you can see once we move on and once we just submit the data of that form you can see now we are getting the red line inside the email because we have provided the error inside that so you can see here we have the error and then we have the errors inside the errors.email so that's why we are getting the property as the false so for that we need to provide the value for the email so we can have the nickel at the test.com like this and if we just click on the submit once again so now you can see again the form data will not be submitted because now the minimum length of the password is not defined so for that we can again provide the error inside that so we can have the error so that should be equals to again we can turn the value inside the boolean we can turn the value to the boolean that should be we can have the errors dot we can have the password like this so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting the validation error inside the password so here we need to provide at least six characters over there for the password so now you can see now we do not have any errors inside the email and the password and now everything is working perfectly fine 
and if we just click on the submit then you can see now we are getting the data inside that and once we have the errors inside the form then the form will not be submitted so you can see once we click on the submit we are getting the errors here or if you want to use some text as well after the error so you can use a helper text so we have the property inside the helper text inside this so helper text can give you the error inside that so you can give the error like again you can use this property over there like this so you can use this over there like the boolean and once we have the error inside the password then we can have like minimum length and after that if we do not have any error then we'll be rendering the empty string over there so if we save so now you can see length should be greater than five and if we just move on and if we just define the six characters over there now you can see now we do not have any error and same applies for all of the elements as well like for the email so we can provide the helper text for the email so if we save and if we just provide an invalid email once again if we just remove everything from there so now you can see now we're getting the invalid email from there and everything seems to be working perfectly fine now and now we need to define the exact email that we can have like the gmail.com and if we submit the data of that form now you can see now we are getting the data as well and then you can see once we switch to the sign up and we can provide the data to the name like the nickel then you can see now we'll be getting the data of the name as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have handled the form data with the react hook form library so now we are getting the data of that form so now we are getting the data now we have completed the validations part now we have completed the form handling part so now after all now we have the data of that form that we want to send and now we need to send the http request to the backend for the login and sign up for the user and how can we do that so here you can see here we have the property for the sign up so we can just validate if we are into the sign up screen then we want to make the sign up request or if we are into the login screen then we can make the login request for the backend so we can do that easily with the help of this state and now the next step would be that how can we make a request to the backend and because this is a mutation not a query so we need to make a mutation now so if we just move on into the blocks then you can see here we use the use query and here you can see inside that we use the use query and there we define the query inside that inside the queries like this so here you can see here we have the queries like this so we define the query with the gql and then we wrap the query inside the back ticks like this so this is how we generate the query but the mutations part will be different so for the mutations we won't be using the use query we'll be using the use mutations hook from the graphql apollo client so we can just search for that as well we can have the use mutation like this and then you will be seeing the use mutation inside the apollo client and that's how we generate a mutation for the graphql server so you can see the use mutation react hook is the primary api for executing the mutations in an apollo application so here you can see that's how we can define a mutation like that is a graphql so i want to show you an example as well so here you can see so suppose now we want to first generate a mutation for the backend so that's how we generate the mutation like we did inside the query as well we import the gql and inside the back text then we wrap the query for that so here you can see here we generate the mutation like this so as we did inside the graphql backend api server in the backend api interface we generated the mutation like this so we have the mutation and then here in the front end we need to define the function for that mutation so here so inside the graphql backend we didn't have to do this but here we need to do this like this we need to define a function so we have the mutation we have the function of that mutation like the add to do and then inside that function we define the variables like we can have the type variable and that is of type of the string and we had the exclamation mark like this and we need to add the exclamation mark if the property is required so here the type is the required property so that's how we define the mutation and this is mutation and this mutation is for the front end part and here after this after we call this mutation part and after this front end mutation after this front end function then we need to call the function of the backend like in the backend suppose we have a lot of functions like we can see the functions of the backend as well inside the handlers we have the sign up we have the login and after that after this front end mutation then we need to call the backend mutations like the login sign up as well so we can have the login like this and then we define the variables that we have generated here like we can have the name we can have the email we can have the password and we can have a lot of variables that we can use so these are the variables that we need to define here inside this so that's how we define the mutation so now we have defined the mutation like this so here that was an example and now we can just move on and we can just see that how can we run this add to do mutation 
so we can just move on into a function like this we have here the use mutation hook so you can see now we run the use mutation hook for the mutation and use query for the query so here we have the use mutation so we run the mutation like this like we have the add to do inside that and inside that you can see we run the mutation function like this function should be of the same name that we have defined over here like this add to do so you can see we have the add to do function and then after this now how can we run this mutation so we can just move on and we can just check this example as well so here you can see here we have returned something inside the array inside the use mutation and inside the use mutation we have just provided the mutation that we generated here like the add to do like this so that's how we define the mutation inside that so the use mutation contains the first parameter as the mutation itself and after that it returns some values like the first value it returns is the exact function that we want to call so we want to call the add to do function so we can just name that function and then we can just call that like this so first parameter is the function that is a http function and then second it returns the data the loading and the error properties that we can find with that so now let's just move on and let's just apply this into our application and it will be very easy and i know that first it seems confusing to everyone because even i was confused when i used this but then once i implemented this then it became very very easy for me so let's just move on and let's just define the mutations so first thing that we want to do is we can just move on into the front end and here you can see inside the front end folder we have here the graphql we have the queries so now what i will be doing so i'll be defining the function for the mutations like this so we can have the mutations.ts and inside this now i want to generate a mutation so for generating a mutation here so we can have the const first we can generate a mutation for the login so we can have the user dash login like this and that should be again equals to so we can run the graphql like this so we have the gql with that and now inside the back text, now we want to generate the query for this mutation so here we can generate the mutation like this so we can have the mutation and this and after that now we can just give any name to this mutation for the front end part so we can give the name like we can have the login mutation like this so now we have this login and after this now we want to access the variables that we want to send to the backend so we have the variables and now the naming convention that you should define for the variables that should be starting from the dollar sign then that should be like the name email and the password so in the login we'll, we'll be only having the email like this so we can have the email and that is of type of the string like this so we can have the string and then we can use the exclamation mark for if the field is required so we have the email and we can do same for the password as well so we can have the password we have the variable for the password and then it is of the type of the string that we want to access and this is also a required field and after this login then we want to call the backend function of the graphql and you can see the backend function that we have defined is exactly the login as well so we can move on to the handlers so here you can see the function that we have defined for this object is the login so we can again move on into the mutations and then we can just provide the function for the login like this so that should be the login and now we need to define all of the variables inside this so in the login we need to define the variables like the email and here the email variable should be this email like the dollar email and for the password we will be having the variable of the password that we have defined here so here we have the email and the password with that so that's how we can just define here the function for the mutation and now the data that we want to retrieve that can be the id we can get the email we can get the name of that user with that that we want to get in return after this query and after that now let's just move on into this authentication part and here you can see now we want to just execute this query over there so we can have the user login query with that and before that now we want to export this as well so we can have the export so now you can see now we have defined this query now we have defined the mutation into the graphql and here we have the mutation and we are running this inside the graphql mutations folder so that should be the mutations like this so that should be the mutations and now let's just move on and let's just call this mutation inside this auth component so i'll be now closing all of the files and after that now what we want to do so as we check inside the apollo client examples we can use same so we can have the const we can have something that should be equals to we can have the use mutation for this you can have the use mutation and inside that you need to call the mutation that we have just created which is a user login like this so we have the user login and after that the first thing that we want to retrieve is the function that we want to execute so this is just a mutation that it is registering for the 
login functionality. It is registering the user login functionality for the use mutation. And now we want a function as well that we want to call on a specific occasion, on a specific condition. So we can get a function like this. So we can have the user login like this. So we can get a function login like this with that. So it will be called when we run the login function. So we can just call this login function whenever that we want. And after that, now what we'll be doing and after this login, then the second parameter that we can get is the data errors and other properties like this. We have the data, the loading and the error. So what we can do? So we need these three properties for the sign up request as well. So we can just store them in a specific object because if we just use the data loading and the error for the login and the sign up, so the names would be conflicting. So now what we'll be doing? So we can just store that inside the loading object. So we can have the loading response like this. So we can have the login response like this. So we can have the login response as this and this object contains the values of the data, the loading and the error. So we have the login response with that. And now let's just move on and let's just call this login function on the login condition. So here we have the own submit of the data. And here you can see now we have the data as the any. So that should not be the any because we are using the TypeScript. So we need to define the type. So we can have the type for the data. We have the type for the inputs. So that should be equals to. So we can give the name as the string like this. So we have the name as the string. We have the email as well. Again as the string, we have the password. Again as the string like this. And then we can just wrap this inputs inside the use form as well because we'll be using this inside the use form. So we can have the inputs like this and we can do same for this as well inside that. So now we have the data property as the inputs like that. And we can also destructure all of the fields here. Like we can have the name, we can have the email, we can have the password like this. So here you can see now we have all of the properties that we have destructured from this. We have the name, email and the password. And now inside the on submit, now we want to just call the login function. So how can we do that? So again, we can just check that once we have the sign up screen, then we want to run the sign up function. Or once we have the login screen, then we want to run the login function over there. So we can just check that in a condition like this, like once the is sign up property is true, then we want to execute the sign up request or else we want to execute the login request from there. So then we want to execute the login and here we'll be executing the login. So we can just call the login function over there that we have just generated from the graphical mutations. So we have the login function and then you can say it is a promise. So we should use async and await. So we can just make this on submit function as an asynchronous function like this. So we can have the async and then we can use the await over there like this. So we can have the await, the login and then now how can we send the parameters to the login? So you can see we here we have the login and inside that you can see the first parameter that we can provide is an options object. So we can use the options object here. So like now you can see inside this object, we have a lot of properties that we can use. We have the client, we have the context and we have so many things like this. So here the thing that we want to provide is the variables. So here we have the variables object and here we need to define the object which contains all of those variables. So here we need to define the variables like we need to define the variables of the email like this. So we can have the email and then we can just provide the variable like the password like this. So we need the email and the password variables inside that. And then these variables are now stored inside these mutations like this. So we have the email and the password like this. So now we have the variables as well. And now everything seems to be working fine. Now we have the variables. And now after that, now what can we do? So we can just use the then statement after this promise. And then after that, what we can do here. So inside the callback of the then, we can just log the response that we get. We can just log the response of the login response. So you, so here you can see now we have defined the login response. So we can just log the login response here like this. And we can just extract the property of the data inside that. So we get the data inside the login response. So if we just save, if we just move on to the application and if we just try with the login. So here you can see what we have done is we have defined the mutation like this. Here we have the mutation. And then on the basis of a condition, like if the sign up is false, then we are running this login. We have defined the parameter values like the email and the password inside the variables object. Then we are just running a callback function after this promise is executed. Then we are running the console.log. Then we are just getting the data of this request. So if we just move on into the application, if we just refresh this application as well, if we just try it out with that, so we can just run this. We can have the nickel at the rate. We can have the test.com. We can have this email. We can have the password as well. Like I think the password can be like one, 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 one. If we just submit and if we just move on to the inspect, if we just check that, if we just click on the submit, then here you can see now we got an error. 
the error is low you can see now i think we can move on into the network tab we can just run inside that so here you can see now we got the error like we have the errors object we have the message of the incorrect password so we have the incorrect password over there i think we have the different password like one two three four five six if we just check again if we just make a new request of the submit then you can see now again we are getting the response so you can see here you can see now we are getting the data inside that so you can see everything seems to be working fine now we are getting the data and if we just move on to the console again i think we didn't get anything as of now but inside the network tab you can see now we are getting the data like this and after that you can see now we didn't get anything inside the response or what we can do so we can just remove this login response as of now and we can just lock the whole data like this we can just click on the submit again then you can see now we are getting the whole object inside that and we can just move on and we can just check the data so you can see here we have the data and inside that you can see we have the login property and inside the login you can see we are getting the exact value of this user we are getting the name we are getting the id of that user we are getting the email of that user so everything is working perfectly fine so you can see now the login request inside our application is completed and now you can see it is working perfectly fine you can see now we are getting the exact data of the login so now you can see with that the login functionality of this application is completed so the login is completed and now the last step of this authentication is we want to work on the sign up part so here we want to work on the sign up so we need to follow same steps that we defined for the login for this mutation of the login and after that after defining the sign up then we'll be handling the errors as well inside this application so let's just first design the sign up part for this application so now for the sign up part i have an assignment for you so you can try the sign up on your own first and then if you will succeed then it will be very good for you because if you will succeed in the sign up request now then it means that now you have learned about the graphql and the integration with the back end and the front end but if you are stuck somewhere then again you can follow me after a moment so you can first try sign up on your own so were you successful so let's try it out with me so here you can see now we have the is sign up and there we want to run this sign up query so now what can we do so we can just define another mutation over there so we can just copy and paste this mutation as of now so here we have the user login then we can just use here the user dash sign up like this so here we have the user sign up and after that now what we'll be doing so here we should have the mutation of this sign up so here we have the sign up and here as well we'll be having the sign up as well and after that we need to provide the name variable as well inside the sign up so we can just provide the name as well so inside the first parameter then we need to provide the name so that should be the name so we have the name variable like this so inside the first parameter we have the name of the string we have the email we have the password and same we need to provide for the sign up request as well so we can first provide the name that should be the name variable like this we have the name then we'll be providing the email then we'll be providing the password like this and the data that we want to destructure the data that we want to get from the backend is the id email and the name once again so here with that now we have generated the query for the sign up so here you can see finally we have the sign up we have the sign up once again and this is the function from the graphql this is the function of the front end where we want to execute all of these variables and we can move on into the authentication component over here and then what we'll be doing here so we'll be defining another mutation like this so we can have the const we can have something that should be equals to we can have the use mutation once again we have the mutation and then the mutation should be we can have the user dash sign up with that and after that we want to run the function as well so again we can use the sign up function over there we can have the sign up response like this so we can have the sign up response like this and after that now what we want to do so here we want to run the sign up query so here we'll be running the sign up so what we want to do here so we can just use again the await so that should be the await and we'll be running the sign up over there we have the sign up and again we can provide the variables inside that inside the options object we can have the variables and that should be we can have the name we can have the email we can have the password like this we have the password like this you can see now we have defined all of these variables and then after that now we'll be just getting some data as well so we can just use the then statement and with the then now what we'll be doing now inside the callback now we'll be just logging the sign up response from there so we can have the console.log we can have the sign up like this we have the sign up response so if we just save again if we just move on to the application once again if we just switch to the sign up and if and we can also refresh the page we can just switch to the sign up we can just provide a name like we can have a name like the mary we can have the mary at the rate we can have the test.com like this we have the email 
we can have the password like one two three four five six seven and if we just make a new query for the submit then you can see after that now we are getting the data once again so you can see now we have the call false we have the data and i think we can just check that data inside this network if the request was successful so here you can see now inside that we have a property of the data which contains the key of the sign up so then you can see now the query was successful and inside that you can see now we are getting the id we are getting the name we are getting the email of that user that we have just created so you can see if we just switch to the login once again and we have same credentials over there and if we just make a login request once again if we just click on the submit then you can see now the user is being logged in so you can see now we have the user which is logged in and after this you can see here we are just logging the sign up response and the login response and after that if you only want the data property inside that so you can use the question mark as an optional then you can use the data like this because the data will be null in the initial request but after the request will be successful then the data will have all of these properties so if we just save if we move on to the application once again if we just click on the submit then you can see after a couple of seconds then you can see now after this request is performed then we get the actual data with that we have the login we have all of the data with that so now the user can successfully log in. So you can see now the user can log in with a login screen. The user can successfully sign up and it is working perfectly fine. But now what after that? So now what do we need to do after that? So after the user successfully logs in, now we want to enable a couple of functionalities for that user. So for the couple of functionalities, I mean that we can enable the functionality like adding a block for that user. Like the user can have the functionality of adding a new block. But we haven't created that functionality but we'll do that later after this screen so the user can have the functionality of adding a new block the user can have the functionality of viewing the profile all of their blocks and the user can have the functionality of the logout itself as well so we want to enable those functionalities but how can we enable that so that is a big question so we can use them in a state variable so suppose we have a state variable inside this auth component okay so now we have this inside the auth component and now we want to send the state into the parent app component as well because some of the other components will also be using that state because we need to use that inside the header as well because we want to conditionally render some of those links inside the header like only when the user is logged in then we want to show the links of the adding a block and of the profile page so we want that functionality inside the header as well we want that functionality inside auth component as well because we only want to render the auth when we do not have the details so we want that functionality so we can use this state but with using this state the complexity will get bigger and bigger because we'll be sending this state from the parent from the auth to parent app component then to all other components so it will be a bit complex to use so the second option can be we can use the redux so we can use a redux which is a state management package which is a state management library that we can use to manage this application state inside our application and the redux manages the whole data state inside just a single data store so we can use the redux for that so what we are going to do for the redux so we can just search for the redux inside that inside the chrome so we have the redux here so here we have the redux and then you can say it is a predictable state container for the javascript applications and then you can say we have the predictable we have the centralized data store we only have one data store which manages the whole application state and then you can see we have the official package for the Redux bindings for the React applications. So for the React applications, we need to use the React Redux package to make the state available to all other components. And then we have a package of the Redux toolkit. So we have a package of the Redux toolkit as well, which have the couple of slices that we can use. So it provides us a way to define the states inside our applications. So how can we define the state for the Redux? So the Redux toolkit provides us an easy way to work with the Redux states. Like it provides you an option to create a slice. A slice is just an object which contains a state for a specific functionality and which contains some reducer functions to update that state. And then in the reducer functions, then these are some actions that we can define. And then we can just call them actions. We can dispatch the actions from wherever component to change the state. So that's how the Redux toolkit works. So now let's just move on and let's just install these two libraries for our application. So we can have the CD into the block front end. We can install the React Redux. So we can have React Redux for that. And this is for binding the Redux to the React application. And then we need to install the Redux toolkit as well. And you can see the name of the package is the Redux JS toolkit. So we need to install this package as well. So now these packages are now installed. And now let's set up the Redux. So Redux have the only one data store. So we can just create that store from here inside the source. So we can just create a new folder that can be the store. 
and inside this store we can create a new file that can be we can have the index.ts file which contains the store inside that but before creating the store we need the state but we haven't implemented the state yet so we need to create the state with this slice so we can just create a new file that can be we can have auth slice.ts and in this slice now we'll be creating the slice over here and this slice will be now the actual state of the redux so we can have a cons we can have the auth slice like this so that should be equals to so we can have a create slice method and which is available inside the redux.js toolkit and then inside that we need to provide a the unique name for each slice we have the name and then we can name this slice as the authentication slice because this slice is for the authentication purposes then we can just define the initial state for this slice as well and this initial state contains the initial state for this slice so the initial state can have like we can have an object which contains the properties like is logged in so we can have is logged in and initial value of the is logged in can have the false like this so we can have the false and after the initial state then we need to define the reducers so the reducers are the function which manages the state so we can have the reducer functions inside that so first function for the reducer can be the login and now inside this login function now the first parameter that we get is the actual state object we get the state and in this login function now what do we want to do so we want the is logged in property to be changed to the true so we can have the state so here we can have the state we can have the is logged in property and that should be changed to the true like this so that will be the true so that's what we want inside the login state and we can define the function for the logout as well so we can have the logout which contains the first parameter as the state then we can use state dot is logged in that should be equals to the false the initial value of that slice so these are the reducer functions that we require and you can see these are managing the state we have the state dot is logged in property that is true we have the state dot is logged in property for the false in case for the logout and it is working totally fine and after that now what do we want to do is the next step so here we want to just export this slice as well so we can have the export and now we want to export these reducer functions as well because now we want to create this as an actions because now these are the actions that we want to perform and these functions could be called from any of the component while using the dispatch so we dispatch the actions to the redux to call these reducer functions with that so these are the actions that we need to call so we can just export these actions as well so we can have export cost we can have the auth actions like this we can have the auth actions and that should be equals to so we can have the auth slice dot actions from there so we have the dot slice we have the auth slice dot actions and then you can also access those actions as well so you can have the auth slice dot you can just have your <coughs> So you can have the auth actions like this and then you can just access these functions like the login and the logout. So we need to dispatch these actions from the front end in, from any of the component that we want to use. And for the dispatching as well, we will also see the function that how can we dispatch. But as of now, we have this slice and now we want to just export this slice into the store to use this state. So we can have a const, we can have the store variable, which will be the exact store so like this store and that should be equal to so we can have a configure store which will be imported again from the Redux.js toolkit. So this would be the configure store and this would be imported from the Redux.js toolkit, not from other things. We have the Redux.js slash toolkit with that. So this will be imported from there. And after that, we need to provide the options object. So it will contain the options like here. We need to provide the reducer. So we need to provide the reducer from the auth slice. So we are using the auth slice. So that should be the auth slice dot reducer with that. So we have the auth slice dot reducer. So now we can just export this store as well because we'll be using this store because now we need this store to make the Redux data available inside all of those components. So for that, we need to move on into the main file. We have the index.tsx file inside that. So we'll now enable the Redux functionality to all the component tree, to the whole component tree. So now we need to import something from the React Redux package and the something would be the provider which is a provider for the Redux. You can see we have the provider for the GraphQL Apollo as well, for the browser router as well. And this is a provider for the Redux. And now we can just use the provider to all application functionality to the whole application. So we can have the provider and then we can just wrap everything with that provider inside that. So we have the state. So here we have the provider, but you can see in the provider, the property store is missing. So we need to provide the property store, which can be used inside any of the components. So the store that we have just created inside the index.ts, we can use this store over there. So we can have the store like this and it will be imported from this store like this. So now you can see now we have provided the Redux data to the whole component tree. 
and now we can just move on into the main file that can be the app.txt or inside the authentication so we can move on into the app.tsx and now to get the data of that redux now what do we want to do so again we have a hook inside the react redux which is a use selector so the use selector is a hook which accesses the state from that redux so it uses the state it uses the callback function and in the callback function the first parameter is the actual state object which is linked to the store so like you can see we have the store so the actual state would be linked to the store with the use selector hook so we can use that so we can have a const we can access the property directly like this is logged in and that should be equals to so we can have the use selector hook from there so suppose we have the use selector like here and after this so this should be imported from the react redux not the exports so here we have the use selector and the use selector contains a callback function which grabs the actual state of the redux and then you can just access the property of the state dot is logged in property so we have the is logged in property and then you can give any type to the state as well like this you have the any and after that you can just move on and you can just lock the value as well of the is logged in like this so we can have the is logged in with that so with the use selector now we are just grabbing the redux state from the state then we are accessing the property of the is logged in from that state and then we can just save we can move on to the application and then if we move on to inspect if we move on to the console then you can say initially we are getting the value as the false inside that so you can say initially we have the value of the false but if we just move on if we just change the state inside this inside the auth slice if we just make the state to the true then you can see the whole component would refresh then you can see now we have the true inside the redux so everything is working perfectly fine so you can see now we are accessing the state from the redux as well and now we are accessing the state from the redux and it is good but now the next step would be now we want to just continue the work on the authentication part so here we have the authentication part we have the login and now let's just move on and let's just first copy this is logged in property into the auth as well so we can have into the auth so here we can just paste that here and then we can import the use selector from there as well so here we have the use selector with that and after that now what do we want to do so after the user completes the sign up or login request now we want to dispatch an action to the redux so for dispatching the action inside the redux we have a hook inside the react redux which is a use dispatch so we need to use that hook so we can have the const we can have the dispatch so we can have a dispatch like this and that should be equals to so we can have a use dispatch for that we have the use dispatch and after that now what do we want to do so here after the sign up completes so now you can see now we are making an http request without the try catch block so we should always use the try catch block while using the http request so we can use that as well so we can have a try we can have the catch as well like this and then inside the catch once we get an error then we can just log that error as of now then we can have a log we can have an error dot message with that like this so we log that message from that error and the error will be having the type of any as of now so we have the type of the any and now we can move on and here you can see here we have the await request so we can just move that from here into the try block like this so we can have this into the try and we can do same for this as well so we can again use the try catch block here so we can have the try like this then we can use the catch once again if we get an error then we can just log that error once again so we can have the log of the error dot message with that and we can give the type of the na to the error as well so it should be fine and now let's just move on and let's just move this login function into the try block so here we have the try block inside that and after that now what do we want to do as the next step so here you can see now we have the dispatch function as well now we are doing everything now we can achieve one more step now we can dispatch an action to the redux that the authentication is successfully completed so we can again move on into the auth component here and here we can just define a function to update this state so we can have a const we can have our own response received and then inside this we can have a function so we can get the data as well inside that so we can get the data and this should be the any as of now then we can get the data inside that then what do we want to do is the next step then we want to just run something inside this own response received so we can just run something like we can dispatch an action to the redux like the dispatch and then the actions that we want to dispatch are available inside the auth actions constant so we can have the auth actions here we have the auth actions then we can just import the login function from there so we have the login then we can call the login function from there so what it will do so it will just call the login function from the redux and it will change the state of the is logged in property so you can see inside the auth slice we have the is logged in property initially that should be the false then once we call the login it will just change 
it will change this logged in property to the true. And now we can move on into the auth component. And here we can just call this function as well. So we have the await sign up. And after that, now what we'll be doing, so we'll be using the own response received after that. So we have the own response received. And there we can just send the data as well that we receive from this request. So we can send the data like we'll be getting the data. So that should be we have the sign up response like this sign up response dot data with that. And we can do that for the login as well. So here we have the login. And after the login, then we can just paste that here. We can have the login response dot data with that. We have the login response dot data. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see initially we have the state of the false. So initially the is logged in property is false and you can see that here, you can verify that here. And after that, once you can see, once I will enter the credentials, like we can have the Mary at the rate, we can have the test.com. So we can have the Mary at the rate test.com and we can define the password. Like we can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we just click on the submit, Then you can see now we have the true inside that. So now you can see once we click on the submit, now we have the true inside the Redux and everything is working perfectly fine over there. So now we are getting the true inside that and it is a good sign because now with that, so now we have a proof from where we can just enable some functionalities for that user. So now you can see now we have the true and you can see once we move on into any of the page, once we move on again into the home component, once we move on again into the auth component as well, we will get the state as a true. So everything is working perfectly fine. But here again, there is a one major problem that you can see now we have the authentication as the true once we move on into the authentication or inside any of the component. But you can see once we refresh the page, then again, you can see now we again have the false. So we are not persisting the state inside the application because once we refresh or once we even close the browser, then the state would be gone because the browser clears the memory once we close any tab or once we refresh the page. So we need to persist the state. So for state persistent, what we can do. So either we can just use the state data inside any database, but that's not good as of now, because we only want to persist the data inside the browser. So what we can do instead. So instead we can use the local storage of the browser. So the local storage is a type of permanent storage that we can store inside that. So for any server that we can store for the permanent storage like this, like for this server, the local of 3000, we can store some data inside the local storage. So for that, now what do we want to do? So inside the own response received, first we can just get the data from there. So we can get the log, we can get the data like this, and we can just see that what data that we are getting. So we can again have the Mary, at the rate we can have the test.com like this. So we have the test.com, we can give the password. And if we just click on the submit, then you can see the data that we get. I think we are getting the undefined. Why? If we just check the network once again. So now we are getting the data inside that, but why we are getting the undefined there? So now you can see, now we are getting the undefined value inside that. And I don't know why, because we have just used the sign up response and the login response. So I think there is something wrong with the GraphQL and the Apollo client. So we can just skip that sign up response as of now. So we can remove the sign up response from here and the login response from here as well. And then we can also remove from here as well. So we do not need that because now this function as well, like you can see, we have the sign up function. It also returns you the promise with the data of this request. So we can use the data from this request as well. So we can have a const, we can have the response that should be equals to, we can have the await the sign up request and we can do same for this as well. So we can have a const, we can have the response that should be the await for this request. And now after defining the response, now what we can do. So we can just check like if the response dot data like this, then we can just provide the data inside here. We can have the own response received. Then we can just provide the response dot data with that like this. So we can have this thing over there and we can do same for this as well inside this as well. So we can have, if we have the response dot data, then only we want to perform this step. And then only we want to send the response into the own response received function. And then you can see here we have inside the own response received here. We are receiving the data and here we are just dispatching an actions to the Redux. So if we just save, if we again move on to the application, if we again refresh the whole page and if we just check again, like we can have the Mary, if we just click on the submit once again, then you can see now we are getting the login data here. So you can see now we are getting the login and it is working perfectly fine. Then you can say now inside the login object, now we have the key of the login. Then we have the email, the ID and the name of that user. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So now we have the login data inside that. Now we have the data inside that. Now what do we want to do as the next step? So here, what do we want to do? So we need to store this data inside the local storage of the browser. 
so for that now what do we want to do inside that so we can move on into this function we have the own response received and then we can just check once again like once we have the data dot we have the sign up then we want to store that from the sign up state from the sign up key so for the sign up request we'll be getting the key as the sign up and now for the sign up now what we'll be doing so we'll be destructuring some of the properties from the sign up so we can have the const we can have something that should be equals to we can have the data dot sign up like this sign up and then we want to destructure the properties of the id email and the name so we can have the id email and the name and then we want to just store these things inside the local storage of the browser so we'll be having these things inside that and after that we need to store these things inside the local storage so we can use the local storage from here and the local storage is globally available inside the browser so we can have the local storage we can have the set item and inside that now what we'll be doing so we'll be just defining the key as well so key can be the user data like this we can have the user data like this and then in the second parameter now we need to define the value as the string but here you can see here we have the values as the objects the id email and the name so what we can do here we can just stringify all of the data from the json we can use the json like this so we can have the json dot we can have the stringify and then we can just stringify all of these object values like we can have the id name we can have the email like this so we can stringify this data and then we can store this data inside the local storage and now we need to perform these steps into the login as well so we can copy that and we can paste that for the login and then we can have the id name email from the data dot login field we have the login and then we can stringify the data with that with the json dot stringify with that data with that so if we just save if we move on to the application and if we just log in once again if we just click on the submit now you can see now we have the login if we just move on into the application if we just check the user data so here you can see now inside the user data now we have all of the fields we have the id we have the name we have the email so everything seems to be working perfectly fine with that so now you can see if you will now refresh the application then you can see now you still have the data inside the local storage and even if you close the browser and if you reopen the browser still you will be having the data inside the local storage as well so everything is working perfectly fine so now we have the data inside the local storage and now the state is being persistent and now as the final step now we can just move on into the parent app component and here we want to implement one last step like once we have the data inside the local storage once we have the user data inside that then what do we want to do so initially when the user enters this application and if the user is already logged in if the user already have the data inside the local storage then what do we want to do so we can just update the redux to update the whole application with that so we can use the use effect over here so we can have the effect code here and after that now what do we want to do so we want to run it only once because we need to check this only once and now we can just check something over there so we can have a const we can have the data that should be so we can have a local storage dot we can have the get item like this and then we can just get item for the user data like this so we have the user data and now we have the data and now what do we want to do so we can just check like the if we have the json dot parse so now we have the stringified version of the data inside that and to make it available into the actual data object then we can use the parse from the json so we have the parse so if we have the json dot parse data and it is and if it is not equals to the null then what do we want to do so we want to perform a step for the redux then we want to dispatch the action for the redux so for that now what do we want to do inside that so i think we do not have the type annotation here so we can use the string like this so we have the string like this so it should work fine so now we have the string over there string null is not assignable to type string so we can use a string as well like this so we can have a string like this so now it will work perfectly fine and now let's just move on and let's just import the dispatch as well so we can just import the dispatch from the react redux like the use dispatch again and now we can just dispatch an action as well so first we can just register the dispatch here so we can have a cons we can have the dispatch and that should be equals to the use dispatch hook from the react redux so we have the use dispatch and after that what we'll be doing so we'll be using the dispatch here so we have the dispatch then we'll be using the auth action once again then we'll be just then we'll be just calling the login function so what are we doing here so once we have the data inside that once we have the data inside the local storage and if it is not equals to the null then we are just making a request to the redux that you need to enable the login functionalities for this user so if we just save if we move on to the application and now you can see initially we have the data if we just move on into the apps if we just move on into this application even if we refresh a couple of times then you can see if you move on to the console then you can see again you are getting the true property as well 
it means everything is working perfectly fine so now we have the initial authentication property is also working so at least now you can see now we are done with the authentication part of this application and now we need to just move on into the inspect panel and we can move on into the console so you can see now we are already logged in and still we are into the login screen so first we can fix that so how can we fix that so we can move on into the authentication so here you can see here we have the auth.tsx and what do we need to do here is you can see we can import something from the react router so once the authentication completes once we set the is logged in property to the true inside the redux then we need to move on to different page of this application so for that now what can we do so we can just import something from the react router dom so we can import something from the react router dom rrd and then something would be the navigate so we need to use the navigate which is a use navigate hook we need to import this hook so now we need to provide the reference for this hook as well so we can have a const we can have the navigate like this and navigate should be equals to again we have the use navigate that we have just imported and after that now what do we want to do so inside this own response receive function after we are done with all of that then you can see after we are done with all of that and then what we can do so we can just return we can have here the navigate so we need to navigate to the new route so we'll be using the navigate again to moving to the new route that can be a slash like blocks so if we just check again if we just move on to the screen and then we can provide the credentials once again we have the mary at the test.com so test.com like this and we provide the password like one two three four five six seven if we just click on the submit then you can see now the authentication completes and now we are into the blocks page of our application and everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now you can see now we are still seeing the authentication here inside the header so now we want to update the header part of our application as well so for that we need to move on into the header component so here we have the header inside that and now inside the header now we need to use this state so for this state we can again use the u selector from the redux so we can have a const we can have is logged in property And that should be equals to so we can use the u selector once again so here we have the u selector and inside this now what do we want to do so here we get the actual state object like this we get the state we have and then we provide the type as the any then we can move on and we can just provide here the state dot is logged in property so now you can see here inside this link we are rendering the button so inside this link you can see we are rendering a button which contains the text of the auth so now we want to conditionally render this link so we can just wrap this inside a condition and the condition can be once the is logged in property is true then we want to render something else then suppose we want to render an empty tag or else we want to render this link so if we just save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now once the authentication completes now we do not have anything after that so now we want to render the menu for that user so for that we can move on and we can just define a new component for the user menu so inside the source we can move on into the source and then we can move on into the user menu like we can have the user folder like this we can have the user in, inside the header and after that we can move on and we can define the menu of that user like we can have the menu like we can have the user menu like this dot tsx file inside that and now we can just render the rafce for the default setup for the boilerplate code of the react application so here we have with that and now we can just render the user menu instead of this list so we can have the user menu like this so we can have this after that so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are rendering the user menu over here and everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we want to just add here a user avatar like we can have the avatar like icon after that and then we can just render some of the options after that the example that i can show you is if we can move on to the mui.com once again and then we can search for the app bar over here so here we have the app bar so here you can see now i can show you an example inside the app bar of the material ui so you can see we can have this menu of that user like the profile my account with that so we can just show this type of avatar as well so we can show anything after that now what do we want to do so we can move on and we can render this type of avatar inside this so for that we can move on into the user menu and here what do we want to do so first we can just define the container once again so we can move on we can use the box for the container once again like this so here we have the box and inside that now what do we want to do so here inside that we'll be rendering an icon button so here we can have the icon button inside that so the icon button is a type of button which renders the icon inside that like this will provide you an effect of the button but what it will render in inside this but what it will render is the icon in between that button 
so after that we can just provide the color as well so we can have the color we can have the secondary color over there and after that we can just provide here an icon between them so the icon that we want to provide is we can have the f a that should be the user nurse after that so you can have the user nurse after that so that will be the icon name that we are providing to this and then we can just import this icon from the react icons so we can have the import something from the react icons package so react icons slash f a we can have slash fa and then we need to import this from there so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting this icon over there you can see now this icon is also looking good so now we can render this icon so i think the color secondary won't look good so we can use the inherit color over there so now you can see now this color is looking good so now we can just use this color over there so now we have the icon inside that and then you can see once we click on this icon now we have some ripple effect as well inside this and now we can move on and we can render the list as well after clicking on this icon so for that we need to use the menu so what we'll be doing here is we'll be just providing the menu after this box so we can have the menu so there will be the menu inside that and inside this menu now we need to provide the menu items as well like the menu is just like a list container and then we need to provide the menu items as well so like we can have the menu item so a menu item should be there like this so suppose this is a menu item over there so inside this now we want to render something like we can just render the typography here and now we can just provide the state as well inside the menu so like the menu we need to provide the open prop so we can have the open and if we provide the open as the true so the menu would be opened so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now here we have the menu which is open so you can see now here we have the menu which is open but now we need to open this menu on this button so the anchor element of this menu should be on this button so we need to provide the anchor element inside that so for the anchor element we can again use the state so we can have the use state over there like this so we can import the use state then we can use the anchor element like this so we can have the anchor el set anchor el and initial value of the anchor element that should be we can provide the null and after that now what can we do so we can provide the type as well so we can have a type of the element so the element or we can provide the type of the null because the initial value is of the type of the null so here we can provide the type of the element then we can provide the type of the null like this so we can have the null like this so we have the type over there like this <coughs> so now we have the state for the anchor element so now what we'll be doing inside that so once we click on this button so once we'll be clicking on this button so we'll be providing this button as an anchor element for this menu so it will open below this button so for that here we have the icon button so what we'll do so we'll use the own click inside that so here we have the own click and on the own click now what we'll be doing so we'll be using the set anchor element that should be the set anchor element inside that and it should be equals to now we want to have the target of this button as well because we want to have the exact target of this button so we can get the event from there and from the event we can just get the target so we can have the event dot current target like this so it will give us the exact target of this button and then it will set the anchor element to it and then we can move on and here you can see inside the menu we have a prop of the anchor element to provide the anchor element and now the anchor element should be equals to now this anchor element over there now we have the anchor element over there and now the last step would be now you can see now we have the open prop as the true so it will be by default open so now what do we want to do so we can just check like if we have something inside the anchor element then only the open prop should be true so we can do that so we can just turn the anchor element inside a boolean that should be equals to we can have the anchor element so you can see if we just save if we just move on to the application if we just refresh once again now you can see now initially you can't see the menu over there but once you will click on this button then you can see now you have the anchor element over there so you can see now you have the anchor element and it is working perfectly fine so you can see now it is working perfectly fine and once clicking on this menu now we have the menu over there so that's how it works and now what can we do so inside the menu we have a prop of the own close as well so we have a own close and the own clause is called whenever we click outside of this menu so we can use a callback function once again and then we can have a set anchor element once again and that should be equals to the null so it will set the anchor element to the null and then the boolean will give you the false then it will be set it as a open as the false so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see once we click outside now you can see now we do not have the anchor element for this menu and now the menu is false and the open for the menu is false and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there so now you can see it is working totally fine and now you can see now we have two options inside this we have a profile and then we have the logout option and now what we want to do as the next step 
So once we click on the profile, now we want to move on into the profile page of that user. And once we click on the logout, then we want to log out the user. So for that, first we can work on the profile. So here inside the menu item once again, so again, we can use the link component as we use inside the tabs. So the link component should be the link which will be imported from the React Router DOM. And then we can just provide the prop of the two as well like this. And that should be equals to, so we can have the profile like this. So we can have the profile. And after that, we can just do same for this logout as well. So you can see we have the menu item, but we do not want to move to any other component or any other page once we click on the logout. So we want to perform a specific action. So the action would be equals to, so we can use the on click. And then we want to dispatch an action to the Redux that the user is currently locked out. So for that, we can move on and then we can provide a callback function here. So we can move on and we can provide a function here for this on click. And then we can provide a callback function for the on click as well. So we can have a const, we can have the handle logout. We can have the handle logout like this. And that should be equals to a function. And inside this function, now what we'll be doing is we'll be using the dispatch to dispatch an action to the Redux. So we can have a const, we can have the dispatch once again. And that should be equals to, we can have the use dispatch over there. So we can have the use dispatch and then we'll be dispatching an action to the Redux. So we can have the dispatch, we can have the auth actions dot, we can have the logout function. And after that, we can move on to the main page as well. So for that, we can again import something from the React Router DOM and that should be, so here you can see, we can import the navigate as well from the React Router DOM. So we can use the use navigate and then we can just provide the reference for the use navigate as well. So we can have the navigate and that should be equals to the use navigate here. So we have the use navigate and then we can navigate to the home route with that. So we can just use the navigate and that should be the home route. So if we just save and now we need to just register this function inside the callback like this. So we can register here. And here you can see here we are getting the TypeScript error once again. So what we can do for this, so we can remove the link component from here and we can just use the on click once again. So here we can have the on click and we can do the same like we did for the logout. So we can use the navigate over there. So what we can do, so we can have the cost, we can have the own profile click. So that should be equals to a function once again. And now what do you want to do inside that? So we can just use the navigate like this. We can navigate to this route, like we can navigate to the slash profile route after that. And then we can just call this function in the on click. So we can just register here for the callback. So here we have the own profile clicked. So if we just save, if we just move on to the application, if we just click on the profile, now you can see now we are into the profile page of the user. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine with that. And then we can just remove the link import as well from there. And we can also remove the react import as well. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside our application. And now let's just move on and let's just implement these steps for the block scruts functionality. So for that, now you can see the user operations are completed. Now we are seeing all of the blocks as well inside the blocks page. And now we want to make a functionality for that user, for the locked in user, that the user can post a new block. So for that, inside the center of this header, we'll be adding an option for posting a new block for that user. So let's do that. So here you can see now the authentication part of this application is completed. So now we are seeing all of the blocks. Now we have the home and then you can see the user is currently logged in. So now we want to enable the functionality in which user can create a new block. So we can enable that functionality inside the navigation bar. So we can render the link inside the navigation bar. So once the user will click on that bar, so then we should be moved on to add block page. So for that, you can see here we are running the tabs container. Here we have the logo of this application. And just between that, we can just enable that link. So we can have a box container over there once again. So suppose that is a box and inside that now we'll be rendering that content. Now we'll be rendering that link over there. We can provide the SX styles for the custom CSS styling. So we can have the header styles like this. And then we can have, we can have the add link over there like the add link like this. And inside the add link, now we can provide the styles for it. So suppose we have the author button, then we can use the add link like this. And inside this, now we can provide some styles. Like here we can just provide the display that should be the flex so we'll be using the flex box once again and then we need to use the align items so we can have the align items like this and that should be the center so we'll be adding the items inside the center we'll be having the justify content after that that should be again inside the center of the screen and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be providing here the gap as well between the items we can have a gap of around one inside all of these items and then what we can do after that, then we can use the position and that should be the absolute. So we'll be using absolute position and then we can just provide here the right. So we'll be having some right. So we can have the right margin of around 40% from the right side. 
and after that what we'll be doing so we'll be providing the width as well so that should be somewhere around 300 pixels would be enough and then we can just provide the padding as well so the padding can contain around i think five pixels of the padding would be enough inside the link and then we need to provide the hover state as well so we can have the hover state like this so the hover can have some styles like we can use the background color for the hover so we can have the background color and here we'll be using the rgba color for the red blue green and alpha so rgba and with that we can use the zero 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 and we can use the 0 0.5 with that so we can have a 0 0.5 so it will be a little bit transparent color and after that what we'll be doing after that so here we can just provide here the border radius so we can have the border radius like this and that should be somewhere around 10 would be enough we can put the cursor as well that should be the pointer like this and then we can use your i think that would be enough for us so we have this over state after that and now we can just move on inside this header so here you can see now we have the at link and now inside that now we'll be rendering a typography over here so we can have the typography and inside that typography now what can we do so you can see uh inside the typography again we can use the font family here so we can have a font family and that should be again equals to we can give the work sense as of now and then inside the typography we can have a add your block like we can have the add or we can have the post your block like this so we can have a post new block and after this typography then we can render an icon as well so we can render an icon button once again and inside this icon button once again we can use the i am blogger like this so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see now inside the center of the screen now we have a post new block option over there we can just increase the font size as well inside this so we can have a font size and that should be equals to somewhere around i think the font size can be somewhere around 20 would be enough so we can have a 20 of the font size so now you can see now it is looking good and then we have the post new block over there we can just provide the different color for the icon so we can have the color that should be inherited from the backend so that should be inherited from the page so it will give you the white color so you can see now we have the functionality of the post new block after this so you can see this is also looking good so we enter the blocks page and then you can see once the user is logged in then the user can see the functionality of posting a new block from there so now let's just move on and let's just define that functionality over there so now what we can do so once we click on the post new block so now we should be moved on into the add block page so for that what we can do so we can just provide a functionality like again we can use our own click inside this box so here inside the own click now what we'll be doing here so we can use here the navigate once again so what we can do so again we can import the navigate from the react router dom so we can have the use navigate hook you can have the use navigate and then you can provide a reference as well so you can have a navigate and that should be equals to it should be the use navigate hook so that should be the use navigate and after that now what you will do so here you can see now we have this function then we can just provide a callback function here we can have the handle add block so that should be handle add block and then we can define that callback function over here we have the handle add block and that should be equals to a callback function over there then we can just run here the navigate like this we can have the navigate then we can navigate to the add block page so we can have the slash add so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see once we click on this post new block now we are into this slash add route and everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now let's just move on and let's just register these routes like the add block and then we can register the profile as well once we click on the profile so we can register the profile so inside the add block first we can provide the component inside the blocks we can provide the new component as the add block like this we can have the add block .tsx. and inside this we can just run the rfc for the default setup so we have the default setup and after that for the profile we can move on into the user and then we can just run here the profile as well so we can have the profile.tsx like this and inside this now we can just render again now we can just again render the rfce for the boilerplate code and now finally we can move on and we can register these screens inside the app component so we can just copy that once again we can just copy two more times and after that now what we'll be doing here so here that should be slash add and the component that we want to render in the ad is the ad block component and for the profile like this now we should be rendering the profile page of that user so we can have the user profile like this so we can have i think we have the profile component for there we have the profile like this so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see for the profile now we have the profile over there and you can see once we move on into the post new block now we have the ad block feature as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and now the next step is that we want to achieve 
if you want to work on the add block part so now after all of these things now we want to just work on the block functionalities so now from this application from this page now we'll be working on the add block part and this will be very interesting page in the overall application so there you will see an advanced type of interface from where we can add a block for the user so if you have seen the medium clone like i can show you the medium here like you can show the medium and then you can see here how can we write the blocks inside the medium so if i open the medium like this if i just click on the get started so i think we need to sign in over there so you can see this is the block page for the medium so that's how we write the blocks inside the medium so you can see it is looking good so we have the functionality like the title so we can write so we can write any title like this inside the medium and then you can see after the title we can render this story as well like this so we can render this story so that will be the functionality that will be defining inside our application as well so we'll be having this type of functionality over there you can see we have in the title like inside the header we can render the title like we can have tell your story we can have something around we can have the react chase like this then we can render the actual content of the block like this so that will be the functionality that will be building inside our application as well so let's close all of that and let's just implement that functionality over there so we can move on into the ad block and first we can define the styles for them so we can move on into this i think we can move on into the styles we can provide a new styles for we can have the add block we can have the add block we can have the styles dot ts like this and now inside this file now we'll be defining the styles so we can have a cons we can have the add styles and that should be so we need to define the type and the type would be equals to the styles that we have and that should be equals to an object which will contain all of the styles of the add block so now we have the add styles so now we can define the styles for the container like this so we can have the container over there and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be providing at the width of the container that should be the hundred percent so it should be the hundred percent of the width then we can use the height as well so the height would also be again the hundred percent of the height then what we'll be doing so we'll be using the display that should be inside the flex then we'll be using a flex direction inside that so we can use the flex direction so that should be inside the column basis like now so like now we have the column basis with that so now after this container now what we'll be doing so we can move on into the paint once again to design that so inside this you can see first we have the page like this so here we have the parent container page with that and inside that now what we'll be doing so we'll be using a title tag like suppose you can use the h1 tag over there so inside the header we'll be having the functionality of directly editing the content of the dom so we can edit the content of the dom with that and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be rendering the paragraph tag after that in which we can just write the description of that blog and inside the header so before all of these things then we'll be adding a button as well like this to publish your blog so we'll be having the button like this as well so let's move on and let's define this type of functionality inside this page so here so here you can see first we have the container then we can just define the header of that block to have that button as well so we can have the block header we can have the display again for the header that should be we can again use the flex box once again and then what we can do so we can use the justify content that should be inside the center of the screen then we can also use the flex direction as well so flex direction should be the column basis and after that now what we'll be doing after that so we can just provide the font weight as well so we can have the font weight and that should be equals to the bold and then what we'll be doing so we'll be using the padding as well so we can have the padding padding should be somewhere around we can give the three as well and then we can use the align items as well so we need to align all of these items inside the center align items should be center and then what do we need to do so i think we can use the justify content and that should be somewhere around space around would be okay so we need some spacing between the elements as well so we can have a space around because what we'll do so we'll enable the functionality and the interface of the medium so first we can have the name and the details of that user then we'll be having the publish button like that so we can have the space around property with that and now we can just move on into the ad block page into the ad block component so first we can define the header so for that we can just use uh, again the box from the MUI so that should be the box and it should be wrapped with the box only and after that now what we'll be doing inside that so we can move on and we can provide the SX prop we can have the export we can export this first we can have the add styles over there like this add styles and then we can use the container over there we have a dot container with that and after that now what we'll be doing so we can just remove this and then we can just use another box over there and inside this box now what we'll be doing so we'll be having the sx prop once again we'll be having the sx prop and that should again be that styles dot we can have the block header 
we can have the block header like this and now inside this header now we'll be applying some of these styles like we'll be using the typography once again so inside this we'll be using the typography and inside this typography now we want to render the content like we can have the authored by with that we can have the author name and the author is currently the user which is logged in so we can have the author like this so we can have the author by and we can use the static name as of now like this we have the authored by and suppose we can use the static name like the nikhil as of now so here we have the authored by and now what after that now we can just render a button as well after this typography so we can have the button like this and now inside this button now what we'll be doing so we'll be just rendering the content to publish this blog so for that we can just use the button we can just have here the color of this button so the color should be we can have the success color that is a green color then we can use the variant as well that should be the contained like this so we can have the contained so we can have a text of the publisher so we can have the published block like this so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the authored by nikhil and then we have the published like this and and you can see we are seeing the content on the bottom of each other but that's not the functionality that we wanted so here you can see here we are running the flex direction as the column but this should be row so the row is the initial property so we can remove that as of now and then you can see once we will save once we'll move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting the content over there we have the authored by as the nickel and then we have the publish button over there to publish this block so everything seems to be working fine again and now let's just move on and let's just define the functionality in which we can just edit and we can just add the title and the content of this block so for that we can use a form for that so again we can move on to the add block page and after this button i think after this box inside the parent container then we'll be using a form so here we have this form inside that and now we can just remove this action and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be just defining here the box after this form which will be a container for all of these elements of the form and this box will be having the styles we can have the styles and that should be we can have the add styles once again dot we can have the form container so here we have the form container after that and after that we can move on into the add styles and then we can define some styles for this form container as well so the form container will only be having two items only so we can have the form container and that should be we can have the display again that should be as the flex and then we'll be using the flex direction like this so we have the flex direction property as the column like this so now inside this form container you can see now we have the form container over there now we need two elements to render the first will be the h2 tag where we will render the title of that block and then inside the second tag there will be the paragraph tag and the paragraph tag will be having the content of this page so first we can just render the h2 like this so we can have the h2 tag directly and then we can just provide here some of the props like we can just provide here the placeholder and after that we can have another prop which can be the content editable so we can provide the prop as the content editable inside that and then you can see this is a prop in which you can see once we move on into the application so you can see now you can add any heading over there and it is working perfectly fine then you can see you can write as long the heading as you want so you can see that's the functionality that we wanted inside our application and now we need to find the styles for the h2 as well but before that let's just render the paragraph as well so we can just render the paragraph after that so suppose that is a paragraph so this will be a paragraph tag and inside that now what we'll be doing so again we can have the content editable that should be again equals to the true so they will be having the content editable property as the true for the paragraph as well and now we need to define some styles as well for the h2 and the paragraph so what we can do so we can move on into the ad block styles and there what we can do so we can just export another styles for this h2 and the paragraph text so we can have the export because we can have the html element styles and that should be we need to define the type like the type should contain i think the css properties like this so this is of the type of this we have the key of the string then we have the value of the css properties then we can define the h2 over there so we can have the h2 styles we can have the font size as well we can define our own font size that should be around 40 pixels would be enough then we can just provide the font family once again so we can have the font family of i think we can again use the work sense over there we can have the work sense and then we can use the margin from the left we can have the margin from left that should be i think 50 pixels from the left and then we can use the margin from the right as well so that should also be the 50 pixels then we can use the margin from the top as well so from the top we can use a margin around 40 pixels from the top 
and then what we can do then we can use the outline as well so the outline should be the none so that should be the outline and now we need to define some styles for the paragraph element as well so suppose we have the paragraph then we can use the border that should be equals to we can give the none and then we can also use uh, the outline once again that should be equals to we can give the none and then we can use uh, the margin left once again so this will be the margin from the left and the right and from the top as well so we can use this margin over there so i think from the top we can only give 30 percent for this and after that i think we can just provide the font family once again so we can have the font family like this we have the font family and that should again be the work sense like this and here that should be the work sense and after that now what we'll be doing so we can just provide uh, the minimum height for this so the minimum height for the paragraph should be around we can give 300 pixels for the minimum height and after that now what we'll be doing so we'll be using the font size property so font size property can be equals to we can give the 18 pixels for the font size and here you can see we had the font size of 40 but here we'll be having the font size of 80 pixels over there and then we can give the font weight as well so font weight for this should be somewhere around 500 so if we just save and now we need to apply these styles to these elements for the HTML element styles so we can move on into the h2 we can provide the style prop so we'll be having the HTML element styles dot we can have here the h2 style we, we can have the h2 style for this we can again move on we can define the styles for this we can have styles for the paragraph element so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see we have this h2 from here i think the placeholder is not working so i have removed here the placeholder so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting the styles over here you can see now we can just write anything like this so now you can see now we have this header and then you can see inside this now we have the content of our application so now you can see now we have used the interface of the medium to make this and you can see this is very easy to implement we just need to enable the properties like the content editable for the browser so you can see it is very easy and it is very simple to use so you can add your block like this and then what you can do is you can provide the initial value like you can provide the initial value like the title we can describe your story so we can have describe your story so that will be a type of blog application that we want so we have the describe your story so if we save so now you can see if we just move on to the application if we refresh the page then you can see now initial value that we have is we have the post your story title and then you can see now inside the content page inside the paragraph tag now we have the describe your story and then you can just change the content that you want so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine so here you can see now we have designed the ad block page inside our application and it is working perfectly fine so you can see now we can change the title as well we can write any title that we want we can just change the description as well we can write any description that we want as well and it is working perfectly fine so you can see now we have achieved this step of the designing now we want to just work on getting the data of the respective elements so you can see now we haven't used yet the form element so you can see we just use the form and we can also remove the form from here because we haven't used the form inside that we are just directly using the elements like we have the heading element over there and then we have the paragraph element over there and it is working totally fine so here we do not need the form over here so now you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we want to get their data as well so unlike the forms we cannot get their data like we can provide the value prop to them and then we can get their data so it is not like the form because in the form we have the input elements and this is not the input element this is the heading element so how can we get their data so inside this we can just get their data by accessing directly to the dom element so here you can see these elements are added by default into the dom so we need to get their data by accessing their dom elements like if you will just hover over this element you can see here we have the h2 and if you will check inside this so you can see here we have the dom element inside that and then you can see inside the dom element we have the property of this post your story we have the property of the dom and then you can see inside that we have the value of this and then you can see once you change anything inside that so this value also changes so we need to get this value from the dom with that and how can we get that so in the react if you want to get the value directly from the dom then how can you do that so you need to use the use ref from the react so what does the use ref will do so the use ref is a type of hook which connects your element directly to the dom element and then it gives you all of the properties of that dom element and then with that you can just get their values as well like this so if you will just move on and if you will just provide the ref inside that so first you need to use the ref 
so for both the elements we'll be using the respective refs over there like for the heading and the paragraph we'll be using the respective refs so for that inside the top we can just define their ref so we can have the const we can have the heading ref over there like this heading ref and that should be equal to so we can have the use ref over there so here we can have the use ref and here we need to define the type as well for this use ref so we can define the type like we can have the html we can have the heading element because we are using the heading element so we can have the property of the html heading element or we can have the property of the null as well because initially this prop would be the null so we'll be using the null initially inside this element and it will work perfectly fine and we need to define same for the paragraph element as well so we can have the const we can have the paragraph or we can have the content element over there so we can have the content ref like this and after that we can just move on and we can just provide the html paragraph element over there because we are using the paragraph element inside that and then we can move on and then we can just provide the respective refs over there so we have the heading ref over there so we can just provide a ref prop inside that so each html element contains the ref inside the jsx so we have the ref and then ref we can just directly refer to this ref over there like we have the heading ref we can just ref to the heading ref over there and same can be applied to the paragraph element as well we can give the ref that should be equals to so we can have the paragraph sorry we can have the content ref over there like this if you will just save and then you will see there won't be any change inside this application there won't be any effect but if you will just move on and here you can see here we have added the button for publishing the blog and on click of that button now what we can do so we can just provide a functionality that on click of that button we can just get their values of the content ref and the heading ref so we can just provide a callback over here like this and then we can just lock their both of their values so we can have the console.log of the heading ref over there like this and then we can do same for the content ref like this so we can once again have a lock statement and inside that we can render and then inside that we can just add the value of the content ref inside that so if you will save if you will move on to the application if we can move on to the console then you can see if we write anything over there like this even in, in like this as well and then you can see once we click on publishing the blog once we click on the publish button so here you can see now we are getting two values over there so each ref element so each user ref element inside the react.js contains a default property of the current and inside the current property so you can see inside the current object it gets the whole element from the dom so now you have the whole h2 element from the dom so you can see once you will click on this h2 so then you can see now we are accessing directly the dom element from this use ref hook and you can see this is working flawlessly then you can see inside the dom element now we can just get the values as well and how can we get the values inside the dom element inside the javascript so it is very easy so we can just get the value from the inner text from there so we can just get the inner text value from there and it will give you the value inside the string format so you get the value inside the string and that's how you can just get their values and same applies for the heading as well because it is also a root element inside the dom because it is also an element inside the dom so you can just get their value like this from the inner text so that's how we can just get their values so we can have the heading ref dot we can have the current property dot we can have here the inner text over there like this so we can have the inner text and same applies for this as well so we can have the current like this current and then we can just get the inner text like this so if you will just save if you will move on to the application then you can see if you will just not publish this application if you will just not publish this blog so you can see now you got your heading you got your post your story this 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 and then you got this as well as your content and then once you change your content over there like we can have the my new blog like this and then you can see if you will just write some content over there like that can be my first blog with the values and then if you will just click on the publish once again so you can see now you're getting all of the data of this heading as well of their content as well of your blog and everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside this application so here we go here you can see now we are getting the values as well and it is working perfectly fine so you can see now we have the values and you can see this is how simple and how easy it is to use this ref elements and connecting directly to the dom element and one major advantage with that 
is it will not read under the component on every state change. So if you will just write here the log statement over there, like you can have the render and then you can have here the count like this. So here we have the count and then we can just increment the value of the count as well. So we can have the count plus plus and then you will see that how many times the component will re-render once we use this ref elements. So if you will just remove everything, if you will just refresh, then you can see now we have rendered 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you can see once we write anything inside that, so you can see once we write anything over there inside the heading or inside the paragraph, then you can see now on every input render, on every input enter, the component is not re-rendering. And then you can see even if we now publish this, then you can see again, we are not re-rendering the component. And you can see it is working perfectly fine. And then you can see now we have a big performance advantage inside this application as well. And it is working totally fine inside that. And now the final step that we can do is we can just move on and we can just post this block as well. So we can make a mutation request once again to the GraphQL to post this uh, to post this blog over there. So for that now what can we do? So again we can just move on and we can just provide a new mutation for posting a new blog. So how can we do that? So we can again move on into the mutations file. So here you so here you can see here we have the mutations and now we can just define a new mutation for posting a new blog. So again we can have the export, we can have the const, we can have the add block like this. So we can have the add block. And that should be equals to again, we can use the GQL for the GraphQL query. Once again, we can use that. And then what we can do, so we can use the mutation over there. And again, we can define the name of that mutation that we need to define. So we can have the add block once again like this. So we can have the add block like this once again. And then inside that, now we need to define the variables as we defined earlier as well. So we can use these variables. And then we can just cross check once again that what are the variables that we need to define. So we can move on to the handlers as well. So here you can see, uh, here we have the handlers. We have the mutation of adding a blog here. So we have the title, the content, the date, and the user with that. So let's move on and let's provide these mutations over there. So we can have the title like this. So we can have the title of type of the string once again. So that should be the string and it's a require. Then we can use the content as well. So we can have the content over there like this. So we can have the content and then we can just provide the type as the string and it should be the non-null property and then we need to provide the date as well so we can just provide the date so variable date like this then we need to provide the type like that should be the type of the string like this once again the user as well so we need the user id so we need hash we can have the user and that should again be as a string format inside that so it would be the string and now we can just move on and we can just provide the mutation over there the exact mutation for the graphql so we can have the add block like this so i think we have a function name of the add block inside the graphql so here you can see here we have once again the add block so we can use that we have the add block and then we need to provide the variables over there like we need to provide the title like this so that should be this title over there then we need to provide the content as well so we can have the content like this so we can have the content and then the value of the content is the variable content like this like we can have the content and then we can just use uh, I think the date as well so we can have the date and that should again be the date like this so we can have the date and then we need to use uh, the user as well so we can have the user id that should be the user with that like this so here we have the user so you can see now we have the title the content the exact value of that content the exact variable the date the user as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then what data do we need to get inside the return so we need to provide that data so we can just provide the data like we need to only get here the ID or I think we only get here the title of that block. So we only need the title. So you can see now we have defined the mutation for the add block as well and it is working perfectly fine. And I think we haven't used the commas after this variable. So we can use the commas like this, this, this and this. So you can see now. I think they are removing by default. So now we can just move on and we can just provide here the values. So you can see now we can just remove the log statement over there like this. Now we have the values and now on click of that button. Now we do not need to log the data. Now we'll be handling a callback function over here. So we can have the handle submit like this. So we can have the handle submit. Then we can and then we can define the handle submit over here. So we can have the const. We can have the handle submit over there like this handle submit. That should be equals to a function once again. And inside that now what do we need to do? So from this function now we need to make the API request from there. 
So first, even before the handle submit, because it will just directly submit the block. Before the handle submit, now we want to register the mutation as well inside the use mutation hook. So for that, we can just move on. We can just provide the const. We can have something that should be equals to again the use mutation over there, use mutation. And then the mutation that we need to provide is the actual mutation that we have just defined over there, like the add block. So we need to use this mutation. So we can have the add block. We can just import that from here like this. So, so we can just use the add block import. And then what do we need to do? So here we need to just provide here the function for calling this. So we can have the add block once again like this. So we can have the add block. So this will be the function over there. And now the next step that we want to do is I think, so I think we only need one variable over there and it will work perfectly fine. Then now the next step that we want to do is here you can see the handle submit is there and then we can just make this function as an asynchronous function. And now inside this, now what we can do? So we can just post a new block inside the database. So, so first we can just get the data. So we can get the const. We can get, uh, I think we can just get the title. So that should be equal to, so we can have the heading ref over there. So we can have the heading ref dot current dot. We can have the, I think we can just have the inner text over there. So inner text like this. So here we have the inner text over there. So here we have the values. So I think first we need to provide some validation checks as well before this. So I think because it will give you the value of the string or the undefined. So I think what we can do is first we can just check the validation once again. So we can have the if we can have uh, the heading ref over there, heading ref dot we can have the current dot we can have the inner text like this and then we can just use your dot length is greater than zero or we can have the inner text we can have dot trim so it will remove the white spaces so we can have dot trim dot length again is greater than zero and the same for the content ref as well so we can use this validation for the content as well like this so we can have the content ref over there and if the content ref dot trim dot length is greater than zero and then only we need to perform below steps and then only we need to perform these steps inside this and here you can see object is possibly the undefined so i think again we can just check one more validation check like if we have the heading ref and then and then only we need to provide something like if we have the heading ref and then we can have the heading ref dot current dot uh, i think uh, we can just check with the heading ref dot current like this like if you have the current then only we need to provide this okay it will work fine so we can just check with this like if you have the heading ref dot current then we need to do this and then we have the content ref like this we can have the content ref dot current and then we need to just check the validation check with that so you can see now we have this validations over there we have these validations and they are working perfectly fine and now the next step that we want to do here so here you can see now we have here the values as well so then we need to just get their values. So we can have the cost, we can have the title over there. So that should be equals to, so we can have the heading graph dot current dot, we can have the inner text over there. So we can have the inner text like this. And after that, we can just get the values of the content ref as well. So we can have the cons, we can have the content over there. And it should be the content ref once again, content ref dot current dot inner text property once again. So here we can have the inner text and after that we have the title and then we have the content then we can use for the date as well so we can have the const we can have the date so that should be equals to the new date with that so we can use the current date because the block is now being created on the current date time so we can use the new date and then we can just convert the date into the iso string or i think it would work perfectly fine so i think this date will also work perfectly fine with that so we can have the new date over there and now we can just get the user as well. So we can get the user ID. So we can get the const. We can add the user. And that should be equal to the local storage. Dot we can have the get item. And from the local storage, we will get the item inside the JSON format. So what we can do. So we can use the get item once again. And that should be the user data like this. So we can have the user data like this. And then what we will do. So we'll just pass the data as well. So we can have the JSON dot parts. So we'll pass the string data in, into the objects, into the original form. So we can have the JSON dot parts and that should be as string as well like this. So we can have a string, then we'll use this value over there. And then we have the JSON dot parts. Then we can have the ID property with that. So we can have dot, we can have underscore ID. 
because inside that we have used here underscore id so that should be underscore id like here we can just cross check like if we are getting all of their values or not we can use for the title we can use for the content over there we can use for the date as well so we can use for the date over here so here we have the date we can use for the user as well like this so we can have the user like this so if you will just save if you will just move on to the application if you will just add anything over there like this if you will just click on the publish so here you can see now we are getting the values so here you can see here we have the title over there we have here the content over there like this so here we have the content then we have the date over there like this so here we have the date but we are not getting the user id from there so we are not getting the user id so we can just check that why we are not getting the user id over there so we can move on into the application we can move on into the local storage so here you can see here with the id property and not the underscore id so that should be the id over there like this so if you will just save if you will move on to the application if you will just move on to the console if you will just check once again then you can see now we are getting the id as well and now you can see it is working perfectly fine so now we have all the data with that so you can see we have the title we have the content we have the date we have the user id so everything is working perfectly fine and after that finally now what we can do so we can just move on and we can just provide and then we can just call this function over there we have the add block so we can again use the try catch block once again so we can have the try we can have the catch once again and inside the catch now what we can do so here inside the catch we can just lock the error as of now so we can lock the error dot message with that like this and then inside the error now what we can do so we can provide the type as the any with that and now inside the try and now let's just move on and let's just call this function over there so we can have the const we can have the response so that should be equals to so we can have the await and that should be equals to the function that we have defined of the add block of the so we can have i think we have here this function we have the await we can use the add block like this and it's a promise and then inside that now we need to provide the variables as well so inside that object we can provide the variables of this request so for the variables now again it will be an object which will contain the properties like the title like this and the content like this over there we can have the date like this over there like this we can just use the user like this of this so here you can see we have the title content date and the user and everything should work perfectly fine after that and now we can just check the response as well so we can just const we can have the data so that should be again equals to we can have the await we can have the response dot data with that so we get the data from that response from there so that should be the await response dot data so i think uh, we will get the data from there so we get the response dot data then what we can do so we can just log the data from there so we can just log the data so if we will just save if we will just move on to the application and then you can see if we write some block like this like we can add the block so we can just copy this block from there so we can just copy that and then we can just paste that into this like we can have the title like this so here we have the title inside that and then we can just move on and then again we can just copy the content over there like this so we can just copy the content like this inside that so we can just copy content till this space so we can just move on and we can just paste the content over there like this so here you can see now we have the content over there so if we just move on and if we just publish the content over there if we just move on to the console as well if we just click on the publish then you can see i think we got an error like the response not successful receive the status code of 400 maybe something went wrong and then we can just move on into the network tab to see what went wrong so we have the variable user of type string i think variable user of type string is i think used in position except so you can see here we go because we are just using the type of the user as the string so we need the type as the id so we can move on into the mutations and you can see inside these blocks as well inside the handlers we have defined the user as the id not the string so we need to define i think the id with that so we can move on to the mutations and here we can just use the type user that should be type of the id like that so if you will just save again if you will move on to the application if you will remove everything from the console and the network tab if you will just again try to publish then you can see i think so there we go so there you can see now we have published this so you can see now we are getting the add block from there and then you can see in return now we are getting the title that we have just added so now you can see now we are getting the response that is successful and if we just move on into the network tab so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine so here you can see here we have the data and the headers the status code is also 200 which is okay so everything seems to be working perfectly fine 
and if we just move on i think into the blocks page then you can see now we'll be seeing that blocks over there so there you can see now we so there you can see now we are getting this block over there and you can see now this styling is i think a bit rough so you can see we can just fix the styling part as well but you can see now the block is working perfectly fine so now we are getting the exact block and then you can see now we have the date as well like this we have the exact date like we have so everything is working perfectly fine like this and now you can see now the edge block functionality has been completed and now the next step would be now we want to delete and we want to update the block and how can we do that so for deleting and updating the block first let's we just discuss about the profile so inside the profile of that user once we move on to the profile page so here we want to just show all of the blocks of that user so we want to show all of the blocks of that user and after that we need to just have your the delete button and update button for all of these blocks so first we need to design the profile page of that user and then only we need to just work on the delete and update part and we will complete this whole project so let's just work on the profile so we can move on to the pin to see that how we can design the profile page so suppose we have this page again suppose we have this web page and after that now what can we do so inside first half of the page like inside like we can have first 60 percent or first 70 percent of the page we can just render all of the blocks of that user so we can just use the same cards of the blocks that we have previously so we can use same cards over there like this so we can have same cards so here we can have these cards but on the top of that card we can have the buttons for update and deleting that post so on the top we can have the buttons for updating and deleting these posts so they will be the action buttons on there and then we can have multiple cards over there and inside this and then onto the right side of the page so onto the right side we can just display the profile details of that user like we can display the avatar of that user so there can be the avatar icon of that user and after that we can just show the details of that user like the name email and all of their blocks that we have and then we can just show the count of their blocks as well like how many blocks the user currently have so let's just design this page quickly so we can move on again into the application and here you can see here we have this profile page which is just the empty page as of now and now we need to design it again from the scratch so what we can do so again we can use the box from here so we can have the box and after this box now we want to provide the stylings as well inside this so for the styling again we can move on into the styles we can define here the block styles as well so here we can define the profile styles so we can have a profile we can have the styles dot ts and now inside this file now we'll be designing the styles for the profile page so we can have the const we can have here the profile styles that should be equals to a styles so that should be the styles and now we need to define the type as well so the type can be equals to so again we can use the styles from the home page so we have the styles like this and after that we need to design the styles so there can be a topmost container so we can have a top container like this once again so that should be the container after that and then this will contain the display that should be equal to the flex and then it will contain the flex property as the one so we'll be giving the flex property so by default flex that should be the one so we'll be dividing this flex one to two containers the first will be first 70 percent second will be second 30 percent part of the screen and then we can just have the first container so we can have the blocks container like this so we can have the blocks we can have the container for the blocks and now inside this now what we'll be doing so we'll be again using the display that should be we can use the flex box once again we can have the flex and we can use the flex property as the 0.7 because we'll be doing it as a 0.7 then we can use the flex direction as well so the direction to be again the column basis so we'll be using the column basis once again and then what we'll be doing so we'll be just defining the padding as well so the padding can be one equivalent to the eight pixels then we can just define as some i think after that we can just define the border as well so we need some border that can be like one pixels of the border would be enough one pixel solid and then we can give the color that we have inside the header so we can have hash 404040 so that should be the border color and after that now what can we do so inside that we will be having like again we'll be having the container for all of the items so we can have the cards container like this and inside this card container now we'll be defining all of the cards like all of the child elements and we'll be using same card elements that we have inside the blog item so we can have this so cards container can have again the display that should be again inside the flex basis then we can also use uh, i think we can use uh, the gap between them so the gap can be again something around five then we can use uh, the justify content and that should be the flex start once again so we'll be starting the items from the start and what can we do so we can get the align items as well 
so align items can again be inside the center or it should be inside the center okay then after that now what can we do inside that so after the align items then we can use your i think the padding or we can use your around we can use the flex wrap so we can have the flex wrap over there and that should be the wrap basis because we'll be wrapping the items over there and finally we can use the padding as well something around four so the padding will be four so this will be the styles for the cards container and after that let's just define all of the cards over here inside that so inside we can move on to the profile page so we can open the profile here and here we can just define the styles over here so first we need to import the box it will be imported we can give these styles and then we need to export these as well so we can export cost these styles and now we can just move on and we can define the profile styles we can have the profile styles dot we can have the container like this we can have the container and after that now what can we have inside that we can just have your another box container for the blocks container so we can have here the sx prop for this sx prop should be we can define here the styles for we can have the profile styles once again we can have the profile styles that should be equals to so we can have the blocks container over there like this and after this blocks container now what we can do so we can just write the typography here like so we can just render the typography like this and inside this typography we can define some styles for this as well so first we can import that then we can define some styles here so we can have the heading text like this we can have the text and that should be we can have the font family that should be equals to so we can give the font family again for the work sense like this we can have the work sense and after that now what can we do so we can give the variant as well so we can have the variant so we need to provide the variant here inside this so we can have the variant like this and that should be somewhere around h2 or h3 so s3 would be okay for the variant and after that now what can we do so we can just provide here uh, the text align into the center so we'll be having the text align into the center for this text for this text and after this we can just render here the blocks like this so here we can just render we can have the my post like this we can have the my post so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see here we have the my post and now what after that now we need to just provide here uh, the styles of this text so we can just use the text styles over there so here we can just put the sx prop that should be equals to so we can have uh, the profile styles once again so the profile styles dot text would be there like this so we have the styles over there and now we can just move on and here you will be seeing we have the my post over there and then you can see where and then you can see here we have here uh, the border as well inside this because we are inside the blocks container so here we have the around 70 percent of the screen width so there we have the border till the 70 percent and after the typography now what can we do so we can define all of the cards after that so again we can use the container for the cards so here we can have this so we can have the box for the cards container and now inside this now what do we want to do so here we need to render all of the cards that we have so inside this now we need to render all of the cards inside that but as of now we haven't fetched any data from the backend so first we need to fetch the data but for now we can just use the dummy array over here like we can use a dummy array like this we can have some expressions between them so inside this we can have some expressions for the dummy array we can have one two three four five we have the elements of five inside the array then we can just use the map over there and inside this map now what can we do so we can just get the item prop from there and now inside this now we can just render the blocks over there so we can have the block item over there and then we can just pass here some blocks like the block should be equals to so we can give so for the title we can give any title like we can give the item dot to string like this so we can give the two string like this and same we can do for other things as well like we can provide the necessary properties like the content again we can have the item dot to string once again for this as well and then we can use for the date as well so we can have the date like this so that can be the new date like this once again and after that now what can we do so i do not think that we need the user as of now or we can need the id so for the id we can write the item itself so with that now you can see now we have the dummy array with that so here we have the dummy data so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have this like the type number is not assignable to string so we can get the item dot to string once again like we can have the two string over here and then you will see that here we will be getting some type errors as well so we can just skip that address as of now so as of now we can just use inside the top we can have the at the rate ts we can have the no check so it will not check for the type address inside this file 
So if you will save, so now you can see now inside the my post, now we have all of the posts like this. So you can see everything is working perfectly fine. You can see now we have the my post over there. And inside that you can see we have the container for all of the posts. And now inside the right of the site, now we can just render the details of the user. So now we can render the details of that user here. So for the details, now what can we do? So here we can move on and you can see we have the profile page for that. And now inside the second half of this, like after this blocks container, then we can just use another box container and it will be for the profile container of the user. Like we can have the profile container. So we can have the SX that should be equals to. So we can have the profile styles dot. We can have the profile container like this. So we can have the profile container for the user like this. And now we need to have some design for the profile container as well. So we can just move on into the CSS part into the design part. So here we can just move this here. So we can have the profile container like this. So we can have these styles like here we can just provide the display. So that should be again be inside the flex and here we'll be giving the flex property. So that should be the remaining 0.3 part for the flex. And after that now what can we do here? So here that will be the container and now inside this now we'll be having the details container of that user. So we can have the box and that should be equals to so we can have the SX we can have the profile styles once again so profile styles dot we can have the user container so we can have the user container like this and now inside this now what we'll be doing so we'll be just having the details of that user so we can define the styles for this as well so we can have the user container and now we need to just render the user container onto the screen because now you can see now you can see now we can just scroll through all of the blocks inside the page so what we need to do so we need to use the position of the user's details into the fixed so we can just have the fixed position of the user details. So once we scroll down, so we should not scroll the details of that user. So for that, we can move on into the user's container once again, and we can just provide the display that should be again inside the flex box. And then we'll be using, I think we can use uh, the flex direction. So that should be again inside the column basis. And then what we can do, we can again use the justify content for that. So that should be again into the flex start. So we'll be starting from directly just from the left corner. Then we'll be using the margin as well from the auto from all of the sides. And then after that, now we'll be using some position. So we can have the position that should be equals to we can give the fixed position for that. So it will be fixed to the position. Then we can give the top as well. So the top should be equals to we can give the 10. We can give same for the bottom. So bottom should also be the 10. And then we can just provide. I think we can just provide for the left we can have the left position that should be equals to some sub 20 pixels from the left and same for the right as well so we can give the right that should also be the 20 from the right and after the right now what can we do so we can just provide the gap between them as well so we can have some gap between the elements so that should be somewhere around five then we can also provide the padding as well between them so the padding would be four so now we have the user container with that and after that now we'll be designing some styles for the user like we can have the avatar of that user here so we can have the avatar design, A -B -A -T -A -R. we can have the avatar design for that. The avatar can contain the width of somewhere. So we can give the width of somewhere around. We can give the 80 pixels of the width for the avatar. We can give around height of again the 80 pixels for the avatar. We can give the height of 80 pixels and background color would be the same as of header color. And after this users container, then we can render the avatar. So we can render the avatar from the material UI. And inside that we can just use the SX prop like this and the SX prop should be equals to so we can again use the profile styles like this so we can have the profile styles dot we can have the avatar like this so we can have the avatar so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the avatar icon and then you can see the position of this item is fixed so it is now not scrolling down once the page scroll down so it means that it's fine so now it's looking good as well and now what we can do after the avatar then we can render the typography over here so we can have the typography we can provide the different variant for this so variant that should be equals to h3 would be okay then we can give the font family as well so that should be again as the work sans like this so we can have the work sans like this i think we have also designed the style for this we have the text we have the work sans but we do not need the text aligned to the center so we can use the work sans over here like this work sans and then what we can do so we can just display the name of that user like we can have the names like we can have the nickel name like this we can have the nickel so if we just save so now we have the name over there like this so here we have the name 
and after that the second typography we can just copy and paste this so we have the second typography for here and here we can have the variant of the h4 so we can again use the work sense for this so we can have the work sense once again so we'll be changing the font for this as well after this profile page and there we can just render the email like we can have the email like this we can have the nickel at the rate test.com like this here we have the email and after that now what we want to do is the next steps so here we can just move on we can just define another typography with there and another typography can contain the blocks count of that user so we can give the font family of i think the mono space so we can have the mono space font and then we can have your uh, i think you load we can have n number of blocks like how many number of blocks that we have so we can have 10 and then after that we can have the blocks so we can have the blocks like this and then we can just render an emoji as well so we can use emojis like this like this and this so you wrote 10 blocks so if we just move on to the applications so here you can see now we have the text over this like now you can see now you wrote 10 blocks and then you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there and then you can see now we have just rendered the detail of that user now we are rendering all post of that user so you can see now we have designed the profile page and you can see it is working perfectly fine over there so here you can see now we have designed the profile page of this application and then you can see it is working perfectly fine so the design is also looking good but now the next step is you can see now we do not have the real data inside the blocks so we only have the dummy data we have used the array of the dummy data inside that so now we need to render the actual data from the backend inside this post so what do we need to do so here you can see if we move on into the local storage so you can see now we are storing the details of that user like the user data id name and the email so now what we can do inside the graphql so we can make a query for a get user by its id and then we can just get a single user details and in the user details we also have the block details as well of a specific user so for that now we need to move on into the backend and we need to add one more query inside the backend for getting the user by its id so we haven't added that request inside the backend so if we move on into the backend's handlers then you can see now we do not have any request inside this inside the query we have the request of getting all of these users getting all of these blocks and getting all of the comments so now we can just make a query as well like getting a user by its id we can have a get user by id with that and after that now what do we want to do here so we can have the user like this so we can have the user object and inside this we can again provide the type the type can be equal so we can give the user type once again so we can have the user type over here and then we can provide the arguments as well like this so we can have the arguments and now inside this arguments now we need to define the type of the id we need to define the argument id that should be equal to so again we can define the type we can have the graphql id and now what do we need to do so we need to run the resolve as well so we can have the async resolve which will resolve the query and we can get the parent like this then we can get the arguments like this as well and inside the arguments we will get the actual id from them then what do we want to do so we can just return the details of that user so we can have the user model once again user model and inside that we need to pass the id of that user and then what after that then we want to run another function after that which is a populate so now we need to populate the records of the collection of the blocks as well so we need to populate the records of the blocks as well so we need to get all of the records of that blocks so we can use the populate and then we can just use the blocks field with that so now you can see now we have this query over here and now if we just check this query inside the graphql interface so we can again move on into the chrome we can again move on into the local host that should be around 500 slash we have the graphql once again because we haven't turned it to the false so that's why it is still here then we can just move on and we can just check that what query can we make so you can see we can get the user as well so we can get the user we need to provide the id of that user as well so we can give the id of this user which is currently logged in so we can move on into the application into this user id then you can see here we have the id for that user so we can just copy that and then we can just paste this id over here and then we can move on and then we can just have the blocks inside that we can have the blocks we can have the title of this block we can have the content of this block like this so if we just specify and if we just save and if we execute this query so let's see what happens so now you can see now we have the id of that user and then you can see now we are getting all of the blocks of that user so you can see now we get the data and inside that we get the user and here you can see now we are getting the array of the blocks so this user has only one single block inside that so that's why we are seeing only one block inside there so you can see it is working perfectly fine and now we can just move on into the front end part and here we can just make the query like this now we can move on into the queries page and now we can define the query over here so we can have the export we can have the const 
we can have the export we can have the cost we can have the get like blocks we can have the get user blocks like this we can have the get user dash blocks and that will be equals to a query so we'll be using the gql once again and inside this now what do we want to do so here we want to run a query so we can use the query like this so we can have the query and then we want to execute the name of this query as of now so here we can define the variables like again we have a dollar sign the id of that user and it is of the type of the id like this and it is required then again we want to run this function of the user of the backend so this is the backend function and now we need to provide the parameter id that will be equals to this variable id with that and now what do we want inside the return so we want something inside the return that will be we can have the block of that user so we can have the blocks with that and in the blocks we need the title we also need the content as of now we also need the date as of now with the blocks so if we save if we move on to the application and now we are into the profile page and now we want to execute this query over here so we can again use the use query hook as we defined earlier so we can have cons we can have something that should be equals to the use query hook over here so we so you can see here we have the use query and here we want to run this query over there get user blocks so we can just execute this query over here we can import this as well and after that now what do we want to do so here we need to provide the variables as well again because we need the variable we need the user id from the local storage so we can have the variable like this so here we have the variable subject so here we need to provide the first variable which is the id and now the id would be equals to again we'll be passing the data from the json so we can have the json dot parse will be local storage dot we can have the get item that should be equals to the user data like this and this should be a string and then we need to just get the id property from there so that will be the data and in this query the things that we want to destructure are the loading so we can have the loading we can have uh, i think we can just have uh, the data as well we can have the error as well like this so if we have the loading then we want to render something else or we want to render this so here after the question mark then we'll be having the linear progress from the material ui so if we just refresh the page then you can see the first there was a loading bar and then we have the data like this and after the loading now what do we want to do so here we can just log the data as well of the data like this so we can have the data like this so if we just save if we move on to the application then you can see now we have the data as well and then you can see now we have the user object and inside the user now you can see now we have the blocks area as well so you can see now we have the first element of the blocks we have here by this 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 we have the date and then we have the title as well <clears throat> and after this now we can add another validation check over there so we can check if we have the error while fetching the query if we have the error now what do we want to do so here we can just return a paragraph tag as of now that should be equals to the error like this so we can have the error like this oh now you can see now we have the loading we have the error and then once we have the data now we'll render the exact data that we have so here now what do we want to do inside that so here inside this loading now what do we want to do so here we can just render another condition like when we have the data and then only we want to render all of these things so we have this query over there so you can see now we have the loading then we have the data then we want to render all of these things so here you can see here we are rendering a dummy array so after that now what can we do so we can use the data dot we can add the user property from the data because we have the user and inside the user we have the blocks so we can use the data dot user we can have the blocks like this and then we can run the map function from them so we can have the map and after that now what do we want to do so after the map we get the item over here we get the block item so the block should be equals to i think for the block we can use here the block that should be we can have the item dot we can have the title over there we can have the title like this and for the content we have the item dot content over there like this we can have the content and we can remove this we can have the date item dot we can have the date so item dot date like this and then for the id we can send the item dot id as well so we can send the item dot id so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting the details of the blog as well so you can see now here we have the detail and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there so you can see now we have just completed with the profile page as well and then you can see it is working perfectly fine over there so now we have the blocks as well if we move on into the blocks then you can see now it's loading the blocks and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there so now we have all of the blocks and then you can see this block is written by the current logged in user so that's why we can see the blocks inside this if we move on to the profile then we can see this block over here so everything is working totally fine with that so you can see now we are done with the blocks part now we are done with the home page as well and now we are done with the profile and the logout page as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now the next functionality that we want to achieve is once we click on any block so now we should be moved on to that block page 
so here you can see here we have just promotion cards inside that so we have just promotional cards for the blocks but once we click on any card item so we should be moved on to that block page so for that now what do we want to do so here first we need to register that page inside the route so we can just register the page with a specific id inside the url like here you can see here we have the blocks and after that we can just view the blocks like we can have the blocks we can have the view we can have dot id of that blog inside that and from that id then we'll be fetching the actual details of that blog so that will be the functionality and process for that so let's just move on and let's just register that page for that so we need to move on into the routes so here you can see here we have a couple of routes but these are just the static routes that we have so now we need to create a dynamic route as well so what we can do so we can just move on and we can just create another route with that we can have the route and there we need to provide the path once again so we can have the path so we can have the path but now inside this path now what we want to do so here we need to move on to slash block slash we can have the view and slash we can have the id of that block and now to declare the id inside the parameters now what do we need to do so we need to add the parameter as the colon slash id of that block so that's how we can just add the id inside that and the element that we want to render so we can use the element so element that should be so we can just define a new element for that so here we have the block so here we can have the view block as well so we can have the view block dot tsx like this and here we can just define the boilerplate once again and we can again move on into the app.tsx and here we can just use the view block like this so we can have the view block so here you can see if we just move on into the block slash view slash id so suppose we have here slash blocks so we can move on into slash block slash view slash id so then you can see now this page will be rendered and now you can see this id can be anything like one two three four or any specific blog id and then this page would be rendered inside that and this one two three four will be stored in the variable of this id so that will be the functionality of this application so now what do we want to do so once we click on any block inside the blocks page so once we click any of the block so then we should be moved on into that block page so for that how can we do that so here you can see inside this block card item so here we have the block item so here we have the details of that block inside the card so inside this you can see here we have the details so what we can do so we can just put the on click functionality inside this card so we can have the on click and now inside the on click we can just have the handle click with that so we can have the handle click with that we can have the handle click and now we can register the handle click function as well inside so we can have the const we can have the handle click and that will be a function and now what do we want to do inside this function so again we need to move on to that specific block page because we have the id as well inside the block type like this id so we'll be navigating with the use navigate to that block page so for that first we can register the navigate as well so we can have a cons we can have the navigate like this we can have the navigate so this will be the use navigate inside that so here inside the handle click now what do we want to do so here inside that we already have the id inside the blobs so we have the block and we can get the id of that block so we can use the navigate directly so we can have the navigate and then we can use the template with all strings so we can have slash block slash we can have the view slash that id of that block and the id we can get from the props so we have the props dot id with that so we have the props dot block dot id and we can navigate to that id with that so that's how it will work and now we can just return this as well so we can have this return so if we just save if we move on to the application then you can see if we just refresh the whole blocks page then you can see if you want to open this block so we can click on that and then you can see now we are into the block slash view and slash id of that block page and there you can see and now from this id now we can fetch the details of this block and then we can render all of the details on this block page so that will be the final functionality that we want to achieve so how can we do that so again we can move on into this page like we have the view block page and now we can just design that page first and now inside this view block now we can define some styling as well for that so we can move on into the styles folder we can just create a new file that can be view dash styles dot ts file and now inside this file now we'll be defining the styles for the view page but before moving on into the styles let's just first move on to the paint and we will design this page as of now so we can move on to the paint so suppose we have a home page like this so suppose we have a blocks page like this so this will be a page of the blocks and now what do we want to do so in the first we can just have another box like that would be the container for the header 
so suppose we have a header container over there after the official navigation bar so here we have the header and inside that first we'll be rendering the name of the author like here can we have the name of the author like here we can have the name of the author like this then we can have the email as well of the author so we can have the email like this of the author so there we have the name and the email and after that now what we'll be having so we'll be having the title of the blog inside the center so inside the header we can have the title of the blog so suppose we have the title of the blog like this like that can be my new blog like this so that will be the title over there suppose this is in the center and after that now what we'll be having after that then we need to render the actual content of that blog so then we'll be rendering the actual content of that blog like this like inside this paragraph we'll be rendering the actual content so after this whole content then we'll be rendering the comments as well so for that we'll be rendering some comments after that so we can have the comments suppose like this so we can have the comments like this after that so that should be here inside this so suppose we'll be rendering this like this so we can have the comments and each comment can have a specific ui for that so we can have comments like this like we can have the comment one we can have comment two after that for a user we can have comment three so that will be the design of this page so let's now continue designing this page so now we are into the view styles file and here we can just define some styles for the view page as well so for the view page first we need to define the styles like we can have the export cost we can have the block styles like this we can have the block page styles like this and that would be we need to give the type as well so the type would be the styles that we can use so we can have the styles and that would be an object so inside the object the first property would be the container so for the topmost container we can just provide some styles like this we can have the container and for the container we can use the display that should be as the flex box so again we'll be using the flex box and then we can use the flex direction as well so here we can have the direction once again like this and the direction can be the column basis so we'll be using the column for the direction and then we can just use the height as well so height would be the 100 percent of the full screen for the full container and then we can use the padding as well so the padding would something around two would be enough so we can have the padding for the container and after that we can have the header as well of this so we can have the page header like this or we can have the profile header because the header will be specifically for the profile so we can have the profile header like this and inside that we can use the display that should be as the flex box so again we'll be using the flex box and then again we can use the direction that should be once again the column and after that now what can we do so here we have the padding of the one that we can have for the header and after that we need to provide the styles for the typography as well inside that so inside the header now what text do we want so we can provide the font as well for that text so we can have the header text like this so we can have the header text and inside that now what do we want to do so here we need to define the font family so here what we can do is we can just provide a different font family than the defaults and the box ends. So for that, we can move on into the Google fonts. And then you can just search for the Arvo font inside that. So you can search for the Arvo like this. So you can have the Arvo and then you can see this font is looking good. So you can get this font here and then you can see what I have. So you can see what I've already chosen for the regular 400. You can see here is my import statement as well, which is modified. So here you can see here is my import statement which contains both of the fonts, the Arvo and the box sense as well. And here you can see for the box sense we have the weight of the 400 and the 500. So it seems to be working fine. So we can just copy that import statement and then you can move on into the index.css once again. And there you can just paste that over here. So you can see now I have already pasted that. We have the font family of the Arvo and we have the font family of the box sense and weight of the 400 and the 500. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So we can have here the font family of the Arvo like this. So we can have the font family and now we can move on to the view block page and then we can just register some of these elements inside that. So what can we do here? So here first we can just remove the div from here. So instead we can use the box from the material UI once again and with the box we can provide the SX once again and that should be we can have the block page styles dot container. So that will be the topmost container so we can use the container for that. And after that, we can use the profile as well. But you can see here, we do not have the block data as of now. So we can get the ID from that block. So you can see once we click on the block, so we can get the ID. But after we will design this page, then we'll get this ID from the URL and then we'll fetch the block from the database. So that will be our approach. So first, we'll complete the design part. So for that, we have here the box, we have here the container. And after that, we can define another box over there. So another box can contain we have the sx that should be equals to so we can have the block styles once again we can have the block page styles and that should be equals to so we can have the profile header 
we can have the profile header like this so we can have the profile header inside that and now what do we want to do as the next step and now inside this we can just render the typography for the header we can define the typography for the name of the author so for the author name we can use the sx that should be equals to again we can use the block page styles like this dot that should be equals to so here we have the styles for the header text so we can use the header text over there and now inside that we can use the name of that author like we can have the nikhil as of now so we can use the sample name like the nikhil as of now we can have the nikhil thadani with that so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the nikhil thadani over there so you can see now we have this font so here you can see here we can define another container as well for the profile headers and and inside that container we'll be having a couple of items like here we will be just registering the email of that user and there will be having the edit page as well so we can have that we can have the box like this so we can have the box we can have the sx that should be equals to so again we can have the block page styles like we can have the profile header items so we can have the items over there and now we can just move on and we can define the styles over there so here you can see now we can use that profile header items and here we can just define the styles like this spray that should be once again the flex box so we'll be using the align items once again so that should be again inside the center of the screen then we can use a uh, i think we can use the padding that should be the one and then we can just define some gap between the elements so the gap would be somewhere around two would be enough so then we can have this profile header items over there so now we can move on and we can define the respective elements as well so we can move the view block here inside the left and then let's just move this view styles inside the right and then we can close the other files as well we can close the sidebar as well and after that we can just move on and we can define the typography as well so we can have the typography again that should be we can define the sx and i think the same styles would be given to the typography that we have over there we have the header text so we can just copy that and then we can just paste that over here we have the header text and then we can provide the email as well for that user so we can have the email like i can have the nickel at the rate we can have the test.com so we can have the email like this so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the nickel at the rate test.com which is the email and it is looking perfectly good and after all of these things now what do we want to do as the next step so here that was the profile header so here it was a profile header and now we can move on and we can define another typographies for the title of the blog and for the content of the blog so we can have the typography once again like this so here we have the typography and inside that we can use the sx prop once again and here we'll be using different styles for this heading of that blog so we can have again the block page styles once again that should be we can have the block title and with the block title now we'll be having another typography over there like this so we can have the another typography and that will be for the block content so we can have the block content over there so we can have the sx we have and we can have the block page styles we can have the block content from there so we can have the block content and here we can just define some styles for them so what we can do so here we have the profile header items and now inside that now what do we want to do so here we can just use here this style we have the block title so we can have the block title over there and that should be equals to so we can have i think we can have the font size for that so that should be somewhere around 30 pixels would be enough i think yes 30 pixels would be enough for them so we can have the pixels over there and after that we can use the text align once again so the text align should be again into the center of that so we need to align the into the center we can have the font family as well so again the font family would be rvo like this so we can have the rvo and then we can move on we can give the font weight as well weight as the 700 as of now and then we can just import that 700 weight as well and now we can move on we can provide the text shadow as well so text shadow can be we can provide somewhere around 2 pixels 2 pixels and 12 pixels of the blur we can define hash triple c color for the text shadow so we can have this for the blocks title and after that we can define some styles for the block content as well so for the content we can define the styles for this content we can move on and we can just provide that here so we can have the block content over there and inside the content now what do we want to do so again we can use the text shadow the last property that we had i think for that i think we do not need the shadow so i think we can still have the shadow we can have the one pixels and we can have the one pixels vertically we can have the six pixels of blur so that we do not see the actual shadow then we can use hash triple c color for that and then what we can do so we can have uh, the padding somewhere around five we can have i think we can and i think we can define the font size as well once again 
so we can have the font size and that should be somewhere around 20 pixels would be enough then we can use the align as well so we can have the text align of somewhere around i think we can have the text align of center or we can have the justify like this so we can have the justify and then we can use the font family here so we can have the different font family here that should be the box sense that we previously imported and after that finally we can have the width as well so that should be somewhere around we can give i think we can just skip that width part over here and now we can move on and we can just render some content over there so for the title we can just get any title from that block we can move on into the blocks and there we can just search for any title <coughs> So here we can just search for this title over there so i can copy that and i can paste that over here so we can have this title like this over there so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see we have the title as well like how netflix content engineering makes a federated graph searchable so here you can see now we have the title over there so we have the how netflix content engineering team makes a federated graph searchable and then you can see now we have this over there so now we have here the title of that blog and now we can move on and we can add any description as well so we can just add just a little bit of description as of now like this so we can just copy and paste that description over there or i think for the description now what we can do so we can remove this and for the description now what we can do so we can use the lorem like this so we can have the lorem dot we can have the 200 with that so if we save and if we just enter and then we can just save so if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the description over there as well and everything seems to be working perfectly fine <coughs> and then you can see now we have the lorem i think it is very small now we can use again so we can have the lorem like this and then with that now we can just use for around 500 so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the content over there and then you can see it is looking very beautiful now you can see now we have the actual blog page with that first we have the name of that author then i think we have some spacing and then we have the email of that author as well then we have the title of this blog page and then we can have the actual blog content with that and then you can see the font is very beautiful we have the heading and it is looking perfectly good and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and then we can try it with the br as well like here we can have the br in the paragraph and here we can just have the lorem once again so we can have the lorem like this so we can have the lorem and then we can have somewhere around 500 again with that or we can have here for the thousand now so if we just hit enter and if we just save once again so then you can see now we have the lorem over there and again we have somewhere around 500 with that so if we just save so now you can see now we have the break row over there and then you can see now we have the actual content with that and then you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there and then we can use another one so we can have the br once again and then we can just check with the lorem once again that should be somewhere around thousand as well so if we just save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we have the actual content of the blog so you can see now it is very long blog so you can see now it is very long as of now but you can see that's how the blog pages look inside the real world applications so you can see now it is looking a real and it is looking very beautiful block over there so you can see now we have actual block content over there so you can see now we have the title over there we have the heading over there and then you can see we can write as many content in the block as we want so you can see it is looking very beautiful and it is looking like a real world block page application you can see it is looking very fine with that so we have spent somewhere around 10 hours on it and then you can see it is looking very beautiful right now so you can see that's how we can build the real world applications with the react the graphql and so many things with that so you can see now it is looking very beautiful and now we can move on and we can render the comment section here so we can use the box once again for the comment so we can have a box and inside that box that would be the i think that would be the comment box inside that and inside this box now we'll be rendering the comment from there so we can render the styles for this so we can have the sx that should be equals to so we can have the block styles we have the block page styles and that should be equals to so we can have the comment box like this so now this is our comment box and now after that now what we can do inside that so we can just move on and we can define the styles for the comment box as well so we can move on to the right and here we can just provide the styles for it so we can have the comment box and inside the styles we can have the padding that should be the two somewhere around two we can have the display as well so we can have the display that should be as the flex box once again and after that we can have the align items so that should be again inside the center and after that now what can we have so we can have the gap properties so that should be the two once again so we can have the styles for the comment box and now inside that now we can just render the comments over there so we can just render the icon first of the comments so first we can add the comments like this so we can have the comments like this so we can have the comments and after that we can just render some space between them 
so we can render the space with the expressions so we can have the string value for the spaces so we can have the strings and inside that we can render spaces like this so now with the space and after this now we need to render the actual comments from there so we can render the comments so we can use the icon button once again for rendering the icon of that comment so we can have the icon button and inside this icon button now what can we have so we can use the icon again we can have the f a we can have any comments with that so we can have the f a comments so that would be the icon that we'll be using so we have this icon we can use the size as well so this size would be somewhere around i think the 30 pixels of the size would be enough so we can have the 30 for the size inside that so by default is pixels so now you can see now we have the comment from there and now we can move on and we can just check that once again so now you can see now we have rendered the comments over there and now below that now we want to render each comment that we have for a specific block so we can render each comment but before that also now we need to just allow the user to add a comment so we need to allow the user to add a comment so what can we do inside that so we can just move on and we can just define an input tag over there in which the user can paste a new comment from there so we can have the comment once again so here you can see here we have the comment box over there and after this box i think after this box now inside the parent container now we can just add that input element as well so we can just use another box from there so we can have the box we can use the sx prop once again for that so we can have the sx and that should be equals to so we can have the block page styles like this so we can have the block page styles and that should be equals to so we can have the comment input container so here we can have the styles for the comment input container and now inside that now we need to define all of these styles and inside that now what can we do so we can provide some styles for this so we can have the comment input container and inside that we can use that and then we can provide the styles over there so it can contain the styles like we can provide the padding somewhere around two would be enough for the padding for this we can give the width as well so somewhere around i think 30 percent of the width to be given to it and then we can use the height as well so somewhere around 40 percent of the height would be enough for this so we can have the 40 percent of the height and now we can move on and here with the comment input container and now inside that now what can we do so we can use the typography so we can have a typography first so we can have the add your comment over there so if we just save and if we just check once again so here you can see now we have the add your comment over there and then you can see now after this now we can just add the comment and then we can provide the styles for this so we can have I think we can have the font family so that should be equals to we can have the arvo like this so if we save so now you can see now we have the add your comment over there and after that now we can just move on and we can just render here the input tag as well now we can just render the input tag here as well and now inside that now we can just use here the input tag so for that we can again use here the box for that so we can have the sx that should be equals to so we can have the block styles once again that should be dot we can have the comment layout so we can have the comment layout with that and inside that so we can have the input layout instead of that so we can have the input layout so we can have the input layout we can define the styles for it so we can move on we can paste that over here and now inside the input layout now what can we do so we can use the display that should be again equals to the flex we can use the gap between them so we can have the gap that should be somewhere around two we can use the align items as well to align the items inside the center of the screen so we can have the input tag and after that we can just have the button as well to submit that block so we can have the sx over there and now we can just render the text field here so we can render here the text field for the input tag and now inside this text field now we can just use a, a value prop so we can have a value and for the initial value we can give any value or what we can do so we can remove the value as of now so we can have this and after that we can just move on we can just put the sx as well so that should be equals to so we can have the block page styles once again so that should be dot input with that or we can have the text field with that so we can have the text field like this width like this so that should be somewhere around 100 percent only so this will be the only style for the text field i think and after that we can move on and here we can just provide here another button to submit that comment so we can have the button once again and for the button again we can use the icon button from there so we can have the icon button and this time the icon button can have the bi that should be the send so we can use this button to send a comment and then we can use that comment we can use this size as well and this size we can use is somewhere around 25 would be enough for the size so that would be the style for that comment so if we save so if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we have the add your comment over there so you can see it is looking perfectly good and now we can just render the comments with that then you can say it is working perfectly fine so here you can see here we have the comment box as well 
and I think the size of this comment box is not well enough. So we can move on into the text field itself. And here we can just provide the props for directly the input element behind this styles. So we can move on with the input props inside that. So we have the input props. So, and inside the input props, now what can we do? So we can just provide the styles. So we can just use the style for the input. So I think we can just directly access the input, but we do not have. So we can use the style and that should be equals to. So we can provide the styles like we can provide somewhere around 60 viewport width for the input. So we can have the width of somewhere around. We can give the 60 viewport width that we can have. We can use the border radius as well. So we can have the border radius of somewhere around. We can give like five pixels would be enough. So if we say if we move on to the application. So here you can see now we have the comment box and then you can say it is working perfectly fine. Now we have the comment box as well. You can increase the border radius as well. You can increase it to 10 pixels as well. And then you can see now you have the 10 pixels of the comment box inside that. You can use 20 as well with that like this. So you can use any border width that you want with that. And then after that, now you can see now you have the send icon as well. So inside the send icon, now what you can do. And I think we can just use the send icon into the right side of that input. So into the right corner of that input. Now we can just use the send icon. So for that, now what we can do. So here you can see here we are already defining the input props with that. So we can move on and we can define here the endowment as well. So we can have the end endowment. And inside that we can just use this icon over there. So we can copy and paste this icon over there. And then you can see once we will save and once we'll move on to the application. So here you can see now we have this icon over there inside the right corner of this input. So you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So now we have the content over there. And then you can see it is looking perfectly good. And then finally we can use the font family as well inside this input. So we can use the font family. So here we have the styling. We can use the font family like this. And that should be equals to, so we can use the work sense like this. So we can have the work sense with that. So if we save, if we move on to the application. So now you can see now we have the add your comment over there. And after that, now what can we do? So now we can just render all of the different comments as well, which the input currently have. So now we can move on into the parent container. And from there, we can just define the input styles. So we can have the SX prop. So that should be equals to, so we can have the block page styles. Like we can have the block page styles, then we can have the comments as well. So we can have the comments with that. And after that, now what can we do inside that? So here we have the comments. And inside that, we can just render an array of the comments with that. And now inside this container, now we need to render. And now we need to just provide a list, which will be the array of the comments that the block currently have. So we can just provide an array of the comments. And each comment can have a particular item. We can have here the particular item. And inside each particular item, the user can have the avatar icon. And then the user can have the actual comment over there. So we can do that. So here we have the block page styles dot comments and now inside the comments now what styles do we need? So we can have the comments like this and with the comments we only need the display. So that should be only the flex that we want. We can have the flex in it. We can have the display that should be the flex. Then we can have the flex direction as well. So that would again be inside the column basis as well. And now we can move on and we can just render an array of the comments as well. So we can use again a static array like one, two, three, four, five. And this should be inside the expressions as well. So now we can have the area of the one to the power five. Then we can use the map as well. So we can have the map and then we will be getting an item over there. Now what can we do? So we can just move on and we can just return something with that. So we can just return a box once again, which will be a comment container. So we can have the box like this. So each box that will be rendering inside that input and then it will contain the key as well. So the key that should be, we can define the key of the item itself like this. We can have the item. And now we can move on and we can define the styles for this as well. So we can have the comment item styles. So we can have the comment item like comment. We can have the item with that. So we can have the item. And now inside that, now what can we do? So again, we can use the display flex because we need to render the avatar and then we need to render the actual content of that input as well. So we can have here the flex box once again. We can use, I think we can use here something around padding. That should be the one we can again use the gap as well. So the gap would already be the one then we can use here. I think we can use a border from the bottom. So we can have the border bottom. So border bottom would be somewhere around one pixels or we can have the solid one pixel solid. Then we can define the color like color can be the black as well. So we can use the black color with that like this. And after that, now what can we do? So we can have the border bottom width. So we can define the width as well. So border bottom width. 
like this and that should be equals to somewhere around 10 as well so we can define the width of 10 pixels we can define the margin as well for this input so again the margin can contain that would be the one and finally we can use the align items so we need to align everything inside the center inside that so that should be the center and now we can provide the styles for the comment item inside that so we can have the comment item we can provide the key we can provide the sx that should be equals to we can have the block page styles dot comment item and now inside that now we need to render the avatar so we can render the avatar as well so like the avatar of that user then it should be the avatar we can use the sx prop for the avatar as well and i think we only need the padding only inside the inside that so we can use the padding of somewhere around one we can use the color as well for that that should be the red like this and finally the last thing that we can use is i think we can use the background color as well so we can use the bg color and that should be the transparent with that so we can have the transparent color with that and after that now what can we have inside that so here we have the avatar and after that we can just render the actual comment that we can have we can render the actual comment so for that we can move on with the avatar and i think we can and i think inside the avatar now we can use the name of that user as well like if the user is nikhil thadani then just we can use here the nk with that like we can use the short form of the nikhil like we can use the nt like this so we can have the nt and then you can see once we will save once we will move on to the application so you can see now we can have the nt with that and you can see everything is working perfectly fine with that and i think you can see now we have a lot of width so we can move on and we have already defined the width of the border bottom so we can remove this width as of now and then you can see now it is looking perfectly fine now we can define the height as well so the height should be somewhere around auto as well so we can give the height auto and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now it is looking great and after that finally now we can use the actual comment text as well so after this avatar we can use the typography once again for the comment text and we can provide the styling for this and this should be the last item that will contain the styling for now we can use the sx and now inside that now what do you want to do so here we'll be using these styles like here we have these styles for i think so we can use these styles we can again move on into the sx prop we can use the block page styles once again we can have the block page styles we can have the comment text like this we can have the comment text so that will be the final style and instead that now what do we want to do so here we can just render that once again we have the comment text we can give the margin that should be the two we can use here the font weight i think that should be somewhere around 600 or 500 would be enough 600 would be enough we can give the font size as well so somewhere around i think 18 or 16 pixels for now we can give we can give to the comment text so i think we haven't defined the font family so we can use the font family as well for that we can use the font family of arvo once again like this so we can have the arvo and then finally inside the comment now what do we want to render inside the comment we can again use the lorem is pump so we can have the lorem of uh, somewhere around i think we can give the 30 bit of that comment so we can have the 30 so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have brilliant comments as well you can see now we have brilliant styling inside our application and then you can see it is working perfectly fine so now we have the comments like this and then you can see it is perfectly rendering inside the input and then here you will go now you can see now we have the comments over there you can see now it is looking very good so now we have very good styling for the comment now you can see now we have very good fonts for the comment we have the styling and then you can see each comment has the border as well at the bottom you can see now this page is looking very fine you can see this is looking like an actual real world block page you can see it is looking fine so now we have the comment and finally now what we can do so you can see this is not looking good at the add your comment so now what can we do inside that so we can either give some padding between these two elements so we can move on into this so i think we have this styling over there add your comment so here we have the add your comment like this like here we have the add your comment inside that and inside that we can provide the styling so we can provide the sx prop or we can provide the margin from i think we can provide the margin that should be somewhere around two so if we save so now you can see now we have the add your comment and then you can see now it is looking good now we have the add your comment inside that and everything is working perfectly fine inside this application so now we have completed the block page as well and then you can see it is working perfectly fine and the last final thing that you can see so now you can see now we have some margin and the padding between them so what we can do so here you can see we are just providing the padding as the one so you can see here we are providing the padding as the one inside the profile header items so we can remove that padding from now and then you can see now we have good over there and now before that email now we can render here and 
an icon as well for the email so we can move on and before that we can render an icon like that should be i am mail icon so that will be the icon so that will be the icon we can give the size as well so that should be somewhere around 20 with that so if we save if we move on to the application then you can say it is working perfectly fine then i think we have some content over there now you can see now we have the icon over there and it is working perfectly fine and then finally we have the header text over there so we can move on into the header text so here we have the header text over there we have the header text we can increase the font size as well so we can have the font size of somewhere around we can give the 18 pixels so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see everything is working perfectly fine so padding we can give that should be the one so we can give the padding as the one and then we can just provide the gap as well that should be the one so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see everything is working perfectly fine inside that you can see now we have the comments over there and then you can see everything is working totally fine and here you can see here we are rendering the static data over there so we do not have the real data as of now we are just rendering a static data so now we need to move on and we need to fetch the real data as well for the blog so for that now what can we do so we can move on into this so here you can see now we have the view block page first we can just get the id from there and then we can just fetch a block from its id so we can just check that inside the backend controllers once again inside the backend handlers like if we have defined it or not we can move on into i think the handlers handlers.ts and then we can just search for the query if we have defined for that like here we have the query for the get user by id we can have the get users blocks as well and then finally we do not have the query for the blocks so we need the query as well so we can just close this and then after this now we can just define that so we can have the get block by id with that and then we can define the block like this and then it will be an object we can define the type that should be again the block type like this so we have the block type and again we can use the arguments as well so we can have the arguments the first argument would be the id and that would be of type so when it could define the type and it will contain the type of the graph ql we can have the non null and that should be the graph ql id with that it should be the graph ql id with that so that will be the argument over there then we need the resolve as well so we can have the resolve that should be the async resolve and inside that now what do we want to do so first would be the parent like the parent structure and then we can just add the id as well like this we can use the id with that so we'll be having this id over there and now inside that now what do we want to do so we can just return we can have the block we can have the block dot we can have the find by id so we can find a block by its id we can define the id over there and then we can just populate other records as well so we can populate the records of the user as well we can populate the records of the comments as well like this so we can have these things with that so here we'll be returning that thing over there and after that we can just save and then we can just move on to the application so here that will be the final made of a function so here now we are into the localhost port of the 5000 slash graphql server and now inside that now we want to make a query request to the graphql and here we have just created the query over there like getting a specific block by its id and then we are getting the populated records as well the user and the comments so now let's just make a query so we can just move on we can define the query like the block and then we can provide the id inside that the id would be we can give any specific blocks id like we can move on into this url over there you can see here we have the url and here we can just get the id from this url because we are opening a specific block inside the block page so we can move on and we can provide the id like this and the data that we want to get inside the return that can be the title of that block like this the title that can be the uh, the content of that block that can be the user of that blog as well the user details of that blog the user can have the name the user can have the email as well and then we can get the comments as well so we can get the comments and the comments can have the text as well inside that so if we just make the query like this if we just execute this so here you can see so here you can see here we have the query over there so you can see now we have the blog we have the title as well inside the blog we have the learning javascript is so easy we have the content as well we have this long content and then we have the user details as well which has created this particular blog and then we have the comment details as well but we do not have any comments as of now so that's why we are seeing an empty array inside the comments the query has been executed successfully now we want to just make this query inside the front end as well so that we can get the details of that blog that we want to render here inside this content so here so here you can see uh, as we have we have the dummy content over there so now we want to make the actual request to the graphql server we want to get a specific blocks details and then we want to render the actual details over actual block so for that we can move on into the front end part now so we can move on into the view block page where we are rendering all of this content 
and here you can see now we need to make a query inside this now first we can just remove all of those unnecessary variables so for that as we know that we need the use query hook from the apollo client to make the query but before that now we need to generate the query as well so we can move on into the graphql folder so you can see as we have defined the queries like this like get blocks get the users blocks as well now we can just make another query over there like getting a block by its id so for that we can again have the export we can have the const that can be the get block by id like this so we can have by id like this and that would be the graphql once again gql and after that we need to define the query over there first we need to define the function so we can have the query and then we can have the block like this and then we need to define the variable id so variable id that would be of type of the string like this so it won't be the string it should be the id like this so we can get the id and it would be a required field and after that we need to just define the function inside that so we can have here the block like this and then we need to define the id that would be this variable id that we have just used variable id and after that the data that we want to get inside the return would be the title like this would be the content like this would be the user details as well like we can have the user details and user can have the name of that user the email of that user and then we can just get the content as well and then we can get the comment as well like this so we can get the comments and the comments can have the text as well and the comments can have the user property as well the user can have the name from that comment so we can have this data for getting a block by its id so we have the title i think we have missed the date over there so that's the date as well so we need to get the date we have the title we have the content we have the date we have the user and then we have the comments property as well so these are the properties that are required for a block so now we can move on and we can generate a query inside the view block so we can have the const we can have here something that should be equals to so we can have here the use query hook that should be the use query and here what do we want to do so here we want to make a query once again so the query should be equals to we can have the get block by its id so that would be the query over there and now the second parameter that we want to provide would be the variables so we can use the variables and the variable that we have inside this would be the id like this so we need the id variable over there we need to provide the id and the id would be equals to this url id that we have but how can we get this url id so as of now we can just give the blank string so inside the react router we have a hook which is named as the use params so we can just get the url details from that hook like here you can see here we have defined the parameter id so here you can see we have defined this variable id inside this id variable inside the app component so anything after the view is being stored inside this id variable inside the url so this id is being saved inside the id so we can get this id from the use params hook from the react router dom so we can move on into the view block and we can import something from the react router dom so we can have the import we can have here this something like we can have the params that should be equals to so we can have the use params and it would be imported from the react router dom and from the use params it contains the whole params variable and if you want to just get the id variable that we have defined inside this app component so we need to get the id from the use params so we can have the use params dot we can have the id like this so this will just give us the id from the use params and we can have this variable like the id like this and now we can just provide the id like this inside the variables as well and after defining the use query hook now we want to just get some data inside the return as well so inside this we can just get the data we can get the error as well we can get the loading as well like this so we can get these three properties from this and now we can define some properties like we can just check if currently the data is loading then what do we want to do so here we need to return the loading spinner so we can have the linear progress like this so we can just store the linear progress with that and if we have the error like if we have the error then what do we want to do so that should be error then what do we want to do so here we can just return some error so we can have here some dialog like this so we can have the dialog from the mui and the dialog can contain some error like this so we can have the dialog we can have the content so that should be equal to so we can have the error inside that we have the error fetching block and after that now we can move on and we can just provide the dialog property that should be the open so that would be equals to the true so we can have the open property with the true if we get the error inside that so if we save if we move on to the application and then you can see now we want to just have it some data as well so we can just use that over here like you can see here we are renting the actual content so we can just verify once we have the data like once we have the data then only we want to return something so you can see once we have the data then only we want to render this content so if we just save if we move on to the application if we just refresh the page once again 
then you can see now currently the block is being loaded and then you can see once we have the data then only we are rendering something inside that and then we can move on to the network tab you can see the graphql so inside the graphql you can see now the status is 200 which is okay and then we can move on with the payload so these are the payload that we have defined we have the variables that we have defined we have the preview as well and inside the preview you can see now we have the block we have the data we have the block property inside the data we have the comments which is an empty array as of now we have the content as well we have the actual content of that blog then we have the title as well then we have the user as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have actual data of that blog as well and now the final step is now we want to render this data that we are getting from the request and now we can move on so here we have the header text so that should be we can have the data we can have dot block property so we have the data dot block we can have the user as well like this so we can have the data dot block dot user and after that we can just get the email property as well of that user so we can get the email like this and same for this as well so we can move on we can use the data we can use dot block property like this we can use uh, dot user once again dot name like this so we can have the name so if we save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we have the name we have the email as well that's working perfectly fine and now we can move on and here you can see here we have the title we can remove this we can use the data dot block we can have the title like this so if we save now we have the title as well so you can see now we have the title learning javascript is easy now we want to render the content as well so here we have the content so we can just remove the lorem is from part as of now because these were the static data that we don't want to provide now so now we have the actual block now we can just move on and we can remove this very long description over there so we can remove this like this and now instead now we want to just render the actual content of that blog so we want to render the content we can have the data dot blog like this we can have the data dot blog we can have the content like this so we can have the content so if we save so now you can see now we have the content like this so we have the javascript is dash 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 and then you can see now we have the comments as well so you can see now we have the comments of this blog so here we go here we have the add your comment as well and here you can see here we have the comment container and after that you can see now we have the comments we are rendering a dummy data of that comments so that won't be the dummy data so here we want to just render this data inside a condition so once we have the data dot we can have the blog like this we can have the comments so we can be comment so once we have the data dot block dot comments dot length is greater than zero then only we need to render this comments box so that should be the length like this so once we have the data dot blog dot comments dot length is greater than zero when we have the comments added dot length greater than zero then only we want to render some of those contents and now that should be the data dot block dot comments in this so we want to render the actual array so the array is inside the data dot block dot comments and the item is a comment item itself so we can have a comment like this and now we want to render the actual comment with that so now we can just move on and we can define a function in which we can just get the short form of that user like we have the Nikhil Tadani, we have the NT so we can just get the first character of the first string like we have the Nikhil, we have the N and the first character of the second string like the Tadani so we can move on and we can define the function before the function components so we can have the function, we can have the get initials and now inside this now we can just move on and we can just get the name parameter inside this so we can get the name and that would be of the type of the string now we can just move on and we can just split this name variable into two pieces so we can just get their names so we can split into it so we can split with that array like we can add the name ar so that should be equals to so we can have the name dot split so we can split it into two pieces with the space so we have the names with that and now we can just return something inside the string so we need to return the name array so the first inside the name array so we can just move on we can just return the name array inside that we have the name arrays first property like the nickel and then we can just get the first character from it like the zero position character and same for the second as well so we can get the name array like this and with the name array we can just get the first element and then the zero character from that so if we just save if we move on to the application and again here you can see now we have the comment now we need to define that here so for the comment now we can just move on and we can give the type any as of now so we can have the any type the key we have the item so that should be we can have the comment dot id itself so you need to write the id as well inside the query so here we have the id as well inside the comment so you need to add the id as well inside this so we can just provide the key as well and after that we need to provide the initials 
so we can have this like we can have the get initials so that should be equals to so we can have the comment dot user we can get the name property from that comment and we can just check again like if we are getting the name property from that comment or not we have the user we have the name so everything seems to working perfectly fine so now we have the get initials property as well and here we have the actual comment text as well so we can just move on we can just replace this from the comment dot we can have the text property like this so we can have the comment dot text so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we do not have any comment as of now so that's why we are seeing an empty comments inside that so we do not have comments like this so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine in our application so you can see now we have defined so now we are using the actual data of a blog inside that and if we can move on into the blocks once again so if we can again search for the blocks so here you can see now we have all of the blocks and if we just open a specific block like if we open this block over there we can click on that and then you can see first it will load this block then you can see now we have the actual blog inside that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now you can see now we are missing the date inside the blog post so you can see now we do not have the date now where we can render the date inside that so you can see first we have the name we have the mary we have the email as well which is the mary at the test.com and inside the right side of this email then we can render the actual date as well so for that we can move on inside the right so here you can see now we have this box for there we have the profile header items so here we can use another box like this with that and it can have the margin from the left that should be equals to the auto so we can write the sx details here so we can have the margin from the left that should be equals to the auto like this so we can have the auto and after that now we can move on and we can put the display as well like this so we can have the display that should be equals to the flex so we'll be using the flex once again so first we can just render the date inside that so for the date we can just render the icon as well so for the icon i have just used this specific icon for the date so we can just use a specific icon for the date like you can say you can use any of the icons so i'll so i will be using this icon from that and then we can just import this icon as well so we can have the import we can have something that should be equals to we can again have the react icons so we have the react icons slash i think we have the bs so we need to import from the bs and the icon name would be the date we have the bs calendar dash 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 and then we can just render this icon over there so here we have the profile header items and now inside that now we can just render the date first so we can have your this icon we have the bs calendar like this and after that we can just render the actual date as well and after this we'll be having the typography once again set this typography now we can just use the new date property to extract the date from a number so for that we can have the new date once again so we can have the new date and from that now we can just get the block state as well so we can have the data or we can have the dot block we can have the date as well like this so we can have the date and you already know that the date that we are getting inside the data dot block contains a string so we need to generate it inside a number so for that we can just convert this date into a number like this then we can have the data dot block dot date property and then we can just use the actual string from that date so we can have the two date string so we can have this and then we can use the two date string with that like this so we can have the two date string with that and then we'll be having the actual date with that so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we are getting the actual date which is the sunday march 12 2023 and then we can just move on we can just provide some gap between them so we can have the gap that should be a three we can have the align items so that should be equals to inside the center so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we have the date and then you can see now we have this icon as well now we have the icon we have the date and everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then we can use different font for the date as well so we can have the font family like this so that should be again equals to we can have the work sense so we can have work sense we can give the font weight as well so the weight should be equals to so we can give the 500 for the weight and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now you can see now we have the date now we have the icon of the date now we have this as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have actual data of the blog inside that and everything seems to be working inside that inside this blog page so now you can see everything is working perfectly fine so now we are getting the real data inside any blog page as well so now the next step that we want to achieve is we want to add a comment as well so you can see now we have a comment section as well so once we just add a comment inside that so that comment should be added to the blog so we have already implemented that functionality inside the backend so if we move on into the backend so here you can see we have a mutation over there in which we can just add a comment to the blog so we can just check that so here we have the update blog we have the delete blog and then you can see now we have a add comment to blog so from this function so from this handle mutation now we can just add a comment to the blog as well 
so for that we need a couple of arguments the block the blog id the user id the text and the date of that comment so now let's start working on that so here you can see now we have a add your comment so we already have this thing over there and now what we can do so we can move on into the view block page and here we can just handle this through state so for this again we can use the react hook form for that so we can move on inside that and we can just import the react hook forms so we can have the import something from the react hook form so we can have the react hook form and the something would be the use form so we need the use form hook for that so we can use the use form hook and again what we can do so we can just move on and we can just import some of the things from the use form so we can have const we can have something that should be equals to the use form so we need to destructure a couple of items so the items that we want to destructure will be the register function that we want to destructure and then we need the handle submit of that form so we need these two things only for the comment and now we can move on and here you can see now we have the comment as well so we can just check the comment input container and inside that you can see now we have the comment like this so here we have the send icon for the comment and here we have the text field so what we can do so we can register this for here so we can register this inside this so we can have the register and that would be equals to the comment itself so we can have the comment so we can have the comment like this so it will register this comment now we have the register over there and now we need to just call the handle submit function as well so from where we can call it so you can see here we have the send icon as well and you can see it is clickable as well so what we can do so we already have the icon button over there so we can just provide the own click prop inside that so we can have the on click and inside the on click so we can have the on click and then we can just run a function of the handle submit and inside the handle submit now we want to accept a callback function so for that now what can we do so we can define a callback function so we can have a const we can have the handle submit or we can have the submit handler we can have the const we can have the comment handler so we can have the comment handler like this and that should be equals to a function which will get the data inside that so it will get the data and after that what do we want to do so we can just log the data as of now so we can log the data inside that and the type of the data would be the any as of now because we only be having only one property inside the type of the data that will be the comment itself so here we go here you can see now we have the comment inside that or and in the handle submit now what can we do so we can just call here this submit with that so and we can just have this comment handler with that on the clicking of the handle submit so we have this button and here you can see now this will be the functionality so if we just save if we move on to the application if we refresh the page if we move on into the inspect panel if we move on to the console and now you can see once we add any comment like nice block so we can have the nice block and if we just click on this submit then you can see now we have the comment we have the nice block with that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine now the next functionality that we want to achieve so for this now we want to make a mutation so for that for the mutation again we can move on into the mutations folder so here we have the mutations file and here we have the add block we have this block as well and now what we can do so we can just define the mutations so we can have the const export const we can have the add comment so that would be equals to the gql once again so it would be the gql and inside that now what do we want to do so inside that we can just provide the comment inside that so now we want to define the mutation then we want to define the function so we can have the mutation so we can have the mutation like this and then we can define a function like at comment to block so we can have this function and then now we want to define some variables as well so first it would be the block comment text so we can have the text so we can have the text like this the text will be type of the string and it will be a required field and then after the text then it will be the date as well so it will be the date and then it will be of type of the string once again so we can have the string and then what do we want to do is the next step and after this now we want to add the user as well so we can have the user it would be the id of that user so we can provide the id like this so i think we haven't provided the dollar sign between the variables for the date and the user that would be the date user and after that the final thing would be the block itself where we want to add so that would be the id once again so we can use the id for that block and it will also be a required field so these are the variables that we have defined inside this so we have the text we have the date we have the user we have the block and these are the things that are required for this you can see we have the we have the block the user the text and the date and now we want to just add this function inside that so we have the function name at comment to block so that would be the function here once again we have this function then we need to provide the text once again so the text would be the variable text as we have defined inside the parameter and then the date would be the date as we have defined inside that so that would be the date same for the user that would be the variable user 
and then for the block as well so that would be the block and the variable of the block like this so this will be the block so now we have this so now you can see now we have these couple of items and now what do we want to do after we have the comment so here we have the text we have the date we have the user we have the block now what will be the data that we want to require after this so what data do we need inside the return so we need the text of that comment once again so we need the user as well for that comment the user can have the name property inside that and then we can so we can only have the text and the user for that comment so we can have the text the user and the name of that user so we can have these things so now we can move on into the i think into the view block page and then we can register this mutation as well so for that now what do we want to do so here we have already registered the use query for the get block by id so we already have the data the loading and the error so now we want to just submit a mutation function for comment handler so for that we can use so we can have the const so we can have the const we can destructure a couple of items from the use mutation hook and we already know that what is the use mutation because we have already used this use mutation inside a couple of components so we have the use mutation so inside the first parameter inside it now we want to provide the mutation itself like we have the add block like here we can have the add comment inside that so that would be the add comment so we can have the add comment inside the use mutation and now we need the function as well that we need to call so we can have the add comment to block so we can have this function that we want to call so that should be the add comment to block and after that we need some response as well so we get the response like this so we can have the add comment response so from this function we'll be just calling the graphql api for making the http request and from this this will be the actual response which will contain the data the error and the loading properties as well so now we can move on and here we have the command handler so we can make this function as an asynchronous function as well so we can have the async but now after that now what do we want to do so first we need to get all of this data so first we need the user so for the user the logged in user will be making this comment so we can just get that user property from the local storage so we can have the user that should be equals to so we can have the json dot parse so we'll be parsing the data so the json dot parse and after that that should be the local storage dot get item dot get item that should be the user data so we'll be getting the data of that user as string and then we want to destructure the property of that id of that user so we want to destructure the id so from this we'll be having the user like this inside this and this will be of type of the string like this so we can have this string and after that we can just move on and we can just provide the block id as well so for that we can move on like this const we can have the block id so we already have the block id here because we are just getting the block by the parameters url so we have the block id as well so we can remove this const variable and after that we need the date as well so for the date that will be the new date currently so we can have the const we can have the date that should be the new date like this so we can have the date so now we have the date now we have the user now we have the blog id and now we have the text as well so for the text we'll be having this text like this so const text that would be equal to so we can have the data dot text property inside that and we need to make sure that we have something inside the text so now we have all of these variables we have the user we have the text we have the date and then we have the id of the blog as well so now we want to make the request so again we can use the try catch block so we can have the try inside that and then we'll be using the catch as well and inside the catch if we get an error then we'll be displaying that error as well so for that we can just return we can have the console.log so we can have the console.log that would be the error itself so we'll be getting the error inside that and the error can contain the message as well so we can get the message like this that we'll get from the backend and the type that we need to provide for that error would be the any as of now and now inside the try now we want to make this request so as you know that now we have the command handler which is an asynchronous function so we can just get the response we can have the const response that would be equals to the await and it would be equals to the add comment to block so we need to call this function so we can have add comment to block like this so that would be the function and now we need to define some variables inside this so we can have the variables and it would be an object and inside the variables we need to define the text property like this so we can have the text and in this we can have the date as well for the comments so we can have the date like this like here we have the date then we can have the blog as well so we can get the block which will be the id itself so as we are getting the id from the parameters so the block would be the id itself and then finally that would be the user as well so we can get the user so we are already getting from the local storage so we'll be getting the user like this and now we can just log the data of the response as well so we can have the response with that so if we just save if we move on to the application and if we just add a comment inside that like we can have the nice block we can have the understood so we can have the nice block with that and if we just click on the send 
then you can see i think we are getting an error like the response is not successful receive the status code of 500 maybe we can check inside the network as well like what like what went wrong so here you can see now we have the variable text which is required of type string so we have already provided the string i think so we can check the payload as well so we have the variable subject and inside the variables we have the block we have the date i think we haven't provided the text variable but we did it here so it won't be the data dot text it would be the data dot comment because we are using the comment with that so that would be the data dot comment inside that and now we can just save again and we can just check again with that we can move on to the console and if we just click on the send once again so i think it should work so here we go so here you can see now we get the data as well so now you can see now we are getting the data and inside the data now you can see now we are getting the add comment to block and inside this property now you can see now we are getting the text which is a nice block so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then you can see the username as well we have the mary as well so everything is working perfectly fine inside our application so you can see now once we refresh this page once we refresh this block page then you can see now we'll be having a comment as well so i think we have some error inside that we can just check and refresh once again we can just move to the inspect panel as well inside the console inside the four errors now we have the errors and you can see cannot read properties of undefined reading zero maybe we are getting something wrong like reading zero so we have the reason i think we have this error inside the get initials property so we can check with the view block so here we have the view block and after that i think we haven't provided the full name of the mary so we need to provide the full name so now you can see now we have the error inside the name because the name of this user is the only the mary so it does not contain the last name so here what we are doing so we are just using the name array dot split and we are accessing the zero element and the first element but this user's name is not inside the first element but this user's name is currently mary so it does not contain the second name so the name error one is getting undefined so what we can do so we can just add an if check as well so we can have the if and then we can check if the name array dot length is greater than one like if the length is greater than one then only we need to perform this then only we need to return this or either what we can do so we can just return so we need to just return and that should be equals to so we can have this over here so we can have the name array so we can have the name array and then we only be accessing and then after that if we only have the first name of the user then we'll only be accessing the first name's first letter of that user so we can have the first name dot first letter so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now the error is gone and then you can see now we have the comment as well so you can see now we have the m which is a nice block so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine now we are getting the comment as well so everything is working fine inside our application and you can see now the comment functionality is also working fine and after this comment so now you can see now we made a comment with the add comment and then you can see now we got the message of the nice block once we refresh the page so what we can do so once we will make a comment and once the comment will be then added to the database then we want to refresh the whole block data as well and how can we do that so here you can see inside this use query so if we just check the use query here so you can see here what we are doing so we are getting the block details by its id so now what do we want to do so once we made a comment once we added the comment to the database then we can just import something which will be the refetch so we'll be refetching the whole block details from that so you can see after just importing the refetch from the use query and it is already available inside the use query so we need to refetch so we need to destructure the property of the refetch so we can just copy that and then you can see after the comment handler so after we'll make this comment to the database then we are just logging the response then what we can do then we can just call the refetch from there so we'll be refetching the block details so that it would be refreshed here inside that so then you can see now we have the refetch here so you can see i think it's a promise as well so it's a promise so we can just use the await as well like this so we can await for the refetch and now what can we do so here once you make another comment like it can be a good one so once you make this comment and then you can see once we just click on the submit then you can see now we'll be seeing this block over here after the couple of seconds so you can see after a couple of seconds now we already got this comment over here which is good one so you can see everything seems to working perfectly fine so now we are refetching the block details as well once we make a new block so everything is great and everything is working totally fine 
so here we go so now you can see now we have the comments now we have the blocks as well so you can see now we are fetching the details of that block now we are adding the comment and then you can see everything is working totally fine and we are on the verge of completing this project so here you can see now everything seems to be working fine but here one last thing with the comments is now we want to delete a comment as well but how can we delete a comment and what will be the criteria of deleting a comment so the criteria first to deleting the comment is like if the user is currently the locked in user like now you can see the block can be any block like we can use any block for commenting inside that but we can also delete that comment as well so we have made these two blocks on this comment and we already know that the current logged in user is the Mary. So you can see that inside the inspect panel, if you can move on into the application, if you can move on into this. So here you can see now inside the user data, we have the name, which is the Mary and the Mary user has made these comments. We have the nice blog and the good one. And then we can verify that user as well with the ID. So what we can do. So we can just verify the user by its ID. So if the current user has already made one of those comments like this, so the user will be having an option of deleting a comment. So that will be the functionality. So now what do we want to do for that? So here you can see now we can move on into the view block. So here you can see if we just move on into the end. So here we are rendering each comment item. So that can be a each comment item. So we have the box, we have the avatar, we have the typography. So here we can just conditionally render one delete button if the user is currently the logged in user. So we can just check that validity from this as well. So you can see from here, from this comment handler, we are already destructuring the user ID from the local storage. So what we can do, so we can just use this variable as a global variable. So we can move this inside the top, inside the view block. So we can have the user ID like this. So then we will just check if the current user is the logged in user and then we can delete that comment. So we can move on and here you can see now we have this comment item. We have the get initials, we have the comment text and now what can we do? So we can just conditionally render one thing like if the user, like you can see if the user is equals to because we have the ID inside the user. So if the user ID is equals to we can have the comment dot user dot ID. So if the comment dot user dot ID, if the comments users dot ID is equal to the user ID that is currently logged in, then we can just conditionally render a content. Then we can just conditionally render a typography like this. So we can have the typography like we can have the delete like this. So we can have this delete and then you need to add the ID as well inside the queries. So you can move on to the queries and there you can see once we are getting a block by its ID. So you need to add the user and their ID as well. So make sure you have added the ID because if you won't provide the ID here, then the calculation will be wrong. Then you can see then this condition would always be wrong because the ID would be undefined. So then this won't be enabled. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we are seeing the delete option as well because the current logged in user has made these comments and now we can delete this as well. So you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And after that, now we can just use the icon button here. So we can have the icon button for the delete. So we can have the icon button like this and then instead of this delete text, then we can use a specific icon and for rendering the icon again, you can move on into the react icons. So you can move on into the react icons and from there you can select any specific icon for the delete. So we can move on and we can search for the delete. So you can see these are the icons. So you can just get this icon as well. So you can say it is looking good. So you can just copy that and then you can just move on inside the top. You can import this as well. So you can import something that should be equals to react icons so we have the react icons like this and make sure the package name starts from the ai because we are importing it from the ai so we can move on we can provide react icon slash ai like this so we can have the ai and then we need to import this icon from that ai ai outline delete and now we can move on into the end again where we are rendering this icon button so here we have the icon button inside that you can see here i think here we have the avatar here we have the avatar, here we have the user and here we can just use this icon. So we can have the AI icon delete like this and then we can just save and then we can provide the color as well for this icon button. So the color would be equals to, so we can give the error like this. So that should be the delete color. So if we save, if we move on to the application, so here you can see now we are seeing the delete icon as well and everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And now we can just send this icon to the right. So we can again use the SX prop inside this and then we can have the margin from the left. That should be the auto. So if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now we are seeing the icon at the end of this comment. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And now the last step that we want to achieve is once we click on this, then we need to delete the comment as well. So we can move on. We can provide the on click as well. So we can have the on click 
and the on click would be equals to then we'll be having the handle comment delete so we can have the handle comment delete and then we can define that function as well on the top so we can have the function before the return statement so we can have const we can have this function over there so we can have the handle comment delete that should be an asynchronous function so that would be the async and after that now what do we want to do so here we need to delete a specific comment that we have and inside that now what can we do so inside the parameters now we can just get the id as well from there so we can get the id in the form of string so we can get the id as the type of the string like that and then what can we do so here again we can define another mutation to delete a comment so for that now first we need to provide the id so we have the handle comment delete and here we can just provide the id as well because the first parameter it contains would be the id so we can just use this as a callback function like this so we can have the handle comment delete and here we can just provide the id so the id would be the we can have the comment dot we can have the id so we can get the comment id like this so we can have the comment dot id and make sure you have the id inside the comment like we are already using the id inside the comment so make sure the id is already there so now we have the handle comment that is currently the id and then we can just use the async as well like this we can use the async and then we can just use await as well like this so we can use the async await like this and then we'll be just deleting the comment from this and now we can move on into the handle commit so here we have the id inside that and first we can just verify that if we have the id or not so we can just use the id then we can just save if we move on to the inspect panel once again if we just move on to the info if we just click on the delete then you can see now we have the id as well and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have the id and one last step then we can move on into the handlers then we can just delete that comment as well so we have the delete comment functionality then we can delete that comment which will delete this comment from the users array as well from the users model as well and from the blocks model as well so we can move on again into the mutations so we can define that mutation over here so here we have the add comment now we can have the delete comment as well so we can have the export cause we can have the delete comment so that would be again equals to the gql so we need to provide the gql like this and then again we can provide the mutation like this so we can have the mutation that would be we can have the delete comment and after that we'll be defining the variable would be the id so we need the id variable like this so that should be the id and after that it is of the type of the id and it is a required field so we have the variable then we can just use the actual function and the actual function that we have inside the handlers would be the delete once again so we have the delete comment so we can just use that here we can have the delete comment we can provide the id that would be the variable id that we have just defined inside the parameters and then the thing that we want to get in return would be nothing because we do not get anything inside that so here we can just get something in return like we can just get anything like uh we can just get the text of that comment that we want to delete so we can have the delete like this and then we have the text so now we can move on into the view block once again so here we have the text and then we can just register this mutation once again so we can just register one more mutation here so we can have again the const we can have something that should be equals to so we can have the use mutation once again and inside the use mutation that should be we can have the delete comment and here we need to just extract a function as well to call this delete comment so we can have the delete comment function like this so we'll be having this function that we want to call and now we can move on into the handle comment delete so we already have the id then what do we want to do so again we can use the try catch once again so we can have the try and the catch blocks here and then we'll be logging the error if we get any error so we'll be logging error dot message with that so we'll be logging the message as well and now what do we want to do so here we have the try catch and inside the try now we want to just call we can have the const we can have the response that should be equals to so we can have the await and it would be equals to the delete comment so we have the delete comment function which is an asynchronous function now we want to define the variables as well so the variables would be an object which will contain the id inside that and the id would be the actual id that we currently have inside the string format so we have the id with that and it will be converted to the id format then everything would be successful and everything would be fine so we are awaiting for this task and one last thing that we want to do at the end so we can use await and we can again refresh the details of this block so we can refresh the details of this block like this so after all of that if we just save if we move on to the application we have the error we can just use any property once again for the error so if we save if we move on to the application and then you can see once we just click on the delete so then this block should be deleted so if i delete this block 
then you can see now this blog has been deleted so now you can see this comment has been deleted so you can see everything is working perfectly fine so you can see now this blog is deleted now everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now you can see now the whole blog functionality is okay and it is working totally fine and after this now we can just add one last thing which will be the notifications so we'll be using some notifications as well so for the notifications we can use a package which will be the react toast so we can have the toast as well so we have the react hot toast that we can use and this is a great library for the notifications like this you can just click on this you have this notification like this here you toast you can use a success one you can use the error one as well you can use multi line as well you can use emojis as well inside this and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we can just install this library so we have the react hot toast and here we can move on and we can install this library so we can move on into the front end folder once again we can have the block front end we can just use npm install that would be the react or toast and then you can see here we have the installation steps as well so first we need to install this package and then we need to just add a toaster at the top of the components so we need to add the toaster at the top so it would be the toaster like this and then we will be importing the toaster like this and then we will be registering the toaster here and this would be a self-closing tag so that would be a self-closing tag as well so everything should work fine and now what we'll be doing here so you can see here we have the view block once again so once we make a comment then we can just add a toast so here you can see add comment handler so once we make this comment then what do we want to do so here after we are done with everything after we are done with this then we are just having the refetching then we can just use a toast as well so you can use the toast like this and you need to import the toast from the react hot toast once again so you can import something from the react hot toast like this and you need to just import the toast from it and the toast is like a toast bar that you can define and i can show you that how it works so here we have the add comment to block we have the await refetch then what we can do so we can just use the toast like this so we can have the toast and then we can just use that we want like if you want to use the success then we can use a success if you want to use the error then we can use the error if you want some promise as well so that would be the promise as well and we can use the toast inside a promise way so here you can see once we are just done with making a request with this add comment to block then we can just use a toast to refresh the data so while the data is being refreshed then we can just show a toast to the user and it would be a great user experience so for that we can use the toast so like this we can use a toast like this and inside that we can use a promise version of the toast and if you do not know about the promise you can again move on to the react or toast and there you can see you can click on the promise so here you can see how the promise works so you can have the promise like this you can have the saving and then once the save completes you get the notification like this settings saved so we can use this file fetching a block details so here you can see we have the toast.promise we can have the save settings and then inside the second parameter we need to provide the values for the loading the success and the error so for that now what can we do so here we have the toast.promise so inside that we can just use this only for refetching the data so you can also use with this as well but i think using this for refetching would be a great approach so we can use with the refetch so we can remove this from here and then we can just call the refetch function here like this so we can have the refetch here and after this refetch now what do we want to do so inside the second parameter now we need to provide the variables like for the error like if we get error inside this promise then what do we want to do so we can get the error like we can get the unexpected error like this and then some and then a message for the success as well so we can have the success that would be we can have the refetch we can have the fetching complete like this so we can have this message and then with loading we can have the loading message like this we can have the hold on we can have the hold on message for the loading so here you can say now we have the toast.promise and then you can say we have the refetch and we have the error we have the loading property and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now you can see now we have added this inside the add comment to blog so now we can move on to react application once again and then we can just add a comment here and then we can just add a comment over here so we can just again add the nice one like this so we can add the nice one and we can add an exclamation so here you can see once i will now just send this block then we'll be seeing a notification so here you can see now we have the hold on and then you can see once the fetching completes now we are seeing this message as well so you can see everything is working perfectly fine inside our application and you can see this application is also working fine so you can see this is working fine and now what do we want to do as the next step so here we can have the promise like this and now we can just use this promise inside this as well so we can just copy that we can just paste that here instead of the refetch so we can do that as well so if we just save again if we move on to the application and then you can see once we will just click on the delete like if i delete the good one if i delete like this 
then you can see after deleting the block then we have the functionality of the hold on and then you can see once the block deletes then we are getting this functionality so everything is working totally fine and then if you want to add this for the blog as well so you can use that but for that you need to define these two functions inside a separate function so you can do all of the things inside a single function and then you can use a toast.promise to call that function if you want to just add if you want to show the notifications while adding a comment and deleting a comment but i think this also would work fine we have the refetching the data and everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we can just remove this response variable as well from here as well and from here as well so everything should work perfectly fine and then we can just try it out one more time so we can have the good one once again so we can have the good block and then if we just click on the send then we'll be seeing the message over here so here we have the fetching once again we have the hold on and then you can see again we have the fetching completes so everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside this application so you can see the whole block functionality has been completed so we can see the block by its id we can add a comments as well we can delete a comments as well we have the notifications so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now the last functionality of these blocks would be the deleting and the update as well so there are two functionalities which are remaining for deleting and updating a block so for that what do we want to do for deleting and updating the block so the deleting a block would be very easy so what we'll be doing so we'll be using the blocks page so if we can move on to the profile so we can just add the profile pages so here you can see inside the profile we can add a functionality of deleting a block we can add the button inside the card actions so we can add the actions inside the card then we can add a button functionality for deleting and updating a block so for that here we can see now we have the content like this so here we have this content so we can just add an option of update and delete and then in the update now what we'll be doing so we'll be moving on into the post new block page so we'll be using this design for the update so we'll be using this page for updating a block and how can we use that so we can just set some initial values inside these blocks like we can have some initial values for the title and the content then we can just have the button for updating a block so that will be very simple functionality so let's complete that also so here we go so everything is working perfectly fine and now the last functionalities that we want to implement is editing and deleting a block so there are two functionalities which are remaining of the edit and the delete so we need to implement these two functionalities as well but how can we implement them so to implement the edit and the delete so we need to move on into the profile page so only from the profile page the user can have the functionalities of, of editing and deleting the block so only from the profile page will be showing the access buttons of edit and delete the block so you can see inside the my post section we are rendering all of the blog posts of that user so inside each blog post will be having the buttons of edit and the delete and these two buttons will only be enabled only on the profile page so that will be the functionality so here you can see if we move on into the profile component and there you can see we are rendering the data.user.blocks.map and from there we are using the same blog item that we are using inside the main blocks page as well and inside the profile page as well so we are using the same block functionalities so now we can move on into the profile and here you can see now we have the profile page now we are rendering the blocks so only from the profile page we can send a prop in which we can identify that this block page is being rendered from the profile page so for that we can move on into the blog item and here you can see we have the type of the props now what do we want to do so here we can just accept another prop and that would be an optional prop like we can have the is edit or we can have the show edit so we can have the show we can have the actions like this and the type of the show actions would be the boolean that we need to provide so we'll provide the show actions property only from the profile page so we can use the blog item we can use the show actions like this and that would be equals to the true that we need to provide so now what we are doing so only from the profile page now we are just sending a prop which is a show actions that would be the true and then we can just render the actions of the card like the actions would be edit and delete but how can we implement that so here you can see now we have the card over there but now what do we want to do inside that so inside top of the each card we can just render the card actions so we can have the card actions with that so that should be the card actions inside that and inside this card actions then we'll be having the action buttons of the edit and the delete so for that we can have the icon button so we can have the icon button like this so for the edit so this would be for the edit or this would be for the delete so we can have these two icon buttons for that and then we'll be rendering a specific icon for them so for the specific icons again we can move on to the react icons package so we have the react icons and then here we have the icons we can use the update icon so we can use the edit so for the edit that icon will look good so we can just use that 
So we can just move on and we can just render this. So we can have the AI outline edit. Same would be applied for the delete as well. So again, we have icon for the delete. We have the AI outline delete. So we can just copy that. We can move on and we can just paste that here. So these two icons are available inside the AI package. So we'll be using that package and we'll be importing these two icons from the React icons. So we have the from that should be equals to so we can have the React icons like this. So we can have the React icons and it will be imported from the AI folder from the React icons slash AI. And then I think everything should work fine. So here with the type. So this type should be there of the props like this. So we have this functionality here. So you can see now everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So now you can see now we do not have any error or the type error. Or you can see we do not need the from as well. So we can remove that as of now. And now we can move on and we can render these two icons. So for the edit, we can use this icon over there. Like we can have this icon for the edit like this. We can use same for the delete as well. So we can move on with the AI out and delete. So we can just use that here. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, then you can see if we just move on into the profile page. So now you can see from the profile. Now we have the edit and delete buttons and you can see, I think we are getting the error on clicking on that. So if we just check again, so you can see if we just click on this block, so you can see we are getting the error and maybe this error is because we haven't provided the ID and the ID is also undefined. So maybe we are not getting the ID from this. So we can move on into the profile and we are rendering the profile page from this. And then we have the blog item. We have used the data.user.blocks.map. We have used the ID as well. I think we haven't provided the ID inside the queries. So if we can move on into the queries page, then you can see now we have get user blocks and here we have the GQL property. So here you can see now we are not accessing the ID from the backend. So we need the ID as well. So we can use the ID. So if we just save, if we move on to the application once again, if we just click on this block once again, so now you can see now everything is working perfectly fine. So now we are getting the ID. So you can see now we have fixed that error and now we can move on. And there you can see now we have the button of edit and delete. So now once we click on the edit, so we need to move on into the edit page and once we click on the delete, then we need to delete this block. So if we just click on the edit, so now we want to move on to the edit page and how that edit page will be designed. So we need to work on that. So we'll be using the same design that we have currently inside the post new block. So we have the functionality of author. We have the functionality of publish. We have the functionalities of adding this content. So we'll be providing the initial value to this component in case of the edit. So for that, now we can move on. And there you can see we have here the blog item. And what do we want to do? So here, once we click on the edit, so we can just provide on click button. So we can have the on click like this. So we can have the edit handler. So we can have the edit handler. And for the delete, we'll be having the delete handler. So we can have the on click. So we can have the on click. So that should be the delete handler like this. So it would be the delete handler. And now we need to define these two functions. So we can have the const edit handler. That would be a function in which we need to move on and we need to just provide the function. So as of now, it will be an empty function. Same would be applied for the delete handler as well. So we can just copy that. We can paste. We can apply for the delete handler as well. So now we have the functions of the edit and the delete. And now what do we want to do? So once we click on the edit, so we need to move on to the different page. So you can see we already have the navigate. So we can use the navigate once again. So we can have the return to the navigate and that should be block slash we can have the update. So we'll be using a specific route. We'll be having the block update and that should be equals to we have the props.block.id. So that will be the functionality for the edit. So if we save, if we move on to the application, if we refresh once again, then you can see if we just click on the edit, then you can see now we are into the block view. So here you can see here we are getting an error. So you can see if we just click on the edit, so you can see still we are moving on into the view page and that's because you can see we have implemented the on click functionality into the cart itself. So wherever we click on the cart, so the on click would be called first. So what do we want to do? So we can remove the on click from the cart and then we can just use the on click for this box container. So for this box container, we'll be using the on click functionality. So you can see now everything should work fine. If we just move on to the application, if we just refresh, then you can see if we just only click this box container inside that, then only will be moved on into the view page. Or if we just click on the edit, then we'll be moved on into the update page. So you can see that will be the functionality inside that. And then one last thing that we can implement with this box. So we can use here the styles header. We have the card header. And inside the card header, you can see if we just move on into the card styles, we have the block styles. So here we have the container. 
and here we have the header so we can just use the hover as well so we can have the hover inside that so that we should be aware that once we click on this then only we'll be moving on to the next page so we can have the hover and then we can have the cursor so we can have the cursor of it that should be the pointer like this so we can have the cursor pointer so if we just save if we move on to the application if we just move on to the all of the blocks then you can see if we just move on into this then only you can see now we are seeing the cursor over here and if you just click on that then you can see now we are moving on into the block view page and here you can see here comes another error so now you can see now we are rendering the edit and the delete inside all of the block pages as well so we need to move on into the blog item once again and we need to only render the card actions when the props dot show edit property is true so we can have the props dot show actions then only we need to render these actions so if we just save if we move on to the application so you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there you can see everything is working perfectly fine so now we have the functionalities and then you can say it is working fine and then you can see once we click on any of the card then you can see now we'll be moved on to the specific block page and then you can see if we just click on the profile now if we just move on to the profile then you can see now we are seeing the buttons of edit and delete and then you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there and then you can see if we click on this block then we'll be moved on to the view page and if we just click on the edit then we'll be moved on to the edit page as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and now we can just move on and we can just apply and now we can just add the page of the block update as well so for that we can move on into the app component into the parent component and there we can just define that functionality there so we can have another route over there we can have the block we can have the update that should be the id and, and then we want to render another component then we want to render different component so here we have the block then we can use a component that can be the update block like this dot tsx and from there we can just render the refc for the initial setup we have the initial setup like this now we can move on again into the app component and there we can just render that specific component so we can move on and then we can just provide the details like we can have the update block like this so we can have the update block with that so everything should work perfectly fine so now we can again move on into the update block and the design that we want to render from the update is the same as we defined inside the ad so there will be same design because we want to render the title here we want to render the story here so we'll be using same design so we can move on into the ad once again into the ad block page and there we can just copy the design part so we can move on and we can just copy that design part from here we can just copy this box or we can just copy that whole component from there then we can move on into the update then we can pass that inside the update and then we can just specify the update block like this so we can have the update block we can just use the update block here as well so we can have the update and then you can see now what do we want to do so here we do not need the handle submit as of now so i think we can just move on and we can just comment it as of now so we can just remove the on click button and then we can also comment it out the handle submit button now we have the functionality of adding a block but we do not need that functionality as of now then we need to move on and here you can see now we have the refs as well so we have the refs of the paragraph and the heading and then we also want to remove the mutation we want to use the query from them so we want to use the query and then we do not want the mutations from here as of now and then you can see if we just save if we move on to the application if we just move on to the update block so we can move on to the profile page we can just click on the update then you can see now we're into the block update page then you can see everything should work perfectly fine so now you can see now we have the authored by text as well so you can see now we have the story as well we have the describe but here we won't be using this text as of now so we'll be using some initial data that we currently have inside the block so for that you can see once we just click on any block like suppose we have click on this block so the content should be this content that we currently have and the title should be this that we currently have so we need to apply that thing over there so now what can we do so if we just click on the update then we can just fetch the details of this block from this id so we can fetch the details so we can do same as we did for the block page as well so we can move on to the block page once again so we can have the block page like this so we can have the view block page so we'll be using the same functionality so we'll be using the same query over there so here you can see here we had the query of getting a block by its id so we'll be using same functionality over there so we can move on we can define the use query over there and then that should be the get block by its id and then inside that now what do we want to do so here you can see now we have the properties of the data error and the loading and the fetch and here we have the variable of the id but i think we can move on and we can just provide the id variable as well so the id of the block should be the use params dot id once again because we have something inside the use params which we have defined inside the app component that is the id so we have the use params 
and then we can just import that as well so everything should work perfectly fine so now we have just copied the content from the ad block and then we have modified it accordingly that we need to require for the edit so here you can see now we have the edit now we have the data error loading and the fetch now what do we want to do inside that so now we have the id as well here and now what do we want to do so here we can just run the effect code inside that so you can see once we move on into the update page then we can run the effect code and from the effect code we'll be making a request of the data so we'll be getting the data from this use query and then once we get the data then what do we want to do so we want to update their refs as well like for the heading and the content so now we can use the use effect code here so we can use the use effect like this and there we'll be adding the callback like this so we'll be adding the callback and then we need something inside the dependency list as well so inside the dependency list we'll be using the id and then we'll be using the data itself so there will be two properties that we require so once any of these variables change once any id changes or once the data changes then we want to rerun the use effect code so for that we can move on to the use effect and there we can just check an if condition so like once we have the data then only we want to perform something so when we'll be having the data then we'll be updating their content like for the heading and for the content as well that will be updating their inner html properties of the heading and the content so we can check when we have the data and when we have the heading ref so when we have the heading ref dot current property and when we have the content ref like this dot current property so we can have dot current like this then only we want to perform a step so that should be then i think then what we can do so then we can just log the value of the data so we can just check that if we have the data or not so we can just move on and there you can see the effect code has ran then we have the blog as well and inside the blog we have the blog we have the title we have your uh, you can see now we have the title we have the content so everything should work perfectly fine so now we have the title and the content so now what do we want to do inside that so we have the console.log we have the data but instead of that now we'll be directly updating the dom element via the ref so we have the heading ref we have the content ref so we'll be using the heading ref dot we can have the current dot we can have the inner html property so that should be equals to we can have the data dot blog dot we can have the title so we can use this and then for the content we'll be using again so we can have the content ref like this dot current property dot inner html once again that should be equals to we can have the data dot blog like this so we can have the data dot blog dot content like this so we can have the content so if we save if we move on to the applications so here you can see now we are getting the exact content so you can see we have the content like how netflix content engineering and then we can change that content as well so you can see now we can edit the data and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so you can see if we refresh it once again but now you can see now we are getting the data but you can see there is an effect like you can see if we just refresh then first we are seeing the initial data and then after we ran the use effect code once again then we are seeing the actual data so now what can we do for that so we can just check that once we have the data then only we need to return something so if we just save if we move on to the application if we refresh once again then you can see now we do not have anything after that and then you can see once we have the data then only we are adding something so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside our application so we have already implemented all of those things so you can see we have the design which is working fine so we can also change the content as well like this we can have this and we can add one more paragraph as well like we can just copy and paste it one more time so here you can see now we have another paragraph with that so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then you can see once we click on the publish then we can see the actual data i think we haven't implemented that so we have just used so i think you can see inside the publish we can again provide the on click like this so in the on click what we'll be doing so again we can use the handle submit like this so we can just uncomment that code of the handle submit so you can see now i have uncommented the code of the handle submit so you can see now we have the heading wrap dot current we have the heading wrap dot text then you can see now we are just extracting the details of the title the content the date and the user so now inside the handle submit we do not need the date so we can remove the date and then we do not need the user as well so we'll be removing the user from here itself because the user cannot be updated and the date also cannot be updated so we have these two properties so we have the title and the content but the function that we want to define would be different so now it won't be the ad block so now it would be a different function so as of now we can move on and we can just comment this as of now so we can just comment this whole code from here and then we can just move on and then we can just verify if we are getting the exact values if we are getting the updated values or not so we can get the title like this and then we'll be using another log statement and then we'll be using that for the blog as well so for the content we'll be using that so if we just save if we move on to the application so i think the handle submit is not defined so it should be the handle submit like this 
so it would be the handle submit so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see if we just edit some content like if i add another paragraph like this and it should be added at the end we have this paragraph we can just make a modification inside the title if we just click on the publish then you can see now we are seeing the exact data we have the modification here as well and we have the modification here as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now the next step that we want to achieve is we want to just define the mutation function for updating a block so we can move on again inside the handlers so here we have the function of updating a block as well so here we have the update block so we can just call that function here and then you can see we need the id we need the title and then we need the content of the block to update the block so for that we can move on again into the front end part so here inside the mutations now we can move on to the mutations we can define another mutation for updating so we can have the export we can have the const we can have the update block we can have the update dash block that should be equal to so we can have the gql property and inside the gql now what do we want to do so we need to define the mutation so we can have the mutation we can have the update block like this we can have the update block and then that, that would be a function now we need to define the variables as well so we need the id so the id would be type of the id and it would be a required and then we need the title so we can have the title and it would be the string and it would be a required we need the content it would also be the required so that should be the string like this and it's a required field and then we want to call the function of the update block once again so we can have the update block for the backend we need to provide the id that should be the id itself variable id like this then we'll be using the title as well so we'll be using the title like this and then the variable that we have defined of the title then we need to use for the content as well so we can have the content like this so the content would be having the variable of the content like this so we'll be having these three variables and inside that now in return what do we want so we can just get the id of that block because we'll be refetching the details of that block so we need to only get the id of that block we can get the id we have the title we have the content so everything should work perfectly fine so if we just move on into the update block then we can just register this mutation as well so we can have the const we can have something that should be the use mutation hook once again so that should be the use mutation and inside that that should be the, we can have the update block like this and then you can see inside that we'll be having a function so we'll be having a function of update block like this and then we'll be just calling that function inside this inside this try catch block so we can just remove that from here we can just use the const response that would be equals to the await and that would be this function so we can have the update block like this so we can have the update block and then inside that we need to define the variables once again so the variables would be again we need to define the id that would be the block id that we currently have so we'll be using the same id that we currently have inside the use params then we'll be using the title then we'll be using the content like this so we have the title then we have the content so everything should work perfectly fine and after that now what do we want to do so here we are already importing the refetch so we'll be refetching the whole details from that so we'll be again using the refetch so as we did inside i think so again we can move on into i think inside the view block so here we have used here the promise like re refetching the details so we can use that functionality here as well so we can just copy that we can just paste that inside the update blog as well and then we can just add that here and then we can import the toast as well so everything should work perfectly fine so we can have the toast so if we just save if we move on to the application so here you can see if we just edit the blog once again we can use this and then we can just use another paragraph like this we'll be just using a different content like the searchable like this and then you can see we can just re-verify once again so we have the await update block then we'll be using toast.promise so everything should work perfectly fine so if we just click on the publish then you can see now the block is being published and then you can see hold on and then you can see now the block is being published and then you can see now we have the actual data of that block you can see now we have the exclamation mark so everything is working perfectly fine over there and then you can see if we just refresh once again then we will be seeing the refresh data with that so you can see now we have the paragraph like you can see now it is being repeated then you can see everything is working perfectly fine inside our application so you can see with that our update functionality has also been completed now the final functionality that we want to implement would be the delete functionality so now we want to do something with the delete so for that again we can move on into the block item so we already have the delete handler so now we can move on and we can define another mutation for the delete so for that we can move on to the mutations we can have the mutation for deleting the block 
so as we have the mutation for delete the comment so we'll be using the delete block so we can have the export cost we can have the delete we can have the block so that would be the gql like this so we can have the gql property and with that now what do we want to do so here we can have the mutation like this once again so that should be we can have the delete block like this so that should be the delete and then inside that now what do we want to do so here we want to provide the id like this so we can have colon so we can have the variable id like this so we need to provide the id and that should be of type of the id only because we only need the id of the block to delete so we have the delete block and then we can verify that inside the handlers as well like we have here the delete block so we can just get that so we can have the delete block like this we'll be using the same function over here and then we need to define the variable id that should be equals to the id so the parameter id would be the variable id and then inside that now what do we want to do so we can just get the id inside the return of there so now we have this id inside the return and now we can move on into i think into the block item and then we can just use that mutation over there so we can just import the mutation once again so now we can register this mutation as well so here we have the handle click so here after the navigate then we can use const something that would be the use mutation once again like this and then inside that that should be the delete block like this and after that we will be having the function delete block like this and then we need to move on and we need to make this function as an asynchronous function and again we will be using try catch block so we can have the try and then we will be using the catch and inside the catch if we get an error then we will be just logging the error dot message so we have the error dot message like this and then we'll be returning that error so we can have the error of type of the any once again so we can have the type of the any and we can move on and here we can register this function and we can move on and we can call this function so we can have the await that should be the delete block like this so we have the delete block then we can again provide the variables inside an object the variables would be an object it will contain the id field and the id would be the actual id that we currently have so we have the props we can have the props dot we can have the block dot we can have the id field with that block so we'll be having this id with that so now we are just calling the delete block over here so it would work perfectly fine but now what do we want to do so after we have just done with the deleting then we can move on again into the same block into the same page that we have currently inside the profile so we can move into the profile page so it will just force re-render this page so everything should work perfectly fine so now we can move on and again we can just use the navigate so we can have the navigate like this so that should be equals to again inside the we can have the use we can have the profile so we can have the navigate into the profile so you can see if we just save if we just click on the delete so you can see once we click on the delete but nothing happens so you can see but if we just refresh the page then you can see now we won't be seeing any of the blocks of that user so now you can see if we refresh the page then you can see now the block is gone so you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there you can see now we do not have any block post but you can see now the navigate i think we need to just find a different solution for the navigate so we need to find a different one but you can see now the delete functionality the edit functionality the update functionality the add functionality so all of these functionalities are working perfectly fine so now you can see now we have completed this application we have the blocks page we have the comments as well inside the blocks we have the loading functionality as well we have the error handling we have the comment handling we can delete the comments so you can see we have the profile we have the authentication so everything is there inside this application and then you can see now the final part of this application which is remaining is some optimizations so now we want to work on some optimizations level of this project so finally you can see now we have almost completed this application and this was a huge project you can see we had a lot of functionalities over there even inside the back end and even inside the front end so there were a lot of functionalities throughout this project but now you can see now we need some optimizations to complete and to fix inside this application so first optimization that we want to fix is that you can see now we have the footer so you can see sometimes the footer is okay sometimes we can see the footer at the end of the page but sometimes you can see when we do not have enough content like you can see once we refresh then you can see first the footer is being rendered here because then we were because then the post for loading then you can see after the post has been loaded then only we have the footer at the end of the page so we need to align the footer at the bottom of the page but how can we do that so we can move on and here you can see here we are rendering the topmost div of our application so this can be the wrapper or this can be the topmost container so what you can do so you can just provide some styles to it like you can provide the class name to it so we can have a class name and that can be a wrapper like this so we can have a wrapper class name and then we can move on into the index.css and here we can provide some style for the wrapper so we can have dot wrapper like this so that can be wrapper 
and then we need to provide some styles like this can have the display that should be as the flex then we can have uh, the flex direction as well that should be the column we can have the flex property that should be the one so we can have full flex inside that and then we can have the height for this so we can give the height to it and the height should be because the 100 viewport height so we can have the 100 viewport height or we can give the minimum height like this so we can have the minimum height that should be the 100 viewport height so we can save and then we'll be moving on to the application so you can see inside the app component if we move on then you can see here we are rendering the footer as well so inside the footer we are rendering the footer component so what we can do so we can again move on into the application then we can choose here the footer and we can have the margin from the top and that should be the auto so if we save if we move on to the application once again so you can see if we just move on to the blocks even if we now refresh the blocks then you can see now the footer was at the end of that page so you can say it is working fine and even if we move on to the auth page then you can see now still we have the footer at the end of that page so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine now you can see now it is working fine so now we have completed the first optimization fix inside this application and now we want to work with the second optimization fix and that can be with that so you can see i have encountered an error inside viewing the block so if we move on into the blocks page and if we just open a block like this if i open this block then you can see now we are not getting anything inside the page and i have encountered this error but now we can see that what is that error so we can move on into the console window to check that error so you can see now we have five errors so i think we haven't provided the key as well so we need to provide the key and then you can see the error is that cannot read properties of null reading the id so we are not reading the id but we don't know that where is the id so we can move on into the view block and there you can see now once we are destructuring the properties from the json.parse once we are just getting all of the data from the user data and once we have the id then you can see now it is not finding the id so you can see once the user is not logged in so if the user is not logged in so we cannot get the data inside that so you can see if the user is not logged in so we won't be getting the user data from the local storage so what we can do so we can just make this user property as an optional property so we can have this optional like this so we can have the question mark over here so if we save if we move on to the application and if we just open a new block once again then you can see now the new block is opened you can see once the block will open and then you can see now we can see the block page over there and then we can move on into the end as well so here you can see here we have here the condition as well like if the comment.user.id equal equals to the user and then we are rendering all of the comments inside that and then we need to render the delete comment as well so you can see now everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside this application so now we have completed the second fix of optimizations as well so now the third fix that we want to do is here you can see now even if the user is not logged in we can still see a link of posting a new blog so we need to fix that as well and how can we fix that so we need to make this route as a protected route so we need to move on into the header and we need to only render this post new block when the user is locked in so for that we can move on into the header so we can move on into the header component so here we have the header and here what do we want to do so here you can see we are already getting the data from the redux the is logged in property so it will be a boolean property so we can get the true or false and then you can see here we have here the post new block link so we have the post new block and we only need to render this when the is logged in property is true like when the is logged in property is true then only we need to render this box over there so we can save and you can move on to the application then you can see now the error is gone now you can see now we do not have the link to post a new block so everything seems to be working perfectly fine once again so now we have completed this fix as well and now the next optimization would be now you can see now we are seeing the underline to all of these posts now we only want to render the underline inside that once we hover over this so we need to move out and we need to fix that so we can move on into the blog item so here we have the blog item component and here what we'll be doing so you can see here we have the typography like this so you can see initially i think we can move on into the block style dot title so this is a title so we need to work on the title styles so here we have the title like this and then you can see we have here the text decoration we have the underline we have the text underline offset so we need to only allow the underline once we hover over this link so for that now we can just cut that from here so make sure you only cut then we can move on into the end we can provide the styles for the hover like this so we can have the hover and then we can provide some styles for it so that would be an object and then we can provide these properties for the hover so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see now we are seeing all of these items but you can see once we hover over this link then you can see now we are seeing the underline over there and that is exactly that we wanted so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there 
and now the next optimization that we want to fix is we can move on and there you can see if we just move on into the inspect panel and then you can see if we just open these blocks inside the mobile devices then you can see now the content is coming out of their box so you can see the title is coming out of their box and then you can see it is not good as per the user experience so we need to move on and we can just provide some styles to it so we need to provide the responsive font size to this title so we can move on and we can provide that so here we have the title styles once again so we can move on and we can use the font size property so we need to provide the responsive font size according to the screen sizes like for the large for the lg for the large screen sizes now we can provide the font size for 32 and for the medium then we can provide for the medium and for the medium it would be somewhere around 28 then for the small and for the small we use the sm and for the sm that should be the 22 and then for the extra small devices like the extra small xs that should be somewhere around 18. So if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now the font size is okay. Then you can see even if we open this application inside iPhone SE, XR. So you can see we will be having some responsive font sizes over there. So everything should work perfectly fine over there. So you can see now we have the responsive font size and the next optimization again that we can see. So now we have provided the fixed height for this header background. So we need to fix that also. So again, we can move on into the blog list styles. And here I think inside the card header, we have provided the height that should be 35%. So we can provide the height as the auto. So if we save or if we move on to the application, then you can see now we have the height of the auto or we can provide some minimum height as well. So we can have the minimum height and that should be somewhere around. We can give the 30 pixels for the minimum height. So if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now we can have the height as the auto and then we can have the minimum height as well. So everything should work perfectly fine. So now you can see now we have this as well. We have this as well. You can see we have the minimum height and then you can see we have all of this content as well and then we can increase it to 40 as well so it would work fine so we can have the 40 pixels for the height so everything should work perfectly fine now so you can see now we have the responsive font size for here and now we can provide the responsive font size for this as well for this date as well so we can move on and we can check where we are rendering the date from here so we can again move on into the blog item and here we have the date container we have the typography so we need to provide the responsive font sizes for this as well so now we can provide the responsive font sizes for this as well. So you can see now we have the font size and for the LG we'll be having the 20 pixels of the font size and for the medium we'll be having 18 pixels of the font size and for the small we'll be having 16 pixels and for the extra small devices we'll be having the 12 pixels of this size. So you can see if we just move on to the inspect panel once again, if we just open this inside any device. So you can see now it is working perfectly fine. So now we have the responsive font size for this as well. And now we can move on and we can provide some, some font families as well. So for that we have the date container so for that we can have the font family so we can have the font family like this so the font family would be equals to so we can use the arvo like this because we have already imported the arvo so you can see now we have the font family of the arvo and you can see it is working perfectly fine over there and now the next optimization would be now you can see now we need to also provide the font family for this as well for the title and for some content so for that we can move on into it so again we can move on into the blog item and here you can see here we are rendering the title so we need to again move on to the title properties so we need to provide the font family so i think we can provide the different font family because i think it is not working fine so that should be arvo again so arvo arvo and if we just save if we move on to the application then you can see this font is now looking good so now you can see everything is working perfectly fine over there so the next optimization again would be now we can provide the font family for this text as well so for that again we can move on and here we have the content text i think so we have the content text inside that so we have the content text and then we can provide the font style now we can provide the font family for this as well so we can move on to the blog list styles we can provide the font family like this that should be we can have the work sans once again we can have the work sans like this so if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now we have this font family as well. And everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside our application. So you can see it is working totally fine. So now the next optimization that we want to fix is now we want to provide the author details as well inside this card item. So you can see we are rendering the date. We have the title as well. We have the content. But now inside this header, now we want to add the author as well. So like the author, so like suppose the author is Nikhil. So we need to add the author as the Nikhil over there. So we can move on into the card item. So here we have the blog item file and here you can see here we are rendering the date and after that we have the title and after the title then we can use the typography once again. So we can have the typography and for the SX that should be equals to so we can have the blog styles. So we can have the blog styles dot we can have the author like this. So we can have the author. So now we can move on into the blog styles inside that and then we can provide some styles for the author as well. 
So here we can provide these styles for the author like this. So the author can have these styles like the author can have the display. So we'll be using the displays dot this and that should be equals to the flex once again. So we'll be using the flex box for rendering the details inside the typography. Then we'll be using the align items again. So we need to align the items inside the center. So that should be again inside the center. And then after that, now what can we do? So we can provide the gap as well between the items. So the gap and the gap can be somewhere around one should be enough. Then we can also provide the font weight as well. So we can have the font weight of the author that should be as the bold. So we'll be using the bolder font. Then we can just use the family as well. So we can have the font family that should be again the box sans that we can use box sans. And then after that, now what can we do? So we can provide some padding as well. So the padding can be somewhere around, I think one padding or two would be enough for the padding. And then we can move on and we can provide some color and that should be equals to, so we can use the white color with that. So we can have this and then you can see now we have this typography as well, but we do not have any content inside that. And inside the typography, we'll be using the icon of that author and then we'll be using the name of that author. So we can move on first. So here we'll be rendering the props.block.user.name. So we can check that inside the query as well. So we have made the query inside. I think we have the query. So we have, I think we are accepting the block inside you can say we are accepting the block inside the block type so inside the block type we have the user details as well but we can move on and we can just check inside the block list so what are the so what are the data that we are getting inside the blocks so here we have the blocks and then inside the get blocks we can see what data that we are getting so we are getting the get blocks and inside that we are getting the user dot name property as well so we can provide the name properties so we can move on into the blocks item so now we can again move on into the block item to provide that name and then we'll be using the name as well. So here we have the typography for this title and then we can use the name as well. So we can have the props dot. We can have the blog item once again. So we can have the blog like this dot. We can have the user dot. We can have the name property as well for the user. So we can just choose that. So if we say if we move on to the application, then you can see now we have the names of that users as well, like the James, then we have the Smith as well. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine. And then finally, now what we can do, so we can provide some more styles to it. Now we can provide some author icon as well. So before that, now we can just render an icon as well. So we can have the author icon and that should be, we can use the F a user. So that will work fine. So we can use the F a user icon. It will work fine. So we can choose that icon. So if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now we have the author details as well. Now you can see now we have the author, we have the James, and then you can see we have the James, we have the Smith. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there. So now you can see now we have these authors and now we can move on. We can provide some color. So for this, we can have the color that should be the black. So we'll be using the black color for this icon. So the icon will be having the black color. And then for this James as well, I think we can use the black color over there. And for this as well, we can change the color. So we can change the color to the beach color. So we can have the beach color. So if we save, if we move on to the application, then you can see now this color is okay. Now you can see now this color is looking good. Then we have the content as well. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there. So you can see now we have all of the things and then you can say it will be fully responsive. If we just check inside the inspect again, if we just move on to the application, then you can see it will be fully responsive as well. So you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there. And now the next optimization that we want to fix is that you can see now the user is not logged in. So you can see now we can see the authentication sign and you can see the user is not logged in. But you can see if we just move on into the local host port of the 3000 slash ad, then you can see now we can still access this ad page as well. So you can see this can be a huge security threat and this will break our application as well because we haven't stored anything inside the local storage and we are just posting a new blog. So this will break our application. So we need to fix that. So we can move on into the app.tsx as well. So here we have the app.tsx and here you can see, here we are rendering some of these routes. Like here you can see we have the route path at, and then you can see we have the update as well. So we need to make these routes as the protected routes. And how can we do that? So we can move on and you can see we are rendering the property of the is logged in. And this property is of the Boolean property that we have. So it's logged in property has the Boolean like this. So we have the Boolean. And now we can just move on and we can just check that like once the is logged in property is true, like once the is logged in property is true, then only we need to render this route. So you can see if we just move on again, if we just move on to the application once again, so you can see inside the ad, we can see now we do not have any content inside that. Now you can see we don't have any content. So now we have the ad and then you can see if we just move on refresh once again, now we do not have anything inside the ad. 
But if we move on into the inspect, if we move on to the console, then you can see we'll be seeing a warning that the no routes match the location of the slash ad. So everything seems to be working perfectly fine once again. So now you can see now you cannot see anything inside the ad component. So you can see if we move on into the ad, even before the logged in, then you can see now you won't see anything inside that page. So we want to do same for this as well. So for this as well, so we want to do same thing. So we can have when the is logged in property is true, then only we want to render this page. And then only and we want to just enable this as well like we want to only enable this route when the user is not logged in so we can have when the user is not logged in then only we want to render this page and then you can see if we just move on into the ad you can see now the user is not logged in but you can see we are not rendering anything inside the page so what functionality that we can add inside it so inside the optimizations then we can add a functionality that if the user accesses a route which is not available inside our application so we can just render a not found page like we can just render something like error not found or we can have the page not found so we can add that route as well so for that we can move on and we can just provide another route over here so we can have the route and inside that now what do we want to do so inside the route we can have the path property so this time the path would be equals to the star and this works for the not found pages and for that we can render the element as well and for the element now we can just create an element as well so for that inside the components now we can create a new folder we can have the not found like this and inside that we can just generate a page like we can have the not found dot tsx and now inside this page now we can add some stylings like again we can render the rfce and inside that again we can move this div we can remove this div we can use the box from the material ui so we can use the box like this like this and now we can remove the react import as well and now we can just render this page over there so if we move on into this we can provide the element and that should be equals to so we can have the not found page like this so we can have the not found like this and then we want to render this element over there so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now here we are seeing the not found page as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we can just provide some stylings for the not found as well so for that attached to this lecture you will find an image which will be the not found.png so you will find this image attached to this lecture so you need to download that and then you need to paste it inside the public folder and now you need to move on into the not found and here inside that now we can just provide some stylings to the box like we can provide some width that should be the 100% again we can provide the height as well so the height should again be the 100% for this then we can provide some display as well so after this we can provide the display we can provide the display like this and the display would be again inside the flex box so we'll be using the flex again for the display we can have the flex direction as well so we can have the direction of this flex And the direction would again be inside the column so we'll be using the column basis once again and after that now what do we want to do so we want to provide here the justify content and that should be equals to inside the center so we'll be using aligning into the center as well then we can use align items so for that we can use the align items as well and now we can provide some margin as well so we can provide the margin like this and that should be again inside the auto so we'll be using this styles for this and after this now we want to remove this and we can render the typography like this so we can have the typography like this and inside that we can use the variant that should be again we can use the h3 or h4 variant with that we can use the font family as well so the font family should be ro once again then we can just provide here the font i think it should work we can provide some padding that should be equals to three then we can have the requested page not found so we can have the requested page not found like this so we can have this and then we can render an image as well so we can render the image icon with that the source of the image would be we can have slash we can have the not found dot jpg so we'll be having the not found dot jpg and inside the alt we can use the not found like this so we can have the not found we can provide the width and the width of the image should be somewhere around 50 percent of the width we can put the height as well it should also be the 50 percent so if we save if we move on to the application so here you can see now we just get this page so now you can see now we have this heading we have the requested page not found and then you can see now we have this image so you can see we can see a demo like if you open the demo page like this then you can see we'll be seeing this page over there like the requested page not found so we can see this page so you can see everything is working perfectly fine inside our application so you can see this image is also looking good so now we can move on and we can just work on other optimizations 
And now next optimization that we want to add is we want to add the name of this application as well inside the header. So after the logo, then we can enter the name of this application as well. So for that, we can move on into the header file. And here you can see after we are rendering the logo, then we can use the typography as well. So we can have the typography like this. And this can contain some styles like we can provide the margin from the left like we can have the margin from the left that should be somewhere around 5 pixels would be enough so we can have the 5 pixels of the margin then we can also use the font size as well and we'll be giving the responsive font sizes once again so for the lg that should be 16 for the md as well that should be somewhere around 16 would be enough for the sm that would be somewhere around 12 and for the extra small devices we can have the 10 as well so it should work perfectly fine and after that now what can we do so we can have the font family as well so that should be we can again use work sense like this so we'll be having the work sense again which will be the font family and then we can use the sx as well we can provide the text shadow so we can have the text shadow like this and that should be somewhere around we can get the four pixels of the horizontal shadow and one pixels of the vertical 20 pixels of the blur we can use some color like that should be hash d5 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 and then inside that we can just render the name of this application like we can render dev block like this so we can have the dev block so if we just save if we move on to the application then you can see now we have this over there so you can see now it is looking good now we have this over there and then we can put the font weight as well i think so we can move on after this we can have the font weight and that should be somewhere around 500 would be now so now we have the font weight and then you can see now it is looking good now we have this and then for the margin left we can increase it to somewhere around seven pixels with that or we can increase it to somewhere around one property with that so we can remove this we can use around 1.2 so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see now it is looking good so now we have the dev block and then we can also increase the size as well we can have the 18 we can have here the 17 for this we can have somewhere around 13 for this we can have somewhere around 11 so if we save if we move on to the application then you can see now we have the dev block and then you can see it is looking good now we have the application name as well and if we move on to the application if we move on to the authentication then you can see now here as well we are rendering the name like with the dev block so everything seems to be working perfectly fine once again so the next optimization that we want to fix is you can see now the footer is basically aligned to the bottom of the page and you can see it is looking good but if we move on to the mobile devices if we just check with the mobile devices like this if we just move on to iphone xr then you can see now the buttons in the footer are not looking good so you can see now we have the buttons like this and you can see this is not looking good if we open it if we open this in any other device like in the iphone se then you can see still the buttons are not looking good so we need to fix all of them and if we just open in any other device as well like if you open in pixel 5 then you can see still the footer is not aligned so we need to fix that part as well so we can move on into the home page styles and here we have the footer container so you can see we have provided the gap that should be of 10 so we can remove this 10 and we can use the gap of around 30 pixels for the gap if we just save if we move on to the application then nothing would be changed but if we just move on and if we just provide a different width for the footer button so we can give the width of somewhere around 15 percent of the available space so the footer will take around 50 percent of the available space now we have this width of the button and now we can move on and we can just provide some font size for this button as well so we can have the font size like this and now we can provide some styles for all of the screen sizes like for the large we can provide 20 or like or like for the large we can provide the 16 and for the medium we can again provide the 16 and for the small devices we can provide for the 12 and for the extra small we can provide for the 10 so if we save if we move on to the application so now you can see now the font size is okay but i think we can just increase the width of somewhere to the 20 percent would be enough so we can increase the width and then you can see it will look good and now we can see we have the footer text and then you can see we have the font size of fixed 20 and it will not look good so we can just provide same font size to this as well like this and for the large i think we can provide for the 20 for the medium we can provide for the 18 and for the small and the excess that would be somewhere around 10 so it will look good so now you can see now these styles are looking good once again and i think still we have some width inside that so you can see still we have some space between them so what we can do so we can move on into the footer container so we have the height we have the width and it is basically aligned to the center we have the font size so we can just move on we can provide some more width i think so we can move on and we can just change the font size once again so for the large that should be 12 for the medium again that should be 12 and for the small and the extra small devices we can choose to the 8 pixels for the sizing for the font and then we can just choose the width to the 20 percent for the width so now we have the 20 percent for each button inside the footer width and then finally for the gap we have just aligned the gap to the 20 pixels for that 
so we'll be having the gap for around 20 pixels between them and then you can see now they are looking good so now we have the buttons and you can see they are looking perfectly fine and then you can see inside every screen size it is working perfectly fine so you can see if we just move on into this screen size you can see it is looking good so now we have the buttons for the footer but i think we can just decrease the width once again so you can see these buttons are now not looking good so we have the width so you can see the width of these buttons are not looking good so it is too much according to the screen size but now we can move on and we can just provide some more styling like we can choose to provide the max width so the maximum width that each button can contain so that should be somewhere around we can provide somewhere around 200 pixels for that so if we say if we move on to the application so now you can see now the width is looking good for the buttons and then you can see everything seems to be working totally and perfectly fine so you can see now our application is fully responsive but except the header so if we just move on and if we just check the inspect panel once again so you can see inside all of the screen sizes now the header is not looking good if we just open it inside the pixel 5 so you can see it is not looking good so the header you can see now we cannot see what is the content inside the header so we need to fix that as well so what we can do so we can just provide a drawer inside the header and what about the drawer so if you can move on into the mui.com and then you will find the drawers inside that like you can see if we just move on and if we just decrease the size of the page so you can see they also have the drawers inside that so you can see this is a type of drawer that we can use if we just click on the hamburger menu then you can see we can open some links like this but we'll be opening the drawer from the left side so we open the drawer from the left side so we'll be having that type of functionality so now we can just search for the drawer as well to see what is the exact use of the drawer so you can see that is a type of drawer if we click on this button then you can see we have this type of drawer that we see inside the mobile devices inside so many things inside so many applications so we can choose to have this type of drawer or you can have this type of drawer as well so you can see we'll be using that type of drawer so for that now what do we want to do so we need to move on inside the header component and first we need to verify that if the screen size is below the medium screen size like if the screen size is below the large or below the medium screen size then we can apply the drawer inside the web page because then only we need the drawer because if we just open the device because if we just open this application inside the last screen devices then you can say it is working perfectly fine inside the ipad as well you can say it is working perfectly fine but for the mobile devices for the medium devices for below medium devices so we need to apply the drawers inside that so for applying the drawer we need to check that if our screen size is below the medium screen sizes then only we need to apply the drawer but how can we check that so for checking that we have something inside the material UI which is the use media query. So the use media query is a custom hook which is used to provide a query inside that and it returns the value in the boolean format the true or the false. So if we just provide a query like tell us that if the screen size is below the medium or below the large or between something or is the or if the exact value is this then we need to provide the output. So the output would be true or false and on the basis of true or false then we can render the drawer. So for that we can apply that so we can have the const we can have the is below md like this so we can have the is below the medium screen size so that should be equals to so we can have the use media query so use media query is available inside the mui material package so you can import that now inside that now you need to provide the theme so we have the theme inside the material ui as well and you need to import the theme as well so you can import the use theme from the material ui as well and after that you can just choose to have here the reference variable for the theme as well so you can provide the reference variable for the theme as well so theme equals to the use theme from the material ui this use theme has the entire theme of our application like the below theme like we have the dark and the white pages you have the styles you have the breakpoints and you have so many things with the theme so you can log the value of that theme and then you can find all of the values inside the theme and i have discussed and i have covered all of these things of the material ui inside my separate material ui course so you can purchase that course inside the udemy and then you will find all of the references and all of the guides for using the material ui advanced concepts so this is a type of advanced concept so you can use that as well so we have the theme and inside that theme we can just provide a query like we have the theme and inside that we have the breakpoints so inside the themes we have the breakpoints and then we have here the between we have the down so we can choose to call here the functions so these are the functions that we can use so we have the between we have the down we have the not we have the only we have the values and so many things so we can just choose to call the down function from them so we can choose the down so you can see now we are calling a query like when the theme dot breakpoints is down from so inside that we need to provide the value like we can provide the numeric value as well like the 200 pixels 2000 pixels but here i will be providing a string value which will contain the medium md so now this is a simple query that you can see you have the use media query 
So when the theme dot break bounds will be down from the medium screen size, then it will give us the true or false value. And then we can lock that value as well. So we can have the log, we can have the is below MD like this. So we can have here the is below MD like this, and then we can lock that value. So if we just save, if we move on to the application, if we just move on to the inspect panel into the console window, then you can see if we just move on into the info section, then you can see we are seeing the true value because now our theme is down from the medium screen side. But you can see if we just move on, if we just move out of the mobile devices, then you can see from the header, we are getting the false value. So that's how it works inside that. And now according to that, now we can just provide the drawer. And for providing the drawer, we can just use to create another component for the drawer. So we can have the drawer component like this, drawer comp .tsx. And inside that, we can just run to the drawer like this. So we can have the refce, and then we can remove the react import. And now we can move on and we can just provide the drawer. So inside that we have the drawer inside the material UI, like we have the drawer like this to use the drawer. So we can just choose to import the drawer from the material UI. And now inside that, now we have a prop of the open that we need to provide. So we can have the open and then we need to handle the drawer according to the state. So we can use the use state like this. So we can have the use state snippets and then we'll be importing the use state as well from the react. So we need to import the use state and then we can have the identifiers like the open. Then we can have the set open property. So we can have set open and initial value. I think that would be the false. So we can choose to add the false. And now inside that we have here the div, we have the drawer and the open property would be equals to the open that we have. So we can have the open like this. And now inside that, now we need to provide some links as well inside the drawer because now the drawer can contain some links that we need to render. So for that, I need to provide some links as well. So before the component renders, now we can just provide some links for the authenticated user and for the non-authenticated user as well. So here you can see I have added a couple of links inside that. So we have the auth links and then we have the non-authenticated links. So I provided this array so that we can dynamically render the links content according to the is logged in property of the Redux. So if the user is logged in, then we'll be providing the auth links. And if the user is not logged in, then we'll be providing the non-authenticated links with that. So inside the links, you can see we have the each object inside the array. So inside the array, we have the objects and you can see each object contain the name property like the name. We have the home, we have the URL, we have the icon. Same for this as well, same for this as well, same for the profile as well. And inside the logout, we have the callback as well for the handle logout. And same for the non-authenticated links as well. We have the home, we have the blocks, we have the auth. So you can see this is a type of things that we want. And after that, inside the drawer, now we'll be rendering the list according to this list items, according to this array. So for that, we can choose to that. We can have here the list like this. So we can have the list from the material UI. So here we have the list. And after that, we'll be using something with that. But for that, we need to just check that if the user is logged in or not. So we can just get that property from the props. So we can have the props and then we can define the type of the props as well. So we can move on. We can define the type that should be the props and that would be equals to a type. And inside that, we can just provide something like is logged in property. So we can have this logged in property and that should be the Boolean that we can use. So that would be the Boolean. So we can add a condition inside that, like we can add a brackets. And inside that we can use props dot is logged in. So when the is logged in property is true, then we'll be returning the auth links like that. So we'll be having auth links, or then we'll be having the non-authenticated links like that. So we can have the non-auth links. And inside that we can just use the map as well. So we can have the map from the array. And inside that we'll be rendering the callback. So for each item, we'll be having the callback. And inside that we'll be having another component. So that would be the list item button. So we can have the list item button like this. So we can have the list item button with that. So we'll be importing that over there. So we can have this button over there and then we can just close that as well. So for each list item, we'll be rendering the list item button. And inside the button, now we can render the icon as well. So we can have the list item icon that we can use. So the icon is used to provide the icon over there and the button is used to provide the button effect inside the list item. And for the icon, we'll be using the item dot icon property like this. So we can have the item dot icon property. So we can have the icon and then we can just use some text as well. So we can have the list item text that we can use. And for the text again, that we'll be using. So we can have the item and then we can add the name of the icon as well. So it should work perfectly fine. So now we'll be having this type of functionality and then we can move on into the list item button and then we can provide the callback like this. So we can have the on click and inside that we can just check so we can have the handle navigate so we can have the handle navigate so we'll be navigating to a different page with that so we can choose the handle navigate and then we can define that function over there so we can have the const we can have the handle navigate like this so we can have the handle navigate that should be a function which will contain the url inside that and the url will be type of the string and then what we'll be doing so we'll be navigating to that url page 
and now we can just define the navigate reference as well so for that we're gonna have the const we're gonna have the navigate as we have done in other screens as well so we can have the navigate that should be the use navigate hook from the react router dom and inside the navigate now what we'll be doing so we'll be just calling the navigate function so we can have in the navigate and then we'll be navigating to the url that we have so we can navigate to the url and then we can also return that as well so we can return navigate with that url and inside the handle navigate we'll be using the item dot url like this so we can have the item dot url so that's how it will work and now we can just check the drawer as well so for that we need to just provide a button as well to open this drawer so after the drawer then we'll be having the button as well so for the button we'll be using the icon button once again from the material ui and inside that we can just provide an icon like we can provide any hamburger menu like you can see we can have this fa hamburger so this will be an icon so we'll be using this type of icon for the icon button and for that we'll be providing the on click function as well for this icon button and inside the on click we can have here the callback once again and inside the callback again what we can do so we can just have here something like so inside the on click what we can do so we can choose to provide the set open property that would be equals to the true so we can have the set open property that would be true so it would work perfectly fine so if we just save and now we can move on into the header so we need to provide the header as well so now you can see now we are rendering the i am blogger and then we have the typography then we have the is logged in property so we have so many things so now you can see now inside the header you can see now we have the i am blogger we have the typography and then we have the is logged in property so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine but you can see we need to provide a container which will contain all of these elements so for that now what we can do so after this i am blogger now i think we can just provide a container like this so we can have the container which will contain all of these elements so we can have the empty tag over there and now we can just render this empty tag according to a condition like when what we can do so when we have the is below md then we need to perform or then we need to add the drawer so for that we can have the drawer component like this so we can have the drawer component so we can just call the drawer component like this over there so we can import that as well or after that or else inside that we'll be using all of these links so we can have this type of functionality and inside the drawer you can see we need to provide the is logged in as well so we can have the is logged in property that should be equals to that we are getting from the redux the is logged in so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see this is very simple code you can see we have just provided all of the things according to the is below md condition so we have the log so we can remove that as well so if we just save if we move on to the application so now you can see if we again refresh the application it would work perfectly fine so now you can see if we open this inside a mobile device then you can see now if we open this inside this iphone se then you can see now we have the drawer icon as well so you can see now we have the drawer icon and then you can see we have some links as well inside the drawer and it is working perfectly fine so you can see this is the menu of the hamburger icon so you can see it's working perfectly fine over there so you can see we have the home we have the blogs we have the ad block profile and the logout so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and now we can move on and we can just provide a functionality in which once we click outside of the drawer then we can close the drawer as well and here we have a prop of the own close that we can use so we can have the own close and instead that now what we can do so we can just provide the callback function we can provide the set open property that would be the false like this so we can have the set open as the false so you can see if we just save again if we just move on to the application if we just click outside then you can see now the drawer is being closed so you can see now the drawer is closed and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there we have the home and if we just click on the home then we'll be moved on to the home route if we just click on the blocks then we'll be moved on to the blocks route like this so you can see now we have the blocks like this and if we just move on into the add block so there we can just add a new block like this and then you can say it is perfectly responsive then we can move on into the profile as well so we can move on to the profile page and then we can log out as well so for the logout we again move on to the logout page as well so everything seems to be working totally perfectly fine and now we can just provide the own close function like this and now we can just provide the set open property once we click on any link as well so for that we have this handle navigate so we have the on click we have the handle navigate and after this now we can just move on so after the handle navigate now we'll be moving on and we can provide the set open property so the set open property would be the false so now the one last thing here that we want to perform so we can just add so we can just align this button to the right side so we can align to the right so for that we can move on we can have the sx property that should be equal to so we can have the margin from the left and that should be the auto like this so if we save if we move on to the application so i think nothing would change once again so we can just provide the display inside that so we can have the style like this we can have the display like this so we can have the display as the flex and then we can provide the bit as well that should be the 100 percent 
and then we can move on and we can put the sx prop to it so we can have the sx and then we can just choose to provide the margin left like this so we can have the margin left and that should be the auto like this so we can have the auto so now you can see now it is aligned to the right side and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there and now again we can just choose to put the color as well so for the color of the icon button we can provide the color and that should be we can have the inherit color with that so if we say if we move on to the application so now you can see now we have the white color as well so you can see everything is working totally fine once again so now we are fully responsive site and then you can see once we click on this now we have some links as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now we can just provide the key as well for the button because we are rendering the list so we need to provide the key so we can provide the key it would be the item dot name as well so we can provide the item dot name so if we save if we move on to the application now you can see now we won't be seeing an error for the keys and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine we have no errors we have the no warning and everything is working totally fine over there now you can provide the font family as well so you need to provide the primary typography props inside the list item text and then you can use to provide the font family like this and the font family would be work sense so if we just save if we move on to the application so now you can see now we have the font family which is looking perfectly fine now the final thing for the logout now we need to provide the functionality for the logout as well so you can see we have the logout as well and for the logout now we need to provide the callback function as well so you can see inside the list item i provide the type so for the type we have the name we have the url we have the icon we have the callback and inside that you can see for the callback we have one callback inside the logout function which we have defined over here we have the handle logout and inside the handle logout what we'll be doing so we'll be dispatching the action to the redux to update the state inside the redux that the user is no more locked in so for that now we can move on and you can see i have provided the type as well for this so we have here the item and we have provided the type as the list item for that which contains the name url icon and the callback and now what we can do so we have the handle navigate and inside that now we can move on and we can just put the callback as well so we can have the cb like this and we can provide the type that should be of the void or we can have the type of the null as well like this so we can have the type void or the null like this so we can have this type of expression for that so either we'll be having the void of the callback function or we will be having the null and inside that now we can just call that as well so we can have here the cb as well so we can just check that so if we have the cb then we need to call the callback as well so with that we'll be calling the callback like this so it will call this function the handle logout with that and now we can move on we can provide that as well so we can have if we have the item dot we can have the callback then we need to provide the item dot cb like this so we'll be having cb so we can have that type of expression for the logout and now we can move on and now we can provide the functionality for the logout so now what we can do so we can just choose to import the dispatch as well so we can have the dispatch that should be the use dispatch so we can have the use dispatch from the redux and then we'll be calling the dispatch function from here now we'll be calling the dispatch here so we can have the dispatch like this so that should be so we can have the auth actions dot we can have the logout like this so we can have this type of functionality over there and then you can see now we have the logout and then you can see now we are already navigating to this as well we have the set open false and then we can just call the callback function as well so we have the callback so the callback can have the type of either void or it can have the either type of the null as well and if we have the type of the void then you can see now we have the function and inside that once we have the function then we need to call the handle logout so we have this function and then you can see if we just save if we now move on and if we just check inside the application that everything seems to working fine or not we have the user data and then you can see if we just move on and if we just press the logout then you can see i think we have logged out or not so we can check inside the console we have the six info and then you can see from the app.tsx now you can see now we are running the logout and then you can see once we open this now we have the only three links we have the home block and the auth so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and then you can see here we have one more error so if we move on to the application so you can just still we have something inside the user data so for that we need to move on into the redux as well so we have the slice like this so we have the auth slice and there you can see once we have the logout so we'll be changing the is locked in property and we also need to remove the item from the local storage as well so we can have the local storage we can have here the remove item and that should be the key of the user data like this so it will remove the user data as well with that so now one more fix that we have so you can see now if the user is not logged in so if we just log out and then you can see if we just move on to the blogs page like this if you open a blog then you can see still we can add a comment to the blog as well so you can see still we can add the comment even if the user is not logged in so for that we need to fix the functionality so we can move on into the view blog page we can close other files and then we can add a functionality inside the comment handler so here we have the comment handler and now what can we do 
so we can just provide the if check over here so we can have the if and instead the if check now what we'll be doing so we'll be using the functionality from the redux we'll be just getting the is logged in property from the redux and then we will check that if the user is logged in then only we need to provide the comment functionality for that so what we can do so we can choose to move on we can have the cost we can have the is logged in property so we can have the is logged in so that should be equals to so we can have the use selector hook from the redux and then we can just provide the set and then we have the state inside the callback so we can have the state it will be of type of the any then what we'll be doing so we'll be using the state dot is logged in property so we can have the state dot is logged in so with that we'll identify that the user is logged in or not and here we can just check inside the comment handler so if the is logged in so we can just check that like if the is logged in is true then only we need to perform below steps so then only all of this code would be handled so inside we can have this functionality or else now what we can do so inside this we have the if check and after the if check now inside the else case now what do we want to do so we can have the else like this and now inside the else now we can have the toast we can have the error so we'll be adding this message so you can see if we just save if we move on to the application and then you can see if we just try to comment like it is a nice block like this so we can have the nice block and you can see if we just save then you can see you need to log in first to add a comment so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so you can see it is also looking good and you can also hide that comment as well you can also hide that comment section as well so for that we can choose to provide that so you can have this functionality like the is logged in property then only we need to provide this comment input handler so if we save if we move on to the application so you can see even if now the user is not logged in so we won't be having any issue while submitting that so you can see we have the comments and everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have fully authenticated the application with that and then you can see it is working totally fine and you can see even if we now log in so we can have the mary at the rate test.com like this so we can have this and then we can have the password and then if we just log in then you can see it is working perfectly fine if we just open any block then you can see then only we can comment so you can see everything is working perfectly fine we can post a new blog as well and again you can see here we have a functionality error so we are just providing a static name so for that we need to move on into this into the ad block so we can move on into the ad block page like this and inside the ad block you can see we have the return we have we are the authored by nickel so that should be the user name itself from the local storage so for that we can have the const we can have the user from the local storage so we have that inside the view as well so we can just have this property like this of the user so we can have the user and then we can choose to provide this as well so we can have the user and from that we'll be using the name from that user so we can have the name we can provide the author by and then we can just provide it the user like this so we can have the user like this so if we just save if we move on to the application then you can see now we have the author by mary and then you can see we have the publish as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine we can provide the font family for this as well so we can have the font family so that should be we can provide the arvo like this so we can have the arvo like this authored by mary we can just provide some button functionality as well so for that we have this button we can just choose to provide some sx prop we can provide the border radius as well so we can provide the border radius and that should be 10 so now you can see now we have the publish button and everything seems to be working perfectly fine inside our application so now we have completed this application and then you saw it was a huge project that we built so you can see at the time of building our application we had the mongoose version of the 6 but now the mongoose has released the latest version which is the version 7.0.2 but inside that they have just have some breaking changes inside that and the breaking changes would affect our application and then you can see they have removed the remove method from that because we were using the remove inside the handler so you can see earlier we were using the return await we have the existing block dot remove to delete a block and we were using same for the comments as well like for deleting the comment we were using the await we have the comment dot remove this session but now they have removed the remove method from the mongoose but they have provided the one more method inside that which is a delete one so you can see they have provided the breaking changes with that so earlier we were using for documents we have the await document dot remove but now we are using the await we have the document dot delete one so you can see we have a new method of the delete one in which we can just provide the delete query with that and then we can delete a document with that so you need to just delete one record from them and then you need to provide the id with that so that would be the id to delete that you want to delete a comment so now you can see this project has been completed so now the things came to an end so now we have completed this huge project from our side so you can see earlier we built a basic user crowd operation with the node.js graphql and there i taught you that how to use the graphql because it's a very good query language that we can use 
and then we built a back end of this application with the node with the graphql with the mongodb express js and so many things like the big rip for the encryption and there were so many things with a perfect authentication so we built the block backend as well and then we built the front end part of our application with the react full stack applications so we had the full stack application with the react we use the material UI for the styling, the Redux for the state management, and there were a lot of things like the notifications, icons, the home page, the authentication, the blocks functionality, and the animations. So there are a lot of things with the front end application as well. So with that step, you can see our application has been built, but now it's not the end, but now we want to deploy this application as well, because now we have done a lot of hard work with that. But now we want to deploy this application as well. And now for deploying this application, now we want to finally build this project. So now we have completed inside the development, but now we need to build this application as well. So you need to move on into the terminal, select a new terminal from there, and then you can close all other terminals as well. So first you can move on into CD. So you can move on to the front end, and then you can just build this application as well. So we will try with the building this application. So we will build this application and then we will just test this application once again to see if everything works fine or not. So first we will build this application. So now we're building this application. You can see if we just move on into the front end, if we just move on into the package.json and then you can see here we have the build commands. So we have the react script build. So it will build our application. So we can just call this so we can have the npm run build. So we can just execute this command to build our application. And then you can see after this, it will build our application. So you need to wait for a couple of seconds until it creates an optimized production build for our application that we can use. So you can see now this project has been built and then you can see there were a lot of things. You can see we have some type checkings as well. And then you can see finally we didn't have any error. And then you can see the file size after the final zip file, final bundle. You can see we have the file size of around this. We have the 210 KB, something around 210 KB. And then you can see it is good for the size according to the front end. We can see the project was built with assuming it is hosted as this. And then you can see you can control this with the home page field in the package.json. So we can just do that later. And then you can see the field folder. You can see the build folder is ready to be deployed. And then you may serve it with a static server. So you can just install this command. So you can just install this serve inside this. So you can have the npm. So you can have this, we have the npm installed as globally as this serve. So we can just use this library to serve this build inside that. And then after this will install, so then we can just call the serve. We can have the build. So we have this command for the serve as, but it will open the application from this build file that we have just built our application. So we can just call, so we can just enter this. And then you can see now the server will be ready. You can see it is now serving and the server is ready on the local host port of the 3000. So you can see if we just open this inside our application as of now. So now you can see this is a build version of this application and the speed of this application would be much faster than the development. So you can see if we now refresh, then you can see the speed is much faster. Then you can see if you just move on to the blocks, it will just fetch all of these blocks inside that. So the, so I think we haven't opened the server inside that. Then you can see if we can open the auth as well. We have this email password. You can see now the build version is working perfectly fine over there. Then you can see there was some request as well like this, like we have provided some requests like this inside the build and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine. So now the front end application has been built and it is working completely fine. So now you can see now the front end application was built and it is working perfectly fine. And now we need to build the back end of this application as well. So we can move on and we can provide the backend. So here inside the package.json, you can see here we had the command of the build, we have the TSC. So it will compile our application with that. And now what do we want to do? So we can just use that. So we can have the npm run build and it will be for the backend. So we can build this application with that. So it will run the TSC command and then it will compile this application into the JavaScript and then we'll be seeing the compile folder inside the dist. So we'll be having the dist with that and everything would work perfectly fine. So you can see now the backend has also been built and now we can just start the server of the node dist app.js with that. So we can have the npm start like this. So it will just start this application into the develop into the production mode. So now we'll be seeing the production build of this application. So now you can see now the server is open on the port 5000 and now you can see we have this message and then you can see now the front end is also open. So now we can just move on and we can just refresh this application. Then you can see it would work perfectly fine. So now if we just open the blocks, then you will see now we'll be having some blocks inside that. So you can see now we have all of these blocks and it is working perfectly fine. We can work on the authentication as well. Like we can have the Mary at the rate we can have the test.com like this. So we can have this ID 
we can have the password like this and then you can see once we click on the submit then we'll be logged in if we click on the submit then you can see now the user is logged in and then the user can post a new blog the user can move on to the home route the blogs user can access the profile the logout as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine over there so you can see now the build version is also working perfectly fine so with that said, you can see now our application is fully responsive across all of the screen sizes and everything seems to be working perfectly fine in our application and congratulations on building this application as well and now congratulations on building this application as well so now the applications has been built and now the last step would be now we want to deploy the build versions the production versions of this application as well so now we can just close their servers for the server as well we'll be just shutting down the server and we'll shut down the server of the backend as well so now we need to shut down this servers so now we have built this application and it is working totally fine and now in this section we'll be working on the deployment part of this application so the production version is ready and is working perfectly fine and now from this section onwards we'll be working on the deployment section of this application so for that you can see for the deployment we'll be using the render so the render is a great platform in which we can deploy our web applications the web servers the static sites the docker containers cron jobs we can have the background workers and then you can see there are a couple of services that we can use with the render web services static sites cron jobs we can have the redis postgres sql the docker files and their images and then you can see in the web services we can run the node and the graphql applications the rest applications the django and the flask and then you can see a lot of applications that we can deploy with the render so you can see it's a great tool and it's a great alternative for the heroku as well which is now a paid platform so now we need to pay for the services for using the heroku but for the render we can get started for completely free without even using the credit card so we can use the render with that and it provides us the simple version for the free version and it has the 512 mb of the storage so we can choose that so now you can see the render is a great alternative and then we'll be using this render for deployment of our backend application so for that now what do we want to do so as we saw here so first we need to publish our application to the github so for that we need to move on into the github so we can search for the github like this and then we can move on to the github.com and then you can see we have this home page of the github so i have logged in and then you can see here here are my couple of repositories here are my activities and this is my profile page on the github and now we can move on we can just click on the new to create a new repository to integrate with the render so for that we need to provide the name of this repository as well so we can have the react we can have the graphql we can have the blog like this so we can have the react graphql blog in which we can provide a name to our repository and then we can move on and you can see we can have the description as well so you have the right to add the description here so you can add that as well and then you can see you can choose to be public you can choose to be private but if you choose to be public so anyone can see your code inside this application and if you choose to be private so it will be privately accessible only to you so i will be choosing it public because i need to provide the source code of this project as well so i will be choosing the public and now you can see we can initialize this repository with adding a readme file as well so the readme file contains some description of your application so you can provide that as well but you can skip that as well and then you need to provide the git ignore as well so with the git ignore you need to provide the template so we are using the node environment for the backend so we can use the node like this so we can search for the node and then you can select this node according to it and then you can just click on create repository and you can also choose the license as well that you can use like the MIT GNU so it's up to you and now we can just click on the create repository to create a brand new repository for this application now you can see now we have the react graphql blog and what we'll be doing so we'll be publishing both of the backend and the frontend applications inside this repository so we'll be creating separate branches for the backend and for the frontend so now let's just move on and let's just set up this folder here so now to publish your code to the github so there are two options so first you can move on and you can just click on the add file and then you can just upload all of your files from the vs code so you can upload all of your files from here and then you can add that to the github so this is the first option and it's very easy but the second option which is very great is we can integrate this folder to the github repository so we can integrate this so we'll be using second option with the integration so for that what you need to do so you need to initialize a git repository inside this repository so you will be initializing a new git repository and before that we need to make a couple of commands and and make sure that you have installed the git in your system to start working on the git so now what do we want to do so we need to initialize a new git repository so for that we need to run the command of the git in it so it will initialize an empty git repository inside this block backend directory so for that we can hit enter 
and then you can see it will give you a message like the initialize the empty git repository inside this and then you can see now you can see the changes section so here we have the source control and inside that you can see the changes and you can see the changes are around 10,000 changes inside that because it is calculating the changes of the node modules as well so it is calculating of the node modules so what do we want to do so here you can see we have provided the git ignore file so we'll so what is a git ignore file we ignore some of these folders before publishing to the git so for that we need to ignore the node modules so i will be now creating a new file here we can have the dot we can have the git ignore like this and inside that i need to add the node modules like this so we can have the node modules so node modules like this so what it will do so it will ignore the node modules while publishing our application to the github because the node modules contains a lot of files and packages and these are not required in the deployment section because because in the deployment the servers automatically install all of those packages that we define over here and now what do we want to do so after the git init then we want to add all of these files inside the git commit so we'll be creating a commit in which we can just create and we can just add all of our files inside the commit changes so for that first we need to add the files to be included inside the commit so for that we need to add the git and then we need to add the dot sign so the dot will add all of these files available inside the root directory like the block backend so it will add all of your files inside that but it will ignore the node modules files with that and now we can move on and before adding all of these files you need to make one change inside the backend so you need to move on into the app.ts and there you can see while creating your application you have used the app.us graphql here you have the middleware so you can change the name as well like you can change the route name as well and then the property that you want to change is the graphql so the graphql is a property in which we can just test our application at the api with the interface so here in the production version we won't be allowing the users to test our api with the graphql so we can just have it to the false like this so we'll be choosing it to the false so now our application won't be available so the graphical interface won't be available inside the production version of our application and now we can move on and we can just set all of these files like this so now you can see we have a lot of files so now you can see we have some warnings as well so it won't do anything and now you can see after doing that now you can see now inside the source control now we have something so you can see now inside the block front end we do not have anything but inside the block back end you can see now we can just publish our applications to the github from here as well like you can see we have the master branch so we can publish a new branch as well we can commit from changes from here as well so there are a lot of things that we can do but we'll be focusing on the command line interface so for that now we are into this and now we have added all of those files and now we need to add the commit as well so for the commit we can use the git commit So we can choose to be git commit and then we need to add the message so we can have the slash m we can have hyphen m for the message and then we need to add the message like we can have the published code so we can have this message like this so we can have the published code so we can add this message and then we can hit enter and the new commit will be created so you can see now we have 26 files inside this commit inside the root commit that we have so now we have created a commit and now we have done the commit and now we have added all of these files we have initialized the git repository and now we want to just add some remote as well so the remote is we want to attach this application or we want to integrate this application to this repository that we have just created so for that how can we do that so first we you need to click on the code we have a drop down and inside that you can just choose to clone this git repository inside that so here we have the empty repository so now we want to connect this git repository into this graphql block so for that you need to click on the code and then you can see here you have the option of the https so you can just click to copy this url so you can just copy this github url and now you can move on and you can integrate or you can connect this git repository to this folder so you can add a command you can add the git remote so you can add the remote you can have the add so to add a remote and then you can give a name as well for this remote so you can give the name like the origin like this and then you need to provide the url like this so then you will see it will just add the remote inside this so you have the git remote at origin we have this Nikhil react graphql block so now we have this remote as well and now we want to push this application so you can see we'll be having two branches here we'll be having one for the front end and one for the back end so for that now we want to create a new branch as well inside that and for creating a new branch we can write another command we can have the git we can have the branch like this and then we need to add new branch so that should be like back end like this so it should be backend so we can have the new branch of the backend and then we need to hit enter so it will create a new branch with that and now what do we want to do so now we need to push this code to this branch inside this backend so we have already created a commit so now we want to push this commit into the backend branch 
so for that we can have the get we can have the push we can have stash u we can have hyphen u for the origin we can have the origin like this because now we want to provide the name of this remote and then we need to provide the branch name that should be the backend like this so then you will see once we hit enter so then you will see the new push will be created so you can see the new push has been created the new push has been created so now you can see object starting get done you can see now the backend will be having a new code inside that so if you will move on to the github so you can see the backend has the recent pushes less than a minute ago so you can refresh as well and then you can see now you have the backend as well and then you can see updated a new commit we have then by Nikhil Tadani so you can move on to the backend and then you can see all of your code all of your code of your application inside this github repository so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now you have the github repository as well so everything seems to be working perfectly fine and now you can move on into the source and then you can just verify that change as well like the graphql is now false so everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now we have added our application to the github so now it's a great step ahead and now we need to move on and then we need to integrate this repository to the render so for that you need to log in and then you need to move on to the dashboard so you can move on to the dashboard so in the dashboard you will be seeing all of your previous projects as well like you can see i had the previous project of the graphql and this was a new version that we have just created and now we need to click on the new to create a new web service for the node.js so we'll be creating a web service and then you can see now we'll be having a connector repository so for that you can just move on and you can just provide the url as well like this so you can move on into this you can provide the url of this and then you can move on into this you can provide that here so you can have this and then you can just click on the continue and then you can see now we need to provide the name of this application as well like we need to provide the unique name for the web service so we can have the graphql so we can have the graphql like this we can have dash block so we can have the graphql block for the node.js we can provide the region as well we have the branch but here we'll be using the branch of the backend but not the main so we'll be using the backend and then we need to provide the root directory as well so here the root directory would be different like root directory would be slash we can have the dist because all of our compiled code is available inside the dist folder you can see inside the dist folder now we have all of the compiled javascript code inside that so we'll be using dist with that and now we have the runtime that should be the node because now we are using the node.js and then we need to specify the build command as well so inside the build command we need to provide the npm install because now we need to install all of these libraries inside that to build this application first because now to run this application we need a couple of dependencies and the dependencies are already available inside that so we need to run the command of the npm i to build that and then we'll be having the start command as well and to start this we have the npm start for the start command like this so we have these commands over there and then what you want to do so now we can just move on and then you can just have here the free version for that so we'll be using the free version inside that and then what do we want to do is the next step so here you can see here we have the advanced things as well so we can just click on the advanced and then we need to provide some environment variables because now we need to provide the environment variables because we have a couple of environment variables if we move on to the dot env so you can see we have the port as well we have the mongodb password and this is very necessary this is very important to provide the mongodb password inside that so you can just copy the environment variable name then you can move on to the add environment variable you need to add the key of the mongodb password then you need to define the value of the password as well like this so you can have a value of this and then you can just click on the add environment variable to add another one so you can have the port like this so you can have the port like this and then you can have the port of the 5000 and it won't be necessary inside the deployment but we can still provide that because we have used this inside our application and then you can say you have the secret file auto deploy yes we have the build filters so you can say included parts as well so you can see now what do you want to do so you need to click on the create web service after that so you can verify all of those changes and then you can just click on the create web service so it will just create a web service for a node js and the graphql backend so now you can see now it has now created a new build so now you can see it is creating a new build it is running the build command as well with the npm install so it will install a couple of libraries and all of these things and then you can see after a couple of minutes then it will be published and it will be deployed then you can see now it is generating a new container docker image so you can see now it is generating a new image so now this may take a few minutes so now you can see now so now you can see now the docker container has been created uploading a build has been created starting service has been created and then you can see server is open on the port of the 5000 so we are seeing this message and then you can see now we have the message of the build uploaded we have the build successful and then you can see now it has been deployed 
and then you can see we have the node distap.js and the server is open on the port 5000 so you can see it is working perfectly fine so you can see now the deployment has been completed of this application so you can see it is completed with that and then you can see this will be the url graphql block .com. so this will be the url now of this application so now we can just copy this url and then we can move on to the front end part to test that if everything working fine or not then we can move on into the front end so block front end we have the source we have the public we have the index.tsx we have earlier we had the local was 5000 but now we'll be having this https graphql on render.com then we'll be having the graphql with that and then we can just verify with that as well so we can move on and we can just start this server of the front end once again so we can have the npm run so we can have the npm start to work on this development version so we can run this with the npm start and then you can see now we'll be testing with that so you can see now we have this thing so it is working perfectly fine and now we can move on we can just click on the blocks so here we go it is loading so now you can see now the blocks has been loaded so you can see it is working totally fine so now you can see the blocks has been loaded and then you can see it is working totally fine inside that you can see now we have the http on render.com and then you can see now the deployment of this backend has been successful so now we have deployed the backend and you can see it is working perfectly fine we can try with the authentication as well so we can have the mary at the rate we can have the test.com and then we can have the password as well like we can have the password and then if we just click on the submit i think it should work fine so you can see now it is working perfectly fine so now we are seeing all of the things inside that the blocks are working perfectly fine and then you can see everything is there and everything is working perfectly fine inside our applications so you can see now the deployment has been successful for the backend part and now you can see now the deployment of this backend has been successfully completed and now you can see now we need to work on the deployment of the front end part as well so for deploying the application to the front end we need to move on to the firebase and the firebase is a great tool in which we can deploy our applications so we can just move on to the firebase you can see this is a firebase you can open this and then you need to click on go to console so we can just click on the go to console to publish our react application and then what you can do so you can just click on the add project so with that you can create a brand new project with the firebase you can enter your project name as well like we can have the react we can have the graphql like this so we can have the graphql I think we do not need to enter a special character so we can have the react and slash graphql after that so we can have the react hyphen graphql and then the application url will be this like we can have the react graphql and this 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 and you can click on the continue and then you can see now we'll be having google analytics but we can skip that as of now and then we can just click on the create project so it will create your project within a couple of seconds so you can see creating your project and then it will be completed within very few seconds so you can see now the new project is ready so we can click on the continue and then you can see now we are into the console.firebase.google.com we are into the react graphql and you can see it is working perfectly fine and now we want to add the firebase inside our application to deploy this application to the firebase and now the steps will be very easy for deploying this application to the firebase so you can see we have the shortcuts for the hosting so we can click on the hosting and then you can see this will be the page for the hosting so deploy the web and the mobile applications in the seconds using a secure global content delivery networks so we can work with this and now we can just click on the get started to get started with the hosting now you can see for setting up the firebase hosting so we need to install a couple of packages as well so we need to install the firebase tools inside our application so we can just copy that and then we can move on to the front end application so here we have the front end and now we can just close that and now we can move on and we can provide that over here we have the npm install g we have the firebase tools so it will install the firebase tools globally inside this system so we can just hit enter and then we can move on and then we can move on till it installs and then you can see we have the allow show me the steps and all of these things so now we'll be having these things and now we can just move on we can just click on the next and then you can see now we'll be having this thing like with firebase login and the firebase init so for that you need to copy the command again so you need to move on and you need to provide this command the firebase login so after this it will open this so like you can see firebase optionally collects the cli and the emulator usage so now you need to click on the y and then you need to press enter so it will open the chrome for login so we can just click on the login like this so now with that we'll be logging in with that and then you need to click on the allow with that so you can click on the allow so now you can see the firebase cli login has been successful so you can see now the success logged in as this 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 so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine so now the authentication was successful and now we can move on and you can see we'll be having below steps like we'll be having the firebase in it so you need to copy that command and you need to paste this once again so we can have the firebase in it 
and it will initialize the firebase inside our application like this like you can see are you ready to proceed so we can just click on the y so we can just hit enter and then you can see we'll be having a couple of options there and now we'll be having a couple of options inside this so you can have the enter to confirm your choice so we'll be using this option over there configure files for the firebase hosting and optionally set up the github action deploy so we can just hit on that and then you can see i think we need to select with the spacebar so we need to start again from the scratch so we can have the firebase again we can have the edit with that so here we are the firebase in it and now we can move on and you can see are you ready to proceed again we can just click on the y and then you can see here we have a couple of options that we want to choose and we want to choose with this space so you can see we want to choose with this space and now you can see the option that we'll be choosing will be this option the configure files for firebase hosting and optionally set up the github action deploys so we can just select this option so we can just select this option so you need to press the space bar and then you can see now this option has been selected and now we can just hit enter and now we'll be having an option of using an existing project so we'll be choosing an option of using an existing project so we need to hit enter so now you will be seeing a couple of options that we have created inside that so you can just follow these applications so i think we have created the application with the react graphql like this so we have this application react graphql so we can just hit enter so now we'll be having this application over there and then you can see where do you want to use your public directory and this time we will be using public directory as the build because now we have built this application so we'll be using the build folder so we'll be creating the build with that so then we need to hit enter and then you can see configure a single page application to rewrite all urls so you can just hit on y and then you need to move on and then you have the setup automatic builds and deploys with the github so we'll be using n with that because we won't be using the github with that so we can just hit enter with the n and finally we'll be having this option like the file and the build slash index.html is already exist so we need to click on the no because it will override the index.html file and it will be completely of no use so we can just click on the end and then finally we'll be seeing the firebase initialization has been completed and now we can move on and we can build our application again for the front end because we have used here like this we have used the new url for this for the back end so we can move on we can run the build once again we can have the npm run we can have the build so we'll be building this application once again so you can see now the build has also been created once again so it is working perfectly fine and now the last step that we want to perform will be very very easy and that would be the firebase deploy so that will be the only command that we want to add like the firebase deploy so it will deploy our application to the firebase so we can hit enter and then you will see after a couple of seconds and then you can see now we'll be having the deploying to the react graphql this 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 deploying hosting deploying all of these files so we need to wait for a couple of seconds till it deploys our application to the firebase and finally you can see the deployment has been completed for the firebase so you can see now we have the deploy complete you can see now we have a lot of options we have the beginning deploy found 16 files and there were so many things with that and then finally you can see we have the hosting url as well so now once you open this url so you need to press ctrl and click on this so you can just open this inside of web browser so then you will see now we'll be seeing our application inside that so you can see we'll be having our application we'll be having some images we'll be having all of this content that we built with our application and then you can see now it is publicly available to any of the user that you can send so you can see it is working perfectly fine we have the blocks as well so we can see we'll be having some blocks features as well so you can see we have here the own render it is working perfectly fine so after around 10 to 15 seconds we'll be seeing this so inside the own render we have one drawback if the application is inactive or like the, if the server is inactive for almost one hour then we need to wait for a couple of seconds to restart the server once again and then it will be available once again so we can just refresh once again so you can see we'll be having some data with that so now you can see now our application is open on this url so you can see it is publicly available and then you can see now our application is working perfectly fine we can just move on to the blocks and then you can see the blocks for loading we can see all of those content as well and then you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine we can follow the auth as well we have this url we have the email we have the password we can click on the submit and then you can see the authentication will be completed so we'll be seeing the user as well we can see the profile as well we have the blogs we can open the blogs and then we can comment as well so everything would work perfectly fine inside our application so we can just test with adding the comment as well like we can have the great post like we can have the great post like this so we can just click on the send and then you will see the comment will be sent to the database so we have the hold on and then you can see fetching complete and then you can see now we have the great post as well so you can see everything seems to be working perfectly fine even if we refresh the page 
then you can see now the blog will be loaded and then we have the great post so you can see everything in our application is working perfectly fine so now we have completed this huge project so you can see the deployment section is working perfectly fine the deployment has been created we can post a new blog as well so you can see everything in our application is working perfectly fine and it's fully responsive application so you can move on you can open it in any device so you can see we'll be having the hamburger menu for moving on to the links and then you can see finally with this step our project has been completed we started with the scratch we built the basic application then we built the back end then we built the front end with so many libraries so many packages so many issues and we fixed all of those issues and finally you can see now we have built this application and then we have deployed this application as well and the deployment is also working perfectly fine so now you can see with this step now we have completed this huge project with that so congratulations on working on this project and i wish you for the successful future ahead so that's it for this project. So let's have a look at the summary part of what we have done throughout this entire course. So first we learned about the GraphQL and we built a basic CRUD API with the GraphQL. And then we built a full stack man applications which includes building the GraphQL backend with Node, Express and MongoDB. Building the front end with React, with the material UI, with the Redux. And then we did some optimizations and some fixing the breaking changes of our applications which happened. And then finally we deployed this application. So that's it for this course. So this was a huge course that we built. And this was the biggest course that we have built by the Indian coders. And we congratulate you on completing on this course. And we hope that you be successful in your future. So good luck and thanks for watching our video. And please do me a favor please subscribe to our channel and please hit that like button so that we can get some help from the YouTube algorithm so that our video can get popular because we work hard a lot for creating these courses, for optimizing the courses, for learning these technologies first, then explaining all of that stuff, then editing and so many work is there. So please just do me a favor, please like the video, please subscribe to our channel. And if you love this course, then you can also comment that, that we love this course so we can create more projects like this. So that's it from this complete course of the Mern stack.